Hello and welcome back to my channel and Merry, Merry Christmas. Today is the release of the brand new Reindeer Wrangler Ranch Romance One Frosty Christmas Road Trip. I know you're going to love this book. I'm so excited to share it with you. It is literally one of the longest books I have written in a long time. So settle in, grab yourself a cocoa, sit by the fire, invite your furry little friend along to snuggle up with you. And without further, oh, oh, before I forget, at the end, there is a bonus little chapter and I'm not going to spoil it, but I just think you should stick around for that. So after the end credits, there's a bonus chapter. Remember that. Don't forget. And I'll see you at the end. One Frosty Christmas Road Trip. A Reindeer Wrangler Ranch Christmas Romance Novel. Written by Lucy McConnell. Prologue. It was a balmy, 82-degree summer night on Reindeer Wrangler Ranch. The sun dawdled like a child procrastinating at bedtime. Salmon and orange colors burnished the clouds on the horizon. Drake Nicholas removed his straw cowboy hat, swiped the back of his arm across his forehead, and settled the hat back in place. A whole week of tending expectant mothers and their newborn calves with his family left him bone-weary and longing for a hot shower. He longed for them on regular workdays because of the shower panel tower system he'd installed two months ago as an upgrade to his bachelor's cabin. Summers in North Dakota were fairly mild compared to other parts of the country, and 82 degrees felt like a heat wave. Dust and sweat clung to his skin, scratching under his collar. Of course, the hottest week would hit them during calving season. He glared at the sun, seeing it as a bad omen and a curse upon their heads all in one. Their reindeer didn't particularly enjoy warm temperatures either. The poor mothers panted and sweated through delivery. The Wranglers brought them buckets of water and sponged them in an effort to keep them comfortable. The 260 to 320 pound animals longed for winter temperatures, icy winds, in the frigid ice scape of the North Pole where Santa's elves tended to their every need. Not every reindeer made it to Santa's elite stables, though. They had over 300 head on the ranch, far beneath what they could care for out here in the wide open hills and valleys that had been in his family for generations. Population control hadn't been a concern until recently. Then, it became a matter of bloodlines, chromosomes, and genes as they worked to solve the biggest crisis the ranch had faced since its conception. The Reindeer Wrangler Ranch was the only reindeer ranch in the whole world. Wild, non-magical herds could live in the Arctic tundra in the adjacent forests of Greenland, Scandinavia, Russia, Alaska, and Canada. As far as the Nicholas family knew, they were the only ones with flying reindeer. Santa himself had worked with Drake's great-great-something grandfather to establish the reindeer ranch, so he would have a ready supply of reindeer to choose from without all the work involved in ranching at the North Pole. Thanks to his mother's tireless work and the help of several scientists, reindeer had been placed under the care of the Endangered Species Act about five years ago, which made the wrangler's jobs a lot easier in some ways and increased their paperwork by 315%. Such was the way of government projects. All that work and their family may have failed. Failed Santa. Failed Christmas. Failed children all over the world who wrote letters, kept themselves on the good list, and waited with eager anticipation to hear reindeer on their rooftop on Christmas Eve. Drake paced just behind the line of four-wheelers and ATVs as his family watched with trepidation as the last pregnant cow worked to bring her baby into the world. He couldn't hold still. Faith, his sister-in-law, and their resident veterinarian, banished him back here because he made the mother nervous. His parents and family sat on their machines, not wanting to crowd in on the female. Caleb's son, Ryder, sat in front of his grandpa, his mouth open far enough to catch flies. Forrest and Mitzi were in a four-seater side-by-side, their one-year-old girl, Aspen, bouncing on Mitzi's lap while Billy, Mitzi's son from her first marriage, leaned into Forrest. Come on, snowball, Billy cheered quietly. He was so excited to be a part of all that happened on the ranch, and they loved having him around. The brothers grew up learning by working alongside their father, and that style of teaching came naturally to them. Snowball was a tawny pelted beauty who descended from Dancer herself, and her 5-20 to 20 pound bundle of joy was their last hope. If she didn't give them a flying calf, they were out of options and out of magic. The thought made him tense and in a weird way, itchy. Snowball bleated and threw her head back. Faith landed on her knees next to Snowball's head and rubbed down her neck in long, soothing strokes. Come on, girl, she cooed. 
You can do it. She'd painstakingly comb through the breeding charts of every animal on the ranch and handpicked the 50 cows they bred this year and the bulls assigned to them. Caleb was next to his wife in a flash. His hands gripped the ground, his knuckles white. Caleb's hair was white blonde with a few grays thrown in, and he had navy blue eyes, while Drake's were dark brown, and his eyes were the color of storm clouds. Caleb was the oldest of the five brothers, and Drake was the baby. Even with their coloring on opposite ends of the spectrum, they had the same build, the same square jaw, and the same worry line between their eyebrows. The family had worked all spring to separate the herd into different fields and ensure they followed her orders precisely. There wasn't room for error. Fifty was more than twice as many as they usually bred. They hoped that breeding more cows would increase their chances of getting a flying reindeer in these desperate times. Pax threw a leg over his machine and stepped down. His medium brown hair and beard turned red in the sunlight. His steel gray eyes missed nothing. Even though he paced opposite Drake, the two of them moving like soldiers guarding a royal gate, his expression was even, and his hands still. Unlike Drake's hands that fluttered here, there, and everywhere, he scratched his head, his chest, and the back of his neck. Pax was the family rock, the steady influence, and, when they were younger, the voice of reason. Not that Drake always listened to him. It's time, Faith called out excitedly. She pulled leather medical gloves from her back pocket and slipped them on. The family held their collective breath. Natasha, their social media guru and documentarian, used three GoPros set on tripods at different angles to film the birth. She also had her husband, Jack, filming with his phone while she did the same, getting close-ups. She and Jack would be out here long after the rest of them drove home, documenting the calves' first steps and feeding for their social media following. They walked a careful line of giving enough information on the herd to stimulate interest while keeping the family's biggest secret a secret. Natasha joined the family last year after filming a movie on the ranch, meeting Jack, and falling desperately, and somewhat sickeningly, in love with his older brother. She enjoyed sharing stories and had taken their little ranch from a local wonder to a national treasure. The upcoming holiday season had the town's band be fully booked, and their holiday reindeer sleigh rides had a wait list almost as long as Santa's nice list. If the interest kept up, they'd have to extend into January. Forrest and Mitzi each put a hand on Billy's shoulder to keep him from launching over the front of the side-by-side -side to be closer to Snowball. Drake stepped up to his father's machine. Dad had a bout of pneumonia last year that left him thinner and older looking. He was back to 75% of where he'd been before he got sick. They all hoped he continued to get stronger. His hair was thinner and his snowy white beard was as fluffy as ever. Dad named every reindeer on the ranch, all 349 of them. With one mighty bellow from Snowball, her calf slid into the world, blinking in the sunlight. Make that 50. It's a girl. Faith cheered. Girls were a good sign. Most of Santa's reindeer through the ages were female. Ryder twisted so he could look up at his grandpa. What's her name? Dad smiled down at the newborn, the pride evident on his face. Nothing was as beautiful as the birth of a new addition to their ranch. This little one represented a new generation and the promise that life continued on. Oh, I think we should call this one Tundra. What do you think, Ryder? Tundra. He tried the name out with the same serious expression he used when Faith put a new vegetable on his plate. I guess it will work. Dad tickled Ryder. You guess? Ryder squirmed and giggled. Grandpa. Drake reached over and added a few tickles under Ryder's chin. He twisted, and Pax barely grabbed him under the bum to keep him from sliding off the seat. Snowball licked her calf as if none of this was her concern. She would focus entirely on her little one for the next few hours. Tundra's pelt started to dry. She was the same tawny color as her mother, had the same big brown eyes. Faith and Caleb moved back from Snowball so she could get up if she wanted to. The baby would have a physical and receive vaccinations, but not today. Snowball pushed up to standing, her body shuddering with the effort. She took a step to the water bucket and drank deeply. Faith nodded as she watched the normal behavior, keeping her distance as she circled the reindeer and calf, giving Mama a visual checkup. She turned to Natasha, knowing she wanted Faith to interact with their followers. Faith was a fan favorite with her beautiful long brown hair, country girl style, and can-do attitude. Their most viewed video was of Faith climbing into a mud hole to rescue a teenaged reindeer. She ended up covered in mud and gunk so thick that her teeth were the only part of her that was clean. Everything looks good. She spoke to Natasha's phone. She's the picture of health. 
Natasha grinned at her. You're getting so good at this. Faith blew a piece of hair off her forehead. I'm glad one of us thinks so. Usually one to pile compliments on top of compliments, Mom was unusually silent. Drake found her watching the little calf intently. It wouldn't be long before she needed to nurse, which meant she had to stand up. Snowflake turned from the water bucket and slowly made her way to her baby. She got behind her and began nudging her to her feet. With wobbly legs and a firm set to her jaw, Tundra struggled to her hoofs. Unlike horses and cows, reindeer had thick skin on their feet and fur to protect them from sharp rocks and other dangers. Snowball encouraged Tundra with a huff. Tundra took her first step, and Drake fisted his hands to keep them from shaking. If she was a flyer, her next step would be in the air, and then the actual work began. They would pack up Mama and Baby and take them to the indoor barn, where they stabled the rest of the flyers. He'd be the one to drape the baby over his legs on the four-wheeler. Snowflake would have to walk behind. It was hard enough for a flying reindeer to raise a flying calf. One who couldn't fly would be at a complete loss. Snowflake would have a new home in the barn until it was time to wean the baby. Tundra undulated in place, as if trying to teach her legs what to do. Move. The momentum propelled her forward, and she took three more steps across the field grass. Drake's shoulders fell, the taste of failure burning across his tongue. Forrest groaned. Natasha turned off her phone and sighed heavily. Jack took off his ball hat and threw it on the ground. Faith silently wiped tears off her cheeks. Caleb wrapped her in his arms. It's not your fault, he said as he kissed her hair. Drake turned away from the tender scene. In the depths of his disappointment, he didn't need to be reminded that he was alone and wouldn't ever have a beautiful woman to hold when his world stopped turning. He liked being single. He chose this path and would continue on no matter how much his brothers insisted he was an idiot. After a lifetime of being the youngest brother, he liked not having someone tell him what to do, which was why he'd built his cabin already. His brothers had waited until they were married to claim their plot of land on the long drive up to the ranch. Not him. He wanted to do things his way and enjoyed every decision he'd made on his own. Countertops. Cabinet color. Type of flooring. Floor plan. Furniture. All of it was his and his alone. What if your wife hates it? Pax had asked when the large semi pulled up with the logs for the exterior. I'm not going to have that problem, Drake replied. Pax opened his mouth and then waved him off, as if arguing his point was pointless. Pax was also single and didn't show any signs of wanting to put himself out there and date, which meant he wasn't going to find a wife anytime soon. So why did he care if Drake did or did not want one? Drake's only problem with being single was that his brothers made being married look so good. They doted on their wives, doing all sorts of things to make them smile. Just the other day, Forrest finished the porch swing he'd been secretly working on and installed it for Mitzi while she was at the grocery store. Drake was working on a fence nearby when Mitzi pulled into the driveway to find Forrest rocking slash waiting for her. She'd flown from the car and kissed Forrest like he was some kind of superhero. It wouldn't be horrible to have someone look at him like that, or kiss him like that. Natasha asked Dad for an interview. He set Ryder down so he could run to Caleb. Caleb tossed him into the air and then set him on his hip. What's this new reindeer's name? Natasha asked. She added sunshine to her voice, as if Tundra wasn't a tremendous disappointment that dashed their hopes to the South Pole. The rest of them took note of that and squared their shoulders. Any new reindeer on the ranch should be celebrated, not born under this cloud of unmet expectations. It was difficult to dispel all the clouds. Flying reindeer were a symbol of hope and magic, and without new calves, the world seemed a little darker. Faith moved out of Caleb's arms to check on Snowball as she nursed, talking in a soothing voice as she checked her vitals. She allowed the reindeer to keep her body between her and the baby. As closely as they worked with the reindeer, they were cautious to remember that they were large animals with instincts, and protecting their young was one of the strongest. The brothers gathered in a circle behind the four-wheelers. Pax kicked at the grass, his chin to his chest. The scent of clovers lifted into the air, and Drake took a deep breath. Caleb pulled his leather work gloves from his back pocket and slapped them against his jeans. Let's not get discouraged. Jack, Caleb's younger twin, scoffed. Three years, bro. Three years without a flyer. What are we going to do? He ran his hand down his cheek. He had a beard last winter and shaved it off this spring. They all cycled through facial hair, depending on how early they wanted to get up in the morning so they could shave. Drake liked to shave in the summer. It was too hot to deal with facial hair. The thing is, 
Caleb glanced over his shoulder. Faith thinks it could be our studs. It's possible the flying gene isn't strong enough in them. Drake blanched. None of them? Caleb cupped the back of his neck. None. They're all at least two generations away from flyers. Forrest snapped his fingers, his hazel eyes lighting with hope. What about that one lady who called? The one from Montana? Drake shook his head. I talked to her. Mom talked to her. Dad tried, and she blocked his number. She won't sell the reindeer. She wouldn't even consider it. He wanted to scream every time he thought of her uppity tone and dismissive texts. It's stupid because she shouldn't even have him. It's illegal. Now that reindeer were a protected species, owning one required permits and permission from federal and state agencies. He hooked his thumbs in his belt loops. We could report her. Once the authorities get a hold of him, they'll bring him here. Of course, if they found out he was a flying reindeer, they'd turn him over to a group of scientists for research or whatever. Forrest lifted an eyebrow. And have her arrested? Drake rocked back on his heels. No. Of course not, he said to appease them. But at this point, he wasn't sure he cared if a stranger went to prison for keeping an illegal reindeer. There were children all over the world who needed Santa. What was a year in prison for one woman compared to that? Jack shook his head. Not if he's bonded with her. Can you imagine separating Billy and Snowflake? Drake sucked in a breath. The repercussions for both reindeer and human could be catastrophic. Over the years, they'd each had a reindeer that claimed them as their person. For them, it all happened when they were kids. Reindeer made the best best friends. They were loyal and fun, protective and playful. You could tell them all your secrets, and they never shared. Once they bonded with a person, they refused to leave, ever. Drake's reindeer BFF, Zane, passed away seven years ago, and he still missed him. Helplessness was not something Drake liked. In fact, he hated the feeling with all of his being. There has to be something we can do. We can't keep trying and failing. Every. Year. Caleb narrowed his eyes. Nothing against Faith, he backtracked quickly. She's doing the best she can with what we have, but we need to give her something else to work with. It wasn't like they could bring the reindeer from the North Pole down. Once they joined Santa's crew, their focus was on that Christmas Eve ride and only that ride. Which was another reason having the ranch in North Dakota was so important to Christmas. Even Dunder, their current reindeer king, didn't produce any offspring. Jack's large hand landed on Drake's shoulder. Let's just take two steps backward. Drake shook off his hand. I'm going in. Being told to calm down was the worst. Especially when you didn't want to calm down. Sometimes, he just wanted to act instead of having to talk in circles with his brothers over every little thing that happened on the ranch. He climbed on his four-wheeler and tore out of the clearing. A hard ride through the hills would blow off steam. His family was a keep-the-faith family. He had faith. Their pastor was the first one to remind them all that sometimes you had to get off your knees and give God something to work with. A starving man who sat down in a wheat field and prayed for a loaf of bread to appear would continue to starve. Yeah, he paid attention in Sunday school. Widows had oil, blind men washed clay off their eyes. God didn't just drop a miracle out of the clear blue sky. He'd find a way to get that reindeer to the ranch. And if God wanted to step in and make a Christmas miracle out of it, well, that would be up to him. Chapter 1 Clove Hogan pulled her long sweater tighter around her and cinched it at the waist before stepping onto the large wraparound porch to check on the Thanksgiving turkey in the smoker. When it snowed, it didn't feel all that cold out, so she slipped into the boots by the door and stepped into Old Man Winter's playground. The world was dressed in layers of snow for the festivities. Giant pine trees reached to the clouds, their boughs heavy with snow. She and Grandma Hannah had stored their trucks in the garage weeks ago and now used their snowmobiles to get around town. She liked the speed, but if she had the chance, she'd cross-country ski all winter long. The activity helped her feel like she wasn't cooped up for the winter, but set free to explore while the bear population slumbered. The scent of applewood smoke reached her first, and she wrinkled her nose, knowing she would smell like Thanksgiving for the rest of the day and have to wash her sweater. There were worse things. Stir the wax. Grandma yelled before the door shut. She worked her arthritic hands to the bone in the kitchen, determined to have all the fixins for the holiday. Even though it was just the two of them, she insisted they couldn't do without stuffing, cranberry sauce, or sweet potatoes topped with miniature marshmallows. When Clove showed up on her doorstep, 
she wasn't so sure about raising her granddaughter but had risen to the task of making their cabin in the woods a loving home. Clove pressed her palm over her stomach, already anticipating the food coma she'd have while trying to wash dishes. They'd have enough leftovers to feed them until Christmas, and then they'd do it all again to celebrate the birth of the Savior. She loved their quiet Christmas traditions and the manger they put out on the porch every year, along with a few bales of straw. She went to the smoker first. Pressing the button that read the temperature, she nodded at the steady progress. Their bird was right on time. It would have a smoky flavor that made it taste like they had cooked it over a campfire and dripping with juice. Her stomach growled in anticipation. Stepping to the camp chef to stir the wax, as directed, a distinct crunch sounded under her brown leather boot. She paused and lifted her foot to look underneath. Something orange stuck there. Carrot? Off to the right, there was another piece. Hmm, she said a little louder, I wonder how these carrot pieces ended up on the porch? She followed them like breadcrumbs to the base of the giant pine tree that sheltered her bedroom window from the sunrise. Looking up, she found her culprit. Felix, she scolded the reindeer as he lounged on the largest branch. I told you to stay out of the root cellar. Repeatedly. Every time she went down there and every time she came back up and latched the door. Felix's eyes widened, I did. She narrowed her eyes at him. I know you did, until you didn't. He spit a carrot stem on the ground in front of her, prove it. She pointed up at him. You're on thin ice with me, mister. What she couldn't figure out was how he got down there with his antlers. The entrance wasn't wide enough for him to fit easily. He must have really wanted a snack or charmed a squirrel into bringing him food. Somehow, that seemed less likely than him flying into that tree to munch on his ill-begotten vegetables. A snowmobile roared, coming up the drive and interrupted their spat. It's the sheriff, she hissed up at Felix. He rolled his eyes as he flipped off the back of the branch and landed softer than an angel's kiss on a marshmallow floating in whipped cream. His elegance and grace sometimes overwhelmed her. As Sheriff Hoffman cut the engine Felix turned around and rubbed his backside on the tree. Lovely, Clove mumbled under her breath toward the hairy beast. Putting on a neighborly face, she called down the drive, Hello, Sheriff. What brings you out on the holiday? He swiped his helmet off his head and tucked it under his arm. His orange hair stood on end, and his freckled face was red with the effort of managing a snowmobile in fresh powder. I'm here on official duty. He gulped. And for the hundredth time, call me Alan. We went to middle school together, for heck's sake. He ran his gloved hand over his hair and ended up leaving behind a bunch of snow. Scowling, he took off his glove and brushed it out. Official business, she glanced at Felix, her pulse spiking with fear. The only thing in her life that was slightly outside the lines was harboring an illegal reindeer. She and Grandma didn't claim ownership of Felix, but he was an endangered species. If their property wasn't right on the border of the Kootenay National Forest, he wouldn't have been able to stay as long as he had. She forced herself to act casual. What's so official? It's Thanksgiving. Shoot. I didn't mean to alarm you, Clove. He went to lean on his snowmobile and, having misjudged the distance, stumbled into it instead. Felix chortled. Alan looked at Felix as if he just realized he was there. You should cut off his antlers. Felix's mockery cut off, and he glared at the sheriff, his shoulders hunched as if ready to tear into the man for recommending such a thing. Alan, feeling the heat of his glare, unwound his scarf. He's supposed to shed them. I bet he gets headaches. Felix pawed like a bull getting ready to charge, you're a headache. Clove coughed to hide her laughter. Some reindeer don't shed them. I looked it up. As long as he doesn't walk crooked, he's fine. Oh. He glanced around as if looking for another topic. Your business, she prompted. Yeah, I'm checking on all the cabins and making sure they have enough firewood for the weekend. He stepped back and patted a bundle on the back of his sled. I think we're good. 
She motioned to the five-foot stack of firewood she'd cut that summer. Yeah, you are. His gaze raced over her and back up to her face. His cheeks turned nearly purple. I, um, do you want to go to dinner with me? He patted his sled again. Did he expect her to climb aboard and take off right now? Clove tipped her head. Tonight? No. 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 He waved her off. Felix swiped a hoof through the snow, smooth. Be nice, she admonished him. Sorry. I Alan lowered his head and stared at the ground. I didn't mean to upset you. No. Not you. She waved to Felix and then threw her hands in the air. This is why she would never have a serious relationship. Not because she had a flying reindeer but because she was hopeless at all this relationship stuff, including having a normal conversation. Not that she wanted to marry Alan. For the love, she could not imagine him leaning in for a kiss. E.W. He was like a brother. They had braces at the same time and the yearbook pictures to prove it. Movement caught her attention. Grandma stood in the window, holding a jar of apple preserves. Bless her. Sheriff, it's your lucky day. She darted to the door. Just as she reached it, Grandma opened it and shoved the jar out to her. Real subtle, she ground out before Grandma shut the door. Spinning, she slathered a smile across her face as thick as cream cheese frosting on a sugar cookie. For your table tonight. She tromped down the steps and thrust the bottle into Alan's chest. We're all stocked up and have enough to share. She let go too soon, and he fumbled the bottle. Thanks. This is great. Hannah's apple pie filling will make me the envy of the town. Clove nodded. It's the least we can do for the sheriff. As long as he was bragging about apples and not having a date with her, he could blab to whomever he wanted to. He didn't stay long. His red tail light bobbed between the trees and then disappeared. She brushed off her palms. Good work. Turned down a date, and the man left happy. She paused, her enthusiasm dipping. Was being replaceable by a jar of apple pie filling really something to be proud of? She let out a sigh. Felix went back to scratching his behind. He's a decent guy, Grandma said right behind her. Clove screamed and clutched at her sweater. How are you so quiet when your actual joints creak? She pressed her hand over her heart to slow it down. Maybe you were deep in thought? Grandma lifted a shoulder as she checked the turkey. Why don't you give Alan a break and go out with him? That boy's been sweet on you since the seventh grade. Clove huffed. Because I knew him in seventh grade when he ran Olivia's bra up the flagpole. Grandma opened her mouth, and Clove held up her hand. I have no idea how he got it. Clove rubbed her arms. I don't feel anything but friendship for him. Love can blossom from friendship if given the chance. Grandma patted the smoker as if it were a pet who had just delivered the newspaper. Not that their pet, if you could call Felix that, had delivered anything to their door. He took more joy in scaring off the mail carrier than he did in saving Clove steps down the mountain. Clove shook her head. I should feel something, Grandma. With Alan, it's a big blank. Blank paper is meant for writing on, like a love story. She pumped her eyebrows. Clove glanced at Felix. He shook his ears, you're on your own with this one. I'm not paper, and neither is he. Besides, it will take a special man to love me, you, and Felix. We're a package deal. She side-hugged Hannah, noting that her shoulders felt thinner lately. Old age was not for the weak. Alan knows that. I think you should call him. And I think you should mind your beeswax. She kissed Hannah's hair. Don't get sassy with me, young lady. Grandma spanked her backside. Clove laughed, dancing away from her. No. Your actual beeswax. She pointed to the stockpot on the camp chef. The wax they'd harvested over the summer had waited long enough to be purified. They'd use it to make lotions, 
body butter bars, lip salves, and other skincare items to help them come through the winter, still looking like total babes. Bring the strainer, dear? Grandma asked as she stirred the last of the bits into the dirty-looking liquid. It was a dark yellow and brown now, but would be a stunning cream color by the time they were done with the process. Be right there. She loved this life. She loved living as off-grid as they did. The three of them managed together just fine. Felix is the only male we need around these parts. The only one she'd let into her heart. Having it broken by a man was an experience she didn't want to repeat. Chapter 2 Happy Thanksgiving. Drake swooped to the door and took his niece from Natasha. She was one and precocious and perfect. Straw-colored curls were tamed into pigtails and adorned with ribbons that wouldn't last longer than a piece of pie. Dwake. She squealed as he swung her around and around. You make me dizzy. He stopped and planted a loud kiss on her cheek and then blew a raspberry right after, earning him a fit of giggles and the title of world's most favored uncle. You make me dizzy, little girl. I not little. She held up all five pudgy fingers. He grabbed her hand and kissed each one. Then you must be gigantic. He tossed her into the air. You're taller than me. She laughed, and when he transferred her to his hip to cart her around, she patted his cheek. He loved those pats. They were the best part of his day. His mother was big on all the holidays, with Thanksgiving being almost as important as Christmas. She pulled out all the decorations, adding large acorns and sprigs of leaves in red, yellow, and browns, pumpkins, turkeys, and little blocks of wood with sayings on them that reminded everyone to be grateful, thankful, and that they were blessed. This year, they were all full of thanksgiving that they still had dad to celebrate with them and that they'd added to their family with a beautiful wedding. Catching sight of her cousins, Aspen wiggled to be let down, and he set her on her boots to scamper off and snitch olives from the table when she thought no one was watching. Sighing, he turned to see where he could help. Caleb and Jack finished carrying up the folding chairs from the storage in the basement. Forrest and Pax laid out the dishes and silverware. Faith and Mitzi hauled in the side dishes. Mom brought in the turkey. Dad sat at the head of the table, carving knife in hand. He was almost back to his pre pneumonia weight. Coupled with his white beard and white hair, he looked like Santa once again. And Drake was back to being unneeded. While Dad was down, he'd had more than his fair share of things to do to keep the ranch running. The reindeer happy, Mom from feeling overwhelmed, and Dad involved in things even though all he could do was lay in bed. Training the few flyers they had in the barn, even though they would never make it to Santa's sleigh, was just as crucial to the reindeer's mental well-being as it was to keeping the wrangler's skill set sharp. Not to mention, he'd been Mom's right-hand man for a while. All the little things she'd asked Dad to do around the house, like fix a door knob or change the light bulbs, had been his domain for a while. He'd been essential until he wasn't. That was part of the reason he'd decided to build his house. He'd gotten a taste of being responsible for the upkeep of a home and wanted more. The very day he moved in, he had an overwhelming sense of accomplishment. The next day, he felt lonely. He'd grown up with five brothers. How could he not miss the noises of other people in a house? Water running through the pipes. Footsteps on the wood floor. The refrigerator opening and closing a million times a day. Most mornings, he came to the farmhouse for breakfast, claiming that mom's cinnamon rolls and apple oatmeal were better than anything he poured from a box. He suspected mom saw through his excuses, but didn't mind one bit that her youngest son exchanged morning hugs for breakfast. Gather in, folks. Dad called over the general bus. He had on a brown and cream flannel and a pair of brand new jeans that were stiff enough to hold up a horse. His custom belt buckle, with an outline of a reindeer, glinted, and he grinned at each of them as they took their seats. Ryder climbed up on a chair with an old Yellow Pages telephone book on it. Drake laughed that Mom had hung on to the thing, but she swore it was the best booster she ever had. He checked the date later, but was pretty sure he'd sat on it a Thanksgiving or two when he was a child. Mitzi set Aspen in the high chair. She banged her pudgy hands on the plastic and grinned, knowing wonderful taste and yummy things were headed her way. Drake was a little more patient. The spices and flavors of the holidays were his absolute favorite. They had turkey a couple times a year was all, unless it was deli meat, and he couldn't wait to dig into a drumstick. He and Jack always got the legs, because no one else wanted them, which was just fine with him. Billy would get the wishbone in a couple of days after it had a chance to dry out. 
When Ryder and Aspen got a little older, they'd have to take turns. He'd always thought the dining room was so big. Their family of seven easily fit in the space. He teased Dad once that they could move the table out and have a barn dance in here. Dad had that look in his eye of an adult who knew more of the ways of things than a child and said, one day, it might be too small for all of us. Drake hadn't known what he meant at the time, but he understood now. Dad stood, and the room went quiet. I want to thank all of you for being a part of this family. Some of you didn't have much of a choice. He looked over his glasses, meeting each of his boy's eyes. And some of you were coerced. He looked at his daughters-in-law, who all chuckled. Mitzi blew him a kiss. As a woman who was on her own, raising a son, she'd fallen into this family and adopted them as her own. She even called Drake's parents mom and dad. I just want you to know how grateful I am to have another year to celebrate with all of you. He lifted his cup. Drake followed his example, the glass cold against his skin. May you all be blessed within the circle of love found here on Reindeer Wrangler Ranch. Here, here. Drake called before clinking his glass with Ryder's tumbler of milk, who giggled, completely thrilled to play along with the adults. Pax. Dad motioned for him to say the blessing. They bowed their heads, and Pax offered up a prayer of thanksgiving to the one who provided. As soon as the amen rang out like bells on Christmas, the room erupted with conversations, dishes clanking, and soft music mom liked to have in the background. This year was a collection of the piano guy's Thanksgiving hymns. She'd found them on YouTube when Dad was sick and played their albums throughout the day when she was in the office or in his room while he fought for his life. Drake kept his head down and listened to the conversations going on around him as he helped Ryder put olives on his fingers. The two-year-old wiggled and laughed too hard to do it himself, and it was a tradition for the kids at Thanksgiving to have olive fingers. Or, it had been, until they'd all gotten too big to fit the olives over their digits but some things were important to share with the next generation. Looking for alternative means, said Pax across from him. Like what? Asked Natasha. She had on her interviewer persona, something she slipped into often around here as she learned more and more about the ranch. I have a bunch of ideas, replied Pax. Hot air balloons would make the sleigh lighter, so they'd need fewer reindeer to pull it. I need to talk to Ginger about the route they take. We could have smaller sleighs pulled by one reindeer in key places to switch out. Like a relay? Natasha asked. She scooped up some mashed potatoes, cranberry sauce, and a little stuffing all in one bite. Pax nodded, sipping his drink. He cut his cooked carrots into smaller pieces. We could even add an engine for an extra boost. Drake stilled, his head lifting as he stared at Jax. For Santa? You're talking about adding an engine of some kind to Santa's sleigh? Why? On the other side of Ryder, Caleb shifted uncomfortably. We need to look for alternatives. The reindeer aren't going to work forever. Drake's blood ran cold. A three-year drought was a long one, the longest the ranch had ever seen. And the dwindling numbers for five years before that didn't help. Not to mention, only one of the flyers they trained qualified for Santa's sleigh, and that reindeer had been born blind and needed corrective surgery to get there. He knew they were in a desperate place. But engines? Smaller sleighs? Are you losing faith in Christmas? He asked. Jack leaned forward so he could join in the conversation. He wore his most annoying I'm older than you and therefore know more about this look. If the last three years are any indication, we're on borrowed time as it is. Natasha nodded her head in the way reporters do to keep people talking. Drake took in the faces around the table to see who agreed with Jack and who did not. Most of them stared down at their plates, their appetites forgotten. It was a grim sight. Mom's lips drew a straight line. She picked up her napkin and ran her hands along the edges over and over. I don't like talking about this at Thanksgiving. We're supposed to be sharing what we're grateful for. Dad placed his hand on hers in a sign of support. Agreed. Forrest cleared his throat. He wore a dark green sweater that matched Mitzi's plaid flannel shirt and their children's shirts as well. They were the picture of a perfect family. He took Mitzi's hand under the table and they exchanged a meaningful look. We have to consider the fact that the magic might have died out. I'm grateful I grew up with it, though. It was a wonderful way to spend my childhood. Mom lightly smacked the table and Mock glared at him as if he were in serious trouble. That's not what I meant, and you know it. Love softened her chastisement in her eyes. Forrest grinned sheepishly. I know, but you raised us to face things head on, and after talking with Faith, I can't see another way. All heads swiveled to the opposite end of the table where Faith sat between her father, Doc, and Caleb. 
Doc had been their veterinarian for over 30 years, right up until a heart attack stopped him in his tracks, and Faith had to take over his practice. She didn't believe in Christmas or Santa back then, which made it difficult for Caleb to explain flying reindeer. The rest, as they say, went down in history as she and Caleb were happily building a family together. The group of wranglers did not intimidate Faith. She swiped her lips with her napkin and then laid it on her lap. I wasn't going to tell you over dinner. She shot Jack an annoyed look. But it's true. There's no genetic way for any reindeer on the ranch to produce a flyer. We're out of magic. Mom gasped. Dad sat taller. Doc grumbled to himself and swiped his mouth with his napkin. Aspen started to cry and Mitzi lifted her out of the high chair and stood to soothe her with a soft bouncing. Drake gulped. That's not possible. He tore his roll in two and shoved one half in his mouth to keep from yelling his thoughts across their Thanksgiving feast. Should we call Ginger? Mom asked Dad. Ginger was the Santa in residence at the North Pole. Dad frowned, making his beard droop. Drake waited for someone to bring up the Montana reindeer again, even though they hadn't heard from the woman since she blocked Dad's number. He hadn't tried to call her again. She was as firm as he would be if someone wanted to buy one of their reindeer. It wasn't an option. Still, there was hope out there. They just had to be brave enough to go after it. Forrest coughed. We could test other reindeer. There are some in Alaska. He paused. We could even go to Alaska and Sweden. Fan out across the globe and take blood samples. Natasha's eyes brightened. That would be a fun trip. Count me in. Agreed. Faith smiled at her friend. If they didn't get to Sweden, then there was a girl's trip of some kind in the making with that one brief word. However, it's unlikely that any of them have flying genes, Faith replied. I've been corresponding with vets all over the world, being discreet as ever, and the genetic markers on the reindeer, everything from antler shape to body types, differ from our herd. So we're just going to give up on Christmas? Let Santa down? Drake threw his napkin on the table. He'd run out of rolls to chew on and didn't have anything else to hold his words back. Mom lifted her eyebrows at his outburst. It didn't seem like she disapproved so much as she wished she'd been the first one to say it. Dad shook his head. Let's not get upset. We'll talk about this after dinner. Drake got to his feet. I can't sit here and count my blessings like everything is okay. Those reindeer are our lives. They count on us. Christmas counts on us. Caleb stood, too. We know that. Why do you think we've been working on alternatives? You haven't said a word to me, Drake spat. I have just as much right to be in on these conversations as the rest of you. Caleb glanced down at Faith. They shared a guilty look, and Drake suddenly understood that most of these conversations were happening in the private hours they shared. He whipped his eyes to Jack and Natasha. Natasha played with her hands in her lap. He didn't bother to check in with the rest of them. They used to complain when mom and dad would make decisions over pillow talk, and here they did the same thing. Drake suddenly felt alone, bare and alone, surrounded by his family and somehow on the outside of it. So much for waiting until after dinner, Dad grumbled. Mitzi threw him an apologetic smile, even though none of this was her doing. Drake couldn't take this feeling anymore. It was hot and stifling, and if he stayed one more second, he'd lose it. Where are you going? Pax demanded. He often acted like he had a right to know everything about Drake's life, like a grown-up babysitter. I need to move. Drake hurried out. More like storm, mumbled Forrest. Whatever. He hit the front porch with the same ferocity that the cold air hit his cheeks. He needed to take action, to move a mountain, even if it was a mountain of hay. His eyes fell on the line of trailers they used to transport reindeer. He could take the live-in trailer, half camper, half reindeer transport, up to Alaska and search for a flyer himself. He could get off the ranch and away from his older brothers, and they're hovering over his every decision. He could travel and do something to help rather than sit here and watch the hourglass run out on their magic. Montana is a lot closer, he thought. A quick Google search told him he could be there in 12 to 15 hours, depending on the weather and the location of this reindeer. He combed through his old emails, looking for a hint. A woman named Hannah made first contact. She hadn't told him her address, but she'd mentioned a national forest. That should be enough of a place to start. After Hannah's first email, he'd had to deal with a woman who told him no over and over again. She was a Grinch with a side of Scrooge. Neither woman had verified that their reindeer could fly, but Hannah hinted heavily in her email that that was the case. She'd also said he was male. Both women had, in fact, called him a he. Drake would search all of Montana if needed. 
but if he wanted to be back in time for them to have flying reindeer calves this spring, he had to be home by Christmas. And even that was pushing the end of the mating season. He continued to search. If only he could remember the name of the forest. There, the Kootenay National Forest. Another internet search told him how big the forest was and that he could be on the hunt for weeks. There wasn't time to waste. He needed to get on the road and get going. Tucking his phone in his pocket, he went for his truck, intent on getting home and packing up. His family had gone crazy, lost the spirit of Christmas, and it was up to him to get it back. They needed hope, and he'd be the one to find it for them. Even if it meant kidnapping a reindeer, yeah, it would be hard on the animal if he bonded with this woman, but he could adapt. Besides, life on the ranch was a reindeer's best life. Here, he could fly all year long in the indoor arena. He could test his skills against the other flyers. He'd have friends who were like him. He'd have Dunder too. Dunder could be a problem. Male reindeer were territorial, but reindeer kings were protective of their herds, to the point of sparring matches and locked horn wrestling matches that didn't end well for the loser. He shoved the worries away to deal with on another day, one problem at a time. If he started listing the potential issues with his plan, he would stand around all night. For example, there was a genuine chance that the reindeer's illegal owner would chase Drake off her property with a shotgun. Or call the cops. Nah, she wouldn't do that. The police had to side with him and would have to figure out how to transport the reindeer for him. It was unlikely that he would end up in jail. He hoped. He had no desire to rot in prison for a year while his family's situation worsened. He'd have to be sneaky. Get in. Get the reindeer. Get out. This was his chance to do something for his family that would really matter. Something that would make his mark on the reindeer wrangler ranch and ensure that Santa had flying reindeer for generations to come. Something that would finally prove to them that he was just as capable as each of them. He'd have to leave before his meddling family finished Thanksgiving dinner, or they'd try to talk him out of this. Or, worse, insist on going along. They'd see. Once he was back, the new bull would fit right in with the herd and they'd be chasing baby flyers before they knew it. Everything would be fine, merry even. This would be their best Christmas yet. Chapter 3 Clove let the lid to the roosting boxes slam close. She'd forgotten the basket she used to collect eggs and, instead, had opened her coat and pulled up the hem of her sweater to hold them. The hens were happy in their coop, if the number of eggs was any indication, which it was. If they were too cold, they'd stop laying. Funny enough, the snow packed against a new, well-placed straw bale worked as an insulator. She'd have to leave a comment on chickenrebels.com to thank them for the article. A twig snapped off to her right, and the hair on the back of her neck stood up. The forest often made noises sounds she was familiar enough with to block out. But twigs only snapped when larger animals were close by. She turned, peering into the trees. Seeing wolf prints in the forest near their yard wasn't unusual, especially with such plump chickens clucking about. Although Felix's presence scared off most predators, he was much better than a guard dog. Large clumps of snow fell from a branch and landed in powder, making a muted crunch noise. No reindeer games, Felix. I have eggs, she warned in case he was sneaking up on her. It wouldn't be the first time he flew just over the top of the snow and then landed right behind her to make her scream. He laughed his antlers off every time. Movement on the porch drew her attention as Felix lifted his head. He'd been sleeping and yawned. She shivered and hurried up the steps. Some guard you are. He blinked slowly. You don't see anyone on the porch, do you? She smirked. Only a giant, hairy rug. Pausing, she gathered both corners of her pouch into one hand to scratch under his chin. Stay awake for a minute, will you? There's something out there. She shivered and then ducked inside. Inside, Grandma was practically climbing into the fridge, her backside poking out. If you're having a hot flash, you could go outside, Clove joked. Grandma backed out, her arms full of half-empty containers. All this is expired. She dropped it into the garbage. Clove glanced in and groaned. The soy sauce? Mustard? I didn't know mustard could expire. Do you mind running to town? Grandma asked as she wrote a list on a pad of paper. Not at all. 
she plucked the list from Grandma's fingers. A ride into town on the snowmobile was always an adventure and sometimes a challenge in the deep powder. Let me grab my pack. They didn't travel in the winter without their survival packs. Neither had ever needed the space-age blankets or emergency matches, but if they did, they'd increase their chances of survival just by carrying it. And if you see the sheriff, buy him a hot chocolate, Grandma called innocently. Clove rolled her eyes at her grandmother's attempt at matchmaking. The sheriff hadn't stopped by since Thanksgiving, and she didn't expect him back. Unless he ran out of apple pie filling. The thought put her in a pickle. If she took more to town and delivered it, he might think she'd made up an excuse to visit him. He'd come looking for one if she didn't give him another bottle. What was a girl to do? She plucked her key off the hook by the door. I'll buy a hot chocolate for a first responder any time. That would be a good middle ground. If she happened to see him at the quick stop, she could thicken the line between them by calling him sheriff and buying a cocoa for a public servant. That would let him know she didn't see a romantic future with him and they could stay friends. Not like that, Grandma huffed as if Clove was a lost cause in the romance department. She was. She'd already established that fact when her own father didn't want to keep her. Grandma hadn't brought up Alan since Thanksgiving, and Clove thought she'd given up on the idea. Maybe you should date him, she teased. Grandma scowled. Don't be ridiculous. Clove lifted a shoulder in response, threw on her pack, and headed out. There wasn't much more to say on the subject. She wouldn't encourage a man she didn't have feelings for. Heck, she wasn't going to encourage one she did have feelings for, not that there was a man within thirty miles she'd want to get to know. Ugh. She needed to derail this train of thought because it only made her feel bad about herself. She was a perfectly lovely person, not hideously ugly, though she wouldn't say she was a supermodel. They ate homestead foods fried in hand-churned butter, for heaven's sake. She had a lot to offer a man, or, a particular type of man. She highly doubted a New York executive would get all that excited about her homemade smoked mozzarella cheese. He should. It was delicious. The sun was out, blindingly so, and she stopped at the bottom of their drive, which was more of a bumpy dirt road in the best of times and a muddy mess in the worst of times, to switch to her shaded goggles. As she came into town, the coffee shop logo caught her eye, and her low spirits promised to lift if she coated them in warm chocolate. Don't mind if I do, she mumbled as she pulled into an open spot out front. A caramel cocoa and some conversation with Zoe, her high school best friend, was just what she needed. The highway running in front of the place was plowed, though they only plowed half the parking lot. Residents often used snowmobiles and liked to have a couple of places in town to park when they had to shop. There was an unfamiliar truck and trailer outfit parked along the road. Inside, an a cappella group crooned about baby Jesus over the speakers and the heater pumped a blast of sweet mocha air. Red, green, and white streamers crisscrossed the ceiling. They peppered the wall above the refrigerator section with colored pictures. Every year, the shop held a coloring contest for the kids, and they'd really outdone themselves. There were three grand prizes, but every kid got a gift card for a free cocoa. The coffee stop was a serve-yourself place with racks of pre-packaged donuts, cookies, and brownies, protein bars, and jerky to go along with your drink. The wood floors creaked under her feet, and the countertops had cup rings that never went away. The fridge had everything from milk to sports drinks, and the jerky rack sported cow, deer, and even buffalo options. The scents of coffee, cocoa, and cinnamon jingled together and provided an instant holiday boost only two weeks until the big day. Zoe was behind the counter. She wore a long-sleeved mauve and yellow flannel shirt rolled twice up her forearms with a white long-sleeved shirt underneath and a pair of dark jeans. She pulled her wavy brown hair back in a low ponytail with pieces framing her face and making her dark eyes look larger than humanly possible. She did some fancy trick with brown eyeliner that Clove could never quite master. Besides, the dark colors went well with Zoe's caramel skin while Clove went yellowish. So unfair. Trevor, the teenage kid who swept the floor and did odd jobs, 
leaned one hip against the wooden counter. He had on a Carhartt stocking cap that seemed to be all the rage this year, which was funny to Clove because she'd been wearing them since she was in high school just to stay warm. With the two of them was a stranger in a pair of retro Wrangler jeans and a fleece-lined dark brown corduroy coat. His matching brown felt cowboy hat sat on the counter next to an unfolded map of Montana. His hair was the kind of wavy that called out, run your fingers through me, and one of the nicest chestnut browns she'd ever seen. Seriously, he may have been drawn by an artist tasked with creating the perfect cowboy image. Broad shoulders, trim midsection, brawny arms, the man had a great body and build. Where did they grow men like that? If there were enough of them in one town, she'd consider moving. Who was she kidding? She'd never leave her cabin home. Reality was such a buzzkill. Seriously. Since she'd walked in in the middle of their conversation, she went to the cocoa machine instead of joining Zoe for a chat. Something about the man made her feel giddy inside, like if she tried to speak to him she'd burst into a fit of teenage giggles. You can snowshoe or cross-country ski through this area, Trevor pointed to the map. Zoe waved at Clove. How you doin', Han? Good. Clove lifted a hand in return and kept her eyes on the floor in front of her, suddenly shy and worried that she would spill all over herself when she took the cocoa up to pay. Zoe darted her eyes to the cowboy at the counter and then winked at Clove, telling her that he was a cutie. Great. Apparently, he'd been carved from a handsome stone and dropped in her path. She couldn't tell how cute he was from this angle, unless she was judging by his backside. She winked back because the view from back here was mighty nice as well. Oh, my gosh. She was such a goober. Pull yourself together, woman. She silently screamed. He's just a man, standing in front of a map, asking for directions. Great, now she was misquoting chick flicks. The next thing she knew, she'd be thinking Jane Austenish thoughts. Not one second later, a Jane Austen reference ran through her mind. It must be very improper that a young lady should dream of a gentleman before the gentleman is first known to have dreamt of her. She wasn't dreaming of this cowboy but she sure felt something for him before he felt it for her. He hadn't even seen her yet. Might never see her, depending on how long she could debate over a creamer flavor to add to her cocoa. She glanced over her shoulder at him, and her stomach flipped three times. Sorry, Jane dear, but sometimes a lady's butterflies cannot help but be improper when regarding an impressive gentleman of a cowboy nature. I'm such a dork. Here she was, trying to forget her lack of relationship blues and she'd walked right into fanciful quicksand, slipping deeper and deeper by the second. At least he was an out-of-towner. She could look at him, catalogue all the beautiful things, and then he would drive away, and she didn't have to feel bad that she hadn't been able to make him stay. Win-win. Right? Any wildlife in the area? asked the stranger. He had a silky voice, the kind that could wrap around a woman and treat her right. Clove shook her head at her shamelessness as she pulled her glove off with her teeth. Most of the larger animals are hibernating. Zoe leaned a hip against the counter. You'll want to watch out for wolves. Wolves, he asked. You can hear them howling at night. Trevor wiggled his fingers like he was telling a ghost story. Last year, they pulled two guys from their tent and no one ever heard from them again. Clove snorted. That story circulated through high school bonfires when she was in school. You don't say, his skepticism came across, though it was subtle. I think they got cold and abandoned camp, Zoe clarified. If there ever were two guys who disappeared. You don't know, not for sure, Trevor argued. Zoe cocked her head but didn't reply. No one ever really knew for sure about legends and myths, did they? Bigfoot could be out there. Done. Done. Doin. Clove couldn't help but hear them and mentally join in their conversation. She poured caramel creamer into the steaming cup and put a lid on it. Hopefully, this guy would be gone soon, and she'd have Zoe to herself for a few minutes so they could talk about him. She'd have to fill her in on the whole Alan slash grandma slash date slash not date situation. Any reindeer? asked the cowboy. 
her ears perked up. Reindeer were right up her alley or er, snow-covered path. Not in this neck of the woods, replied Trevor. He sniffed and swiped his nose with the back of his hand. Except Felix, added Zoe. She grinned over the stranger's shoulder at Clove with a look in her eye that said, I'm tossing you a softball, don't drop it. Clove knocked over the stack of lids. What in the world was Zoe doing? She didn't want in on this conversation. Invisible ogling was all she was up for, dressed in puffy winter clothing, her nose and cheeks bright red from the cold, and her hair plastered to her head. Helmet hair was never flattering. Felix asked the deep voice of goodness. He could bottle that voice and sell it to millions of women on the internet. Heck, she'd buy a bottle of deep voice the way a lover should sound. Trevor tapped him on the shoulder and pointed to her. This was it. There was no place to run, unless she wanted to fold herself into one of the lower cabinets with the extra styrofoam cups, there was nowhere to hide. Her hands grew warm, and her heart skipped several beats. It wasn't that she was introverted, it had just been a long time since she'd flirted with anyone, a lonely, long time without mistletoe hopes and dreams and, as she'd told Grandma, without feelings. There was certainly a lack of ups or downs lately. Maybe she needed to see a doctor and have her hormone level checked. Deep voice turned around, revealing a ruggedly handsome man with a three-day beard. His hair was dark and finger-combing long. His broad shoulders filled out a heavy winter coat with ease. He'd unzipped the outer layer to reveal a black sweater over a white t-shirt. Even with all those layers on, she could see that his pectorals would make horrible pillows, too firm. Not that she'd consider taking a nap on his chest on a winter afternoon. Oh no. She would not go to that shaft of sunlight on the couch like a cat, ready to splay herself all over him and purr. Maybe she'd knead her fingers through his hair. Their eyes met. His sparkled as if he knew what she was thinking. Knew what she was thinking and was ready to jump into that ray of sunshine and let her paw him. Nope. No hormone doctor for her, they were raging just fine all on their own. Embarrassed, her pulse spiked, and her cup slipped from her fingers and landed with a thud. Clap. Splash. She jumped backward and bumped the counter, letting out a yip. That would leave a mark. She wanted to rub the spot but stopped short of massaging her backside in front of the most handsome man she'd seen in her whole entire life. Clove. Zoe yelled as she rounded the corner, holding a wet rag. Thankfully, the lid stayed on until it hit the floor, and most of the mess spread out instead of splashing. Are you okay? Sorry. She caught the paper towel roll Tyler through her and ripped off five towels, handing them to Zoe. I blanked. Zoe leaned across her to drop the dripping rag into the sink. Play it cool, she whispered out of the corner of her mouth. I'm trying, Clove growled back, looking anywhere but at deep voice. Zoe gave her a look that said, try harder. What was she supposed to do? It wasn't like she handled gorgeous men staring deep into her eyes every day. She chanced to look in his direction and found him leaning over the map and conversing quietly with Trevor as if he wasn't in the same room as a total spaz. He scooted his hat to the side, and she sighed, embarrassingly loud. Darn it all if she wasn't a sucker for a good hat. Looked like it was in shape too. Half the men around here wore flimsy brims and misshaped tops. Then there were his jeans, name brand, boot cut pants that hugged him just tight enough to make things interesting. Zoe pressed a fresh cup of cocoa into her hand. When had she filled that? Probably during the 30 seconds it took Clove to drool all over herself because of a hat and a good pair of jeans. He caught her looking and turned his full attention on her once again. Leaning against the counter, he smiled, revealing straight white teeth and creases around his eyes. It is so unfair that men only get more handsome with age. You're Felix? He looked her up and down quickly, the action more teasing than checking her out. You don't look like a reindeer. His eyes lingered on her hair. Trevor guffawed, holding his stomach as if the guy was the senior quarterback and he the freshman bench warmer. Heaven help her, was he flirting? With her? 
he corked an eyebrow. He was. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Zoe cleared her throat and gently nudged Clove to get her tongue working again. She hurriedly ran her hand over her hair to tame flyaways. Stupid helmet. I'm Clove. Felix is my reindeer. There. A full two sentences that both made sense. She could do this. His smile moved from teasing to satisfaction and sent sparks of awareness dancing through her belly like those fireworks that spiral before exploding. Abort. Abort. Can't handle this man. She sipped her cocoa and burned her tongue. The acidic aftertaste made her blanch. Why were there no words left in the universe? She couldn't find one, nor form one. If Zoe put a script in front of her face, she wouldn't be able to read it. I'd like to meet him, he said kindly. That would be lovely, she mentally replied, still unable to make her mouth move. Hi Grandma, I took your advice and look what I found in town. That was not going to happen. If Alan caused Grandma to think about matchmaking, this guy would have her buying wedding dresses off Amazon. Okay. Time to make a memorable and flirty exit. She could do this. She was a strong, independent woman who managed a homestead, an entire flock of chickens, and a flying reindeer. She dug out a five-dollar bill and placed it on the counter. Maybe someday you will, she replied, unable to hold eye contact for too long and maintain the sense of cool aloofness she was going for. It was time to get out of here. Thanks, Zoe, she called over her shoulder. Call me. Zoe yelled back. Using her hip to bump the door open, she lifted her cup in farewell before letting the door close behind her. He watched her walk out. She knew because she could see his reflection in the door. Feeling like she'd just won a triathlon, the Olympics, and the Pillsbury Bake Off all in one moment, she strutted to her snowmobile. Okay, so maybe I can flirt when the right inspiration comes along. She took a celebratory sip of her cocoa and tasted nothing but burnt chocolate, thanks to her damaged taste buds. Making a face, she groaned as she dumped the cocoa out into the snow and dropped the cup into the garbage. Totally worth it. She grinned, thinking of her suave departure. It helped that she'd never see him again. Which was for the best. A man like that could talk her into doing things that would put her on the naughty list and she was a firm good list kind of girl. Clove. Zoe yelled as she rounded the corner, holding a wet rag. Thankfully, the lid stayed on until it hit the floor, and most of the mess spread out instead of splashing. Are you okay? Sorry. She caught the paper towel roll Tyler through her and ripped off five towels, handing them to Zoe. I blanked. Zoe leaned across her to drop the dripping rag into the sink. Play it cool, she whispered out of the corner of her mouth. I'm trying, Clove growled back, looking anywhere but at deep voice. Zoe gave her a look that said, try harder. What was she supposed to do? It wasn't like she handled gorgeous men staring deep into her eyes every day. She chanced to look in his direction and found him leaning over the map and conversing quietly with Trevor as if he wasn't in the same room as a total spaz. He scooted his hat to the side, and she sighed, embarrassingly loud. Darn it all if she wasn't a sucker for a good hat. Looked like it was in shape too. Half the men around here wore flimsy brims and misshaped tops. Then there were his jeans, name brand, boot-cut pants that hugged him just tight enough to make things interesting. Zoe pressed a fresh cup of cocoa into her hand. When had she filled that? Probably during the thirty seconds it took Clove to drool all over herself because of a hat and a good pair of jeans. He caught her looking and turned his full attention on her once again. Leaning against the counter, he smiled, revealing straight white teeth and creases around his eyes. It is so unfair that men only get more handsome with age. You're Felix? He looked her up and down quickly, the action more teasing than checking her out. You don't look like a reindeer. His eyes lingered on her hair. Trevor guffawed, holding his stomach as if the guy was the senior quarterback and he the freshman bench warmer. Heaven help her, was he flirting? With her? 
he quirked an eyebrow. He was. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Zoe cleared her throat and gently nudged Clove to get her tongue working again. She hurriedly ran her hand over her hair to tame flyaways. Stupid helmet. I'm Clove. Felix is my reindeer. There. A full two sentences that both made sense. She could do this. His smile moved from teasing to satisfaction and sent sparks of awareness dancing through her belly like those fireworks that spiral before exploding. Abort. Abort. Can't handle this man. She sipped her cocoa and burned her tongue. The acidic aftertaste made her blanch. Why were there no words left in the universe? She couldn't find one, nor form one. If Zoe put a script in front of her face, she wouldn't be able to read it. I'd like to meet him, he said kindly. That would be lovely, she mentally replied, still unable to make her mouth move. Hi Grandma, I took your advice and look what I found in town. That was not going to happen. If Alan caused Grandma to think about matchmaking, this guy would have her buying wedding dresses off Amazon. Okay, time to make a memorable and flirty exit. She could do this. She was a strong, independent woman who managed a homestead, an entire flock of chickens, and a flying reindeer. She dug out a $5 bill and placed it on the counter. Maybe someday you will, she replied, unable to hold eye contact for too long and maintain the sense of cool aloofness she was going for. It was time to get out of here. Thanks, Zoe, she called over her shoulder. Call me. Zoe yelled back. Using her hip to bump the door open, she lifted her cup in farewell before letting the door close behind her. He watched her walk out. She knew because she could see his reflection in the door. Feeling like she'd just won a triathlon, the Olympics, and the Pillsbury Bake Off all in one moment, she strutted to her snowmobile. Okay, so maybe I can flirt when the right inspiration comes along. She took a celebratory sip of her cocoa and tasted nothing but burnt chocolate, thanks to her damaged taste buds. Making a face, she groaned as she dumped the cocoa out into the snow and dropped the cup into the garbage. Totally worth it. She grinned, thinking of her suave departure. It helped that she'd never see him again. Which was for the best. A man like that could talk her into doing things that would put her on the naughty list, and she was a firm good list kind of girl. Chapter 4 Drake's body drifted after Clove, drawn to her in a way that had nothing to do with flying reindeer, saving Christmas, or the ranch. He couldn't believe that the beautiful, wind-kissed woman was Felix's owner. She was a lot prettier than he thought she'd be. No, not prettier. Younger. She was younger than he'd thought she'd be after the way she shut him down about buying her reindeer. Hmm, spunky too. She'd driven a snowmobile into town and moved with athletic grace. She didn't seem at all bothered by the temperatures, taking on the cold like it was just another day. Her confidence was bewitching. Trevor waved his pale hand in front of Drake's face. Bruh? You okay? Drake blinked. Yep. He started folding his map. After two weeks of bumming around the small towns and a couple cities on the outskirts of the National Forest, he'd finally found his reindeer. Felix. What a great name. Funny, he would be the first reindeer on the ranch Dad hadn't named. That alone would set him apart. What other qualities did Felix have that made him different from the animals under their care? He tingled with anticipation. His and Zoe's eyes met, and she gave him a knowing smile. Do you want her number? What? PFT. I mean. Do I? Wait. He already had her number on his phone thanks to her firm and declarative leave us alone mildly threatening texts. He leaned with hands on the counter and drew in a breath to steady himself. He had no way of knowing how this whole Save Christmas mission was going to go down. Walking out of here without a connection to Clove would be the smartest thing to do, even if it about killed him to let her slip through his fingers like that. She was curious, in a good way. No. Thank you. He hoped the local rangers and police would think the animal wandered into the vast wilderness and didn't come back. How would Clove take that? His heart cinched at the idea of her large, dark blue eyes full of tears. He concentrated on folding the map and reminded himself that Clove wasn't his business. Felix wasn't her reindeer. He was a wild, 
endangered animal that should be on a protected reserve, like the ranch, for his own safety and that of others. His phone rang and Caleb's picture appeared on the screen. He'd been able to pack and leave before they finished Thanksgiving dinner. He'd sent out a family-wide text, telling them all that he needed a couple of weeks to himself and that he was going camping. No doubt they were worried. Not a meal went by that one of them didn't text him. Mitzi even stooped to sending videos of Aspen showing him her stocking, wrapping his present, and telling him she woofed him before she went to bed. That sneaky sister-in-law of his. He'd sent Aspen a return video and promised to bring her back a present or two. It did his heart good to see that they were keeping up on Christmas traditions even as they faced the possible end of their partnership with the jolly old elf. He couldn't imagine what life would be like for his niece and nephews without flying reindeer on the ranch. It wouldn't take long before they'd become a thing of legend. Someday, the Nicholas would stop believing Christmas magic was ever real. The future was bleak indeed, and because he disappeared in the middle of their crisis, their perpetual pestering was totally understandable. He had to believe that all the trouble he caused would be worth it when he showed up with their salvation in a trailer. He hit the deny button on the call and sent it to voicemail. Thanks for your help. He nodded to Zoe and then to Trevor. They'd done more than they would ever know. I'm headed into the woods for a while. Do you want to leave a return date on the board? Trevor asked, pointing to a cork board where cards and notices for locals hung. If you're not back in time, we'll send in search and rescue. He shook his head. I'll be fine. Besides, I'll be taking a different route home. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, they chorused, making him smile. Small towns like this, with little coffee shops that encourage children to color pictures of Santa and his elves, were full of holiday spirit. He drunk it up faster than his cup of caramel cocoa. He walked out the same door as Clove had just a few minutes before. Her snowmobile was nowhere to be seen, but the tracks she'd left behind were as obvious as the Christmas lights hanging from the store's gutters, and he followed them. He found Clove's rig at the supermarket. From there, all he had to do was wait for her to reappear. He pulled out his copy of A Christmas Carol and settled in to read. He'd reread the story every December since he was nine years old. His hardback copy was covered in worn red fabric with gold lettering. The edges had once been gold and shiny as well, but they'd tarnished over time and with use. The cold air tried to creep into his cab, but he kept the motor running to ward off the chill. Clove was a fast shopper and had her groceries loaded and covered in the sled before he'd gotten through a chapter. He grunted in admiration. Mom would take four hours at the grocery shop because she couldn't see a neighbor and not stop to talk. As kids, he and his brothers would play rock, paper, scissors to see who had to go with her to the store. As he got older, Drake started volunteering because he figured out that when mom was distracted, she'd say yes to a box of donuts. He could eat half of them all by himself as they walked through the store and no older brother could stop him. He let Clove get a good head start and then followed her tracks to a trailhead he would have missed if he hadn't been watching so closely. He parked at the bottom. Better to leave his truck here and travel on foot, or snowshoe, than get stuck part way up. He snagged his gear from the camper section of the trailer and readied himself to hike in, hopefully undetected. Today was about gathering information and forming a plan. If he had a chance to take Felix, he would. Clove, her name whispered through his mind like an admonition. She wasn't the type of woman he wanted to tangle with. Not that there was a type of woman he was fond of locking horns with on a regular basis. He much preferred locking lips, but it wasn't like that was going to happen with Clove, either. It had been a while since it had happened with anyone. He frowned. Part of being a confirmed bachelor meant dating was pointless. He wasn't the type to use a woman when he felt lonely and then drop her when he didn't. Maybe that was why he'd noticed Clove on such a deep level. He was lonely in a life full of just himself. His brothers made being married look inviting. Always having someone to talk to would be a bonus although not having to talk to someone when he didn't feel like it was good, too. The daylight was almost gone, and the snow-covered trees were cast in pink and salmon hues. If he wasn't here on such a nefarious errand, he'd take a minute to enjoy the scenery. For now, he needed to get the lay of the land and determine if Felix really could fly. It didn't escape him that he could be on a wild reindeer chase, and this whole thing could be for naught. Twenty minutes into his hike, he saw lights from the cabin ahead and slowed his steps. If Felix was nearby, he'd hear him calling softly. He pulled a fresh carrot with a green top from his pocket. Reindeer liked gifts, and they really liked carrots. Felix, he called quietly. There was a snort over his head. 
He looked up to see the underside of a reindeer lounging on a fat limb. Felix's brown body blended in with the tree bark and, with his head down, he looked like any other large branch. Nice camouflage. Not to mention, a reindeer that high up had to fly. He broke into a grin as relief rushed through his veins like peppermint cocoa on a cold winter's day. Well, I guess that answers that question. He chuckled. Taking a large bite of the carrot, he chewed with his mouth open. Felix's head appeared. Carrot? Drake continued to munch. Oh, do you like carrots? He waved the end around as he talked. I guess I could share. Felix glanced at the ground and then at him, as if he was calculating the risk of flying in front of Drake. I know you can fly. Drake solved the mystery for him. My family has a ranch of flying reindeer. You can probably smell them on my clothes. This whole thing would be a lot easier if Felix trusted him enough to come willingly. Felix sniffed the air. His eyes flew open all the way, and he scrambled out of the tree, sprinkling twigs and pine needles across the virgin snow. He landed softly a few feet away and approached without caution. Drake held his ground, aware that he could become an antler kebab if this went south. Felix stopped short and turned to look at him from the side. Drake held his arms out. Come and sniff me, friend. Felix lowered his nose to Drake's feet and traveled up one pant leg, up his stomach, and across his chest. His lips twitched. You smell like a female. She's the good kind of trouble. Drake laughed and then checked himself for being too loud. That would be Sparkle. She'd needed a good brushing a couple of days ago, a fact that she didn't let him forget throughout their training session. Sparkle was a celebrity, but she'd been a diva long before she appeared in movies. It was just her personality, adorably self-centered. She was also kind and tender, especially when it came to children. Felix continued to sniff him like a starving man walking into a banquet hall. Maybe he was lonely as a bachelor, too. Reindeer were herd animals. Perhaps the promise of a new family would be enough to get Felix on board with this plan. Sparkle is this tall. He held up his hand. She's also single. He pumped his eyebrows. Felix stepped back abruptly and shook his antlers. Drake laughed. I had the same reaction the last time Mitzi offered to set me up with someone. He offered the carrot. Felix reached for the carrot with his lips, stretching them out and looking ridiculous. I prefer the single life myself. No one telling me what to do or how to live. No one complains if I leave clothes on the floor next to the hamper. Maybe I want them there. Maybe I haven't decided they were dirty enough to wash. He grumbled on, citing his side of an argument that never happened. He had three married brothers and heard plenty of the arguments over socks in the living room that they had with their wives. Although, things like that were hardly arguments at all. If he didn't know better, he'd think they left them in there to tick off their women so they could then kiss them into a blissful state. Do you know where your parents are? Drake asked in an effort to change the subject. Felix grabbed the carrot and chewed it not giving anything away. A mystery man. I can respect that. He reached out and patted the reindeer's neck. He worked his way up to scratch behind his jaw in that spot all the reindeer loved. Felix leaned into him. That feels good. The front door opened. Drake jumped behind the tree Felix had been sleeping in. Night had fallen, and he wore dark clothing so no one would see him, unless the reindeer gave him away. Felix had been so relaxed into the scratches that he toppled onto his side. He cast a dark look toward Drake. What did you do that for? I don't want them to know I'm here. Drake motioned to the cabin. Felix looked back and forth between him and the house. Why not? I, Drake paused. He might contemplate kidnapping Felix, but that didn't mean he was a liar. Yes, he was aware of the murky moral waters he swam in at the moment and wasn't sure how to get out of them. I ran away from home, he replied. There. That was the truth. Felix yelled an older woman. Drake peered around the tree to see a lady with short gray hair dressed in snow pants and a heavy sweater. She was illuminated from behind and he couldn't make out her face. Felix, let's go for a walk. Stay down. Felix snorted once and then trotted over to the porch. It almost seemed like he was doing his best not to look back at Drake. Step one, make friends with the reindeer. Check. The lady stepped out and rubbed Felix's face scratching around his eyes where it was hard for a reindeer to get to. Clove appeared behind her, and Drake sucked in a breath as if he'd been punched in the stomach. She wore thick socks that went to her knees, a pair of tight black leggings, and a heavily oversized sweater. Was it possible for a woman to get prettier in a few hours? I have choir practice tonight. She pecked a kiss on the woman's cheek. This must be her grandmother, 
the one who had first contacted them. Interesting. So, I'll be gone when you get back from your walk. Have fun, dear. Grandma patted her back. Come on, Felix. We gotta keep these old bones in shape. Felix stepped back and bowed. Ladies first. You're such a charmer. Clove teased from the porch before disappearing back inside to do whatever women did to get ready to leave the house. Drake waited until he couldn't hear the grandma and reindeer's footsteps crunching through the thick snow before heading back down the mountain. He needed to move his truck and trailer before Clove saw them. Then he'd come back while she was gone and coax Felix into going with him. Coax being a nice way to say he'd get a halter on the reindeer and drag him down the mountain if he had to. Yeah, like that was going to happen. He needed more carrots. A Hansel and Gretel trail into the back of the trailer might do the trick. He could be on the road in a couple of hours and home in two days. This was the easiest reindeer heist in Christmas history, and at the end of it would be the generation of flying reindeer on Reindeer Wrangler Ranch. What could go wrong? Chapter 5 Drake stopped by the grocery store and read a couple of chapters of A Christmast Carol while he waited for Clove's snowmobile to drive by a secluded parking spot between a couple of pine trees. Backing the trailer in there wasn't something an amateur could have done, and he'd taken a picture to show his brothers when he got home. They'd be impressed with his skills. Clove cruised past, and time seemed to slow down as he took in every detail. Her pink or peach or whatever colored coat had a fur-lined head that probably worked great when snowshoeing but couldn't fit over her white helmet. She was smart to wear bright colors at night, and the reflective patches on her coat would keep her safe as she traveled the edge of the highway. Her long blonde hair was braided down her back. He wondered what it looked like when she let it free. Was it wavy or straight? She didn't turn in his direction or make any other movement that said that she'd even seen him tucked off the road. He drove back to the clearing at the bottom of her lane. Keep it together. You can't let a beautiful woman distract you. He cut the engine and sat in silence, contemplating what he was about to do. He didn't like it. If any of his brothers had had this fool idea, he'd talk them out of it right quick. Stealing, taking, kidnapping. However, he defined what he was about to do. It would land him on the wrong side of the law and probably put his soul in eternal jeopardy. Life wasn't always as cut and dry as a naughty and nice list, though. He had to weigh the good and the bad. He glanced up at the silver-laced clouds. Christmas had to continue on. Santa had to take presents to all the good little boys and girls this year and every year after. Was there any good reason to let the goodwill that filled the earth during the holidays die out? Was it fair for Clove to keep Felix to himself when he could do so much good for children all over the world? She didn't understand the building blocks that happy holiday memories provided. They were foundational, the type of blocks people leaned on when times were tough. Blocks named hope and faith. Children needed Christmas magic. Adults too. For most of the year, the world was harsh and unkind. Political voices filled the airwaves with negative messages. Teachers handed out homework. Bullies attacked. Bosses piled on the workload and cut pay. Cars broke down. But at Christmas there was a call for peace on earth. Families gathered to celebrate long-standing traditions and create a few new ones, too. If Santa let down even one-fifth of the children on the good list, the results could be catastrophic. He had to kidnap Felix. Not just for his family's ranch to continue on, but for Billy and Aspen and all the other children around the world. Doing the wrong thing was the right thing to do. He opened the truck door. I am so getting on the naughty list for this, he grumbled. Gathering Tack out of the trailer tack room, he retraced his steps from earlier and ended up at the cabin. Light spilled from the windows and landed on the snow, giving it a golden glow in contrast to the silver from the moonlight. Golds and silvers, Christmas colors. It was a sign, wasn't it? Clove's grandma was on the couch, her fuzzy gray hair just visible over the back. She was watching one of those Christmas shows that his sisters-in-law loved so much. He could be bribed with a plate of Christmas cookies into watching one or two of them with his mom. She liked the ones that included royals and castles and such. She'd even cut out sugar cookies in the shape of crowns when one of those came on. He could practically taste the sweet icing. Drake circled the house, searching the branches overhead for Felix's large body. More like looking for a big lump and a bunch of lumps as snow gathered. It fell softly, not hard enough to cover his tracks, darn it all. At least it muffled his footsteps. If the temperature had been five degrees warmer today, he'd be crunching through a thin layer of ice with all the sneak-de-sneakness of the abominable snowman. Felix shouldn't be this hard to find because he had a rack that was almost as impressive as Dunder's. 
not that Drake would dare whisper such a thing in Dunder's presence. The graying reindeer was retired and spent his days lounging in the barn, eating more oats than any other reindeer on the ranch. His glory days were behind him, or so it seemed. When the school groups came for field trips, he trotted out and met the kids, giving them all a taste of the magic a reindeer who flew for Santa carried in his or her soul and looking as spry as a two-year-old. Unfortunately for Drake, Felix wasn't up a tree or down the lane. Nope. He'd taken up residence on the back porch near the door, in plain view of Grandma on the couch. He curled up like a cat with his legs tucked under him and a contented, heavy-lidded look on his long face. Drake waved. Felix lifted his eyebrows. Or what would be eyebrows? You're back? Drake approached slowly. He'd worn the gloves he used when caring for Sparkle last time, hoping the scent would entice Felix to cooperate. Hey, buddy. He'd seemed pretty interested in other reindeer, and Drake wasn't above using that to get in Felix's good graces. He held the halter out in one hand. Reindeer didn't appreciate surprises. Well, most reindeer didn't, and it probably depended on what the surprise was. A carrot was always welcome. Felix eyed the halter with more than a little mistrust as he scrambled to his feet and down the stairs, raising a clatter that would wake the dead. Don't hey buddy me. What's that for? I know you're not used to this, but it's not so bad. I promise. He held it out in front of him, dangling the clasp so it clicked. Go ahead. Take a look. Felix stretched his neck all the way in a good impersonation of a giraffe. He sniffed. Drake's hopes lifted. Reindeer were curious creatures and it worked to his advantage tonight. This exercise, showing the reindeer the lead rope, was something they did with calves within the first two weeks. The sooner they were accustomed to being haltered, the sooner they could start training. Felix was so far behind the calves that were born this last summer that he'd never catch up. In a quick move, Felix grabbed the halter with his teeth and threw it behind him. It landed on the stairs. Drake glared. That wasn't cool, Felix. Felix chortled. You like reindeer games? I'll show you reindeer games. He unhooked the rope he'd attached to his belt and started swinging the large loop. This one's called Rope the Reindeer. Flash was the only reindeer in the barn who could beat him at this game, and that was because he flew so quick Drake could barely see him, let alone catch him. Felix leaned down on his front legs, lifting his back end and wagging his tail. I want to play. He jogged back and forth across the clearing. You'll never catch me. Bet. Drake called. He watched Felix's pattern and started swinging the rope over his head. Felix chortled. He juked just when Drake knew he would, and Drake let the rope fly. It circled Felix's antlers and settled around his neck. Felix hopped onto the porch and ran down the steps. The rope wrapped around the porch support beam, and Drake planted his feet and leaned back against the tug. If Felix wanted a fight, they'd take the house down with him. He hoped he didn't freak out when he realized he'd been caught. The rope tightened across his neck. Drake prepared to let go. It was just a game, after all. Felix stopped in his tracks. You caught me? He pulled his chin back as if trying to see the rope around his neck. You got him. Now what you gonna do with him? Asked Grandma from behind Drake. He nearly jumped out of his coat at the sound of her voice. She must have gone out the front door and snuck up on him. Felix stomped one hoof and then lifted his chin and bugled. Yeah, good one. Grandma folded her arms across her coat a bemused look on her laugh-lined face. Ma'am. I. Uh. Drake stared at the rope in his hands, feeling as if the words guilty and thief were woven into the fibers. This isn't what it looks like. Her eyebrows shot up so fast they broke speed records. I certainly hope not, because it looks like Felix is about to tear down my porch roof. Felix shrugged. He started it. Okay. It could be what it looks like, he admitted. I'll pay for damages. She shuffled to stand next to him. How about we don't damage my home and sit down and have a friendly talk? I'll get some cocoa. She pointed to Felix. Do not break my house, reindeer. Felix scowled. I'm not the one holding the rope. Drake walked up and around the porch, coiling the rope as he went. I know all sorts of games. Wait till you see what we can do with a hula hoop. He loosened the rope and pulled it up and over Felix's antlers and then nose. We have relay races too. I'll bet you'd give Sparkle something to think about on the racetrack. Felix lifted his chest. Darn right, I would. Grandma reappeared, this time through the back door, with a whole tray of food. I figured you hadn't had dinner yet. He ducked his head. I ate a protein bar. You can hardly call that dinner. Come on over here. She set the tray on a small table between two rocking chairs. 
The scene reminded him of home, so much it made him lose his grip on his determination. Felix swung his head around and watched the forest. He's not going anywhere, Grandma said with a flap of her hand toward the reindeer. Drake decided to trust her. She hadn't chased him off the property with a shotgun. Yet, he took off his gloves and joined Grandma on the porch. Name's Hannah, she said by way of welcoming him to dinner. Closer to the house, the winter bite wasn't as noticeable and the soft light from inside was like a welcome handshake. Drake, he couldn't hold back his manners. She offered him a sandwich made from thick slices of roast beef and homemade mozzarella cheese. His mouth started to water. A carafe of spicy mustard with a spoon for scooping it onto the sandwich was all the invitation he needed. It had been two weeks since he'd had a homemade meal. She looked him up and down. You're a reindeer wrangler, aren't you? He nodded as he chewed. The roast beef was tender and melted in his mouth. Goodness, the woman plied all his secrets with well-seasoned meat. Might as well implicate the whole family tonight. She stared out over the snow. According to the map, there was a lake less than a quarter of a mile in that direction. The way she stared, it was like she could see right through the trees to the water. I told Clove to take Felix to you people. She wouldn't have it, though. He leaned back, surprised that she was so willing to send him when Clove was not. He's mighty needed. I gathered as much from the videos you've been posting. He shook his head. Not me. My sister-in-law. She's the social media specialist for the ranch. I just take care of the animals and my mom. That last bit about his mom slipped out and his cheeks warmed despite the cold temperatures. She seemed to soften as women do when they take a man's measure and respect what they find. She pushed off the arms of the chair. I'll throw together a bag and we can be on our way. He choked on his sandwich the bread turning to cardboard in his throat. W-E? He coughed twice. What did she mean by we? Ma'am, I can't take you with us. Felix won't go willingly without me. She disappeared inside. Felix approached the porch. He grabbed the rope with his lips. You want to try again? No, he snapped, not at all in the mood for reindeer games. Drake considered him. What do you think? Do you want to go to the ranch? You'll have an unlimited supply of food, friends, family, a chance to train with the best reindeer in the world, and a warm barn to sleep in at night. Felix snorted sarcastically. Will you bring me carrots every night too? You can turn up your antlers all you want, but our place is a reindeer utopia. Drake purposefully ignored the reindeer as he gulped the cocoa that was cooling quickly. Not to mention we train Santa's reindeer. We're the only ones who can. He stood and dusted off the back of his pants before putting on his gloves. Felix sidestepped it away from him. I'm not going with you. Be reasonable. Hannah is in no shape to make a trip like this, he appealed to the reindeer softer side. The back door creaked open before Felix could answer. Hannah had a small suitcase in one hand, a bag that looked like it contained balls of yarn, and a green stocking cap on her head in addition to the coat she'd worn during dinner. I'm ready. Drake dropped his arms. This was the worst reindeer heist in the history of all Christmas movies, both Disney and otherwise, not to mention real life. Although he'd never heard of a reindeer heist before, but that didn't mean that they hadn't happened. Ma'am, I appreciate your willingness to come, but I can't take you. Hannah stood taller, which meant that she didn't quite reach his shoulder. Why ever not? He opened and closed his mouth as he searched for an answer that wouldn't offend her. She was too frail. The woman snowshowed in the woods with no one but a reindeer for company. She was too old. She moved with the agility of a woman half her age. She would get in the way. Actually, she'd be a lot of help with Felix. He let his arms flop to his sides. It wasn't in the plans. Plans change all the time. She sat down to fasten rubber snow cleats over her boots. I assume your truck is at the bottom of the lane? He nodded, but stood in front of her, both hands up. I can't be responsible for your health. I'm fit as eleven drummers drumming. She pushed to her feet with a grandmotherly-like groan. Let's get the show on the road. Felix sidled up to her and pinned Drake with a look. It's both of us or none of us. Stinking loyal reindeer. Ma'am, he rubbed the back of his neck. This feels like a very bad idea. She laughed. But kidnapping my reindeer seemed like a good one? The heat that had burned his ears spread across his cheeks. Reindeer I can handle. His thoughts jumped to Clove. What about Clove? Don't you need to be here for her? It's Christmas. Family should be together. You've met Clove? She faced him full on. Her dark blue eyes, so much like her granddaughter's, were full of intrigue. She practically rubbed her palms together as she looked him over in a new light, one of a potential suitor for her granddaughter. 
He held up both his hands and stepped back. Whoa there. We did not officially meet. We did not exchange names or phone numbers. I mean, I already have her number from when I called earlier this year, but we didn't. You know, meet meet in the way you're implying with that smirk. I saw her at the fuel stop today. That's how I knew Felix was here. Where did all those words come from? Hannah approached him like a woman in the fabric shop looking for the perfect cut of cloth. Don't ask him how many times he'd seen that look on his mother. He was her favorite shopping buddy. At least he had been until she got daughters-in-law who actually wanted to spend time in the fabric shop. So you're the reason she came home humming Christmas songs, she mused as she patted both his shoulders as if checking them for sturdiness. A different kind of warmth spread through Drake. She was humming. He asked in a voice too high. He cleared his throat and quickly added, I didn't do anything. Uh huh. Hannah gave him a little shake and then let him go. Let's get going before she gets home and puts a stop to this train. That shook Drake out of his kooky grin and warm thoughts of Clove and got his feet moving. Felix didn't follow. When Drake turned around, he purposefully planted both feet in the snow. Hannah grunted, I'll take care of this. She went back and whispered into his large ear for at least a minute, gesturing to Drake and then the cabin and throwing her arms up and letting them drop. When she was done, she nodded once and started walking. Felix fell in line behind her. Drake reached back and took Hannah's bags. I'll get those. Aren't you a gentleman? She said with force as she glared over her shoulder at Felix. Drake didn't want to get in the middle of their argument. Although he had a pretty good idea he was already in the exact middle of it, the cause of it, and the fuel that kept it burning. He kept his eyes forward and, when it got slippery, he offered a hand to help Hannah down. She didn't weigh a thing and he could have carried her and her luggage without breaking a sweat. Not that her pride would have allowed that to happen. Taking Hannah with him hadn't been in the original plan. So what? Good things could come out of this. For example, he wasn't stealing or kidnapping Felix and therefore his eternal soul was not in danger of being cast into a pit of despair for all of time. Total bonus. Also, though dragging his feet Felix came willingly. A compliant reindeer would be much easier to handle over a couple days and probably not destroy the inside of his trailer, maybe. As an added benefit, instead of asking forgiveness, he'd be the hero. A slow smile spread across his face as he thought of his brother's faces when he pulled into the ranch. They'd eat the words of caution they were always piling on top of him and finally give him the respect he deserved. Chapter 6 Clove hummed as she parked the snowmobile under the carport. She felt all light and easygoing and full of holiday cheer. They'd worked on Hark the Herald Angels Sing Tonight at choir practice and the upbeat tempo matched the way she felt inside. The house lights were on. Strange. Grandma was usually in bed by the time she got home from choir practice. Snowshoeing with Felix wore her out. Wonder what has her burning the nine o'clock oil, she joked. The familiar print of Grandma's boots met her at the bottom of the steps and then wandered into the wilderness with another set coming into the yard from the opposite side. At least I know she made it home, she mused. Grandma, she called softly as she entered through the front door so as not to wake Felix who usually slept on the back porch. The cabin smelled like cinnamon and orange peels. Cinnamon from the pine cones they'd sprinkled with oil and used for decorations along with pine boughs and bright red ribbons. The look was old-fashioned and she loved it. The orange scent was from lunch. The rinds filled the bucket they used to take scraps out to the chickens. The television was off and Grandma's blanket was folded over the back of her chair. Maybe she'd gone to bed? And left all the lights on? Not likely. She tiptoed down the hall and peeked in Grandma's room. What in the world? Pushing the door open all the way she stared at the clothes thrown with wild abandon on the bed and falling out of open drawers. Grandma, she said, more alarmed than the tightness in her throat allowed her to vocalize. Running and stumbling over her own feet, she careened into the kitchen. This room was tidy. There was a note on the fridge and she yanked it off, sending the Santa-shaped magnet flying. Dear Clove, a very nice man is taking me and Felix on a road trip. Love, Grandma Hannah. Wait. What, she yelled as she read the note again. What did she mean they took her and Felix? Was this Grandma's way of asking for help? She went to the door and flung it open. 
Felix. If the reindeer was within the sound of her voice, he would come within ten seconds. She counted her breaths as she waited. Nothing. No sound of reindeer paws pounding through the snow or branches breaking overhead as he flew to her rescue. Just empty sky and lonely snow. She slammed the door, making the pictures on the wall rattle. Digging her phone out, she called Grandma. It went right to voicemail. No. 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 She tried again and got the same result. The whole situation was fishy. Grandma wouldn't up and leave, especially during the holidays. And what nice man. Grandma didn't know any nice men, at least, not any that Clove didn't also know. If it was one of the men from town or church, Grandma would have given her a name. She pressed her hand, closed into a fist around the note, to her forehead and tried to think. Did Grandma have a secret online dating profile? She almost laughed at the thought. The woman used a Kindle but rarely typed out an email or text, preferring to call. Other questions raced through her mind like toy trains around a Christmas tree. Why would someone want to take Felix? A better question was why Felix and Grandma. She could understand one or the other, but both. That was weird. Then there was the big question, how were they going to transport Felix? He was as big as a buffalo, maybe not quite that big, but he wouldn't fit in a regular trailer or the back of a pickup. Gosh! Did someone tranquilize him? She stopped herself from gasping. If they had, they wouldn't be able to carry him down the hill without a tractor. He weighed 300 plus pounds. She would have seen the trail they left on her way up, and she hadn't seen a thing. She groaned. She hadn't been paying that close attention because she was daydreaming about the cowboy in the coffee stop. The man was too good to be true with his fitted jeans and name brand jacket. Not to mention that hat. She hadn't seen it on his head, gentleman that he was, he didn't wear it indoors. But that didn't stop her from fantasizing about him smoldering at her from under the chocolate colored brim. She should have been watching the path, not humming I saw mommy kissing Santa Claus while imagining the cowboy waiting for her under the mistletoe. The only reasonable explanation for the state of grandma's room and the note was that grandma and Felix were in trouble and she'd left this note as a clue for Clove, hoping Clove would come after them. I'm coming, grandma, she yelled as she charged to the door. She slammed on her helmet and then paused. Was she really going to race down the mountain on her own? Should she call the police? She pulled up Alan's number and dialed before she knew what she was going to say. She could report grandma missing, but then there was Felix. She couldn't explain that Felix was a flying reindeer and, therefore special in ways that other animals were not. What if the kidnappers had tried to take Felix and only Felix and grandma went along to make sure they didn't hurt him? Her stomach clenched with fear and her brain flashed white. Clove? Alan asked in a tone that said he had already said hello once. Are you there? Yeah. Uh. Hi, Alan. Hi. He said it like a question and she couldn't blame him. It wasn't like she'd ever called him for anything other than to report animal sightings like bears. And that was always in the spring. Is everything all right? He prodded. No. Grandma's gone. Hannah died, he yelled into the phone. What? She yelled back. No. Oh my heck clove. You scared the living daylights out of me. He then spoke to someone nearby. False alarm. It's okay. Hannah's okay. Sorry. Clove dropped her chin to her chest. Sheriff. Listen. I came home and there was a note from Grandma that she was going on a road trip with some guy. She went with the story that was in the note, because what else did she have to go on and because saying someone stole my flying reindeer sounded crazy. Oh? She pulled the phone away to make sure they were still connected. Why aren't you freaking out? Because I think it's kind of sweet that she found a fella. Clove grit her teeth. I've never met the man. He chuckled in that way guys do when they're proud of another man's romantic prowess. Sneaking off, eh? 
She tightened her grip on the phone. Can you go get her and bring her home, please? She added the please at the last second. G. Clove. If she went willingly with this guy, there isn't much I can do about it. She's a grown woman. Last I checked, she was mentally sharp and capable of beating half the town at Trivia Pursuit. Even if I report her missing, officially? She grasped for straws. Grandma would be mortally embarrassed and mortified to the extreme to have a police officer bring her home. She probably wouldn't speak to Clove for a week. The silence was a small price to pay to get her family back, though, and she'd press charges against the perpetrator in a heartbeat. She's not really missing though, right? You just don't want her with this guy? Ugh, she growled because he was right and that was extremely annoying. Grandma would not leave like this. Her note was vague. She left you a note. Clove, I'm sorry, but this isn't a missing person's case. Clove strangled her phone and silently screamed to the ceiling before putting it back to her ear. Thanks, Alan. I have to go. Okay. Merry Christmas. She hung up. I should have said she wandered off and didn't come home. A wave of guilt immediately followed that thought. A report like that would have brought out the entire search and rescue crew, putting them all at risk as they looked for grandma. Not to mention, the drain on their county resources. What did grandma expect Clove to do, go to bed as if nothing was out of the ordinary? Yeah, right. Forget it. Grabbing her gear, she marched back out to the snowmobile and fired it up. No one takes my family. She drove down the lane at a speed she wouldn't have dared on a clear day, let alone after nightfall. With the roar of the machine, she couldn't hear the owl's hoot nor the call of the wolves, if there were any. She hoped there weren't. At the bottom of the lane, she used a headlamp to check the tire marks in the snow. There was a set from a pickup truck and trailer. That explains how they're hauling Felix. She stood there with her hands on her hips, wondering how they got him to walk into the trailer in the first place. As far as she knew, he'd never trailered before and, other than sticking his head in their cabin in hopes of a treat or a chance to curl up by the fire to sleep, he didn't go inside anything except the root cellar. The trees were his bed and the sky his playground. She'd always assumed he was claustrophobic. They better not have drugged him, she ground out as she parked her sled. Her four-wheel drive SUV was in the garage. She unlocked the building and lifted the manual door. Snow had piled up two feet high, but she didn't have time to shovel her way out. She let the vehicle warm up, shifted into four-wheel drive, and then barreled out like some hot rod looking for a mud puddle to splash through. With a steel grip on the wheel, she managed to make it out all right. Then she had to jump out and shut the garage door again so she didn't come back to a garage full of snow. There was no quick escape from off-grid living. For a moment, her brain went to all the things she should have done, like feed the fire so it didn't die out and the pipes didn't freeze. Doesn't matter. We'll be back before the hearth grows cold. Following the truck's tracks, she plowed ahead. The roads weren't that busy tonight and if she pressed her luck and her speed, she'd catch up with them before they hit the interstate. She hoped. A truck hauling a 400-pound reindeer couldn't go that fast on slick roads. Once she got over 35 miles per hour, she took off the four-wheel drive and prayed for safety. The radio crooned Blue Christmas, and she sang along, changing the words, a note of sarcasm in her voice. I will not have a blue Christmas without you because you're coming home. 30, 40, 50 minutes into the drive and her heart hammered painfully. Every mile seemed more hopeless than the last. Signs of civilization appeared ahead. A gas station overhang lit up the night. She slowed down and cased the parking lot for any sign of a truck and trailer large enough to haul a reindeer. Nothing, nothing, nothing. She rolled through town, which didn't take long. On the other end was another gas station. Parked at the loan pump on the far end of town was a black Dodge with a lift kit hauling a stock trailer, and between the slats she could just make out Felix's antlers. Bingo! She slammed on the brakes and her car skidded to the side of the road. 
She pulled forward so she was out of the lane and hurried to the truck and flung open the driver's door, hoping to catch the man off guard enough that she scared him as much as he'd scared her. Gah! Grandma, sitting in the passenger seat, threw her hands in the air, dropping her knitting into her lap. Clove, she asked in surprise. Grandma, Clove hissed. She lifted on her tiptoes to see over the front of the truck. There was a man in a cowboy hat at the counter paying for two hot chocolates. Clove glanced back at the trailer. Even if she managed to get Felix and Grandma out before he came back, she wouldn't have a way to get Felix home. He could fly. And expose his talent to the whole county, ruin their quiet life, and possibly be taken in by the government to study in Area 51. Not going to happen. In an adrenaline-fueled rush, she jumped in the cab and started the truck. She'd turn the tables on this thief and set things right. What are you doing? Grandma braced a hand on the dash. I'm taking you both home where you belong. Clove shoved the truck into gear and slammed on the gas. They lurched forward, the truck weighed down by the trailer. Felix bellowed his protest from the trailer. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on, she told him. Not that he could hear her up here. Stop. Grandma told her. The man came out of the convenience store and stared at them. Clove eased them forward, moving too fast. She cranked the wheel so they could make a U-turn, excited and proud of herself for pulling off a rescue. Take that, Alan, she cheered. Alan? Grandma turned to look behind them as if Alan was right there in his police cruiser. She turned back and shouted, watch out. The truck lurched to a stop, and metal groaned. Something popped. Clove pressed the gas, making the engine growl. They didn't move. Hey, yelled the cowboy as he threw the hot chocolates to the side and ran for the truck. He wrenched open Grandma's door. Hannah, are you okay? Clove stared at the familiar stranger in the brown hat. Part of her noted that it looked as good on him as she'd thought it would. You. She pointed a shaky finger. Her world flipped on the side. Grandma nodded to him. I'm okay. I had on my seatbelt. We were going two miles an hour, Clove grumbled as she slipped open the door and slid to the ground to inspect the damage. She turned too sharp and caught the trailer on the metal post, denting it. The trailer tipped to the side. It didn't look right nor good. Dag Nabbit. The cowboy came around and glared at the damage. He slapped his hand on his thigh. Cinnamon sticks. He was angry? He was angry. Oh, heck to the no. She pointed at him. You don't get to be upset about this. His eyebrows disappeared beneath his chocolate brown cowboy hat. You wreck my truck and I don't get to be upset? How does that work? She drew herself up. You kidnapped my grandma. Did not. He scoffed at her as his eyes cut to the side. Clove narrowed her gaze. You did, didn't you? He pressed his lips shut and denied the accusation with a curt shake of his head. Did you see my note, dear? Grandma called from the cab in a soothing tone. Like this was all just some big misunderstanding and once they got it sorted, they'd laugh about it. Clove turned to her, unable to hold eye contact with the cowboy for long. His gaze was so intense it made her aware that she hadn't put on mascara before choir practice and that she'd worn a helmet and not fixed her hair. I saw your vague and unhelpful note. Thank. You. I also tried to call and you didn't answer your phone. It's not like you to run off with a man, Grandma. You can't blame me for being worried. Grandma sniffed. I ran off with your grandpa. Forty-seven years ago. That's not exactly regular behavior. Besides, you took Felix. She threw her arm to the trailer. Felix huffed a giant breath of moisture into the air, don't drag me into this. She folded her arms and cocked a hip. Oh, you're knee-deep in it, big guy. It's not like he stuffed you in that trailer. The cowboy turned sharply to stare at her. Clove squirmed. 
It wasn't like most people understood Felix. He had his own way of speaking and she and grandma and a few children could understand him. She must look crazy talking to a reindeer. It's time to go home, grandma. She motioned for her to get out of the truck. No one's going anywhere tonight, said the cowboy. Oh? She moved her hands to her hips, ready to do battle. Are you itching to spend Christmas in jail for kidnapping? He dropped his chin to his chest as if she wore him out with her empty threats. When he lifted his head, his brown eyes twinkled with hidden knowledge. The image was so sharp it cut through her snow fort defenses and she drew a quick breath. The axle is broken. He pointed to the spot where the trailer tipped the most. Unless you want Felix to fly, we need to get it fixed. He stepped away. No one is going home tonight. Fly home? She giggled in a manic way that was like scraping ice off a windshield. She shuddered. She hated that sound. Who said anything about flying reindeer? His eyes moved to Grandma and then Felix. Without a word, he turned on the heel of his expensive cowboy boots and walked back toward the store. Where are you going? she asked. Keeping him in her sights was better than him catching her unaware. You're just going to leave us all here to freeze? Okay, now she was pushing his buttons. But she kind of wanted to see how far she could push him before he exploded. So far, his self-control far outweighed hers and it left her on uneven ground. His shoulders bunched up around his ears and then dropped with his exhale. He came back and stopped in front of her. I'm going inside to ask about a repair shop. He touched the open door and then held out a hand to her like a gentleman. You'll be warmer inside the truck. The engine still works so you can turn on the heater if you'd like. She had half a mind to refuse his kindness. Come on. It's getting cold in here. Grandma waved her into the cab. She didn't take his offered hand, grabbing the steering wheel instead to hoist herself up. Stupid lift kit. Who needed a truck this tall, anyway? Why didn't you have running boards like a regular person? Because I have long enough legs to get in without them. His eyes dropped to her legs. So do you. Try not to break anything, he grumbled at her as he shut the door. Her mouth fell open. He'd noticed her legs? She snapped it shut and folded her arms. That was beside the point. I told him not to be upset. Grandma shook her head. You owe that man an apology and a lot of money. Clove groaned and dropped her forehead to the steering wheel. She didn't want to think about the nice leather cover and how the steering wheel was heated and how nice that felt because she was chilled to the bone. It smelled good in here, too, like the kind of cologne that they sold in department stores and hay and snow and him. Men shouldn't smell good. Someone should tell him that. This was a trader's truck, a kidnapper's. She shouldn't like it, but she did. It was all sorts of manly and comfortable. What is going on? she asked pitifully. This whole thing was absolutely ridiculous. Two weeks before Christmas and she was out chasing her flying reindeer and grandma in the frigid cold and dark of night. Honestly, there was no good explanation. Grandma chuckled, and Clove turned her head so she could see her. We're going to save Christmas, dear. Clove closed her eyes. I was afraid you were going to say something like that. Chapter 7 Chestnuts. Drake threw his hat on the convenience store counter. It slid across the formica and then stopped before falling off the edge, not giving Clove a complete dressing down for trying to steal his truck and wrecking his trailer had taken every ounce of his patience. She'd used up the very last drop of it the moment she got out and told him he had no right to be upset. No right? No right to be angry that she dented the heck out of his property, broke the axle, and put them back at least two days? Maybe even a week. Not to mention, they were stuck in some no-name town in the middle of nowhere with a flying reindeer. How the peppermint was he supposed to keep Felix on the ground and fix the truck? All the things he'd wanted to say to her in that moment, like the fact that he knew Felix could fly, had slid down his throat like broken candy canes because the truth was that he needed her to like him enough to take Felix home. Hannah told him all about Clove bringing Felix home one afternoon after reading by the lake. 
How the reindeer followed her like a puppy and made her laugh. How the sound of Clove's laughter was the very thing that convinced her to let Felix stay. She'd not heard the teenager laugh before, not in the five years she'd lived there. Which meant that Felix was Hannah's reindeer. He may have followed Grandma this far, but if he had to pick between them, he'd choose Clove and leave Drake here until the snowman melted in the spring. He didn't have time to wrap his head around Clove's life before Felix before Hannah had moved on to Felix's eating schedule and preferences, his mischievous side, ability to sneak into the root cellar, and the other reindeer games he played. She was an excellent storyteller. Billy, Ryder, and Aspen would love her. Hannah's continual chatter kept him from having to think about what would happen after they made it to the ranch. Dunder was an issue, one he wasn't sure how to handle. A reindeer king didn't take kindly to new males in his territory. He brushed that concern aside and had tried not to think about getting Hannah off the ranch once they settled Felix in with the herd. She didn't say anything about going home for Christmas and he didn't have a place for her to stay long term. His mom would know what to do about that, so he pushed that aside too. All in all, he'd done a great job of avoiding thinking about the consequences for his actions and chose to focus on the hope he hauled behind his pickup truck. No matter what he'd done, his family would forgive him, though they may not let him forget his stupidity. As if summoned by his prophecy of their teasing, his phone rang and Forrest's name appeared on screen. He answered with a short, Merry Christmas. Ho ho ho, Forrest boomed. Where are you, bro? It's two weeks till Christmas and you're missing everything. I'm having truck issues, which was putting it mildly. I thought I'd be home tomorrow, but it looks like I'll be in a repair shop. He could kick the cashier stand. He was so frustrated. Peanut butter fudge. Forest Christmas cursed. Do you want me to come get you? You can leave your truck for a month and we'll go back in January. Drake pushed against the annoyed younger brother that lived inside of him. The last thing he needed right now was Forrest riding to his rescue. No thanks. I'll deal with it myself. His tone was one of burnt cookies and dried pine needles. Forrest paused before responding and in the silence Drake heard him decide not to bite back. Okay, have a great trip. Call if you need. Or want to. Okay. They said goodbye and Drake hung up the phone, staring at the screen. Forrest had done the same thing to him that he'd done when upset with Clove. Did he try his brother's patience that much with his independence? The cashier, Rory, came out from the back office. Did you forget something? He wore a red and black plaid flannel shirt and black jeans with brown work boots. His hair was two months past a good haircut, and he had three-day gray scruff on his chin. I wish, he mumbled before speaking up. We had a little running out there, and I'm hoping there's a repair shop in town. Rory set a box of individual-sized bags of Christmas kisses on the counter and opened the top. The sweet smell of commercial chocolate wafted past Drake's nose reminding him that Christmas was close and with it the official close of the reindeer breeding season. Well, now. Rory scratched his neck, stretching it out like a turtle from his shell. We've got a few guys who do that kind of work on the side. Are any of them welders? The dents in the side were something he could fix when he got back. The axle needed to be fixed right, or they'd end up in a wreck a few miles down the road. Ordering a new axle out here could take months, assuming the dealer had one in stock. If you're looking for welding, that's Otis. He took his cell out of his pocket and thumbed through the contacts. Drake did the same, readying his phone to accept a new contact. While he waited, a text appeared from his mom. Mom, Gabriella, can you let your dear mother know you're alive today? He hurried to type back a reply. Drake, I'm alive. Healthy. Dealing with truck problems. He almost typed out that he could handle it on his own, but stopped himself and hit send. Mom, thanks. Love you. Glad you're my son. If his mom wasn't so sincere, he'd think she was trying to lay a guilt trip on him. But she said that kind of thing to him all the time, so he knew it was his own guilt at leaving on Thanksgiving without saying goodbye that aided him. She had every right to be angry with him, and instead, she gave him room to have a tantrum of sorts. At least, that's how this probably looked from her vantage point. Drake, me too. Sorry, I left without saying goodbye. I love you. Dad too. Will you tell him? Mom, of course smiling face with hearts. Drake, thanks. I can't wait to give you your Christmas present when I get home. Mom, any idea when that'll be? Here it is. Rory rattled off a phone number and Drake rushed to enter it into his phone. Then he went back to finish texting. Drake, not sure. Waiting to talk to the mechanic. I'll let you know when I know. He wished he could give her more information, but with Clove in the picture, 
he wasn't sure he'd be able to make it out of the state with Felix, let alone all the way back to North Dakota. You'll want to call him first thing in the morning. Rory took out a package of kisses and ripped it open, offering one to Drake. He took it absently. Morning? It was dark as ink out there. His phone read after nine. Any place to stay in town? He had portable panels in the trailer that would make a nice pin for Felix. Not that they'd keep him grounded if he decided to fly out, but people tended to feel better when the reindeer stood behind a fence. Judy, two streets up that way, has a couple rooms she rents out on that airband B thing. She might have an opening. There's a sign in her front yard. Drake made a mental note and gathered up his hat. Any damage to my property? Asked Rory. Drake shook his head. Your metal pole is just fine. Maybe a little scuffed. Rory nodded once. It's fine steel. Got it off of a tank someone was taking apart. Can't remember what part of the tank it was, but it was a good buy. I painted it bright yellow, so it was hard to miss. Drake's face flamed with embarrassment. He lifted a hand in goodbye as he ducked back outside. The icy wind raced down his coat collar and he shivered, shoving his hat on his head to keep warm. Instead of going to Clove's side of the truck, where she might reprimand him again, he approached Hannes. She rolled down the window and warm air spilled onto his cheeks, reminding him of everything he was missing. There's a band B not far from here where we can settle in for the night. My treat. He put on a smile, but it felt as forced as holiday cheer in cell block 43. Why don't we just go home? I have my SUV. Clove pointed across the street. Drake closed his eyes and reminded himself to be nice. The voice sounded an awful lot like his sainted mother's. The trailer won't make it that far. I'm going to have to pull it off to the side here and hope Rory doesn't mind it spending the night because I can't call the repair guy until tomorrow morning. Clove drew her lips in and her eyebrows down. But you could drive us home. All of you but Felix. He turned to Hannah and felt himself soften a bit. She was more than a willing partner in his reindeer heist, and she'd been nothing but supportive. I didn't think you'd want to leave him behind. Hannah patted his cheek. That's very kind of you. A strangled sound of protest escaped from Clove's pressed lips. Maybe escaped was the wrong phrase. It was more like a forced noise from the back of her throat. He locked eyes with her, daring her to argue with his plan. She apparently couldn't help herself. We can get Felix home. It's dark enough that he could. She trailed off her eyes flitting from him to Hannah. Fly, he spat out. You want him to fly home? Her eyes rounded. Yeah, I know he can fly. He should calm down. He should school his voice and not let the grouch inside of him take over. He would do all of that if this woman wasn't glaring at him like he'd stolen the last candy cane from her child. I know he can fly and that he talks to you and that you say you want to protect him, but you're really hiding behind him like a coward. She gasped, her already big blue eyes going wide. A voice of reason inside of him shouted for him to stop, but he was a snowball rolling downhill and gathering speed. If you want Felix to fly home, be my guest. Flying reindeer reports on the local knees and spreading all over the county will be easy to dismiss when everyone knows you're the only one with a reindeer. How do you think I found Felix? Her eyes darted from side to side as she remembered their conversation at the coffee stop. Her recall was so quick. He wondered if she'd been thinking about those few moments as much as he had and they were fresh in her mind. He pushed away from the door, the honesty and truth in his thoughts causing a physical reaction to her inside of him. He yearned to take her in his arms and soothe all the places where she was pricked and poked into becoming the woman who looked so lost. His mom said that he had a way of seeing things and people they didn't want to see in themselves, and that's why they got upset when he pointed them out. He called out Caleb when he said he didn't like Faith told him he liked her more than he was willing to admit and that he was running scared from her. They're married and have a kid now, so it all worked out. He told his date to the junior prom that he knew she didn't want to go with him, but thought he was better than sitting at home. She was mad and embarrassed until he said it was fine, but would appreciate it if she'd stop pretending to be interested in him and just be his friend. They danced and laughed, and she sent him a Christmas card every year. She lives in Idaho. Living honestly wasn't always easy, but it seemed to pay off in the long run. Apparently, pointing out that Clove hid behind Felix had been the wrong thing to do, and he wasn't sure how he was going to get over the ice block she'd put between them. He had to wonder how he'd seen all that in Clove in such a short amount of time. It wasn't like he'd grown up with her like he did with Caleb, or that he'd spent an awkward dinner with her like he did with Caitlin. Nope. He'd had less than 10 minutes with her, and he was throwing out nuggets of truth like they were candy at a Christmas parade. Maybe she was easy to read. 
He rounded the back of the trailer, ready to open the door and encourage Felix to back out, but came up short at Clove standing there with her arms folded and angry puffs of cold air gathering around her head. We'll stay in town with you tonight. She spit the words out. And, because he was Drake Nicholas and not St. Nicholas, he replied, don't do me any favors. He reached for the latch to open the door. Maybe she wasn't the only one with an ice chip on her shoulder tonight. She slapped her hand over the latch to stop him, and he ended up putting his hand over the top of hers by accident. Lightning rushed through his veins and he jerked his hand back. Drake grew up with the Kringle sisters. Santa's daughters had magic in their blood. They could do things like build windmills that powered the exercise barn. Thank you, Lux, and bake enough cookies to feed the whole town for the 4th of July picnic in one hour. Thank you, Robin. Nothing that he'd seen or felt with the Kringles had prepared him for the tingles that rushed through him at Clove's touch. She stared at her hand, her mouth slightly open and her eyes wide. She felt it too, he thought. A part of him was proud that he'd stirred inside of her the same zing Y feelings she'd thrust into him. It horrified the other part of him that he couldn't hide it from her. Unfortunately for him, she recovered faster. We're staying with Felix. Her eyes were big and full of determination because it's the best thing for him. The very fact that you feel like you have to clarify that, he teased, his voice lowered to a slow burn. The thunder in her gaze said that he'd already said too much. He cleared his throat and glanced down at his heavy winter boots. She sniffed. How long will it take to fix the trailer? He shook his head and stuffed his hands in his pockets. If I were home? Twelve hours. He wasn't sure why he wanted her to know he could take care of these kinds of things. Call it a manly instinct of wanting to be the alpha. Or, it could be that he just wanted her to see him as capable and strong. Strong? Like, strong enough to throw her over his shoulder and haul her back to her front porch, if he had the inclination. Carrying her away had a certain amount of appeal. Shoot. Not like a man carrying off a woman. Only because he could leave her there. Right. Yeah. That was it. He stomped his feet against the cold seeping into his boots. In the middle of nowhere? He waved his hand around, indicating the small town. I have no idea. I got the name of a welder. He might be able to fix it. Or he might let me use his equipment and fix it myself. He mentally rolled his eyes at his second attempt to impress her with his welding skills. Women don't care. He silently yelled at himself. I won't know until I've talked to him. She tucked her chin. Fine. He blinked in surprise at her one word and somewhat easy to come by answer. Fine? Yes. Fine. She turned part way and then stopped. I'll pay for the repairs in our rooms tonight. She ground her teeth and then said through tight lips, I'm sorry I broke your trailer. The apology cost her a whole lot of pride. How's it taste? He asked, feeling his insides relax. How does what taste? She asked, a small line appearing between her eyebrows. Crow. He gave her a crooked smile. Felix chortled from inside the trailer. Clove banged once on the side of it with her palm and he cut off. She pointed at Drake. You are not my friend and cannot tease me. I'm going to check in at the Banby. Watch out for Grandma and Felix. She left him there and crossed the street to her car. You're bossy. You know that. He called after her. She waved over her head to let him know she'd heard him. Her sauntering step told him she didn't care one what he thought. Felix huffed twice. You could have handled that better. I know. Drake walked around the side of the trailer so that he was out of Clove's sight. He couldn't seem to rein in his mouth when she was around. That alone was disturbing. Add to it the sense that he should puff out his chest and lift heavy things, and he was all sorts of mixed up. Think she'll warm up to me? Felix groaned. Don't count on it. Yeah, I didn't think so either. As upset as he had been that they couldn't make it home tonight, Clove had done him a favor. She'd given him time to change her mind about him, the ranch, and Felix. As much as he would have loved to haul Hannah and Felix home, and then let Clove catch up to them there. Her angry arrival would have brought a sleigh load of trouble for him, especially with his mom. And if there was one woman on the planet, he didn't want to upset it was mom. She had more than enough to worry about with the ranch failing, Christmas coming, grandbabies, and dad not fully recovered almost a year later. Maybe he never would get back to his old self. That alone put pressure on mom to check in on Drake and his brothers, and was enough of a reason for him to figure out how to get along with the frosty reindeer owner. He sighed loudly as he went a knock on Hannah's window again. I'm going to see if I can get the trailer over there, he told her as he pointed to the darkest part of the parking lot. Then I'll unhitch and we can head over to the bed and breakfast. She glanced over her shoulder at the trailer. 
I'll put Felix on the lead rope, and you can hold it out your window. We'll drive real slow, okay? He'd sat on a tailgate while holding a lead rope plenty of times, but hadn't attempted it out of an open window with a rank reindeer. Yes, Felix was rank. He'd been allowed to roam free, never having fences, a barn, or so much as a halter on before. He flew at will and may or may not have the control needed to maneuver around chimneys or land on a roof without making a clatter. All of which was good, in a way. Reindeer Wrangler Ranch needed Felix more than Santa's stables needed him. They also needed to be able to work with Felix, though, and that meant training. A lead rope was very basic training. That'll be just fine, dear. She began putting her knitting away. She'd made a lot of progress since they'd left the cabin. What are you making? He nodded at her project. A blanket. She ran her hand over the soft-looking yarn. It was red and white striped like a candy cane and as fuzzy as a teddy bear. Looks like a good one. He smiled. I hope so. I don't use patterns, and I never quite know how something will turn out until I've seen it all the way through. In the beginning, it's just a bunch of stitches and not beautiful at all. But if you keep going, it turns into something worth holding close. She looked out the window to where Clove pulled her four-wheel drive onto the main road, letting her words sit there like a model of wisdom she hoped he was smart enough to pick up. He got the message. He just wasn't sure what to do about it. He hadn't come to Montana to find a girlfriend. He'd come for a reindeer. What if he got both? Asked a little voice in his head. He gripped the window. He didn't want a girlfriend. He wanted freedom. Making friends with Clove and convincing her to let Felix stay at the ranch was enough for him. But, started the voice, and he cut it off. See, he could cut off the blunt honesty when he wanted to. He just had to figure out how to do that around Clove, and everything would be fine. Chapter 8 Clove sat on the queen-sized bed in the two-story home that was too large for the jolly woman who lived here. Judy had hair that must have been salt and pepper at some time in her life but had gone to snow and thunderclouds. She was short, with round hips and a quick smile. Her pixie haircut, holiday sweater, and black leggings were the image of Christmas cheer. She'd thrown open her door to Clove and welcomed the three of them to her home as if they were her long-lost cousins. What followed was a half hour of touring the house, finding towels, discussing meals, and sharing a plate of kiss-topped peanut butter cookies that could give an elf a sugar rush. They had just the right balance of peanut butter and chocolate, and she'd eaten two more than she should have. Now that things had settled down, she debated on whom to call to take care of her chickens, turn on the furnace to keep the pipes from freezing, and run the dishwasher so the dirty dishes didn't stink to the rafters by the time they got home, hopefully tomorrow. All these chores meant that the person she called would have to go inside the house. She went through her options. Pastor Tom was her first thought. While she could trust the aged man in her home, she didn't quite trust his ability to get up the winding snow path and back down it without breaking a hip. Since he turned 70, he stayed closer to home and closer to the parish church in the winters. Sheriff Allen. He was on the right side of the law, and she should be able to trust him in her house. Although he might become suspicious about the state of it, considering her phone call about Grandma. Had she really called him less than three hours ago? It felt like a lifetime ago. Truly, she was in a different life here. Instead of taking care of their place, doing daily chores, making meals, and all the other things she did to keep their homestead going, someone else would make her bed tomorrow. Judy insisted. In a way, she felt like an imposter here, although another part of her liked knowing that the whole world didn't rest on her shoulders. Alan was young enough to make the trek up and back, as evidenced by the fact that he'd done that very thing earlier in the week. The trouble with asking Alan was that it implied they were friends or, well, acquaintances. Friendly acquaintances that she'd been able to keep some distance with despite his advances for more. She suddenly felt bad for pushing him away all the time. If he needed a friend, she could be that friend. Why did she always assume he was after her for a relationship? Musical note, jingle bells, musical note grandma's voice rang out from the shared bathroom next door. She always sang in the shower and it, apparently, didn't matter if they were in a publicish building or not. Also, grandma saw romance in every single man that came through town. She'd often teased Clove that what she needed was a summer of tourist boyfriends to loosen her up, 
kissing twenty men without commitment would do her some good. Clove wasn't interested in a man that didn't have a commitment bone in his body. She'd had a father like that, and that was enough of that kind of man to last a lifetime. Not that she could say all that to Grandma. She was Dad's mom after all and bad-mouthing a woman's child only put her on the defensive. However, Grandma could say anything she wanted to say about Dad's wanderlust, and no one got mad at her. Most of the time Clove added a quick amen to the end of Grandma's My Son is a Terror speech. Think, she admonished herself to get back to the task at hand. Going into the past never brought her joy and wasn't productive. She'd grown astute at avoiding it. If she couldn't call the pastor and she couldn't call the sheriff, then she'd call Zoe. Zoe would ask a million questions when she got back which was just fine with Clove. She needed a sounding board to throw all of her conflicting emotions about Drake at in one hot chocolate-fueled unofficial therapy session. Musical note. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Musical note the water rushing through the pipes cut off and Clove was running out of time. She dialed Zoe, who picked up on the first ring. They said hello and Clove asked her to do chores for a couple of days. Where are you? Clove pinched the bridge of her nose. I am in Windy Plains? I think. She vaguely remembered seeing a sign for dog sled rentals, a dead giveaway that they were in Windy Plains, where dog sledding was the pastime of choice. Or just on the outskirts, anyway. What are you doing there? Zoe asked, as if she'd come here on purpose. Clove chewed on her thumbnail as she thought. We, uh, had a situation with Felix and then the trailer had a mishap and we're spending the night. Hopefully, it's just one night here while it gets fixed. Zoe gasped. Is he okay? The stress Clove carried went down by two degrees because Felix was healthy and fine and Zoe's question reminded her of that. Yes, she counted stress in degrees. The more stress the hotter she felt and the hotter she felt, the more she perspired. For the last two hours, she'd had a steady glow about her. Felix will be just fine, she assured her friend. But I'm worried about my chickens. She drew in a breath. The reindeer thief had told her it could take a couple of days. You know what? Just turn on the furnace. I'm not sure how long the repairs are going to take. Okay. You still have those auto feeders for the hens? Zoe heard all about Clove's brilliant idea to build a feeder that could hold a week's worth of pellets. Yep. And heated waterers. You just have to make sure they have some water in them. Done. I'll take care of everything until you get back. Good luck. Thanks. I, she gulped, hating the feeling that came with the next words, oh you one. Sure. I'll be sure to collect on that when I take my Hawaiian vacation next month." The sarcasm in her voice reassured Clove that she wouldn't hold this over her head. Clove released another knot of tension. Only 996 knots to go. Grandma sailed in, wearing pajamas covered in Rudolph faces. His red nose stood out against the green background. She smelled like her favorite lavender shampoo and body wash. Thanks, Zoe. I'll call you when we're on our way back." She hung up just as Grandma scowled at her. What was that about? Grandma tucked her shower stuff into her suitcase. Just getting someone to look after the cabin for us. Clove stood and stretched her arms above her head. The room was comfortable with a queen bed in the middle, a large matching dresser and mirror on the wall with the door and a big window on the other side. The velvet shade was drawn tight to block out the streetlight that threatened to ruin any chance of sleep for Clove. She loved living in the cabin where the only light they had to worry about was a full moon. You should be looking after the cabin, Grandma groused. She yanked back the covers and climbed into bed, displaying her unhappiness that Clove had showed up at all. She had no idea what Grandma planned to do once they made it to North Dakota. Was she going to leave Felix there? Take up residence? Ever let Clove know where they'd gone? They'd be sharing the queen-sized mattress tonight and not talking about these all-important things. The bed and breakfast only had two rooms, and it was either share with Grandma or share with Drake. Drake wasn't even an option. 
Have you talked to Drake? Grandma asked before Clove could mount a sizable defense for chasing after her. Why would I talk to him? She spat out as she shimmied out of her jeans and down to her thermals. Thankfully, they were as comfortable as pajamas, though not quite as stylish. At least she could sleep in them. You should be nice to him because you crashed his truck into a metal pole. Grandma folded her arms. Or at least try to be nice to him, especially after something like that. Besides, he's taking care of Felix while we're inside, nice and warm. Clove sat on the edge of the mattress and pinned Grandma with a look. Tell me the truth. Did he come to steal my reindeer? Yes. Grandma laid one hand on Clove's arm. They are in a desperate situation, Clove. I could see the fear for his family and for the animals they care for in his eyes. Desperation doesn't mean it's okay to steal, Clove insisted. She'd learned that lesson by the time she'd taken a bag of chips from the convenience store. That was hours before Dad dropped her off with Grandma for the last time, never to be seen or heard from again. She hadn't eaten for two days and when she'd asked for food, he'd sealed his lips together and shook his head. To this day, she didn't know if he didn't have money or just didn't want to spend it on her. Either way, he wasn't a good father, so what did it matter? Something banged loud enough to cause alarms, and two knots in Clove's neck. She ran to the window, threw open the sash, pulled up the glass and leaned outside to see Drake setting up a series of lightweight metal panels against the side of the house to make a pen. The cold raced right down her top and up her sleeves, but she didn't pull herself inside. What are you doing? she asked, a note of derision in her voice. That's not going to hold him. Drake stopped and tipped his head up to see her. The streetlight cut across his square jaw and made his shoulders look broader. His hat hid his deep brown, soulful eyes from her. It's not about holding him in, but keeping people out. He went back to work. Clove came back inside and slammed the window on his good answer. He wasn't supposed to be smart. Felix did fine with people. People didn't always do fine with Felix. Especially teens. They were too aggressive in their admirations and had no idea how much muscle and power a reindeer had in his enormous body. Not to mention, one quick swing of his neck and his antlers could take them down. Hmm, Grandma said from the bed. It's almost like he knows what he's doing. She turned off her light and faced the door. Clove folded her arms. She watched as Drake finished putting up the panels. Using the side of the house as one side of the pen gave him an extra panel to enlarge the area that Felix would have to rest. He could fly out if he wanted, he could sleep on the roof if he wanted. He would behave, though. Over the years, he'd learned what was appropriate behavior in front of people and what would make them jump out of their skin. Drake disappeared and came back a minute later with two large buckets stacked together and Felix trailing behind him. He set the one bucket inside of the pen and Felix stuck his face in and came up with oats dripping from his eager lips. Drake laughed, sending happy puffs of air up around his head. Felix leaned into him, and Drake rubbed his neck and jaw. The scene made Clove's heart expand. Felix didn't have a lot of people in this world, and Drake treated him like he was important and worth something, not just another reindeer or animal in a herd. He left and came back with a bucket of water. Speaking to Felix as he set it down, he gestured up to the window. Felix turned and looked, and she waved out of reflex. Her face heated with embarrassment at being caught watching them. Drake had put Felix outside her window so he would feel close to her and Grandma. That was thoughtful. She wasn't sure how she felt about Drake doing something nice, because he wasn't supposed to be a good guy. Felix was an excellent judge of character and the fact that he palled around with this reindeer thief had her reconsidering her initial judgment. She shook off the doubts. He was still a thief. Which made him a bad guy. That's how it worked, right? There were bad guys and good guys in the world. Her dad? Bad guy. Alan? Good guy, but not made for her. Pastor Tom? Great guy, great man who worked to spread glad tidings throughout his sphere of influence. Drake? 
she tipped her head side to side, weighing him and not being able to put him on one end or the other. Ugh. She hated that she couldn't put him in a box. Maybe he was a bad guy, but a good reindeer wrangler. Her brain felt itchy trying to work it out. Sleep. She needed sleep. Knowing Felix had food, water, and as much protection as they could give him in this situation, she turned off the lamp and crawled into bed. Grandma snored softly, the sound familiar and comforting. Clove rolled from one side to the other and back again, not feeling at all comfortable. Get over it, she whispered into the dark. You're here. You can't go home without Grandma and Felix, so buckle down and deal. A few minutes later her lids grew heavy, and she felt herself falling into the mattress as if she'd held herself stiffly above it before that. As she fell asleep, the image of a man with a square jaw and dark hat filled her head and she felt oddly safe knowing he slept under the same roof. Chapter 9 I'll make you a deal. Drake tried not to look anxious as Otis scratched under his chest-length beard. What was it with this town and beards? He hadn't passed a man who didn't have facial hair in some stage of growth or another. No wonder they stared at him. He'd shaved before leaving the bathroom this morning. Not because Clove might be right outside the door. That was just plain silly. He always shaved in the morning, so knowing he would see her at some point in the day had nothing to do with it. He shoved his hands into his coat pockets and questioned his sanity. Every thought went back to her, even Otis's beard. That wasn't normal behavior, and he needed to be his normal, clever, resourceful self if they were ever going to leave Windy Plains, because the other alternative, calling his brothers for help, wasn't something he wanted to do. No less than five huskies made circles around him and Otis, the tags on their collars jingling, as if rounding up him and Otis. They were beautiful dogs, with strong shoulders and traditional markings. He'd guessed they all came from the same litter and that the dog with the darkest fur was the Alpha. The apple cinnamon pancakes Judy served this morning were incredible. She paired them with a butter pecan syrup, maple bacon, and whipped cream. He hadn't eaten so well since leaving home and told her as much. She'd preened even as she'd swatted away the praise with A, just an old family recipe, that's all. Clove didn't say much over the meal. She twirled her fork through the syrup, making snowflake designs that disappeared seconds later. Grandma chatted with Judy as if they were old friends. The two went to work on dishes and Clove went to feed Felix while he came down to talk Otis into getting to work. What do you have in mind? He prompted the overall clad man to get on with making his offer. Any silence was immediately filled with clove and the pillow creases on her cheek. You help me fix up this old dog sled, and I'll let you use the welder free of charge. He grinned as if he'd come up with the perfect solution. Drake stared down at the sled in question. It looked like it was two days away from turning to dust. Two things. He held up two fingers. Otis nodded. One. I am happy to pay you for using the welder. Clove had offered to pay for the damages, and he'd let her because it was the right thing to do on her part. Besides, payment for use of a machine would be much less than it would cost to pay a mechanic to order parts or do the work himself. Otis opened his mouth to argue, as evidenced by the way his face went dark. Drake plowed on. Two. Why do you want to fix up this old thing, anyway? Otis broke into a warm smile. This was my granddaddy's sled. He won the race to the sky three years running with this sled. These dogs come directly from his line. Drake lifted his chin, starting to see where this was going. And you want to enter? Been thinking about it for a couple years, even bought the supplies. The race isn't until February. He scratched under his beard again. If I get the sled in order now, I'll have time to practice with the dogs. They need it. They look in sync already. Some dogs ran in a counterclockwise direction, while others went clockwise. They passed one another at regular intervals, and he could pick out who the lead dog was by the way she twitched her ears or snapped at another dog that fell behind. Wouldn't take much to get them working together. Otis eyed him. You work with dog teams? Reindeer. Drake didn't want to get into much of the training work they did. They taught the non-flyers to pull sleds, either alone or in teams. They never needed more than two reindeer for a sled, though. It wasn't like he could tell Otis that he trained Santa's eight reindeer, nine now that Rudy and his glowing red nose lead the team. Rudy's rare genetic trait, one they hadn't seen in 43 years, also came with partial blindness. It wasn't until Faith operated on him that he'd been able to see clearly and train hard enough to be eligible to join Santa. His dreams came true last Christmas Eve. 
Sometimes Drake missed him, though the only one he'd told was Dunder. That old reindeer would keep his secret for the rest of his life. Besides, Dunder missed Rudy too, and Drake didn't tell anyone about his softer side. So you want me to help you fix up the sled? He ripped the cover off. Most of the wood was rotted and full of splinters. The metal runners looked thin and warped. The brakes were non-existent. Drake groaned. This wasn't a fixer-upper, it was a complete rebuild. How long do you think it'll take? A week? Otis said hopefully. Drake stalked around the workshop, cataloging scraps from other projects that he could harvest for the sled. If they had everything they needed, he might cut it down to three days and get the trailer fixed. Otis's shop was disorganized but well-stocked. You've got yourself a deal. He shook hands with a delighted Otis. I'll tell the missus. And I'll get your trailer over here right now. Otis jogged inside, whistling for the dogs to follow. They barked and ran after him. The amount of dog hair in that house could probably stuff a mattress. Drake shook his head as he walked back to the bed and breakfast. It was only a couple of blocks north, though most of that was skirting a wooded area. He tapped his boots against the top step to dislodge the snow before throwing open the door. Oaf. He looked around the door and found Clove leaning against the wall, her arm up to protect herself. Sorry, he said as he quickly shut the door. Judy wasn't paying to heat the front porch. I didn't know you'd be standing there. I wasn't standing here. She tugged down her plaid shirt. I was going to go out and shovel the walk for Judy. Drake nodded once and went right back outside, grabbed the shovel, and started work. It was good for him to have something physical to do. Back home, he would have fed the reindeer by now, a process that included lifting several bales of grass hay, bags of oats, and hauling water by the bucket at times. The old pickup they drove into the field was a stick shift with a gummy clutch that could give you a Charlie horse for trying to shift gears. Being out here meant he wasn't stuck inside with Clove. She unsettled him. She was pretty, with her blonde hair in two braids and a stocking cap. She looked like a ranch girl, and he would be lying if he said he didn't have a thing for ranch girls. Some men wanted a woman to take care of, one who kept house and looked pretty when he came in for dinner. Not Drake. A woman who could hold her own with a chainsaw was sexy. Clove came out a few minutes after, her face red and her eyes dark. I wasn't telling you to do it. She grabbed for the shovel. It's my job. He pulled it out of her reach. Doesn't matter. I'm doing it. Well, stop doing it. She reached again, her arm across his body and her face close. Close enough to kiss. Her lips were light pink, and she had three freckles on her nose. Cute. Added that her hen-like indignation that he'd taken her chore, and she was downright adorable. He mentally shook himself. Clove hated him. He had no right to think about kissing her or each of those three freckles on her nose. Do you have a problem with people being nice? He asked instead. She continued to grasp for the handle, which he barely kept out of her reach by twisting his body a little more. I don't like people doing things for me. She twisted with him. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, he growled. She stomped a foot and launched after the shovel. He twisted his body so far around that he was off balance. He grabbed her arm with his free hand in an effort to steady himself. Her foot slipped, and the two of them fell. He tossed the shovel away and grabbed her, absorbing the impact of their fall. They laid there for a second in shock. She pressed up on her forearms, her braids hanging down and her face haloed by the winter sun. Her skin was pink from the cold and her eyes worried. Did you just save me? He assessed his circumstances, not at all hating the feel of her body covering his. The situation was quite comfortable as a matter of fact. Yes. She hit the snow with her fist. Don't ever do that again. He blinked. Fine. Don't ever throw yourself on top of me then. Her mouth fell open. I didn't throw. She grit her teeth. I wouldn't. He couldn't seem to stop himself. But you did. He quirked an eyebrow and smiled knowingly. Admit you like me. Gah. She scrambled to her feet, kicked snow on him, and stormed away. He lay back and laughed up at the sky. He was not laughing at her, but at his own stupidity. Clove went inside the house, the shovel forgotten in her huff. That was fine with him. He needed space to clear his head. He threw his arms and legs out and made a snow angel. The movement released some of his frustration and soothed his soul. The cold seeped into all the angry rivers coursing through his blood. What are you doing? Asked a little voice. He lifted his head to see a small boy in a blue coat with a red hat staring at him. I'm evaluating my life's decisions, he replied and went back to work on the snow angel. The kid watched him for a few minutes and then flopped into the snow next to him, 
making Drake miss his nephews and niece. A moment later, a hairy-looking mother stood between them. Her face was splotchy in a way that he didn't know if it was from the cold or from crying. Calter Buford Dixon, what on earth are you doing? She dug her fist into her hips, or where her hips would be if her coat wasn't so puffy. Value it in my life's decision, he replied. A laugh burst from Drake. Sorry, ma'am. He said as he carefully got out of his angel and then helped Calter Buford Dixon out and brushed him off. Seems I distracted him. You've nothing to be sorry about. She turned on Calter. You have chores to do. Clove came around the corner of the house with Felix on the lead rope. Being with the reindeer soothed her. He could relate to that. Felix held his head high and sniffed the air as he prance walked beside her. His movements were like a thoroughbred horse wanting to burst into a run. Calter's mouth fell open. He grabbed his mom's hand and tugged while pointing at Felix. Do you see it? He asked in a whisper, as if he were afraid of scaring Felix off. His mom turned to see what he was staring at. My Lanta, she exclaimed, tugging Calter behind her. Drake chuckled. He's pretty tame. Do you want to meet him? Felix spotted Calter and dragged Clove in their direction. She tugged on the rope. I do not want to talk to him, Felix. She ground out through her clenched teeth. Drake rolled his eyes. You're no picnic either, sweetheart, he called to her, cringing inside even as he said the words. What was wrong with him? If Clove heard him, she didn't respond which made him want to call her sweetheart again, just to see what she would do. Seeing her all flustered did something to him, something he liked but couldn't put a name to. Knowing reindeer had a soft spot for children, he motioned for them to come closer. Felix, come meet Coulter. Felix broke into a trot. Clove let go of the rope and threw her hands in the air. Drake stepped between Felix and their guests and jogged out to meet him, more for the mom's sake than anything. Once he had Felix's lead rope in hand, he walked him over to Coulter. This is Felix, he said proudly. His chest swelled, and he realized how proud he truly was of this reindeer. Felix had a beautiful rack, classic really. His pelt was shiny and healthy, and he had a great personality. Calter stepped forward and lifted a hand to Felix. Felix took his measure and then dipped until his nose brushed Felix's mitten. Calter giggled and Felix blew a raspberry. The spirit of Christmas that hung on children's laughter filled the air. Drake turned to look for Clove wanting to share this moment with her. Her eyes were soft as she watched Felix nip at Calter's coat with his lips, totally harmless and bringing giggles from deep within the child. Her eyes sparkled, and his breath caught. He'd thought she was beautiful before, but that was nothing compared to the moment her walls went down and he could see into her soul. Calter grabbed Felix's entire face in a hug. Felix froze, not wanting to hurt the little boy. I love you, Calter exclaimed. Clove's eyes misted over. Drake's heart made an impression of Tin Lords a-leaping. Clove's eyes met his, and the air crackled and popped and zinged. She turned away first. He continued to watch her, wondering if she would melt or turn back to ice. Chapter 10 Clove hugged herself in an effort to pull her thoughts and feelings back into proper alignment. One look from the reindeer thief, one charged, Christmas-induced, sweet look, and she'd let her walls tumble to the ground like a poorly constructed snow fort. Her eyes fell to the two snow angels in the snow and she snorted. Drake was no angel. He wasn't a devil either. No devil could make a child laugh like that, though Felix was doing most of the work. Drake seemed to understand the reindeer's nature and that it would be easy for him to interact with the child. Was that normal for a reindeer? Or was it just reindeer who could fly that took to children like that? Felix hadn't tried to talk to Calter, not like he communicated with her. Of course she'd had children come up to the cabin to see Felix before. She'd never allowed them so close without her right there. Maybe she should have given Felix more credit. Ugh. It ticked her off that Drake seemed to know more about her reindeer than she did. At the same time, she had so many questions. Was Felix an average flying reindeer? How would he measure up against others? Was there a way they could watch him fly? He usually disappeared above the trees and was gone. She'd never seen him stretch his figurative wings before, and she wanted to. Where did they keep the flying reindeer? She pictured an immense field with a chain-link fence over the top and trees growing through the links. Surely they didn't do that. It would be so suspicious. Then there was the whole Santa thing. 
she shoved those questions into the closet under the stairs of her brain where they belonged. There was no sense dragging out horrible memories when she didn't have to. Calter released Felix's face and stepped back. His mom grabbed his shoulder. We need to get home. I'm supposed to be at work. Calter kicked the ground. Sorry. Mom. She hugged him to her side. Come on, before Mr. McAllister realizes I'm not at his beck and call. She looked over the top of Calter and told Clove. I'm a virtual assistant. Clove smiled. That's a great way to be home with your kids and work. She nodded. Unless they sneak out to visit a reindeer. Clove chuckled. Well, if you're going to sneak out, Drake turned his head to the side to hide his smile. She didn't like that. Didn't like it at all. By Felix. Calter waved as long as he could. His new coat swished as he moved. Felix did a little hop and shook out his antlers in farewell. Once Calter and his mom were on their own front porch, she stroked Felix's neck. You did good, buddy. He let his tongue roll out, of course I did. She laughed and tucked it back in for him, wiping his slobber on her pant leg. Great, she grumbled. Problem? Drake asked. This is my only pair of pants, and I just swiped it with reindeer spit. She grabbed a handful of snow and rubbed it into the jeans. It didn't help. Isn't your house, like, an hour that way? He pointed west. She narrowed her eyes at him over Felix's back, grateful for the large animal between them. I'm not leaving you alone with Felix. W-H-Y. He sputtered. It's not like I can go anywhere without my trailer. Ha! Huh. She threw up an arm. You'd probably just jump on his back and ride him back to North Dakota and leave Grandma stranded here. He lifted one eyebrow. We don't normally ride reindeer. In fact, I've only met one woman daring enough to try it. Clove instantly hated her. Who, she demanded. Stella Kringle. Drake's soft smile and disbelieving shake of his head told her the Stella woman was special to him. The green-eyed monster had her hands in fists. Not only did she ride the reindeer, she did it with passengers, he said, as if confiding in her. Total respect. I'm sure Miss Kringle is waiting for you back at your ranch so you can just pack up, go home, and leave us alone. She took Felix by the halter and tugged. He huffed, easy. She let up on the pressure, but continued to encourage him away from Drake. Drake jogged to catch up with her, not even having the decency to be out of breath. Stella Kringle lives at the North Pole, so I'm pretty sure she's not in North Dakota. Whatever. She rolled her eyes. Drake stopped walking, and Felix stopped too, making her have to stop. She glanced over her shoulder and found Drake studying her his head tipped to the side in this cute I'm trying to figure you out angle. What, she looked down to make sure she didn't have pecan syrup all over herself from breakfast. I just told you the name of one of Santa's daughters and you didn't so much as blink. So, she spat. So, that's normally a conversation starter. He gave her a lopsided smile that made her heart flutter. She barely resisted pressing her hand over her ribs. I don't want to talk about Santa or his daughters. She folded her arms. Felix turned his head, I want to talk about them. Sure thing. Drake walked on the other side of the reindeer and the three of them started moving. They were walking where there should be a sidewalk. Felix was antsy in his pen and needed exercise and to see the world. He wasn't used to being in a box, one more reason he should not be at the ranch with Drake and his 18-foot-high chain-link fencing. You know, if they had that. She didn't know, and she certainly wasn't going to ask. Santa, or Harvey, as we call him, has five daughters. Ginger and her husband, Joseph, are currently the ones delivering gifts on Christmas Eve. She's smack dab in the middle of the five daughters and she wasn't planning on being Santa. Felix cocked his head, oh? Why not? Clove caught herself doing the same head motion as her reindeer and jerked her chin back to neutral. She did not care about these people elves. 
wasn't Santa a jolly old elf? She clamped her mouth tight, so the inquiry didn't slip past her lips. Because everyone thought it would be the oldest daughter, Robin. Robin. Stella. Ginger. That's three out of the five. She ran through possible names for the other two. Gumdrop? Rudolph? No, that was a reindeer. She hated herself for even thinking about this. She needed to zone Drake and his deep, captivating voice out completely. She tried to think of a song to sing in her head, but all that came to mind was Santa Claus is coming to town. This was so stupid. They reached a crossroads, and she turned them back. She'd originally planned to do three or four miles, just like they did at home, though she wore snowshoes for those hikes. Instead, they'd get in a mile, maybe a mile and a half. Once they were home, she'd make it up to Felix and do a loop around the entire lake. Fifteen miles in a day should make him happy. Robin didn't have the naughty and nice radar, although she knows what you need to feel better even before you do. There was this one time. I think I was fifteen years old, and I'd tried to kiss Susan Threadbare at the Fourth of July fireworks. I missed and Susan laughed. I went home feeling embarrassed and ashamed. The story suddenly got interesting, and Clove didn't even try to hide behind Felix. Her eyes dropped to Drake's lips, well what she could see of them in profile, since he looked ahead as he spoke. The Kringles spent their summers with us on the ranch back then. I think their parents hoped we'd all fall in love and keep everything in the family, you know? Didn't you? she blurted. Heaven help her, she was such a sucker for a romance story. Just because she hadn't had a good one of her own didn't mean she didn't like to hear, read, or watch them. He barely glanced at her out of the corner of his eye, which was a good thing. If he'd given her all his attention, she would have shrunk away. His brown eyes were too intense, too observant, too probing into her soul, thank you very much. Robin, who's older than me by a few years, met me on the porch with a cool glass of strawberry lemonade and a side hug. She assured me that it wouldn't be long before the girls lined up to kiss me. Coming from someone who was older and wiser and so pretty, I believed her. Clove harumphed. Of course you did. He and Felix chuckled. Women have a lot of power over us men. He turned then and their eyes met. Clove stopped walking, the connection between her brain and her feet frazzled by the electricity surging between her and Drake. Felix continued on, oblivious to what was going on inside of her. Drake stopped too, and soon there was nothing between them. What power, she whispered. He stepped into her space in one long-legged stride. He had to be over six feet tall because she tipped her head up to maintain eye contact. You don't know, he asked, his voice low and intimate and deeper than she'd heard it before. He bit the end of his glove and pulled it off his hand before feathering his finger across her nose. His hands were warm, and she fought the urge to lean into them. You have three freckles. She wrinkled her nose, and he smiled. His eyes crinkled at the corners. She wanted to reach up and smooth them out. I like them, he added. Thanks, she pressed out of her too tight rib cage. She couldn't get enough air to breathe. It all smelled like Drake's aftershave or cologne or body spray or whatever it was he used to torment her. He stepped back to put his glove back on. Cold rushed in to replace him, and she shivered. Felix had stopped several paces away and watched them with interest. She gulped, feeling bare in front of his knowing gaze. You didn't answer my question, she accused lightly. Drake shook his head. Oh, I answered. Her lips formed an O, but no sound came out. He walked up to Felix and patted his side. Make sure she gets home safe? Felix lifted a hoof and dropped it, yep. Clove stared after Drake, realizing after a moment that she was watching his backside. And what a nice view it was. Rolling her eyes at herself, she managed to rip herself away and turn back around. They'd get that four miles in today, after all. Felix caught up with her and bumped her, he totally answered you. Yeah. Yeah. She lightly shoved him. Not one more word, reindeer. 
He lifted his chin and looked away from her. Clove drew in a breath. She wasn't sure what to think about Drake. He came off as this ultra-confident bad boy who could get away with kidnapping a reindeer and her grandma, invade her personal space, like her freckles, and tame her reindeer in a way she couldn't. Yet his story spoke of a slightly awkward teen, and the snow angel with Coulter said he was still a kid at heart. Who was he really? Don't even think about trying to figure him out, she warned herself. Darn it all if Drake wasn't one of the worst things on the planet. He was interesting. That was hard to come by in her neck of the woods. Heck, interesting things were hard to come by in her life. She liked it that way. Except now. Now she may not be able to go back to her cabin and live the quiet life she'd so carefully constructed. Drake's brand of mystery man wouldn't get out of her head. It didn't matter if she spent twenty years alone in the woods, she'd always wonder. Well, shoot, she mumbled, because the only way she was going to figure this out was to ask all her questions. Once she satiated her need for answers, she'd be able to let him go and not look back. How hard could it be to figure out a man, anyway? Chapter 11 Drake made his way back to Otis's shop to see if he'd been able to tow the trailer yet. Going back to the band B meant talking to Hannah and Judy. While the women were full of holiday cheer, Hannah overly excited about the chance to save Christmas. He couldn't sit by the fireplace and hang out when there was so much to do. Movement, work, and solving problems with his own two hands would do his nerves a lot of good. That moment in the snow with Clove so close he could have kissed her was illuminating. She'd been pretty, gorgeous, really, from the moment he'd laid eyes on her. She was also every bit the cantankerous woman who threatened to put a restraining order on him if he didn't stop calling her about Felix. But there was a wink of time when he'd seen past her walls and his heart opened up to wrap around hers, claiming her. All of her. The soft parts that loved Felix and Hannah and the prickle parts that pushed him away. He chuckled happily thinking of her kicking snow on him in frustration. At least he'd gotten a reaction out of her. Maybe not the one he wanted but a reaction, nonetheless. Or, maybe it was what he needed at the moment. Kissing her would have overwhelmed him and not allowed him time to process everything. He still hadn't processed it. He did that best when his hands were busy. Therefore, he needed to get to work. Otis's shop was made of thick wooden beams overlaid with gray sheets of metal, heavily insulated on the inside, and finished with unpainted plywood walls and tons of homemade two-by-four shelves. It was like a lot of mechanic-slash-welding-slash-wood shops in his hometown where farmers knew everything from diesel mechanics to soil pH and needed the equipment to do it all themselves. An oversized garage door took up half of one wall. A dump truck could fit through there, and probably had, which worked out well for Drake because the stock trailer was taller than the average vehicle. Projects cluttered the corners. He used the term projects lightly, as it was unlikely Otis would have or make the time to finish them. If he had children, they'd end up hauling most of this to the scrapyard after he died. Pax kept their welding shop clean. He couldn't stand to have things half-finished. If you started something, you'd better finish it or he would. He'd park the stock trailer inside. A wood-burning stove, sitting on a bed of cinder blocks, blazed in the corner away from combustible materials. It baked the chill off and made it possible to work without coats. Drake removed his and laid it on an old metal desk that had paint thick enough to keep it from rusting for a thousand years. He cuffed his hoodie sleeves. Do you need gloves? Otis called from under the trailer. His overall-clad legs and work boots stuck out. Three jacks kept the trailer up high enough for him to work. Drake checked their placement and the stability. Good job. I have some in the tack room. He went there and found leather work gloves, tucking them into his back pocket. Moving around the trailer, he squatted next to Otis's legs. What's the verdict? Otis wiggled out. He'd cut open a cardboard box and laid it down on the oil-stained concrete floor. His dark blue overalls wore thin at the knees and his heavy flannel shirt had a hole in the shoulder and dark stains. You're in luck. We can take this piece off and get her straightened out today. That was a lot of work to do in five hours. But if Otis thought they could accomplish it, then he was game to try. He'd mentally prepared himself for a week in Windy Plains, with two days of welding on this section alone. That's great. Don't get too happy on me. The axle is another story. We'll have to clean off all the rust, fabricate a new wheel disc, and weld them together. I don't suppose you have a new axle just lying around here, do you? He craned his neck to look around. 
Christmas miracles happened all the time. Wasn't he due for one right about now? Scratch that. His motives might be in the right place, but his deeds didn't line up with a few of the big Ten Commandments. Otis chuckled. Nope. Drake's hopes fell like sleet with a vengeance on a cold winter night. I didn't think so. But I have enough metal that we can fabricate one. Shouldn't take me more than a few hours. Drake considered him. Really? Just a few hours. Otis nodded, scrubbing at an oil stain on his pant leg as if it would come off with a bit of spit shine and was much more interesting than whatever Drake wanted to talk about. Fabricating parts was precise work that required a lot of training and even more skill. If Otis could do that, then his time was worth a lot more money than the deal they'd made on a handshake. Drake felt humbled by his obvious gift. He didn't know Drake from Adam, and yet he spent his time before the holiday getting him back on the road. Rather than embarrass the man by gushing with gratitude, Drake clapped him on the back. Let's get started. They began by removing parts. Drake deferred to Otis, taking instruction and doing what he was told. Grunting, sweating, and muscling heavy things freed his mind to concentrate on other things. He continually went back to Clove and the entrance to her heart, wondering how he could get inside. She had it locked up tighter than Santa's workshop. His next thought was why he would even want to try. Nothing could happen between them. They lived in different states, and he had no intention of becoming romantically involved long-term with any female. Still, he sensed she needed someone she could count on, and a part of him wanted to be that man. Could he do that and not be more to her? A bigger question was, could he be her Superman without falling in love with her? When his puzzler became too puzzled to puzzle over her more, he applied his problem-solving skills to the broken grandfather dog sled in Otis's dreams. Drake grunted as he lifted a section of metal to the work table. Are there any rules about sled construction? Like what it's made of or the shape? Otis's face turned red with effort and a bead of sweat dripped down the side of his face. Nope. He dropped his side onto the table and Drake pushed with his legs to get a section on far enough the whole thing wouldn't topple to the floor. It made an unholy sound as it scraped the work table and he cringed. Then I think we should reinforce the claw break with steel. It won't add that much weight, but it'll give you more control. He swiped his forehead. Otis ambled to a shelf and retrieved two welding masks. He handed one to Drake. Good idea. They continued to take things apart until the trailer was a sad-looking shell on cinder blocks. Otis pulled the concrete blocks out of all sorts of places, causing Drake to wonder if what looked like chaos to him was actually a form of organization. Otis went to a dorm-like fridge and pulled out a couple of sodas. He handed one to Drake. Drake accepted the drink, wanting to protest against pausing when there was still daylight. But he was at Otis's mercy and didn't want to push the man too far. He already looked like he'd be sleeping in menthol cream tonight. He popped the top and let the fizz settle before taking a sip. Feeling restless, he moved to the sled and pulled the cover all the way off. He used his phone to make a punch list. Then he listed the parts and supplies he needed to get it done. Otis gave the sled a good shake. Grandpa built it right. I don't work much with wood though. Metal's my thing. His phone rang and he answered. We have a couple more hours. Yep. Yep. Bye. He hung up. Dinner will be on the table at six. I gotta quit then or the missus will have my hide. Drake laughed and lifted his soda can. That's why I'm staying single. Otis dribbled soda down his chin as he stared at Drake like he'd grown a fur coat. You don't want to get married? Drake shook his head. I'm the king of my castle. Why did that sound so hollow when he said it in front of Otis? When he gloated to his brothers about leaving the toilet seat up, he always felt strong and somehow superior to their puppy love. Otis waved his can. What about the lady you've been hanging around town with? She's just a... His voice caught, and he had to clear his throat. We're friends. Sort of. I mean, she kicked snow on me today, so I don't know if I can claim friendship. He chuckled again at goading her. Why did he like getting a rise out of her so much? Otis shook his head in disappointment. Drake squirmed. He didn't like the feeling of deficiency that slithered up his spine. He'd chosen the single life on purpose. He liked it. He didn't need to excuse himself or his choices. Did you want me to check the tanks before we get started? He wandered to the two army-grade C-25 cylinders. Throwing back the rest of his soda, Otis crushed the can and tossed it into a metal garbage, where it clanged against the side before settling. Don't want to be late for my home-cooked pork roast and potatoes. He smirked at Drake, rubbing in that he'd have a good meal tonight. Joke was on him. Judy promised to have dinner ready when he got back to the Banby. He was about to point that out when Otis added, 
can't wait to hold a warm lady close tonight. It's supposed to get down to 27 degrees. Hope you have an extra blanket. He said blanket like a white elephant gift no one wanted. Drake smirked in return. Having four older brothers taught him to hold back once in a while. He stood back and took a picture of the sled. He sent it to Pax with a text that read, Restoration ideas? Pax, call me in a couple of hours. We'll talk. Drake wrinkled his nose as if he'd stepped in reindeer poop. He tucked his phone away and went to work. True to his promise, they had the axle ready for installation before the dinner bell rang. He and Otis said goodbye, and Drake called Pax on his way back to the band B. Merry Christmas, Pax, he said when his brother picked up. Ho, 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 Pax replied. Where are you? Small town, Montana. He replied quickly. I'm waiting on a repair and told a guy I'd help him fix up his sled. Pax was the one who designed and built their flying sleigh. It was made from lighter weight metals and woods and painted Christmas green. Every year one of them dressed up like St. Nick and rode through town in the red sleigh pulled by a non-flying reindeer, bells jingling. It was a lot of fun for the kids to look out their window and see Santa drive by. Pax sighed. Look, we're all upset about things, but now we're worried about you, too. Drake smacked his gloves against his thigh. Well, don't. Okay. Pax was full of sarcasm. Yeah, we'll just cut off caring about you altogether as easy as turning off a faucet. Why didn't I think of that? Grinch. Drake pulled his shoulders back. Look, I'm in the middle of something that's going to be big for the family. I want it to be a surprise. It already is. You should have seen us when you didn't show up for work. Surprise. You know what? Drake stalked to the tool shelves and grabbed a hammer, not even sure why. He shoved it back in place. I covered for you when you took off to California. That was a planned vacation. You knew six months before I left that I was going. Pax shouted now. So, are you mad that I'm gone? That I left without telling you? Or that you had to do extra work? All the above. Plus, you're missing the cookie party. That took the bluster out of him. The cookie decorating party was another big tradition in their family. They both breathed heavily. If this argument took place in person, they'd be wrestling on the barn floor by now. Are you going to help me or not? Drake growled. Not. Pax hung up on him. Drake stared at his phone. Well, that's a fine how do you do. He tucked his phone into his pocket. He'll be eating his words when I pull up with Felix in the trailer. For a minute, he contemplated calling one of his other brothers, but it was unlikely that he'd get a better response from any of them. His family loved each other fiercely at times. If any of his brothers had taken off like he did, he'd be ticked at them too. The anger drained out of him. He rummaged around the shop and piled spare parts up next to the sled. It took him an hour to do what Pax could have done in 10 minutes, but whatever. At least he could make progress and avoid Chloe for the rest of the day. By the time he turned the lights off in the shop and shut the door, it was dark outside. That wasn't saying much. It got dark at 4.30 in the afternoon in these parts. He tucked his hands into his winter work gloves and trudged back to the bed and breakfast. The lights were on in the house, and Christmas lights wrapped around the porch railing. Those decorations hadn't been there when they checked in. Maybe Judy decided to spruce things up because she had paying customers. He stepped into the smell of beef stew and homemade rolls. His spirits instantly lifted. There you are. Hannah called from a rocker by the fireplace. Her hands flew as she knitted away at the candy cane blanket. We were starting to wonder if you'd gotten lost out there. He glanced around and didn't find anyone else in the room. We? Huh? He teased her lightly as he shucked his shoes and set them on the rubber mat. The snow would melt there without leaving a mess on the hardwood floors. Hannah watched him, her hands not even slowing down. I might have had a conversation with Judy and Clove over dinner. Drake perked up. Now this I have to hear. He plopped onto the couch next to her and set his chin on his fist. Serve the tea. Tea? She asked. He chuckled. It means give me all the gossip. You know, like women do over a cup of tea. Hannah squared her shoulders. I don't gossip. But I will tell you that you're making quite the impression on people around here. People or a person? He lifted one eyebrow in question. Hannah regarded him. Are you interested in one person in particular? He had to tread lightly here. I'm interested in talking a certain someone into letting me take Felix to North Dakota without a fight, if that's what you mean. It's not at all what I mean. Hannah's eyes danced. I'm not old, but I ain't in the spring of life anymore and I'd like to see Clove with a family of her own. She needs roots. Drake shook his head. What was with people wanting to marry him off today? I'm not the man for the job. Trust me. Confirmed bachelor. 
He pointed his thumb at his chest. Hannah burst out laughing. There's no such thing. Drake leaned back. With all due respect, people say the same thing about flying reindeer, ma'am. Hannah's joy didn't recede one bit at his logic. And we can both prove them wrong every day of the week. She stopped to undo a knot in her yarn. I'm not going to push tonight because you're hungry and a man with an empty stomach is as dangerous as a grizzly just out of hibernation. Drake couldn't argue with that. Maybe you should have asked Pax if he was hungry before he argued with him. All I'm going to say is that you'll never be the man you want to be until you find your better half. Drake scowled. You're saying I need a woman to make me a better man? That's exactly what I'm saying. It's not a knockdown. It's a fact. She bobbed her head once, making her soft gray hair sway around her face. Drake pushed to his feet. I'm going to the kitchen. Hopefully, there were leftovers. Hannah waved him off. Judy left the slow cooker on. You should have plenty. She's such a dear. Drake nodded and left, more than ready to have all the marriage advice and nagging done for the day. He pushed through the swinging door to the kitchen and practically attacked the slow cooker. Soft footfalls landed on the stairs, and he groaned. Can I just get a minute of peace? He growled. Clove stopped, one foot on the bottom stair and one on the floor. She wore ridiculous onesie pajamas and hot pink and had her hair in a messy bun on top of her head. Sheesh. I just need a glass of water and then I'll be out of your way. He fumbled with the spoon. She looked adorable, and that wasn't a word in his regular vocabulary. Her freshly washed face shined and her cheeks were rosy, making him wonder if all her skin turned that color after a hot shower. Her big blue eyes grew guarded in an instant, and he doubly regretted his outburst. Sorry. It's been a day. She didn't say anything as she went to the sink. With her back to him, he caught sight of the trap door to the goofy pajama set. He shoveled a spoonful of stew into his mouth to cover his snort of laughter. Nice pajamas, he managed to get out. Clove lifted her chin. Thank you. I'm rather fond of them, as they were a gift. Oh. He lifted his eyebrows, encouraging her to go on. She sighed, as if discussing this with him was a torment she had to get through. I didn't pack a bag in the only store in town with clothing his feed and seed. My thermals needed to be washed and Judy, so kindly, handed over this beautiful set of fully-footed pajamas, because, and I quote, they're too long for her elf-like legs. He chuckled as he glanced down at Clove's long and beautiful legs. Even under all that fabric, he could see her beautiful shape, and he hated himself for noting it. That would be a problem, he croaked. The tags said that they came from the home shopping network. Clove plucked the fabric between her fingers. By now and beat the holiday rush, these slightly itchy, mummy-worthy bodysuits won't last long, she said in a fake announcer's voice. How's the stew? He moaned in pleasure. So good. He took another bite and then another. Relax there, big guy. No one's going to take it from you. She smirked. He lifted his bowl closer to his chin, letting the warm steam brush over his cold nose and cheeks. I have a few flannel shirts I can loan you. The idea of Clove wearing his clothes did that thing to him again the thing he couldn't name but really liked. He felt taller and stronger and like he should strut around the house or crow like a rooster. It was stupid, but true, and he wished he didn't feel that way when she was near. What he'd told Otis and Hannah was true. He didn't want to get married. He didn't want a woman in his life, making things difficult that didn't need to be. She tucked a stray piece of hair behind her ear. Normally, I'd tell you to take your clothes and toss them in the lake, but I'm in kind of situation here, so thank you. Will you make me cookies in return for my kindness? He asked hopefully. She laughed, the sound like Christmas music in a tree lot, bright and cheerful. I'm serious. My family has a sugar cookie decorating party every year and I'm missing it. He set the empty bowl down, not having tasted the last three bites. You can always go home without the trailer, she sing-songed as she made her way to the stairs. Without the trailer. Without Felix. Without her. It shouldn't bother him if she wanted to stay. But somewhere in this conversation the image of her on the ranch, her blonde hair hanging loose down her back and the winter sun hitting all the highlights, had crept into his consciousness. He wanted her to see his cabin. He'd seen hers, she should visit him and see what a great job he did building it. Clove stopped. What? No snappy comeback? He pushed all thoughts of her barefooted on his living room rug as far away as they would go, which meant they were on the nearest shelf in his brain. He drew himself up. It's been a rough day. I think I'll hit the sack. He rinsed his bowl and the now empty ceramic liner for the slow cooker and put them in the dishwasher, checked for soap, and then started it. 
She watched him as if waiting for the punchline. He met her at the stairs, but she didn't turn and go ahead of him. Instead, she put her arm out to stop him from going by. Not that he could. The space was impossibly small with the two of them in it. Had this house been built to code? Or was it built for someone as small as Judy and he and Clove happened to be giants in her world? This close, he could smell the soap and lavender shampoo she used. The scent calmed him at the same time it brought to mind, nuzzling her neck and pressing kisses to her flushed skin. Why was it a rough day? She asked softly. Maybe it was the kindness in her voice, or perhaps he just needed someone to carry part of his load. But he told her, I disappointed Otis, I fought with my brother, and I got a lecture from Hannah. He dropped his eyes to her covered feet and wondered if she painted her toenails. I'm trying to do my best, and it never seems good enough. His shoulders hung heavy, the weight of the world sitting on them. Clove's forehead wrinkled. Did you try to rob a bank or something? He huffed a humorous laugh. If only. At least then I'd have a pile of gold bars. Her hand flew to her mouth to hold back her laughter. What? He asked, feeling a surge of energy from the merriment dancing in her eyes. His fingers itched to touch the slight crinkles in the corners. She swallowed and pulled her hand away, forcing a serious expression. I mean, if you're going to rob a bank, I don't recommend stealing gold bars. Why not? He drew his eyebrows down. They're perfect because you can melt them down, remove the serial numbers, and then sell them. You've contemplated this crime before, I see. She tipped her head from side to side as she considered his logic. I think I'd go for cash. Easy to spend. Easy to hide in a mattress. Easy to trace. He tickled her side. You'd be in jail before the end of your first shopping spree. She squealed and jumped up a step. And you'd be caught on your way out the door because there's no way you're running from the police with a hundred pounds of gold bars. She mind lumbering along with her arms full. He tickled her again, wanting more than anything to make her laugh. She did, her smile stretching across her face and lighting up his world. Stop. She yelped off balance and fell into him her hands resting on his upper chest. The air grew thicker, heavier, and charged. He could touch metal and make a spark, or maybe just touch her. Suddenly, the horrible parts of his day melted away. His eyes dropped to her lips, level with his since she stood a stare above. His heart rate kicked up and his palm warmed where it rested on her side. She stepped up one more tread. I, uh, should check my laundry. He nodded slowly, not quite trusting his voice. His tongue was dense and sluggish. He moved up a stair, drawn after her in a way he couldn't explain. She shifted her hands, and he steeled himself for her touch, anticipating her fingers in his hair and the soothing it would bring to his frazzled mind. She suddenly dropped her arms and dashed up the steps. He dropped his chin to his chest, feeling the loss of her body heat in the small staircase immediately. He'd let her have a head start and put all the space between them she needed. He needed it, too. He retreated to the kitchen and took a long drink of water. His throat was parched, but he didn't feel like the failure who had walked into the kitchen. Nope. Clove's laughter had flipped a switch inside of him. He felt whole again. Weird, he said out loud before cautiously making his way upstairs to take a shower and change. Just because he felt better didn't mean it was because of Clove. Right? He could have had the same conversation with Judy, Hannah, or Otis, and he'd feel better. He'd laughed. Laughter was medicine. Wasn't that what people said? He ran his hand through his hair. Okay, maybe Judy wouldn't have the same effect on him. He doubted either Otis or Hannah would have made his heart prance like a reindeer during the first snowfall of the season. It was possible he was attracted to Clove. Heck, he'd noticed how pretty she was the first time they met. And her laughter? Gorgeous. So, yeah. His spirits would lift when a pretty woman laughed. It didn't have to be a big deal unless he made it a big deal, which he would not. Definitely would not encourage his little crush to grow. Nope. No watering the seeds. That wasn't his style. It took a ten-minute shower, getting dressed again, checking on Felix, and then tossing in bed for a good forty minutes before he was ready and capable enough to ignore the feelings Clove planted inside of him. That was all. He had his slight fascination with Clove under control and he wouldn't slip up again. Chapter 12 Clove pressed her palm against the wall where the pipes rushed with water for Drake's shower, wanting to have a connection with him that was safe. Touching the wall that touched the pipe that brought the water that filled the shower was about as safe as she was going to get while living in the same house. And yet, it was almost more than she could handle. He was more than she could handle. 
It wasn't like he was trying to seduce her or anything of the sort. He didn't drop a cheesy pickup line or smolder at her with his dark earth-colored eyes. He teased. He verbally prodded her into frustration. He laughed, a sound that was warm and melodious, like a bass choir humming. He tickled, and she was so very ticklish. No one had bothered to tickle her for a long time though, and she felt this untapped pleasure inside of herself that he'd somehow stumbled upon her giggle button. That sounded so childish, but it was true. She didn't get to be a child when she was one. No wonder she enjoyed it so much now. Learning about herself, seeing things inside of her that she hadn't before, all this was because of Drake. The experience was under a microscope intense and she'd run away, charged up the stairs, desperate to get away from the sparks pulsing between them. The sense of freedom and letting go was too strong, too much for her to stay there and experience any longer. Once she'd hidden in her room, she replayed the scene over and over again. He'd stared at her lips as if they were gumdrops he wanted to nibble on. She touched them with her fingertips. They tingled in anticipation of a kiss that would never happen. She was not here to kiss a thief, a kidnapper, a reindeer wrangler, or any other side of Drake he decided to show her. But she wanted to. She'd wanted it at that moment, and she wanted it now. The sensations Drake stirred inside of her made her want to climb out of her own body and fly through the star-filled sky like Felix. Who was Drake to make her feel this way? He wasn't anything special. Just a man full of contradictions. He justified kidnapping and yet made snow angels. He argued with her and yet made her giggle with abandon. He dressed like a cowboy and tamed reindeer. What even was a reindeer wrangler, anyway? She'd never heard of the job title until him. He probably made it up to impress women. The water cut off and her brain conjured up the image of Drake in a towel, water dripping off his wide shoulders. She dropped her head back and moaned. This was so. Not. Good. She needed to get her mind off of Drake and onto something productive. But what? It wasn't like there was anything to do in this small town, nor in this house. At the cabin, there was always a project. The beeswax lotion bars and face creams would keep her busy for several nights. If only she had her supplies. Grandma brought her knitting, but there was no way Clove would ask for lessons. She'd tried several times and was all pinkies when it came to yarn and needles. They said there was no knot that couldn't be undone but she'd prove them all wrong and then some. There was a wall of puzzles and board games and books downstairs, but she didn't want to be caught by Drake again. She wasn't ready to face him and the feelings he shook up like a snow globe. She felt rather helpless against them, especially when he'd tickled her side. She couldn't remember the last time she'd been tickled. It felt forbidden and silly and like she was young and free of all the adult worries that plagued her since she was eight and dad dropped her on grandma's doorstep. Before that, actually. As one of them had to be an adult and it wasn't going to be her father. She grabbed her phone and looked up the Reindeer Wrangler Ranch social media. Drake's brothers filled the feed she could tell they were related by the shape of their eyes and the width of their shoulders. Were they all built like that? Sheesh. Working a ranch did a body good. Hey reindeer fans, chirped a beautiful young woman in a red pea coat and cream hat. Her thick mittens matched the hat, and she smiled widely. I wanted to take you out for a morning feeding. We're going to speed things up. I hope you enjoy it as much as the reindeer do. What followed was a time-lapse of a wrangler loading feed onto the back of a flatbed trailer, driving through an open gate, stopping to shut the gate, and then driving through the field, dropping feet off the back of the truck. Everything was set to the Beach Boys version of Little Saint Nick. There were shots of the woman smiling and waving from the driver's seat, the wrangler pretending to surf in the back of the truck, and reindeer chewing their food or prancing across the field. She sighed. The scene was so happy. So content. The video ended with the man holding mistletoe over his head as he stole a kiss from his giggling wife. He looked like Drake, but a little lighter in coloring. His eyes were different too, hazel instead of Drake's intense brown. 
A soft smile graced her lips, and she spent the next half hour watching as many reindeer videos as possible, trying to catch a glimpse of this family of handsome men and the women who charmed them. The next video featured his parents. His mom had long, gray hair pulled back into a ponytail. Her smiles included both upper and lower teeth and her laugh lines were like ornaments on a Christmas tree, they added to her natural beauty. His dad had a full Santa beard and a large face. His shoulders sloped with age, but his blue eyes sparkled. He wore a cream-colored felt hat and a denim coat lined with fleece. Ho ho ho, he chuckled, his voice like hot cocoa on a cold day. Welcome to Reindeer Wrangler Ranch. We're the only ranch in North America with permits to house this breed of reindeer and we couldn't be prouder of our herd," added his mom. Her name appeared in the lower right corner and Clove squinted to see. Anna. That was a pretty name, and it fit her perfectly. We had a banner year of births and are up to 350 head this year, said Abner. Clove paused the video and studied him. Abner seemed nice. Soft and yet tough. Like the type of man who was humbled by working the land and knowing he was at the mercy of nature and God. She restarted the video and watched Abner closely. Then she did it again. With each viewing, she liked him more. Which was silly. She didn't know the man. She knew his son, though, kind of. When that video was over, she looked for others that featured Abner, obsessed with the notion of a father who stuck around and raised his children and found one during the herd's annual vaccines. He joked with a reindeer named Apples, doing a dance with her. If we could get you two to learn one of the TikTok dances we'd have a viral video, said the voice behind the camera. It sounded like Mitzi, the same woman who did the video about the morning feeding with her husband. Abner laughed heartily, holding his belly. Maybe I could get them to do a conga line. He turned in front of Apples and started walking. Da 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 da. Apples followed behind, sniffing his pockets where he kept the reindeer treats. When he kicked a leg out, she stopped and looked at him like he was crazy. Clove could practically hear the reindeer say, You're losing it, old man, and she laughed. If Drake's family was half as fun and half as happy as they seemed, then it was no wonder he was desperate to save their ranch and way of life. Not to mention, there was something wonderful about Abner. What would it be like to have a father like that, she mused. For some reason, she thought Abner would be on her side about this whole kidnapping Felix thing. She could probably call him, and he'd chew Drake out for putting her and her family through this. Calling wasn't even a temptation. Because she liked Drake. She liked how he treated Felix with respect and care. She'd watched him this morning as he brushed Felix like a horse, laying compliments on him like snowflakes accumulating on the sidewalk. Felix practically preened under the attention and stretched under the curry comb like a cat leaning into a good scratch. She knew he was a little vain, but had no idea he wanted so much praise. He stood taller after Drake left, holding his head high. Had she stifled him all this time because she didn't flatter him? Ruined his self-esteem because she didn't understand how to nourish it? Drake was also respectful and kind to Grandma. She couldn't enter a building or a room or exit a vehicle without him holding the door and offering his hand to steady her. He'd carried her luggage into the band B. And Clove had a strong suspicion that it wasn't Drake's idea for Grandma to come along with Felix on this expedition and yet he'd allowed it. Then there was the way he played with Calter, the little boy from next door. Some men talked down to children or encouraged them to move along. Not Drake. He'd accepted Calter's presence, talked to him like an adult, and made him feel important. Grandma came into the room carrying a glass of water. She liked to have one by her bed at night because the wood-burning stove back in the cabin sucked the moisture out of the air. They had a pot that they kept on the stove, filled with water to steam, but they didn't leave it on overnight because it would dry out and ruin the pan and could cause a fire. This house had a regular furnace, but old habits die hard. You look like you're thinking too hard. Grandma set the glass down and opened the nightstand to find her pajamas. Clove hit her phone under the covers and leaned back against the headboard. I have a lot to think about. 
Like what? Grandma sat down and picked up her brush. She liked to brush her hair 100 times each night, said it soothed her nerves. Clove wasn't sure how to share her thoughts without giving away too much. If Grandma so much as sniffed her interest in Drake, she'd throw the two of them together in as many awkward ways as possible. Do you remember during harvest time when Pastor Tom talked about knowing someone by their fruits? The fruit sermon, as the congregation dubbed it, was an annual one. He didn't repeat many sermons, however, Easter and Christmas were always variations of the same message. That was to be expected. In the spring, he'd give the seed sermon, talking about planting the word in your heart. In the fall he did the fruits and a couple weeks later he'd talk about the harvest. She enjoyed the repetition and reminders. They were comforting and a good chance to gauge her progress from the last time she'd heard the message. I do. Grandma nodded. What do you do when the fruits are mixed? She plucked at the front of the bright pink pajamas, wondering what Drake thought of her dressed like Dolly Parton's biggest fan. What do you mean? She stroked the brush through her hair at an even pace. I mean, what if someone has both rotten fruit and good fruit on their branches? How do you tell what is real? She gulped back the emotions that tightened her throat, not even sure why she was emotional over this topic. It was all Drake's fault. He had her tied up in knots, wanting to kick his shins one moment and snuggle into his rather impressive chest the next. If she'd never witnessed for herself the many muscles he contained in a flannel shirt, she could have died in contented bliss. Now that she knew they were there, she would have to be content with the memory of the warmth of them against her palms. Grandma chuckled. I suppose we all have some of both. Clove's mouth opened, but no words came out. She hadn't considered her own branches and fruit. Grandma glanced at her gaping mouth and then explained. I can be a little cantankerous when the occasion calls for it." Clove snorted. A little? Grandma gave her a sharp look. You're no picnic all the time either. She clamped her lips shut. We're works in progress, dear. She stood, gathering her things for a shower as she talked. We're going to have rotten fruit, that's what Jesus is for. We're going to have good fruit as we become like him. Don't judge people just by the rotten fruit. Take in the entire tree. She stopped to kiss Clove on the head, leaving behind a hint of the fireplace and softening the lecture. Clove smiled in return. She was right. Of course, she was right. Just like a tree, no one was done growing. Maybe Drake had more good fruit than bad fruit on his tree. Grandma left and she pulled the phone out from under the blanket. She glanced at her phone. Abner smiled back at her. What would make a man raised by this guy want to kidnap a reindeer? Love. Love for his dad, whose eyes were sunken in and whose shirt hung on his shoulders as if he'd lost weight. She set the phone aside and climbed into bed. She'd crashed the trailer trying to protect her loved ones. Maybe Drake's kidnapping was along those same lines. Heck, if she had a family like his, she'd do anything to protect them. She and Drake weren't that different. The thought was unsettling for two reasons. One, she didn't like seeing her faults in someone else because they stood out and couldn't be ignored. Was it wrong to do something like steal a truck and trailer when her motives were good? Probably. The Big Ten didn't have amendments or clauses or footnotes. Thou shalt not was pretty darn clear. Yet she jumped in that cab and hit the gas without a second thought. Two, having things in common with Drake meant that they could find common ground when it came to Felix. Maybe she could give a little, and he could give a lot, and they'd find a place where they were both happy. Yeah. And she'd dress up as Mrs. Claus this Christmas and hand out candy canes. She turned off her lamp and closed her eyes tight. Tomorrow would be a much better time to listen to Drake's side of things, he'd already pulled and pushed herself to think differently, to see him in a better light, and her mind stretched out like taffy. Tomorrow she'd talk to Drake and see if she could be different. Chapter 13 Schnitzel. Drake cursed and jumped back. The chrome trim crashed to the ground, barely missing his boots. He scowled at it. He happened to like these boots. 
They were a composite toe and nice leather. He'd paid good money for them, and a slice in the leather would have ruined them forever. The image of Pax's boots, covered in duct tape just for that reason, flashed through his mind. His brother thought the solution was genius, not caring that he looked like a homeless man even though his boots were in a pristine condition under all that silver tape. Otis wasn't feeling well today. He had a migraine or something, and so he'd hold up in his house. His wife, a nice woman in an ugly Christmas apron, told Drake he was free to use the shop if he still wanted to work. Of course, he still wanted to work. He had a deadline. Christmas Eve wasn't going to wait around for him to get home. He'd already missed the cookie party. The awful door squeak scraped through the air, and he jerked his head in that direction, his chest filling with hope that Otis had miraculously recovered and come out to help. It wasn't Otis. It was Clove. The strangest thing happened. Instead of his heart plummeting to the ground with disappointment, it lifted a little higher and fluttered like a bluebird. Or was it a new bird? Why did he hear music? He shook his head and stared back down at the chrome. He'd gotten the dent out of it as much as possible and just wanted to put it back in place to cover the dent in the body. Oh, man. Clove came around the trailer and picked her way through the pieces spread all over the place. He and Otis weren't exactly tidy in their project. I didn't do all that, did I? Drake allowed a half-smile to form. You're a lot more destructive than you think. She whacked his stomach with the back of her hand. Ha, huh. ha, huh. ha, huh. she deadpanned. What's the plan today? She towed the chrome as if it would spring to life at her touch. He sighed. Setbacks and irritation. She huffed a laugh at his sarcasm. I'll help. You? He had her up and down, not lingering on any wonderful curve of her body, but not skipping over them either. She didn't want to spend more than five minutes in his presence, and now she wanted to work with him? That didn't make sense. Maybe she was softening toward him. Then again, maybe she wanted out of windy plains, and this was her way of speeding things along. He wished he knew her motivation. Yes, me. I'm a homesteader. I got skills. She took off her coat and tossed it over his on the metal desk. His chest expanded at the sight of his flannel shirt, rolled up to accommodate her shorter arms and tied at her waist. He never wanted it back. Nope. She could wear it every day for all he cared. Where should I start? He waved to the trailer. Take the big dent. He checked his grin, waiting to see what she would do. She ran her hand over the dent and then glanced toward the back of the trailer, where the door hung open. Spinning around, she grabbed a small sledgehammer, the head the size of his fist. Wait, what are you doing? He held up both hands as if trying to stop shoppers from rushing a store on Black Friday. I'm helping. She went around him and disappeared inside. A moment later, a clang rang through the building and reverberated through his head. He grabbed both sides of his skull to stop the ringing. Maybe that's how Otis got his migraine. Clove? The only answer was another loud clang followed by three smaller but nonetheless disturbing thumps. He covered his ears. He zeroed in on where the sound originated and noticed that the bump in the trailer wasn't so bumpy anymore. She was pounding out the dent and doing a decent job of it from what he could see. She kept at it for about five more minutes and then came out of the tack room, dusting off her palms and swinging the sledgehammer like she had a home run. How's it look out here? He ran his hand over the surface. Not bad. Not as smooth as it was before the dent, but a whole lot better. She grinned. I bet the chrome will fit now. Shall we? He watched her out of the corner of his eye as they lifted the lightweight metal and put it in place. She hadn't called him a thief, yelled at him for anything, or argued, and he wasn't sure what to do about it. She pressed her hip against it to help steady it. Okay. I've got it. Can you screw it in? He jumped to work. He hadn't had to ask her to hold it in place. She seemed to know what needed to be done. He put in four placeholder screws, as his dad called them, so she could let go. They held the weight of the sheet. She grabbed the container of screws and handed him one at a time as he went down the row of pre-drilled holes. Thanks, he said when they were done. You're welcome. What's next? She closed the box and placed it on the shelf where a couple dozen other screw boxes resided in no particular order. He scrubbed the back of his neck. I hadn't planned to get that far today. He gave a self-depreciating chuckle and explained about Otis's migraine. That's too bad. She tucked her fingers into her front pockets and lifted onto her toes. Well, it's not like there's much to do at the band B and I'm used to being active, so, understanding how she felt about needing to move, to stay busy, he scrambled for something they could work on together. Can you weld? She twisted her lips. I'm not bad, but I'm no pro. It'll look like a DIY project. Hmm, 
He couldn't bring the trailer home in less than perfect shape. Pax would have his head. Then he'd take it all apart and put it back together again. Which would irk Drake to no end because Pax acted like he could do everything better than Drake. He didn't want to send Clove away, and he didn't want to relegate her to the sidelines while he welded. There was something satisfying about working alongside her, like that was the way it was always meant to be. The dog sled. He moved to that area of the workshop. The cargo bed needs glue in all the connections. He grabbed the handles and shook the sled while Clove looked at the places where the wood dowels went into the frame. They were all loose. We need shims too. She glanced up and their eyes met, that same energy growing between them that had sparked and sputtered to life on the stairs last night. He'd sworn her eyes had dropped to his lips and, for a brief moment, she leaned into him. Then she was gone like the ghost of Christmas past and he had goosebumps. This time, distance tampered the wattage. If they'd been standing closer, his hands may have gone to her hips and his eyes to her lips, and then he'd be pushing her up against the trailer and kissing her like he'd caught her under the mistletoe. He looked up. Nope. No mistletoe. Otis hadn't put up so much as a stocking out here. Not that most people decorated their diesel shop. Some did. His family did. Since three of his brothers got married, they hung mistletoe everywhere. He couldn't muck out the stalls without ducking under the stuff. Drake? She asked. He jerked out of Christmas kissing thoughts and back to the drab interior and the problem before him. Shims, he said way too loudly. Spinning around so fast the world had to catch up with him, he went to the shelves and came back with a pack of small wood fillers. I knew I saw them somewhere. They lifted the sled onto the work table and each took a side of the sled to work on. Having something between them felt prudent. After a few minutes of quiet, where they dipped the ends of their shims in the glue and then inserted them into the gaps clove cleared her throat. How long has your family been taking care of reindeer? His hands paused. Her question surprised him. Up to this point, she blocked any and all efforts to talk about the ranch. He ducked his head, not daring to hope they'd turned a corner. A long time. My dad took over when he was in his 20s. Grandma and Grandpa passed away the same year, and it was really hard on him. He married my mom that Thanksgiving and they've been there my whole life. She swiped extra glue off the sled and wiped it on a paper towel roll she found on the shelf under the table. What about you? How long have you been homesteading with your grandma? Since I was eight. She grabbed the finish hammer at the same time he did. He yielded it to her, though she didn't yield the conversation to him. How long have the reindeer been in North Dakota? He leaned over the top of the sled and cupped one side of his mouth. You mean Santa's reindeer? She rolled her eyes. Yes, as long as my family. And we go back several generations. I think it was in the 50s that the reindeer were put on the protected species list. We were grandfathered and at that point, and the permits were automatic. Mom has to do a lot of paperwork to keep them, and we have inspections periodically. Her head came up. Inspections? It was his turn to roll his eyes. Nature conservationists and well-meaning activists think that the herd would be better off roaming free through the wilds of Alaska or something. They get a senator all worked up, and he orders people out to the ranch to evaluate the level of care and attention we give to the reindeer. Have you ever had a critical review? She tucked her hair behind her small, delicate ear. It was rather perfect, and her earlobe was blush pink. He stopped staring. Nope. Though they can't fly, most of the reindeer are as full of personality as Felix. Officials and scientists fall in love with them and see how domesticated they are and don't think they would do well against predators. Oh, I hadn't thought about that. Felix does fine by us. We never have wolves on the property. He scares them off. He smiled softly at her. Not all reindeer can fly. I bet that scares more than wolves. She nodded, not meeting his gaze. Good point. She cleared her throat again. He was starting to think that was something she did when she was trying to get words out. You had a banner year for calves. Do you think you'll split the herd? He paused. There was no way she'd know about their calving rate unless she looked up the ranch. Were you checking me out? He teased. She sputtered and dropped her glue-covered shim to the floor. No. She dropped down to pick it up and popped back up again, glaring at him. I may have watched a few videos about the ranch last night. Her cheeks dusted pink to match her ears. He checked his grin. Faith, my sister-in-law and our resident veterinarian, went through the pedigree charts and came up with 50 unique gene combinations we could try. We're hoping for a flying reindeer. We haven't had one born on the ranch for a while and without them, well, I don't want to get into the doomsday Christmas spirit. 
so I'll let you figure out what will happen if Santa doesn't have any flying reindeer. She bit the side of her lip. It didn't work, she stated. He took the hammer from where she'd set it and tapped his shim deeper. Nope. Basically, we're out of options. My dad blames himself. He thinks he should have been more careful about breeding, but none of us thought running out of flyers was ever going to be a problem. Oh? His mind drifted back to the good OL days. When I was a teenager, we had more flyers than we had time to train. The ranch was a terrific way to grow up. Some guys like Rodeo and Riding Brocks, they should try training a reindeer to fly through a hoop or landlight as a snowflake on a roof. Talk about an adrenaline rush. And then when you put them on a sleigh for the first time and take the reins. He laughed just thinking about it. Your whole life flashes before your eyes. I can't tell you how many times I ended up stuck in a tree. She laughed too, her baby blues sparkling with mirth. That's something I'd like to see. He reached out and tickled her neck. She giggled and moved out of reach, swatting at his hand but not telling him to stop. She glanced shyly from under lowered lashes. What's your dad like? She asked quickly as she looked away. His thoughts slowed down. He had to think about this one. I've always been closer to my mom. Her eyebrows went up. He pointed to his chest. Youngest son. Ah, uh, baby of the family. He bristled at the term but tamped it down for her. Caleb and Jack, my oldest brothers, their twins, were dad's helpers. He used to tromp out to the barn and one would follow in his right footsteps and one in his left. She smiled as she worked. She was one dowel ahead of him, but he didn't care. Then Forrest and Pax came alone. Forrest hung with Caleb and Jack, but Pax is more of a loner. He's shy and likes to be in the workshop, alone. Thank you very much. He shrugged. I guess there wasn't much room for me on the tractor with three other boys and Pax didn't like to talk much, so I hung out with Mom. Clove squeezed more glue onto the paper plate where they dipped their shims. Anyway, last year Dad got really sick, and we didn't know if he'd make it through to Christmas. I spent hours sitting by his bed so Mom could do what she needed to do for the ranch, and I feel like I got to know him for the first time in my life. He tried not to think about how sad that was, that he didn't know his own father with whom he shared a roof and a table his whole life. It would have been tragic if Dad didn't get better. Now, it seemed like a strange thing to lament because their relationship was so much stronger. Oh? He felt confident of being able to answer her question now, but he wouldn't have felt that way two Christmases ago. Dad's a thinker. He has deep thoughts. We spend a lot of time talking about the Bible and Jesus and life and even death. It scared me when he'd want to talk about what happens on the other side of Diane Dot. He rubbed his moist palms down his pant legs and went back to work. I kept thinking he was trying to prepare to go home, and I was just starting to understand him. He stepped back and surveyed their work. They needed a handsaw to cut off the parts of the shims that stuck out. He crossed to the shelves and started looking. You felt cheated, she whispered. I get that. The pain and longing in her voice made him believe her. What did she say? She'd been with her grandma since she was eight? What happened to your parents? He tried not to look at her, to make her feel less like he was studying her and more like she had an open space to share her thoughts. She sucked in and her back stiffened like a cornered cat. Did you find a saw? He paused before turning back to the shelves and allowing the change of subject. Yep. Let's cut these off and take Felix for a walk. He needs some exercise. She smiled as if she hadn't ignored his question. Sounds like a plan. They worked in silence, what she hadn't said hanging between them even though both of them tried to push it aside like a shower curtain. Drake wanted to know what pain she had behind her can-do attitude and homesteader skills. But it wasn't his to explore, and he certainly didn't want to expose old wounds and make her hurt in the process. Some things were better left in the past, right? Instead of probing, he'd let her keep her secrets and be grateful they'd gotten along so well today. So far. There was always the chance that he'd strike a sensitive spot and they'd be back to arguing and cold shoulders before Felix had a chance to stretch his legs. That's part of what made Clove a challenge. She wasn't cut and dry, easy to read, or black and white. He liked that. He liked her and he wanted to spend some more time working alongside her. He'd like to see what she could do if she'd let him be a part of it. Chapter 14 Clove crossed her arms and glared at Drake as he held his sides and laughed. He even had the audacity to pretend to wipe a laughter-induced tear from the corner of his eye. A chain link what? he asked between gasping for breaths. Clove shoved him. 
He was so weak with amusement on her behalf that he stumbled two steps to the right. How am I supposed to know how you keep flying reindeer from getting away? Felix ducked away from her, embarrassed by her question. Try to act like you've been to the dance before, will you? You are not supposed to know human slang and expressions. Where did you learn that anyway? She chastened him. Everyone knows Vince Lombardi, right bro? Drake fist bumped Felix's shoulder. Felix huffed a yes. Clove mentally raced to place the name, football coach? She couldn't remember, but wasn't about to ask. They were already laughing at her for asking if they had a chain-link roof on their field or something. She stomped Grandma's snowshoes as she walked. How Grandma managed to pack so much to run away, she didn't know. Drake also had a set that he'd kept in the stock trailer. She was delighted when he pulled them out, noting one more thing they had in common. Working on the trailer and then the dog sled was good for her mind. She enjoyed coming up with solutions and working around a problem with what was on hand. Otis had a lot of tools which made shimming the sled easy. They had to wait for the glue to dry before they worked on it again and the fresh air did wonders for her sinuses after the diesel fuel laced air in the shop. Drake pulled himself together. We have an indoor barn with individual stalls for each of the flying reindeer. We find that they have bigger personalities than the non-flyers and prefer their own space over bunking together. Drake filled in the blanks. We have a huge indoor training facility that allows us to work with them while flying without anyone seeing what we, or they, are up to. When they're ready to fly with the sleigh, we fly at night over the more than 300 acres we own." Clove nodded. The images she'd seen in the videos last night made more sense. A large four-wheel drive truck drove slowly by. The kids in the back seat pressed their noses to the glass to look at Felix. He lifted his jaw, striking a pose for them. Clove chuckled at his antics. You ham. She rubbed his cheek fondly. The town wasn't much. They'd already been down to the convenience store for snacks to take back to the band B. Drake carried the plastic bags. Judy agreed to feed them two meals a day, and she served dinner at four, but they'd decided that having a few things on hand would be a good idea. Drake bought a lot more than she could imagine them eating in the next day or two, but she figured that he had to fuel all that muscle with something. Felix liked the longer walk. He rambled through the woods back home on his own, with her and with Grandma. You've been real patient with our stop here. You're such a good reindeer, she cooed. He seemed to slide into her praise like someone going downhill on a sled. After hearing the way Drake complimented Felix, she decided she needed to up her reindeer-owning game. She gave Felix an extra pat. A police car pulled up behind them, its lights flashing, and drove at a snail's pace. Behind it was another truck. Is he pulling us over? she asked. I think so. Drake gave her an amused smile. Should we pull out of traffic? She snorted a laugh. If you can call this traffic. There weren't any cars on the road and they were walking on the side. The officer stopped and got slowly out of his car. The driver of the pickup wasn't so methodical. He stepped down two sets of running boards and hurried over. Clove leaned toward Drake. Is his lift higher than yours? Bite your tongue, Drake growled, making her laugh. Easy there, she soothed. Your truck's prettier. Darn right it is. The truck guy got to them first. He didn't stop, though. Instead, he reached for Felix's lead rope and tugged, trying to bring Felix to him. Felix pulled back, hopping on his front feet and dragging the man and clove with him. Whoa! Drake grabbed the guy and pulled him back. You do not grab a lead rope like that. Clove stepped closer to Felix, who snorted like a Brahma bull, ready to give the stranger a manners lesson. Easy there. She stroked his neck. He didn't mean any harm. He's just excited to see such a handsome reindeer. Felix lowered his eyelids, do I look stupid to you? She pressed her lips together to hold in her chuckle. He could tell the difference between flattery and placating, good to know. Easy there. 
We don't want to assault someone in front of a police officer. An officer who took his sweet time walking less than 15 feet. Felix scraped his hooves back a mere six inches, I haven't touched him. Yet. Clove stepped up to his shoulder and placed a hand on him. Easy there, big guy. Let's see what he wants. The officer approached with one hand held out to ward off Felix. Do you have control of the animal? Clove and Felix exchanged a look. He's joking, right? Felix asked. Clove spoke out of the side of her mouth. Play along. She grabbed the harness at his cheek. I've got him. She called to the officer. Drake grunted. With one flick of his chin Felix could launch Clove across the street and all three of them knew it even if the other two did not. Not that Felix would ever hurt her. Is there a problem, officer? She asked innocently. We've had several calls about a reindeer wandering around town. The other man clapped his hands in rapid succession. Yes. Yes. A reindeer. Twelve days before Christmas. Isn't that just perfect? Twelve days. It's just like the song. What song? Clove asked, wrinkling her brow in confusion. She finally took a moment to look him over. He wore a name-brand blue ski jacket, even though there wasn't so much as a bunny hill in sight and a pair of matching snow pants. On his head was a white cowboy hat that matched the piping on the coat and his gloves. He looked like he'd stepped out of a photo shoot except that he wasn't quite that pretty. His middle-aged stomach pressed heavily on the zipper, and he didn't have a lick of hair on his head. Also, his nose looked like a light bulb, in shape, not color. Though the longer they stood in the cold, the brighter red it became. The twelve days of Christmas, of course. On the first day of Christmas, my true love sent to me, a reindeer. He held his arms out like he was presenting Felix to a live studio audience. He's absolutely perfect. Just what I needed. Excuse me? Clove said. Who was this guy and why did he act like he owned the street and anyone walking on it? Felix huffed, I was going to say that. I can assure you Felix is not here for you. Drake shifted the sacks in his right hand at the same time he regretted the mocking way the policeman said wandered but there was no taking it back. He put on a bright, friendly face. He looks angry. The officer tucked his thumbs into the front of his belt. His official green coat, with a star over the chest, came in at the waist. Had he tucked it in? Weird. He's the nicest reindeer you'll ever meet. Clove stroked Felix's cheek. Yeah, right, the officer mumbled. It's against zoning to have a large animal within city limits. No cows, horses or reindeer. Chickens are okay. Drake's eyes sharpened. Does the law specifically state no reindeer? Because if it mentions cows and horses specifically, but not reindeer, then it doesn't necessarily preclude them. Which means that you're wasting your time clove thought. She silently applauded Drake. He'd said something about his mom filing paperwork and doing legal things for the ranch. He must have picked up some of her wisdom. Bless Anna. I should detain you all while I look it up. He pulled off his aviator sunglasses and pinned Drake with a look. Yes. Do that. Detain them all. The man rubbed his palms together. Drake grinned as if he had a trump card. You could. But where you gonna keep him? Before the officer could climb any higher on his figurative high horse Drake said, tell you what. We're staying over at Miss Judy's place. Going that way right now. If you find a reason to detain us, you come on over and we'll be there. We will? Clove said under her breath. She had no desire to stay in a town with these two. The shorter guy salivated over Felix and she wasn't sure if he wanted to cook him up for Christmas dinner or keep him as a trophy. Either option was unthinkable. If she could ride Felix, they'd be halfway out of the state by now. Our trailer had an unfortunate run-in with a pole and Otis is helping get us up and running. As soon as it's ready, we'll be out of your town and out of your hair. He worked hard to sound calm. 
a vein in his neck throbbed, giving away his desire to grab her and Felix and run. He looked dangerous in his simmering state. The cop studied Felix. His antlers are too big. Felix lowered his brow, thundering. He stomped a foot. Clove stepped slightly in front of his body, her hip and side up against this chest. He wouldn't run her over to get to the cop, it was against everything inside of him. Still Drake gave her a look that said she was a brave woman and she warmed under his admiration. All right. I'm checking your story with Otis. The cop pointed at Drake before turning and getting back into his vehicle. The other man stuck out a hand. Name's Mayor Ward Winston. I want to buy your reindeer, how much? Ah, that made sense. The mayor followed the sheriff around town and stuck his nose in where it didn't belong. He's not for sale. Clove forced a smile. Besides, it's illegal to have a large animal within city limits. She lifted a shoulder in a sorry-not-sorry -sorry gesture. Mayor Winston waved off her concern. I don't live within the city limits. Name your price. He's not for sale, she said firmly. He opened his mouth to argue. She sliced her hand through the air. Don't ask again. His beady little eyes went hard. I won't. He shoved his white hat down on his head and spun around, stalking back to his truck. Drake let out a whoosh of air. I feel like I just walked over Jacob Marley's grave. He shuddered. Talk about a Grinch. Clove chuckled. Come on. The sheriff let us off the hook for now and the mayor left with his tail between his legs. Not a bad showdown at high noon if you ask me. The police siren blipped at them, making them all jump. Get a move on, said the cop through the speaker. Felix glared at him. If Clove didn't have a hold of his halter, he probably would have charged the guy just to see him sweat. Drake would enjoy that, too. He was one good reason away from punching something or someone. There was no sense in encouraging bad behavior. Reindeer didn't always understand the small nuances between situations. Clove started walking again. You look like you're trying to figure out the whole world and the universe it sits in. His angst, because that's what it was, lessened. He rolled his shoulders. I can't stand guys like that. Police, she asked. You have a problem with the law, cowboy? Her light tone and easy banter soothed his ruffled feathers. Which was nice to see, especially since she had a way of getting him all riled up with a little effort. I'm fine with the police. I don't like guys who act like, like, know-it-alls in charge, cocky, power-tripping, older brothers. She burst out laughing. That was a mouthful. He chuckled. There's a lot in here too. He gestured to his head. Were you brothers hard on you? He groaned. No. They were great. I love them all. They're good at everything they do and so responsible that I, he shut his mouth. I don't need to burden you with all this. Sorry. She turned, her eyes wide. I don't feel burdened. No? He quirked his eyebrow. She scowled and then brightened. I'm an only child. I feel like there's this club for people who have siblings, and I've never had a membership card. Shoot Clove. You can have mine. He chuckled. She joined in. Glancing over her shoulder, she said, he's not following us. But I get the feeling that we haven't seen the last of him, them. Drake nodded. He'll be back. His calm reassurance that they had, at the very least, an annoyance, and at the most, a battle, ahead of them cast a depressing net over her and she fell into silence. They reached the street with the band B. Instead of continuing on to the corral in the back with her and Felix Drake turned down Coulter's walk. Felix looked from the house to the band B and back again, where's he think he's going? Clove shrugged. The heck if I know. He's a man of many mysteries Felix. They decided to wait for him and Felix shifted his weight so it countered her leaning on him as if he were a wall. You're a big, tough reindeer. She patted his shoulder. 
He lifted a cheek in a satisfied reindeer grin. I know. Giving Felix the compliments he needed wasn't difficult, so why hadn't she done it before? Probably because she wasn't brought up to say nice things. It wasn't second nature or even habit, though she could make it so. Words were powerful things, and she'd been holding back some of the strongest ones all her life. Yes, she was taught to say please and thank you, but there were times when she could have given praise and she bridled her tongue because she was afraid of being seen as weak or silly. No more, she would take off the fear corset that held her too tight and allow mighty words of kindness to flow. Drake set down a couple of the bags, the ones with bread, brownie mix, butter, and canned soup, on the porch. None of the items would spoil out here in the cold before Calter's mom came home. Clove's chest swelled with admiration. He'd noticed Calter's mother's threadbare coat and the frayed hem of her jeans too. Only, instead of just noticing, he'd taken action. When he got back to where they'd guessed the sidewalk should be under all the snow clove felt the pressure of her recent personal vow to say the words press against her throat. She cleared it twice. That was a nice thing to do. I'm sure she will appreciate it and, well, I wish I'd thought to help her like you did. Drake's neck flushed, and he looked down at his shoes. It's just a few things for the pantry. No big deal. Clove could let it go. She'd fulfilled her vow and said nice things, but a voice inside told her it wasn't enough and she groaned as the woman she wanted to be fought the woman she was five minutes ago. She touched his arm to draw his attention to her face. As soon as his brown eyes grabbed hers, she knew it was a mistake to look at him while she bared her soul. He could already see too deeply inside of her and she felt like she was standing naked on a frozen lake. Why was changing herself so hard? She gulped. I don't remember where we lived before I went to school. But I remember a knock at the door and dad finding grocery bags just outside. She turned away, embarrassed at her past and having been so hungry. It was the first time I'd ever tasted mac and cheese, and I thought it was so good. It was the first night in a long time I went to bed with a full stomach. Felix hummed, making his chest vibrate in a soothing way. She put one arm over his back. I don't think they're that bad off, but every little bit does make a difference. When she finally looked up at Drake, she found nothing but softness. He pulled her into his chest and wrapped his powerful arms all the way around her, the plastic bags resting against her back. His breath warmed her ear. He didn't say anything, and she was mighty grateful for that. After a few seconds, she melted into him and let his strength fill her up and replace the shame of her past with soft acceptance. Passing her the remaining grocery bags, he took Felix's lead rope. I'll put him away and check his water if you want to head inside where it's warm. She continued to stare at him. Just when he was about to give up on getting an answer, she popped up onto her tiptoes and kissed his cheek. His skin seared her lips with heat. He smelled like the soap in the guest bathroom and sugar and cinnamon from breakfast. What was that for, he asked, looking like he wanted to know so he could do it again. Good fruit, she said. He might not know what that meant, but that was okay. She patted his chest once with her glove and then went to the front door. Chapter 15 Drake watched Clove walk all the way to the door, his heart hammering like a madman in his chest. That hug? That hug was. Well, he'd never felt anything like it. He'd wanted to hold her up because she looked like a stiff breeze would take her down as she faced a bit of her past to give him a compliment. What she'd done was the very definition of strength. So he'd done something brave and dangerous himself and reached for her, not knowing if she'd let him close or punch him in the stomach when his arms were spread out. She'd been stiff at first, and then she'd pushed aside her walls and allowed him to hold her properly. It was. Awesome. She smelled like fresh air and snow and clean laundry. Her curves fit against him in just the right way. The soft sigh she let out sounded like the coo of a dove calling out to him. It had been all he could do not to kiss her and see if she made other sweet sounds. Felix sidled up to him, smirking with his eyes slightly narrowed. What you thinking about? Drake pushed the reindeer's face away from him. Don't get any ideas. He didn't need this guy trying to amp up his love life, too. Seemed everyone around here thought he should be married by now. He took up the lead rope and started walking. Felix snickered. 
I was going to tell you the same thing. Glad we're on the same page. Two steps later, he was yanked backwards when Felix paused. Thrown off balance, he almost fell. Hey, he complained. Now we're on the same page. Felix strode forward with grace in his every footstep. You're not subtle, Drake griped as he rubbed his shoulder. The reindeer asserted his protective feelings for Clove at the same time he wanted to make sure Drake understood that he was stronger, level-headed, and not in control of him. The message was intended to intimidate, but Drake grinned. Asserting his protective side was something Dunder would have done. Dunder who led the herd and was king of the flying reindeer on the ranch. He couldn't even be upset that Felix had an attitude because he was everything they'd been praying for in a reindeer. Maybe even a little more. He and Clove got along a lot better today than they had before, but he purposefully hadn't brought up taking Felix back to the ranch. The topic always brought up her defenses, and he liked her so much more without them. Maybe that was the problem. He liked her. He liked the softness he'd found under all her prickly edges. From what he could tell, not a lot of people got to see that side of her, and he wanted more. Opening up to him wasn't easy for her, though. Not with her past. She hadn't told him what happened to her parents, and after the story of going to bed hungry, he wondered if it was too painful for her to talk about. Felix walked into his pen, giving the oats bucket a hard glare for being empty. The water bucket had frozen, so Drake tapped the giant ice cube out and filled it again. Without a warmer in the bucket, he'd have to do that three times a day. He gave Felix a scoop of oats to hold him over until dinner. When that was all taken care of, he decided to go back to the shop and get some more work done. He had a sinking suspicion that they hadn't seen the last of the mayor or the sheriff. They needed to get out of town, and soon. He contemplated inviting Clove to help him, but he needed room to think about how she affected him, and it seemed he needed to evaluate his life's decisions once more. He did a lot of that lately. That was the trouble with having a woman in his life. He knew they were trouble going into all this. So why hadn't he been able to stop it? Chapter 16 Clove woke up to someone yelling outside her window and Felix kicking the panels. She flew out of bed, startling Grandma awake too. What in the what? Grandma exclaimed, flinging her arm out to the side like a toddler having a bad dream. Clove's heart thundered, and she blinked several times before her eyes realized she needed to use them. She squinted through the early morning half-light. The sun wasn't quite up, but that didn't mean the day wasn't underway. There was a truck and trailer parked right next to Felix's pen, the back door swinging open. The sheriff in his green coat and Smokey the bear hat came around the side of the trailer and directed someone else to back up to one of the panels. What's going on? Grandma asked, her throat thick and groggy. They're taking Felix. She ran to the bedroom door, threw it open and hurtled herself into Drake's bedroom door landing both hands and a hip bone against the wood. In the back of her mind she registered that she wore the embarrassing one-piece pink pajamas, which she swore he would never see her in again, but she didn't care. She pounded with all her might. Drake, she screamed in panic. The door whipped open, revealing Drake in plaid pajama pants and no shirt. If she had even three seconds to appreciate the view, she would have taken it all in so she could bring up the image later on and savor it, but there was no time for that right now. The police are back and they're taking Felix. Over my dead body, he growled. He stepped out, pushing her in front of him toward the stairs. Holiday cheese and crackers. He was sexy when he looked dangerous. Uh, you might die out there if you don't get a shirt on, she managed to get out. That sounded right, didn't it? Not like her throat had closed off at the feel of a half-naked man hot on her heels and breathing warmth down her neck. No time. Be still her pounding heart, the man was blazingly brilliant in his anger. They hurried down the back stairs and into the kitchen, where he threw on a coat and stuffed his bare feet into boots. Clove grabbed whatever was hanging up and shoved her arms inside. Drake was faster. He tore out of the house, leaving the door open for her. Stop. His voice boomed across the half-morning light. Clove slammed the door behind her wanting to create as much of a scene as Drake could with his deep and commanding tone and make the thieves pause in the middle of their crime. Felix kept his antlers at hazardous levels and the sheriff, who was already weary, was having a difficult time trying to get behind him and prod him into the trailer. 
The second man hopped out of the truck and Clove scowled at his five-foot-two frame. Since when did the mayor join the police force? This was a small town, but still, it all seemed fishy. Knock it off, you're scaring him. Clove demanded. Felix looked anything but scared. His nostrils flared, and when he took one mighty step, the ground shook. She stumbled at the vibrations but plowed on. That was new. He'd never done anything like that before. She glanced at Sheriff Hoffman's new rig and spied an animal control logo on the side. Do you have any experience with reindeer? She ran to the panel and started climbing. If she could get to Felix, she might save one of the men from impalement. Ma'am, barked the sheriff in that same tone that made Drake's hair stand on end. Stand back. Clove ignored him. Yeah, right. Drake motioned for her to keep going. Once she was climbing down the other side, he put one foot on the bottom rail and launched himself over, landing his feet on the ground before she did. Now there were three humans and a reindeer in a small pen made from temporary panels. What could go wrong? Clove wasn't afraid of Felix, but she was terrified for him. Being with people who loved him allowed him to push past his comfort zones and do things like ride in trailers, not fly, and stay in a small space when he was used to having a whole forest to roam. Having to do any of those things while strange men pushed, yelled and prodded him would be traumatizing. He may or may not be able to control himself. Best and worst case scenario was that he flew away. I've got it. Mayor Winston approached, a cattle prod in his hand. This is bad. So. So. Bad. Clove lowered herself into a fighting stance, ready to tackle the mayor if he came anywhere near Felix with that thing. The shock it produced was not enough to hurt him, but she'd never used anything of the sort on Felix, not even in his most stubborn moments, and he wouldn't like it one bit. If he flew away, he might never come back. Clove's heart crimped and shrank at the thought. Felix was family, and she had precious little family to claim in this life. She couldn't deal with another male leaving her behind. Her hands started to shake, and she worked to quell the panic threatening to overwhelm her. You two need to exit the area, commanded Sheriff Hoffman. Drake drew himself up to his full height, which was a towering foot taller than the other guy. Clove groaned. Now she had to protect Felix from the cattle prod and Drake from this guy who pushed all his buttons. How about we all slow down for one blasted second and not have a brawl in Judy's backyard? Everyone turned to look at her, including Felix. Why are you stealing my reindeer? Sheesh. How many times was she going to ask that question this Christmas? Felix snorted, good question. She glanced at Drake out of the corner of her eye and caught him giving her a sly smile. Do you want to steal his truck? He whispered out of the side of his mouth. Jail was not an option for her right now. Maybe later, she whispered back. Ma'am, it's come to our attention that reindeer are not permitted within the city limits. As a matter of fact, they're not permitted in the state. The sheriff grabbed his belt and hitched up his pants. Come to your attention? You mean you looked it up last night, didn't you? Clove wasn't going to give him an inch. This isn't some coincidence that popped up and you stumbled upon it, it's premeditated. She nodded once. That's right. Premeditated like murder. He sniffed and nodded. I have a responsibility to the people of this town to maintain their safety and uphold the law. We already told you we're passing through. Drake folded his arms and glared down at that guy. As soon as the trailer's ready, we're out of here. Doesn't matter if it's one hour or another day, the officer responded. We'll move him to the animal shelter until we have further instructions from the state patrol. Clove's blood froze in her veins and then cracked, the shards ripping her apart from the inside. Where will they take him? She practically screamed. That's none of your concern, he had the audacity to say. I've applied for a permit to keep him right here, said Mayor Winston. We're going to have our very own reindeer attraction for the holidays. It'll put this place on the map. He smiled as if he were the solution to all their problems. Clove lunged at him, 
claws out and nothing but a feral instinct to protect her family driving her actions. Drake turned lightning fast and hooked his arm across her middle. She struggled against him. How dare you? Felix isn't yours. He's not yours either, said the mayor. But since we have him here, I've invited the elementary school kids over to see him. They'll arrive within the hour and I need to find a photographer so I can attach images to my proposal for the town meeting. Drake's whole body worked to keep her from doing something stupid. She knew she was being crazy, and she didn't care. You can't take my family. Drake spoke over his shoulder to the sheriff. I can and do own reindeer in North Dakota. Which is where we're headed. The reindeer wrangler ranch, Clove growled out. Look it up. If you can produce papers of ownership, you're welcome to pick him up today. But we have to take him into custody. Sheriff Hoffman wouldn't budge. Clove was officially naming this guy Officer Scrooge. Well, she wanted to name him something else, but it wasn't a name she could use in front of a reindeer or children. What's going on? called Grandma as she shut the back door. Grandma! Clove exclaimed. You need a coat. Grandma flapped a hand at her and walked right into the snow in her slippers and nightgown. What's happening? Drake released Clove and removed his coat, leaving his bare skin at the mercy of freezing temperatures. Goose flesh spread quickly over his chest and arms, but he didn't so much as shiver. He hurried over the panel and draped it around Grandma's shoulders, whispering to her as he did so. Grandma nodded, her face set. She walked to the fence, and Felix met her there for a morning pat on his neck. He huffed out a breath that hovered in their air around the two of them like a fog, everyone's all worked up. You need to go with them and be a good reindeer. We'll get this sorted out. She pinned the mayor with the hotshot in his hand with a look. You'd better put that away, son. It's not going to do anything but make all of us mad and you don't want a mad reindeer on your hands, let alone an angry grandma. He nodded as if he'd been given a lashing and moved to put the cattle prod away in the trailer. He came back empty-handed. Clove grabbed the panel, the cold metal biting into her palms. They can't take him. I won't let them. She fought tears because it was the only thing she could fight at the moment. Everything else came at her like a tidal wave that she was helpless to stop. Grandma patted her hand. Everything will be all right, dear. Her eyes shone with sadness. This was hard on her, too. Clove's stomach roiled and her muscles felt weak. She might just fall into the snow and lay there until the world righted itself. Come out of there, dear. Come on. Grandma nodded to Drake at the same time she rolled her hand, urging Clove to move. He unwrapped the chains that secured the panel in place and pulled it open for her to walk through. His skin was bright red from the cold. It hadn't taken long to move past the goose flesh. If he stayed out here much longer, he'd get frostbite. Felix, Grandma Drake, how could she take care of all of them? It was impossible. Grandma stepped in and took her hand. Clove stared down at the flimsy slippers. If she didn't get Grandma inside soon, her feet would freeze. Why did everything feel so urgent? I can't leave him. An ugly sob built inside of her. She swallowed, trying to keep it at bay. It came out anyway, choking and drowning her in the loss. A clang grabbed her attention, and she turned to see Felix walking into the trailer without the sheriff or the mayor making it happen. Each foot that landed on the metal floor rang out like a final gong that shook her heart. He turned around and winked. Don't worry about me. No. Felix, her cry for him sounded more like a whisper. Her whole body started to shake. Drake pulled her against his bare chest and she curled into him, feeling like that eight-year-old yelling on Grandma's front porch for her daddy to come back. Drake rubbed her back in slow, soothing circles. She cried into him, letting her fears and pain from all those years ago splash to his wonderful chest in a smattering of hot, salty tears. The trailer door slammed, and she shuddered. Drake lifted an arm and drew Grandma into their circle. She put one arm around Clove. I'll make this right. 
I promise you, we'll get Felix back. Drake's voice had an edge to it that made Chloe feel bad for the men who drove the truck out of the yard and into the street. Felix didn't make a sound. It would have been better for Clove if he'd protested at least a little. He's too noble for his own good. She sniffed and swiped her nose with the pajama sleeve. Drake's hand moved down her arm, and he grabbed her fingers. I know you're going through something right now, sugar, but I need you. Her eyes jumped to his heart as steel gaze. He was a man ready to do battle for her, for her reindeer, and for her grandma. She fell a bit in love with him at that moment. She used the PJ sleeve to wipe her face clean. There wasn't time for tears. She cleared her throat. First thing first, she needed to make sure grandma was toasty and tucked inside, then she'd unleash her mama bear's instinct and take care of Felix. Let's get grandma inside. She put her arm around grandma and started walking. Drake held her other hand, and she squeezed his in appreciation. He tempered himself, holding back the parts that wanted to break loose and probably break things because of what happened this morning. She had memories of her father tearing through their tiny apartment, appending chairs and one time on the whole kitchen table. The same level of anger pulsed inside Drake. She glanced at him, wondering what it would take to break his control. His jaw ticked, but there was nothing about him that made her feel afraid. She trusted him, even in this time of high emotions. She made a note of those thoughts so she could revisit them at a better time and decide how she felt about all this. Grandma was more than ready to be in the warm bed and breakfast. They went back in through the kitchen to find Judy standing by the sink, wringing her hands. What happened? The tea kettle whistled, and she poured hot water into waiting mugs. Drake accepted his on his way to the stairs. I'm going to put on a shirt. He winked at Clove over the top of the mug before taking the stairs at a quick march. Grandma filled in Judy on the morning's excitement while Clove checked her clothes in the dryer and gulped cocoa to warm up. She hadn't realized how cold she was out there, and her hands and feet burned, pricked, and tingled as they thawed out. Judy squawked and gasped in all the right places. Clove said a silent prayer of gratitude for her ability to know just what to do to make her guests feel comfortable. That Mayor Winston is a piece of work. I'll tell you that. He's too big for his britches, if you ask me. Always has been. Clove's eyes strayed to the stairs. Should she follow Drake to make sure he was okay? But someone had to look after Grandma. She kneeled down and pulled off Grandma's frigid slippers. She hurried to the front room and came back with a fuzzy blanket, which she wrapped around Grandma's legs and feet. Judy poured the rest of the hot water from the kettle into a water bag and tucked it inside the blanket. Better, she asked. Grandma nodded. I'm so angry I hardly felt cold at all. You're not the only one. Clove rubbed her arms and stared up the stairs once again. What was taking Drake so long? Chapter 17 Drake tore through his bedroom, ripping shirts out of the drawer and throwing them on the bed. Nothing seemed right, and it had nothing to do with what he wanted to wear and everything to do with the phone call he had to make. Despite teasing Clove about the taste of crow, he, himself, despised it. There was nothing worse than admitting to his practically perfect in every way older brothers who never made a mistake that he'd screwed up. There was no other way to get Felix out of police custody, though, and he'd do anything for Clove, or Felix. He'd do anything for Felix and the ranch, right? That's why he was here. Not Clove and her delicate shoulders that folded into him as if he could protect her from all the monsters under the bed. He hadn't thought to bring his certifications or any type of documentation on the ranch. They didn't have paperwork on Felix. How could they? He wasn't theirs. Still wasn't. And Mom would never fudge records. Never. Not that he'd ask her to, but it would make things so much easier if he could waltz up to Sheriff Hoffman and shove a piece of paper in his face and drive off with Felix. Well, march off with Felix because his trailer was in pieces on Otis's shop floor. He'd thought getting him to the ranch was the only hurdle. The mayor's ambition was a wicked punch out of nowhere. It was time to call home and ask for help. Gritting his teeth, he sat on the bed, then jumped back up to his feet so he could pace. Mom answered on the second ring, Merry Christmas, Drake. Is it? 
He asked, too much ginger snap in his tone. He schooled himself. Sorry. Mom. That's okay. Having a rough day, dear? Some of the fight went out of him like a balloon leaking air, making it possible to say the hard words. Yes. But I mean, I'm sorry I left without talking to you. He drew himself up. I'm sorry I didn't tell you where I was going. I'm sorry I made life harder for you and everyone else on the ranch. I'll, he gulped hard. I'll call everyone else later and apologize. I promise. Gabriella, you know I love you forever. Thank you for saying all that, though. He wanted to cry at his mother's easy forgiveness. I hope you still love me after what I'm about to tell you. Please tell me you're not in jail, she joked. He gulped, not sure where to start. In his hesitation, Mom grabbed onto panic. Drake Obadiah Nichols, you'd better not be in jail. I'm not, he fired off. It was time to come clean. Okay, I'm just going to tell you everything, so here goes. He started with calving season and then his fear that the ranch would be shut down forever and his niece and nephews would stop believing in flying reindeer and Christmas and children all over the world would go without Santa's visits and how he decided to kidnap Felix. Mom gasped in horror at that, but he plowed over her sputtering telling her about Clove crashing the trailer and how they were stuck all the way up to how he couldn't keep Clove out of jail and save Felix. When he finally stopped to breathe, the line was quiet. Mom? He pulled the phone away from his ear and checked to make sure he hadn't lost the call. Can you hear me? I heard everything. She sounded like she was smiling. He put her on speaker and dressed quickly. Why do you sound so happy? She laughed. You've managed to get into quite the pickle. Again, why do you sound so happy? Because you had to choose between saving the girl and saving the reindeer, and you picked the girl. He stopped, one foot in a pant leg. Which means, she continued, you must really like this clove. What? No. I. He tripped over his half on pants and fell into the bed. He did like clove, but he didn't want to admit it to himself, let alone talk to his mom about it. Seriously, mom. I'm trying to save the ranch and that's what you get out of that entire story? She laughed. Don't worry. I'm productive too. I've emailed you copies of all our federal permits and our state one. We have a few seals of approval from international organizations that may intimidate a small town mayor into letting Felix go. They're all in your inbox. He rolled onto his back and hoisted his pants up, buttoning them quickly. Thanks. I'll see what I can do with that. Drake, she said, her voice turning motherly, we're behind you on this. I'll explain everything to the family. They'll blow up your phone trying to be helpful. I'm sure. At this point? I'd welcome it. She snorted. That'll be a first. I know. But there's more at stake here than my pride. You're a good man, Drake, she said quietly. It was the first time she'd ever told him that, and he had to wonder if it was his efforts to save the ranch that drew out the compliment or if it was his ability to put his pride aside. Probably the pride thing. It just seemed like something mom would notice. They said goodbye, and he checked his email to make sure everything had come through. It had. She was incredible. He dragged a thermal undershirt over his torso. Yeah, he'd noticed Clove's eyes darting to his chest and stomach. She hadn't really lingered there, though. As much as a part of him wanted to flex for her, this morning wasn't the time. He couldn't get over the feel of her fingers on his bare skin when he'd held her back. It was like fire and ice and electricity decided to samba. Too bad they didn't have the luxury of a slow waltz. It was time to go to battle. Chapter 18 Clove's head popped up at the sound of Drake's feet on the wooden stairs. Grandma and Judy chatted softly, but she'd tuned them out a while ago, feeling numb and lost and lonely. The emotions were as comfortable as a tumbleweed sweater. His phone rang, and he answered before he hit the bottom step. Drake barreled down the stairs, his phone at his ear. Yes, I'll be sure and get Faith in touch with her at her earliest convenience. He hit the speaker button and mouthed, my family. Clove moved to his side as if she'd been sucked there by a vacuum. He took her hand, lacing their fingers together. She leaned on him, thankful for his comfort. That's what the hand-holding was about, right? He was trying to help her keep it together, not pull her heart threads out at the seams and make her all gooey inside. I just found the local animal control center's contact info and the sheriff's email address. I'll send an initial message with your certifications and such and then I'll follow with a second one flooded with the ranch's credentials, our endorsement from the last three presidents, 
and whatever else I can think of to make them feel like idiots for taking Felix. Thanks, Mom. Drake squeezed her hand. Clove smiled. She'd never met this woman, and she already knew Felix's name and was mounting a rescue effort from North Dakota. Your dad has something to say, said Anna. Clove remembered her name from the videos she'd watched. It was good to have a visual to draw on and she was grateful she'd stalked Drake the other night. Drake, this is your dad. Drake rolled his eyes in a like I didn't know that way that made Clove want to giggle. She didn't. It was hard to laugh when your reindeer had sacrificed himself to the police to keep you out of jail for attacking the mayor. You tell Clove and Hannah that they have the full support of the Reindeer Wrangler Ranch behind them. I'll even call Ginger and have people put on the naughty list. No one messes with my family. Drake smiled down at her, his eyes warm and inviting. You just told her you're on speaker. Oh, good. Clove, asked Anna, jumping back into the conversation. Yes, she barely got the word past the surprise at being called out by name. She ran her hand over her messy hair, grateful it wasn't a video call. Drake had a lot of talking to do, how much had he told his mother about her? And why did she care so much about what Anna thought of her? We're with you on this. Even if you don't want Felix to stay on our ranch. We will fight for him to be with you. You hear? Clove was overcome with the surge of emotion that Anna's heartfelt declaration brought on. I. Listen you too, don't do anything crazy. Okay? Drake, Abner cautioned his youngest son. Clove glanced up at Drake as his dad dished out advice. Apparently, he had a reputation for out-of-the-box solutions like kidnapping Felix. I'm calling in some favors and Anna is going to get the senator involved. We should have this figured out before the day is over. Did you tell your dad you tried to kidnap Felix? She asked softly. Drake nodded his head. I told mom and they share everything. You have a lot of explaining to do, she elbowed him lightly. Later, he whispered to her. Thanks, he said to his parents. Keep me posted. I'm going down to the animal shelter to make sure the facility is adequate. Clove's hold on his hand tightened. The sense of being left behind threatened to come back and she didn't want to drown in it. Love you Drake, Anna called before hanging up. Wow. So many emotions, thoughts, questions, and feelings from one phone call. It was obvious that Drake came from a different family background than hers, he'd gotten the parents she'd always dreamed of having while she'd gotten the dad who didn't want her. Drake put his hands on her lower back and pushed her toward the stairs. She fought every step of the way. He grunted. Will you hurry? Hurry what? She braced her foot against the first step to keep from being shoved all the way up them to her bedroom door where he no doubt would lock her away while he rode off into the sunrise to save the day. Get dressed so we can go to the shelter. He motioned for her to go. Her mouth fell open. Wait. What? That wasn't how the script went. He was supposed to get her out of the way. She was always in the way, wasn't she? You're you're taking me with you? Of course. He looked at her like she was crazy to think otherwise. Because Felix is my reindeer? She spoke with as much question in her voice as she felt. This didn't make sense. Men didn't stick around. They didn't take her along. I won't be too much trouble? It had been a long time since she'd allowed those words to haunt her. Grandma nearly spit out her cocoa. She coughed, and Judy handed her a napkin. Drake glanced from Grandma, wiping her chin to Clove. He picked up that there was more going on with Clove at this moment than just the Felix situation. He reached for her trembling hands and held them carefully, but firmly, in his own. The warmth that radiated through her at his touch melted the stiff rods that kept her shoulders tight. We'll talk about all of whatever this is that's creeping up on you but I need you to know that you're not trouble, not to me. You're a huge asset, one I need right now to help me make sure Felix is safe and healthy and happy where he is. I want you with me, Clove. Please come. She nodded as his words sank in. He needed her to help Felix. 
She wasn't a pest. He wanted her. She almost didn't trust those words. A voice whispered, he doesn't mean that. She tried to shove it away and managed to grab onto his hands and prove to herself that he was solid. He was real. Even though this was taking more time than Drake probably wanted it to, he didn't show any signs of frustration with her. She was important to him. Where did you come from, she asked, half in awe and half thinking he must be crazy. He flashed a lopsided, cocky grin. North Dakota. She rolled her eyes. I'll be down in two jingles of a bell. His delighted laughter at her Christmas reference followed her up the steps. Was it possible that Drake is a man who would stick around? She didn't think men like that existed. Then again, she didn't believe in flying reindeer until Felix. Maybe men like Drake were as rare as flying reindeer, and she was just lucky enough to find both a flying reindeer and an honorable guy in her lifetime. Or, she was set up for another giant disappointment that would leave her gutted and heartbroken on Christmas. She shivered. Now wasn't the time to contemplate her love life. It didn't matter what happened to her. She had to save Felix. Then she'd figure Drake out one way or another. Chapter 19 Drake waited while Sheriff Hoffman, the bad cop of Windy Plains, spread the straw over the concrete floor behind the animal shelter building. They had several stalls that looked like they had never been used before. The building acted as a wind block and there wasn't a roof. You'll need at least another bale. Drake tried to keep his tone light. When they'd arrived, the school bus had just pulled up, and the mayor was having a heyday making up some story about Santa losing a reindeer and it showing up in town. There wasn't anything Drake or Clove could do but play along for the kid's sake. Calter was the bravest of all the kids, walking right up to Felix and hugging his leg. The sheriff about swallowed his tongue with fear, for a man who also did animal control, he wasn't comfortable with animals. It was probably one of those duties he didn't think he'd have to actually do while in the office. Hoffman sneered at Drake's advice. Is that right, Wrangler? He said Wrangler the same way someone would say manure when they stepped into a fresh pile. Yep, reindeer prefer soft beds. In the wild, they'll smash pine boughs under their heavy and sometimes deadly feet for a nap. He leaned over to Clove, who stood next to him and whispered out of the corner of his mouth. I totally made that up. He'll never know. Clove snickered behind her hand. She'd gone to a dark place when Felix walked into the trailer. Wherever it was, or whenever it was, it had done a number on her. He suspected she'd experienced some kind of trauma that she hadn't dealt with yet, and Felix leaving had thrown her right back into that moment. He wished she'd talked to him about it, but knew that this wasn't the time. Not when she was in the throes of the emotions or even coming off of the roller coaster ride they'd taken her on. His heart almost broke when she'd asked if she would be too much trouble to bring along. The raw despair staring up at him from her baby blue eyes was grisly to behold. On top of all that, he had the mayor to worry about. The man had an agenda that was bigger than a reindeer, though Drake hadn't been able to figure it out. Where was the path he'd dragged them all on a going? The sheriff held Felix's lead rope and tentatively reached out to stroke Felix's neck. Drake mentioned that he'd win a friend if he dropped a compliment now and again. As much as he struggled with these guys, he wanted Felix to be cared for properly. That's one of the reasons he kept his voice even. Hoffman listened to Drake's advice on everything begrudgingly. He called Felix a handsome specimen of a reindeer and the animal kingdom in general. Felix wasn't completely won over, but he seemed to tolerate Hoffman after that. Drake had filmed Felix with the kids for 20 seconds and sent the video to his brothers by way of a peace offering. By now, everyone back home knew what was going on. Mom could spread news faster than she spread butter on fresh-baked bread. The brothers' only chat lit up. The resounding reaction was that he was a doofus but Felix was incredible, so pretty much exactly what he'd expected. Forrest, he's amazing. Look at his shoulders. Power. Caleb, has he been in a halter before? How much training has he had? Pax, they'd better watch it. He'll tear up the trailer like it's made of tin oil if they tick him off. That was Pax, always seeing the bright side. Huh. Jack, what a stud. Forrest, this is Mitzi. Can you get me footage I can use on social media? Our followers could light up the phones for them to release Felix. Caleb. Forrest. What the heck? Brothers. Only. Forrest. Oh, stop being so fussy, Caleb. I know Faith is reading over your shoulder right now. 
Caleb. Selfie of Faith standing behind Caleb, grinning. You know it. Faith. Jack. Ladies, give the boys back their phones. Drake groaned. It was a wonder they got anything done on the ranch. They continued talking about Felix. Everyone except Pax, who probably set his phone down and walked away so he could be alone with his thoughts. Is there a problem? Clove asked, her forehead wrinkled in adorable concern. Normally, he'd keep the brothers' only chat group to himself, but since Faith and Mitzi were already involved, he scrolled up to the video of Felix and let her read from there down. She used her free hand to scroll, her other hand in his. He'd taken a hold of her earlier today and couldn't let go. Whenever he got close enough to touch her, he'd attach himself like a sticky candy cane on someone's pant leg. That wasn't an attractive image, but it was accurate. The candy cane couldn't help itself from grabbing on any more than he could. She finished and smiled up at him. They sound fun. They're a lot. She elbowed him. A lot of fun. He nodded. It's one of those things. I can't live without them, and I wonder why I live with them. Hey. He barked at Hoffman. The whole bale. Hoffman threw the second half of the bale out of the stall. The animal shelter was a small building with kennels for up to four dogs and cages for eight cats inside. They also had a solitary confinement area for injured animals. The stall was a quarter of the size of the one Felix was in back at the bed and breakfast. Being here, even for half a day, would be a trial. Will you tell your mom to stop emailing me? Gripped Hoffman as his phone buzzed three times in a row. It hadn't stopped buzzing for a half hour. She'd stop if you sent Felix back with us. Drake tried his best not to smirk, but it was hard. Annoying, Hoffman became his new favorite pastime. You can't house a reindeer in a residential area, Hoffman growled. He stomped past them and into the building. Drake approached Felix, taking a moment to rub his neck and that spot under his jaw that made him relax as much as sitting in a warm bath. It'll be all right. I don't expect that you'll be here too long. He ran his hand down the hair that grew under Felix's neck, ending in a soft pat. Hoffman came back out. His satisfied smile raised Drake's alarms. He thrust a half sheet of paper at Drake. What's this? Drake took it out of reflex. He glanced down at the paper, which was cold to the touch on this frigid December day. A ticket. Clove exclaimed. She'd read it two seconds faster than him. Are you kidding me? You're stealing our reindeer and charging us? Drake liked the way she said us. Hoffman smirked. Merry Christmas. Drake took a step forward, ready to wipe the Yuletide greetings off his face and then mop the floor with him. Hoffman lifted his chin, daring him to come at him. How did this man ever get elected? Drake pulled himself back. It wouldn't help his cause if he was in a cell when the senator, representative, or president called. Okay, maybe the president wouldn't call, but he wouldn't put it past mom to arrange a presidential pardon for Felix. Hey, if they can pardon a turkey on Thanksgiving. Why not a reindeer on Christmas? Oh man, he had a lot of explaining to do to his family. The images of Felix helped smooth things over. They got that he was trying to help the ranch. At least that was something they understood. Hoffman turned on his shiny black boot and marched back inside. I think he'll be comfortable here short term. Don't you? Clove asked. The automatic waterer ensured Felix didn't get dehydrated and the horse feeder was full of fresh food. She frowned. He's used to more space. Can I come walk him later? I doubt it. Drake hated telling her no. Mayor Winston sauntered around the side of the building. He'd been out front waving goodbye as the children loaded onto the bus. His secretary showed up for a few minutes to take pictures. No doubt they were already on the mayor's social media pages. What do you think? He beamed as he waved his arm toward the cell, or stall. Deluxe accommodations for our newest resident. They'll be fine until we take him home. Drake could barely get the words out. He didn't like this guy. He was slippery. Clove smiled, although it didn't reach her eyes. I'll be back this afternoon to visit. Sure. Sure. Anytime. We'll need to get a ticket booth or some such setup. Until then, you're welcome back here. He whistled jingle bells as he left. Clove's mouth dropped open, and she snapped it shut. Drake ground his teeth. Even on the ranch, where reindeer were a business, they didn't have a ticket booth. Yes, they charged for some events but the proceeds went to pay for hay or other essentials. They didn't see the animals as money makers. They were family. Clove approached the fence, and Felix stuck his head over to listen to her soft whispers. Drake hated what this was doing to her. How had he ever believed that he could kidnap Felix and no one would be hurt? He would have broken Clove's heart. The idea almost broke him. She came back, 
and he draped his arm across her shoulder as they walked to the truck. I need to apologize for kidnapping Felix and Hannah. She lightly punched him in the ribs. So you admit you stole him? Her tone was light enough that his defenses didn't jump to attention. He pulled her close and kissed her hair. Yes, and I'm so very sorry. I should have. I don't know what I could have done, but taking him was really, really dumb. She snuggled into his embrace. I forgive you. He opened her door, and she paused before climbing in. She placed a hand on his chest, and even though he wore four layers of clothing, he felt the contact all the way to his bones. Thank you for saying that. He nodded, his tongue too thick and awkward to say the actual words. She climbed in, and he took a long way around the truck walk to get back his ability to speak. He got in the chilly cab and started the truck. Do you think he'll behave? Everything he'd seen of the reindeer said that he'd stay where he was told to stay, but if he got lonely for Clove, he might fly out of there to visit. I talked to him, promised to get him out soon, and asked him to give Hoffman a little trouble now and then. She giggled. He's looking forward to a few reindeer games. Drake chuckled. You're devious. She flipped her blonde hair over her shoulder. I prefer the term saucy. He grinned at her, taking in her whole, light-hearted flirting in the brightness in her eyes. She felt better having seen Felix's stall and knowing they were taking care of him. He enjoyed doing that for her. Whatever darkness had snuck up on her this morning was once again put away. He wanted to keep it there, and to do that, he had to prove his words from earlier. Are you tired? She nodded. Worn through emotionally, but fine otherwise. Why? He threw his arm over the back of the seat and looked behind them as he backed out of the spot. Because I want to get the trailer fixed as soon as possible and I could use some help. She gasped in delight and straightened her back. I'm game. I want to be out of this town ASAP. He picked up a piece of her hair and twirled it through his fingers. I like the way you think. She blushed in that pretty way she had. I like he was on the tip of his tongue, but he managed to hold it in. He wasn't ready to give up the life he'd planned, the solitary life of his own where he was the king of his cabin and the master of his Christmas tree. He allowed her hair to fall through his fingers and then moved his arm to shift into drive. Besides, it's about time you meet Otis. She chuckled. Can't wait. Chapter 20 Two Days Felix had been in the stall for two days. The solitary confinement took a toll on him that was hard to ignore. His eyes were constantly wide, and he paced like a caged tiger, rubbing his hide on the walls and pulling out his hair. He was patchy. Clove tried to explain to him that he should not do that but he couldn't seem to help himself and she ached because of it. She didn't know what to do. Hoffman wouldn't let her take him out for walks because the mayor hovered every time she came to visit. She'd wondered how he knew she was there. Yesterday, she'd discovered the camera on the corner of the building. It was comforting, in a way, to know that someone watched Felix 24-7, but it was disconcerting that that someone was Mayor Winston. In an effort to help Felix calm down, Grandma took a camp chair and her knitting and sat with him for a few hours. She told every story she could think of about her life. Clove wasn't even sure some of them were true. Yes, she'd run away with Grandpa when they were only seventeen. Yes, the two of them lived in a Winnebago for several years wearing bell bottoms and beaded vests. Grandma's hair was down to her belt loops and Grandpa's mustache could be used to scrub the floor, it was so thick. Yes, she'd marched in Washington, though she didn't want to get into politics. But, had she really flown an airplane? Consulted a mood ring on which state to settle down in. Sang with ABBA? Clove wasn't so sure she bought the stories, but at least they entertained Felix for a while. Not even Grandma's love had been enough to calm him down for long. She'd cooed and complimented, brushed and hugged, and as soon as she left, he started pacing again. Drake said he needed to fly. That flying was as much of an instinct for him as eating, and denying himself would cause him to go crazy. But there wasn't a safe space for him to take to the skies. We have to get him out of there. Clove grabbed a hammer off the work table and smacked her palm. They were in Otis's workshop finishing up the dog sled. The trailer was done but Drake had promised Otis he'd fix up the sled so he was pounding out the twisted metal runners on the anvil. Seeing his muscles flex and hearing the clang when he struck the metal was a pleasant distraction. Clove should not be thinking about Drake as a hottie right now, 
but how could she not when he was literally bending metal with nothing but his own brute force? Cranberry stuffing. The man had skills. He took every opportunity to touch her, but didn't try to kiss her. A fact that was starting to tick her off because the longer it took for him to kiss her, the more she thought about it. Like right now. She should be doing something productive and instead, she was drooling over Drake. So. Not. Helpful. Her phone beeped, and she reached for it, thankful for the excuse to pry her eyes away from the muscles on his back and the way they flexed and rippled as he worked. Maybe if she held her phone just right while she read the text, she could take a picture of Drake and no. Focus. Hello? Hi, said Faith. Drake got tired of handing his phone to her every time someone in his family called with a question and gave them her number. She didn't mind one bit. Faith was professional, but she also treated Clove like a friend. Hey, Clove jumped into the convo. Did you get the package? She asked right off. Faith had ordered gifts online for Ryder, and they'd gotten lost somewhere between Seattle and North Dakota. No. Faith said, scandalized. The tracking says they're in Arizona now. The company swears they'll have them to me by Christmas Eve, but that's in six days and I have zero faith in them now. Clove frowned. Do you have a backup? Yeah, Santa. Faith quipped. Ginger won't let me down. Switching gears. She jumped around quickly sometimes when she had info or needed info. Fire away. Has Felix been vaccinated? I can't believe I didn't ask this before. Uh. No? Is that a question? Faith chuckled. It was me admitting that we've never vaccinated him but also asking if we should have. He wandered out of the woods and we, well, we, she hated to admit that they hadn't done what they should have done for him. Or that they didn't know any better. I should have called someone. I can't believe we didn't give him shots. Relax. It's not the end of the world. We'll give him a round when he gets here and keep him quarantined until we're sure he's ready to meet the herd. It'll be fine. I just needed to know what we were up against, and now I can have the guys prepare a place to hold him. Clove dropped her head back and groaned. Not another holding pen. He's going crazy as it is. There was a pause before Faith blew out her lips. Listen, I don't want to be the one to bear bad news, especially at Christmas, but things aren't moving along as well as Anna thought they would. Clove gripped the phone. Just tell me. Caleb said something in the background. I'm going to put you on speakerphone so we can all talk. Can you grab Drake? asked Faith. Drake put down the sledgehammer, the very one she'd used to sort of pound the dent in the trailer back out. He put his hand on the small of her back and she leaned against him. The move was so natural, so strengthening, that they could have been doing it their whole lives instead of for the last two days. She felt like she'd known him for a lot longer than that and trusted him in a way she'd not known possible. The thing that sealed the deal for her was that he never left her behind, unless she insisted on staying with Grandma. Poor Grandma. She'd slept a lot these last couple of days. Clove needed to have a heart-to-heart -heart with her and lift her spirits, but there was so much to do to get ready to leave, so many questions to ask and updates from Anna and Abner that she fell into bed at night and was asleep in seconds. Not even a half hour to dream about her wrangler and his wonderful arms holding her tight. Drake, asked Caleb. I'm here. Drake's deep voice went right through her whole body and down to her toes. What's the holdup? This whole thing has turned into a political mess with our governor and Mayor Winston. The bottom line is that you guys may be there for a couple of weeks. Weeks? Clove yelled. She cringed at herself for screaming into the phone. Felix's feelings aside, if we stay here for weeks, I'm going to lose it. Drake ran his hand up and down her back. She closed her eyes and concentrated on the feeling of it, the light pressure, and the soothing motion. Caleb, come on man, you gotta do better than that. Drake kissed her hair. The man had horrible aim. Could he not find her mouth, or was he playing coy? 
she fought the urge to grab the front of his jacket and lay one on him. While she was a woman who knew what she wanted, and could build it with her own two hands, thank you very much, she didn't want a wimp. She wanted someone who would fight for her, slay dragons and all that. Yes, it was terribly archaic thinking, but she couldn't help but feel like she was worth a slayed dragon or two. So far Drake had taken on a mayor and a sheriff. He'd earned that kiss a dozen times over, so why didn't he kiss her? We're working every angle. Mitzi even posted that video of Felix. Hoffman's voicemail is full of requests to let Felix go. We're getting messages from people who say they can't even get through to give him a piece of their minds. He smarted up and stopped answering his phone. How can he not answer calls? Clove groaned. He's a police officer. Maybe he changed his number, offered Faith. Clove and Drake exchanged a look that said, it's possible. We should be ready to roll out of town in less than an hour. I'll call you then, hoping for good news. Drake hugged her close and then let her go. Clove said goodbye to Faith and Caleb and hung up. She tucked her phone in her back pocket. She walked slowly over to where Caleb pounded on the steel once again. After watching him for a couple of minutes, he finally put down the hammer. He glanced at her and then double-taked to make full eye contact. What? She rubbed her lips together, noting the way his eyes dropped to the movement. They stood on opposite sides of the anvil. She was so tired of having things between them. For a brief moment she warred over which issue to attack first, their lack of kissing or her terribly brilliant, no good wonderful idea. The energy in the room crackled and zinged, and her pulse picked up speed. So, of course, she totally chickened out on the kissing. I've spent a lot of time in the back lot of the animal shelter lately. Yeah. He turned to side-eye her. They have a few motion lights set up at night. She waited to see if he would pick up her line of thinking. I guess that's good. It might be hard to sleep, though. H.I.'s forehead wrinkled in an adorably confused way. She chuckled. They also have one camera. She put her hands on the anvil stand and leaned over it. Just one. He stilled and his dark eyes grew even deeper brown as he went into deep thinking mode. She continued painting the picture. It's by the back door and points at Felix. So anyone approaching it from behind would be in a blind spot that would make it quite easy to, say, stick a piece of gum over the lens without getting caught. He snorted. Except for their DNA in the gum. She rolled her eyes. You know what I mean. He put his hands on either side of the anvil stand and leaned toward her. Let me see if I'm getting what you're so delicately not saying. Her eyes dropped to his mouth. He had a great mouth. Both lips were full enough but not so full that they looked like a supermodel's. The bottom one was slightly bigger and looked just about perfect for. Clove, he asked, his voice hazy and far away. Hmm? She dragged her eyes up to meet his and found them quite amused. The scoundrel knew what he was doing, holding out on her. You want to break Felix out of jail? She blinked innocently. Did I say that? You're trying very hard not to. He leaned closer, bringing his cheek next to her cheek. He smelled like oil and work and body wash and something that was just him that she'd come to know over the last couple of days. Her eyes dropped shut, unable to stay open when he was this close. I think it's a great idea, he whispered. You do, she breathed. Yep. He pulled back far enough that their breath mingled together. Clove, will you allow me to try to kidnap your reindeer again? He asked in a slow drawl that made her belly swoop. The fact that he asked her for help and permission had her falling for him in a whole new way. She was in trouble with Drake. He knew how to get past all her defenses and leave her bare. I'll not only let you. I'll help. She could feel his smile, and she couldn't stop herself from mirroring him. She opened her eyes and caught him tracing her cheek with his gaze. Ahem. They jumped apart. Otis laughed, holding his belly like old Saint Nick. Sorry to interrupt. Drake's cheeks turned red. 
We, uh, how much did you hear? Hear? Otis asked, clearly befuddled by the question. Clove walked right over to him, not ashamed at all about being caught with Drake. Catch me any day, every day, all day long, she sing-songed in her head. She put on a wide smile and hooked her arm through Otis's. We finished the sled and I can't wait to show you. Otis perked up. I'll hook up to the trailer and we'll be out of your way. Drake dug his keys out of his pocket. Otis followed his progress until the door shut behind him. He patted Clove's hand where it rested on his forearm. You are such a sweet little thing that I just have to give you a warning. He has no intention of settling down. Waha? Uh -huh. Clove fumbled. The warning came out of nowhere and hit her like an ice ball to the chest. He told you that? Straight from his lips. I like you both, but I don't want to see you get hurt. The garage door lifted and Otis moved over to the trailer to help Drake hook up, acting like he hadn't said the very thing that caused her head to spin. Not settle down? As in Drake was playing her? Nah. He wouldn't, would he? Clove stayed rooted in the spot as she tried to reconcile what Otis said with what she'd felt and the things Drake had done. The heightened emotions, the racing pulse, and the whispers in her ear weren't her imagination. He felt something, too. She was sure of it. Not to mention, his family had drawn her in and sucked her up like a vacuum tube at the bank's drive-up window. Faith wouldn't allow Drake to play her. Abner would be ashamed. Unless it was all a show. Santa wouldn't allow fakers to raise his reindeer. She snorted. Like she believed Santa had anything to do with this. Santa had to be real, otherwise there would be no Felix, but what if they pulled one over on Santa too? Was that even possible? Wasn't Santa supposed to have some naughty-slash-nice list radar or something? She cupped her forehead, letting her cool fingers take her temperature down a notch. There had to be a reasonable explanation for Otis's warning that didn't include a mythical, the real, Christmas hero who delivered presents on Christmas Eve. Maybe he said that to Otis to stop him from interfering with things. She and Drake were in a weird spot. They hadn't discussed the future. He assumed they would take Felix back to the ranch and she'd let the idea run away with her. Heck, she gave Faith permission to give him a complete vet check when they got there, for the guys to build him a quarantine shed, and Anna to prepare the guest bedroom for her and Grandma's arrival. Although she wasn't sure when that decision was made and if she'd been a part of it. It just kind of happened that the best place to take Felix was North Dakota, where the Wranglers had the legal means to protect him. We're ready. Drake turned off the truck. Did you show Otis the sled? He climbed out. Clove came to herself. We didn't have time. Come, take a look. Otis ood and awed over their work. He swiped at his teary eyes with his sausage thumbs. It looks just like I remember it. Sniff. Sniff. I'm dedicating my run to you too this February. Ah. Uh. Otis. That's the sweetest thing you've ever said to me. Drake grabbed the big-bellied guy in a bear hug and rocked him side to side. Otis pounded him on the back in return. It sounded painful to Clove but Drake laughed it off as he stepped back so she could say goodbye. She went in for a hug, too. Otis was a softy, and she was glad that Drake insisted they finish the sled for him. He'd put in the work and not charge them, her, for tool rental, labor, or the space they'd taken up for several days. Don't be a stranger, you hear? Otis said, his voice grumbly. Merry Christmas, Otis. She hugged him once more wishing she could pack twenty years of Christmas wishes into that hug. Because if her plan worked, she and Drake wouldn't ever come back here. They'd be outlaws, or at the very least, suspects. That was a sobering thought. What was she worried about? No witnesses and any fingerprints they find could easily be explained by her frequent, documented, visits. It would be fine. She would be fine. Everything would be fine. And once she figured out Drake's motives and feelings for her, it would all be fine. Just fine. Chapter 21
Drake stared at Clove as they sat in the cab of his truck, the one place she thought they'd be safe discussing a possibly illegal operation. Who was he kidding? It was totally illegal. As much as he didn't want to end up in a jail cell on Christmas, he'd do it for her. She wrapped up her plan for getting Felix out of the animal shelter and waited for his response. He didn't hesitate. That's kind of brilliant. She grinned and half bowed in the passenger seat. Thank you. If you need help breaking the law in the future, you know where to find me. She shot him with finger guns and then tucked her hands under her legs and ducked behind her hair. Adorable. Yeah, he knew he was a man's man and a tough guy and a wrangler on top of that. But the word adorable kept popping into his head when she was around. He decided not to fight it because that would take a lot more energy than he had to give right now. Also, it was nice not to have to police himself around her. If he wanted to call her adorable in his head, he did. If he wanted to hold her hand as they walked to the convenience store, he did. If he wanted to kiss her hair, he did. If he wanted to kiss her, he did all that he could to hold back and so far managed to stop himself. It wasn't that he didn't want to kiss her. Oh no. It was the fact that kissing her came with a promise. At least, for him, it would. He knew enough about himself to know that he couldn't kiss and leave. Not her. And he knew enough about himself to know that he couldn't promise forever. He lay awake last night trying to picture his life back home with her in it. He moved pieces around, shifted his thoughts, and heaved some pride aside and still had a hard time. You know why? Because she came with a grandma and a reindeer. The reindeer was no problem. Felix could sleep on his wraparound porch all day long and he wouldn't care. What was another reindeer on a ranch with 350 heads? Easy. That's what. Hannah wouldn't be all that hard, either. He'd build her a small home on his lot, and she could knit, or garden, or whatever she wanted to do all the live long day. Heck, he'd even build a coop for their chickens. They wouldn't be the only couple on the ranch with a flock. So much of Clove's life fit with his that it seemed like it should be an easy fit. Everything worked, except the idea of her in his house. Every inch of that cabin screamed bachelor, from the leather furniture and bare walls to the couch without colorful cushions and his bed with only one pillow. Why did women think they needed twenty pillows, anyway? Did they sleep with all of them? If not, where did they put them at night? Who put them back on the bed? The whole thing was a headache he didn't need. How many pillows do you have on your bed? He asked. Clove blinked in surprise. They'd been talking about pulling off a Christmas heist, and he was thinking about her in his bedroom. Maybe you should have leaned into the question instead of throwing it at her. Two. Why? See, that's what he was talking about. Women had too many pillows. They cluttered things up and made extra work around the house. All that pillow lifting and arranging. What's the extra one for? She tipped her head to the side. I put it against my back for support. Huh. That made more sense than he wanted it to. Maybe he needed an extra pillow so he didn't wake up with lower back pain. He shook his head at himself. Now she had him wanting more pillows. What was next? Art on the walls? He shuddered. Back to the breakout. She shoved his arm. Do you think we should let your family know what we're up to? He shook his head. Like Hannah, the less they know, the better. She grimaced. I just feel like they could help. I don't know. Is it bad to ask people to pray for you when you're breaking the law? He laughed. Her mind worked over all sorts of angles he didn't consider. Probably. But I'm sure they're praying for us anyway, so we don't need to ask them to. Right. She nodded slowly, her eyes drifting to the front door of the bed and breakfast. We should pack up so we can leave tonight. What about Hannah? He ran his hand around the steering wheel. This topic was a little tricky, and he needed to handle it with care. What about her? Do you think we should send her home? Leave her here? Or take her with us? The decision wasn't really his to make alone. Whatever happened, having Hannah along would slow them down. Clove's eyes darted about as she considered the options. She's been so down and sleepy, I can't see taking her out into the cold. I'm afraid she'd get sick. She paused and rubbed her lips together. I don't feel right about sending her home alone. The cabin is a lot to take care of, and I know she's capable and spry, but if she's under the weather she could be in trouble out there, too. He nodded. He'd had the same thoughts. So we leave her here? Clove cupped both hands at the back of her neck dropped her head back and moaned. If we do, we can't tell her what we're doing or she'll be an accomplice. Drake switched directions and ran his hand the other way around the wheel. How are you at sneaking out? Clove gave him a wicked grin. I guess we'll find out. Come on. He nudged her. Even the slight contact calmed and thrilled him at the same time. 
He was still trying to figure out how Clove managed to do that to him. You can't tell me you never snuck out of the house. She laughed. I didn't. I swear. He felt his neck warm. Her eyes widened. Tell me. Tell you what? He lifted his palms. You totally snuck out. Your neck is all red. She touched his neck, her fingers light against his skin. His stomach flipped, and he sucked in a breath. She nudged him, elbowed him, and hip bumped him, but she'd never initiated a touch before, and he liked it. A lot. He shouldn't. But it didn't seem to matter what he should and shouldn't do because, when it came to Clove, he threw rules out the window. Maybe if she found out he wasn't a saint, like she didn't know that already, then she wouldn't allow him to hold her hand. He reached for her fingers, and she laced hers through his, and the parts of him that were out of alignment clicked into place. I was a dumb teenager. Okay. I thought no one noticed me and that I could get away with anything. He traced a circle on the back of her hand. Her breathing sped up. He'd done that. Sweet rolls and buttermilk. He needed to drop her hand, get out of the truck, and get a hold of himself. Like the idiot he was, he kept going. So my dumb friends and I decided to sneak out and go up to this pond and light fireworks. She barely held back her laugh. Fireworks. Yeah, I know. They sound like gunshots and bombs and we thought we could get away with setting them off in the middle of the night and no one would notice. She clamped her free hand over her mouth to hide her giant smile. It didn't work. Her baby blue eyes danced. So we drove our four-wheelers up to the lake. Yeah, the ones you have to yell over the sound of the engine to be heard. We made it up there and were congratulating ourselves when a cop car pulled in right behind us. He followed us up there with his lights off and we didn't even notice. He shook his head at himself. He gave us the option of turning over our fireworks and going home or having him call our parents. We all chose option A. She giggled. That was a smart decision. He huffed. I pulled in and dad was waiting on the porch. Guess who'd called the cops? No. She gasped. Yep. He didn't say much that night, but I found out a couple of days later. He drifted back to shuffling his boots on the wooden porch slats. Was he so mad? I don't think mad was the right word. He clapped me on the back and said it was good to have me home and to set my alarm for 4.30 because we had work to do. Then he worked me hard from the crack of dawn until midnight. I got the idea that if I couldn't keep myself out of trouble, he would make sure I didn't have enough time to find it. She melted a bit in her seat. Can I tell you how much I love him for that? He stopped making circles on her hand and lifted it to his lips. Me too. I wish I had a father like that, she said wistfully. Drake held his breath. She'd been so tight-lipped about her past, but he yearned for her to share it with him, wanting to carry or even erase some of the pain. He stilled, waiting to see if she would share more. Chapter 22 So many thoughts ran through Clove's mind. Memories that were good and bad and the ones in between. Drake had no idea what it was like to grow up without a father or spend years with one who neglected you. The best thing Dad ever did was leave her with Grandma, but it was also the worst thing he'd ever done to her. She struggled to put that all into words because she was afraid that if she told Drake, he'd see her through Dad's eyes. The thought was terrifying. I, she stared. Thump. She shrieked, pulled her hands out of Drake's, and whipped around in her seat to see snow melting down the window. What in the fiddlesticks? She rubbed at the fog created by the snowball. Who is it? asked Drake, leaning across the empty space between their bucket seats. I can't tell. She rolled the window down to reveal Coulter's grinning face. What are you doing? Wanna build a snowman with me? He bounced on the toes of his moon boots. Clove glanced at the clock. Um. Drake pushed the door open and slid out. Are you coming? He wasn't seriously going to build a snowman when they had so much to do, was he? We need to pack. Although the only thing she'd be packing was her toothbrush. The horrible pink onesie pajamas weren't even hers. Technically, they had a couple of hours to kill. I call the head, yelled Coulter. I have the bottom. Drake called out in the same tone. I guess I get the middle. Clove slid her hands into her gloves. This was happening. Keeping up appearances was a good thing, neighbors would testify that they'd played outside all day. No, sir, officer, we didn't see them steal a reindeer. See that snowman? 
They spent all day building it with Coulter. They went to work and soon had a presentable snowman next to Coulter's front steps. Coulter's mom called him in for dinner, and Clove and Drake trudged home worn out in a good way. Her snowman building muscles hurt. Since she hadn't used them since she was nine, she couldn't blame them. Clove had to admit that doing something was a lot better than sitting around waiting for time to tick by. Coulter was really excited about his snowman, and she loved to see the happiness on his face. It was good to see Drake, too. You're good with kids, she said as she shoved her scarf and hung it on the hooks by the door. A stand mixer ran in the kitchen, the sound more like a hum out here in the entryway. Christmas music, the kind you'd hear in a coffee shop, played through the house just low enough to allow for conversation. The front room had been transformed into a wonderful Christmas scene with a fire burning in the fireplace and stockings hung with care. The tree was in the opposite corner to help it stay fresh longer. She and Grandma knew all too well how easily a wood-burning stove dried out a pine tree. The glass ornaments sparkled from the fairy lights, and the scents of cinnamon, vanilla, and pine candles mingled like guests invited to a holiday party. Drake shrugged as if it was no big deal. I have a niece and two nephews. In reality, working with the reindeer means we work with kids. There's lots of field trips to the ranch and we have to entertain the kids as well as educate them. I've always liked that part of running the place. He laughed to himself. Pax hates it. I think he's part South Pole elf. She chuckled. Of all the brothers, Pax was the least involved in group texts, and he hadn't called her at all when each of the other brothers had, some of them several times. She felt like she knew Caleb the best because he was married to Faith, and the two of them oversaw the health of the herd. Do you, uh, want kids? He stuffed his hands in his pockets and stared at the wall behind her. She ducked her head. On the surface, the question was harmless, but because her feelings for Drake grew with each passing minute, she felt like it meant a lot more. Like she was putting her hopes out there in the spotlight. If he had different ideas or didn't want children, then her answer was a deal-breaker. Which was dumb because they weren't in a relationship, and they hadn't talked about getting married or starting a life together. Heck, they hadn't even talked about what they were going to do with Felix once they broke him out of jail. Was their lack of communication a red flag or was it just a product of the newness of whatever was happening between them? She didn't know. She did know she wanted children. And, well, if Drake wanted any type of future with her, then he would, too. Children were on her non-negotiable list. She lifted her chin. I've always wanted kids. I think I'd be a good mom, if for no other reason than I'd know what not to do. His eyes dropped to meet hers, and his face softened. He brushed her cheek, sending thrills racing across her skin. You'll make a great mother for a lot more reasons than that. You think, she asked in surprise. No one had ever told her that before, and sometimes she had doubts, snowman-sized ones. He leaned in so their cheeks touched. His breath was warm enough to melt her bones as it graced her neck. She fought the urge to arch into him and invite a kiss in that very spot. You're full of goodness, Clove. His words were quiet and spoken in a low, inviting voice. He pulled away, and she drifted after him before she caught herself. This man. He made her want to fall into his arms and kiss him until she passed out for want of air. What about you? She tried to sound casual but came up just a little short with a tightness to her voice that belied how much his answer meant to her. He lifted a shoulder. If you would have asked me last Christmas, I would have said no. Really? She worked quickly to school her features. Otis's warning was fresh in her mind. Was Drake going to tell her he wasn't interested in marriage, a future together, and even gulp her? She wasn't sure she wanted to hear it. Not now. Not after such a beautiful day and a wonderful couple of days together. Could he see how well they worked together? What a great match they could be. But you're a family type guy. He laughed. Family type. What is that? She scooted past him and toward the fireplace, doing her best to school her heart as it thrummed, gaining speed. You grew up with a wonderful family. 
you had a fun and trauma-free childhood. By all accounts, you should have half a dozen children by now. And I shouldn't want to claw your imaginary wife's eyes out, she added silently, but I do. She clenched her fist, creating crescent-shaped jealousy marks in her palms. He followed her into the front room and stood behind her, stretching his hands out to the fire to warm them. The move was so smooth. Acting like she took up the whole fireplace, and this was the only place he could stand. She didn't mind being tucked against his chest at all. He smelled a little like the shop they'd left that afternoon and a lot like the spicy scent of his aftershave. She drew in a breath, imprinting the scent in her memory. She'd never be able to smell it without thinking of him. Maybe that's why my family thinks I'm a weirdo. He scooted a little closer and wrapped one arm around her middle. I've always said that I have nieces and nephews. What more could a man ask for? Hmm, she said, to keep him talking. The thing is, when you grow up with four brothers, you kind of want some space. She burst out laughing. Kind of? He chuckled, the sound reverberating from his chest into her back. Goodness, she could do this all day and all night. Yeah. I shared a room with Pax until I was twenty-two. Bunk beds. He shuddered dramatically, and she giggled. Top bunk, he added, making her giggle harder. He tickled her side. You think it's funny? He snores. He does not, she playfully smacked his arm. He lifted his hand in the air. Cross my heart and hope to get a full stocking. She shook her head at him. I think you'd make a wonderful Father Drake. Heck, just sticking around would make you a hundred times better than my dad. But I know you'd do more than that, you'd be a good influence in your kids' lives. She barely stopped herself from saying our kids' lives. You don't say much about your dad. He rocked her to the side and kissed her temple. She sighed. It was hard to share her ugly, even though she knew it wasn't her ugly, per se. But it was a part of her past and therefore a part of her, no matter how much she tried to shed it. She stiffened. He was a hard man, expecting me to be grown up long before I knew how. He laughed at me as I learned and never had an encouraging word. Drake wrapped both arms around her and just held her while she was in that space. He was a fool. She nodded. He was. Could still be. I don't even know if he's alive. She frowned. Probably not. Well, maybe. I don't know. Have you ever looked him up? She scoffed. Never had the desire, to be honest. Does that make me a bad person? No. It most certainly does not make you a bad person. But you took care of your father last year when he was so sick. Shouldn't I feel some responsibility toward mine? She'd peeled back a layer of her guilt with that statement. It was too late to take it back. She'd just have to take the lecture he gave her and then they'd move on and she'd pretend she hadn't said a word. Clove. He moved his hands to her hips and turned her around to face him. Even the best of families are complicated. She wanted to protest. His family wasn't complicated. They were wonderful. I wish I had the answers but I think that, he paused as he arranged his thoughts, the fact that you don't feel an obligation toward him could be a gift from God. Maybe those ties were cut so you can be whatever person you choose to be without your father's sins hanging over your head. Is that why you want to be different from your brothers, to prove that who you are is your choice? His arms dropped, and he stepped back. Is that what you think? She shook her head quickly, feeling his absence like a slap. It was just a question. I don't even think I thought the words before they were out of my mouth. He took another step back. I'm going to need some time to chew on that one. She pointed to herself. Me too. I'd never thought about my dad like that. Nor myself. Her gaze dropped to her socks, and she crossed one arm over her body to hold the other elbow. Are you mad at me? She finally looked at him. He closed the gap between them and rubbed his hands up and down her arms. No. I was just, have you ever heard the truth, and it knocked you upside the head? 
only a half dozen times, she joked in an attempt to lighten the mood. He snorted. Dipping down to her eye level, he said, I just need to process, okay? He pointed to his chest. Not mad. You? He pointed at her. Not mad. He nodded before kissing her forehead and leaving her in the living room. He had a lot more to pack in his room than she did and would probably be up there for a while. She lifted her arms, feeling as though a burden was gone. Grandma told her often that she didn't owe her father anything, but then Pastor Tom spoke about honoring her mother and father and she wasn't sure where that line was in her life. She wandered over to the rocker and sat down. Grandma's knitting burst from the bag she tried to contain it in. She was making a lot of progress on the candy cane afghan. She began rocking, letting her thoughts ramble through the fields of her memories. If she had a daughter, how would she want to be honored? That question had her pausing and thinking a little harder. She'd want her daughter to be a good person, to build snowmen with the neighbor's kids, to take care of others, to fight for her family, and to follow Jesus. She'd want her to love openly. The last one was so much harder to do than it sounded. She hadn't let a person into her heart, besides Grandma and Felix and yes, she knew Felix wasn't a person, but he was family. Could she take that leap and let Drake in? She wanted to. It would be scary and she'd probably have to fight herself along the way, but a man like that was worth the fight. Her body slumped into the rocker, exhausted the emotional journey taking its toll. She felt good. Just so very tired. She had a big night coming up. They were going to get Felix, and then she'd open her heart to Drake. If he asked her back to the ranch, she'd go without a fight. The fire was warm, and she turned her face toward it and let her eyes drop shut. Chapter 23 Drake threw his folded jeans on the bed. They rolled off and landed on the floor. Sighing, he walked over and picked them up, folded them just like Jack would have done, and put them back. Why did Clove's observation about his behavior bother him so much? His phone rang, and he swiped it. Hello? He barked. What critter crawled out of your Christmas tree? Asked Pax. Drake fell back on the bed and threw one arm over his eyes. Don't even ask. Of all his brothers, Pax should understand his desire to stay single. Yet the man hadn't once jumped to his defense. He didn't seem to care one way or another, which also irked Drake. Whatever. I ordered a new tongue for the trailer and it arrived today. I can install it when you get back. Drake growled. I told you I fixed the old one. You can't even tell it had a dent. You could totally tell it was dented, but he wouldn't give his brother the satisfaction of knowing that until he saw it for himself. Pax didn't respond. Are you going to say something? Drake poked him, wanting a fight. Not worth it. We'll figure it out when you get back and the evidence is in front of our eyes. Gur, why couldn't Jack have called him? They'd be halfway down each other's throats by now. This is why you don't have a girlfriend. Drake flew to his feet and started stuffing clothes in his duffel bag. Pax didn't take that bait either. Drake always assumed he was a solitary kind of person, and that's why he didn't date. But, why don't you have a girlfriend? He managed to ask with sincerity. Pax grunted in a non-helpful, non-informative way. Look, we're the last two men standing and I've met someone. You should at least try. You met someone? Why is that what you choose to focus on instead of my advice to get out there and start dating? Because it's the part that makes the most sense. It makes sense that I met someone? How? I'm the guy who says he wants to die alone. Yeah, but nobody believes you. Drake came up short. Why not? This time, Pax's silence meant he was trying to put his thoughts into words, or come up with the most succinct answer. Because when we were kids, you were always with someone. You didn't have to, you could have done your own thing. I don't think you like being alone or feeling lonely. And you do? I'm okay with it in a way you aren't. I can sit with my thoughts, even if they're uncomfortable. Drake stopped randomly throwing things into his bag. He hadn't been able to lay on the bed for longer than 30 seconds with his uneasy thoughts. You need your other half, Drake. I'm whole as I am, he hurried to answer. Let me put it this way, Pax started. Do you spend a lot of time pondering my single status? Drake goaded him because he wasn't sure he wanted to hear what Pax thought. So far, he'd made sense, well except for installing a new part on the trailer to replace the one Drake fixed. When you're with this woman you met, who I assume is Clove, considering the way her name is tossed around out here, 
Yeah, it's Clove, he admitted. So when you're with Clove, do you feel like you're more? More entertaining? More interesting? Stronger? Bigger? Smarter? He thought back to their conversation by the fireplace and the way she looked at him, as if he had an answer for her. Yeah, he admitted reluctantly. Then you need her to become the best version of you. You need your better half. You don't find it in a person. They aren't your better half. But they help you find the better parts of yourself. Drake pulled the phone away from his ear and checked the name. You there? Pax asked. Yeah, I was just checking to see if I'd switched over to dad or something. Pax laughed heartily. If only. I hope I can be half the man he is. Drake couldn't help but agree with him. Maybe you need a woman to get there. According to your logic, without whomever she is, you're doomed to be half the man you could be. You're still picking a fight. What's lingering? Stupid older brother and his maturity. I've been gone for less than a month and you got a psychology degree. Don't tell me. Whatever. Drake couldn't help but remember Clove's description of her father and he realized how lucky he was to have a whole gaggle of family who cared about him. Thanks for talking and stuff. You're welcome. Call mom tonight. She misses you. Drake smiled. He didn't even care that Pax told him what to do. Not when his advice was that solid. You got it. They said goodbye and hung up. Drake went back to packing, putting things in the places he wanted and not thinking about what his brothers would do. Maybe he was like them. Maybe that was normal as they were all a product of their raising. Maybe being like them wasn't such a bad thing. His brothers were good men. Good men who loved their wives, if they had them packs, and provided for their families. Why had he fought against being like them so much? He did what he hadn't been able to do and sat with that question for a minute. It slithered around inside of him until an answer popped up. Because he wanted to be seen. All growing up, he'd worn hand-me-down clothes. Caleb's blue shirts and Jack's orange flannel and forest brown coat and Pax's welding overalls. And on and on and on. He was just the fifth boy in a line of boys, all with the same face shape and body type. Every teacher knew that the Nichols boys were good kids, and the whole town knew he'd grow up to be a wrangler. Not that he resented any of that, he was proud of his family. But sometimes, he just wanted to be him. He didn't want to be one of five. Clove made him feel special, for lack of a better word. She saw the man he was, dumb reindeer kidnapping ideas and all, and her breath hitched when they touched. That small gasp was an unintentional gift she'd given him, and he'd held onto it for a long time. It helped that she didn't know his brothers all that well and therefore wouldn't claim that his neatness was like Jack's, his work ethic matched Caleb's, and his interest in welding and working with mechanical things was just like Pax. She also didn't think he was a charmer like Forrest even though he could outflirt Forrest any day of the week. He sniggered at the thought. Forrest would tell him otherwise. So would his wife, Natasha. She was Forrest's biggest fan. He half smiled at the empty drawer in front of him as he thought about holding Clove's hand in the middle of his family's Christmas Eve party. The image was as warm as a homemade blanket and as inviting as a cup of hot chocolate with marshmallows. The desire to celebrate Christmas alone every year, this year included, was gone. Replaced without a fight by the desire to whisk Clove out to the ranch where mistletoe hung from every doorway. Yes, he was ready for the promise that kiss meant. He no longer believed he was destined to be alone. Although, until this moment, he hadn't felt or understood what loneliness truly felt like. He got it now. Loneliness was wanting someone and not being with them. It was loving and not being loved in return. Although he believed Clove had feelings for him. Not love. Not yet. But the start of love. So yeah, he was ready for that kiss and the millions that would hopefully follow. This was going to be the best Christmas of his life. Chapter 24 The floor squeaked, and Clove lifted her foot. She silently growled in frustration. It didn't matter where she stepped, the wood floor announced her intent to sneak out of the bed and breakfast like a bullhorn in the fog. Not that Grandma would wake up. She could sleep through a tornado. Still, it was the principle of the matter. Sneaking out meant silence, and she was trying her best. She held her boots and grandma's snow cleats that fit over them in her arms. Her plan didn't include a lot of walking in the snow, but she wanted to be prepared. She'd already ordered grandma another pair and they should arrive within two days. She would debated leaving grandma a note or not. She hadn't taken too kindly to grandma running off with Felix and Drake and didn't want to make her grandma feel like they had abandoned her right before Christmas. 
she settled on setting a reminder on her phone to call her in a few hours. Squeak. Son of a biscuit eater, she growled and tossed her hands in the air. I give up. She walked normally down the hall and down the stairs. If Judy caught her, so be it. Drake was already by the back door, dressed in his winter clothes and felt cowboy hat. She really liked him in that hat. The brim dipped just over his eyes and gave him this mysterious, dangerous look that had her blood skipping through her veins. He grinned at her and held out his hand. She took it and he pulled her to him, enveloping her in his arms and layers of warmth. She snuggled in, needing his strength for what lay ahead. When she was ready, she stepped back and pulled on her coat, scarf, and stocking hat. Her gloves waited in her pockets. Drake had the truck already warming up, and they dashed through the cold, dark night to the warm cab like two kids escaping together. Clove laughed as she climbed inside. I can't believe we're doing this. Her head spun with giddiness and she gripped the door to keep from floating away. In less than an hour Felix would be free, and they'd be on their way to Reindeer Wrangler Ranch. The ranch seemed like a dreamland with Faith, Mitzi, and Natasha as built-in friends. Natasha hinted at doing a series of homesteading videos with her, her. An expert. She'd never thought of herself as such, but Natasha was blown away by the fact that she made her own smoked mozzarella cheese and got excited about filming the process. It wasn't hard at all and literally took two ingredients. Then there were Drake's brothers. They seemed like a rowdy bunch of Christian men who enjoyed life and loved their women. They'd been respectful with a dash of teasing on the phone. If they were at all like Drake, then she'd get along with them well. Of course, all this was contingent upon her and Felix staying on the ranch. Which hinged on a future for her and Drake, which was a little uncertain at the moment. Neither of them had declared their feelings if Drake had them. She sure did. Not to mention, he still hadn't kissed her. She'd pondered that one for a while and determined that she was glad he hadn't, because she would have felt like he was trying to play with her to get her reindeer. Or could have felt that way, especially after what Oda said. But the thing with Drake was that he hadn't asked her for anything she wasn't willing to give. In fact, most of the physical contact he initiated was to support her, hold her up, or comfort her. His actions spoke volumes. Which was one reason she wanted that kiss. If their lips ever met, it would mean something to both of them. For her, it would mean that she'd let him into her heart, which was huge. Drake drove slowly through town, with only the fog lights on. The diesel truck was as loud as an elephant, but at least their lights wouldn't shine through the windows. Drake grinned. Excited to sneak out? She laughed. Probably too much. He patted his chest, an excited smile on his face. It makes the heart race, like peeking at presents. She widened her eyes. You wouldn't. Wouldn't you like to know? He winked, and she decided she'd forgive him for peeking as long as his brown eyes smoldered at her like that. She wrinkled her nose as she grinned back at him. The drive to the animal shelter went by quickly. No one was on the roads at 3 a.m. which wasn't a surprise. They'd decided to leave at three so the road conditions would get better as they drove across the state. It was a 12 to 13 hour trip to the ranch, and they wanted to make it in one day. They parked across the street from the animal shelter. It was a solitary building in the middle of an open field. The light on the back of the building was on. Other than that, the safety lights inside the building cast a soft glow across the snow. Sheriff Hoffman's parking spot was empty and the place looked as deserted as Scrooge's mansion on Christmas Eve. Drake shook his head. How is he supposed to sleep with that light on all night? No wonder he's been anxious. It won't be a problem after tonight, Clove didn't wait for him to open her door. Her boots hit the ground, and the snow crunched. She giggled. I didn't take into account crunchy snow when I planned out this jailbreak. He shrugged. We'll have to do our best. He shuffled through the snow instead of lifting his feet. It helped with noise control, so she stepped into his tracks and followed his example. It was probably better that way, anyway. 
they didn't want to leave behind any identifiable footprints. There weren't cameras in the front of the building, so they walked easily, not worried about getting caught. Close pulse thrummed in her wrist and under her collarbone. She told it to relax, that all was well, but her body knew that they were breaking the law and it didn't like it one bit. Her heart beat so loud that it drowned out all other sounds. How did bad guys ever steal anything without passing out? She'd never make it as a burglar. In a giddy, ridiculous way, she crossed that career path off her list and giggled. Light exploded right in her face, and she screamed, throwing her hands up to protect her eyes. What in the snowballs? Drake jumped in front of her and she dropped her arms, using him to block the light so she could peek around him. Who's there? he demanded. Sheriff Hoffman. Drop your weapons. Clove moaned and dropped her forehead to Drake's back. They'd been caught. Her life of crime was officially over. We don't have any weapons. Drake lifted both his arms into the air. You too, sweetheart, griped Hoffman. She's not your sweetheart, Drake growled low. If he was half as dangerous as he sounded, Hoffman better watch out. Clove thrilled at the protective and jealous notes in his voice. They weren't here to have an alley fight though, so Clove stepped out from behind Drake, her hands up. No weapons. See. She waved her gloved hands. Walk forward until I tell you to stop, Hoffman barked. Clove groaned. The situation wasn't getting any better. Any bright ideas, she asked out of the corner of her mouth. I'm thinking, Drake whispered. They started walking. Clove's hopes for a quick reindeer rescue melted like frosty on a warm spring day. Every step they took was one more crushed ornament of hope. We need to get him out of here, Drake continued. How? Clove whispered. Fly, he whispered back. But. All the arguments for keeping Felix on the ground ran through the two steps of silence between them. Send him to Hannah. He glanced up at the sky to the east, the direction of the bed and breakfast. Clove pressed her lips together, trying to figure out how to get Felix to fly when they'd spent so long telling him not to. Not to mention, what would Grandma do when he showed up outside her window? It wasn't close to the light out, but there were enough porch lights in the residential area that anyone could look out their window and see a flying reindeer. There was only one reindeer in town, and it wouldn't take long to put two and two together. It was a chance they had to take. They stopped just inside the halo of light created by the motion light on the back of the building. Hoffman's car was back here. Felix stood in his pen, his ears pinned back, and he huffed giant clouds of air at Hoffman. If he had a chance to run him over or chase him up a tree, he'd take it. It's okay, Felix. We're okay, she tried to soothe him. His eyes darted between her and Hoffman, he'd better not get near you. She nodded. I know. We're doing our best to get you out, okay? But we're all safe and sound in the bed and breakfast. Grandma's sleeping like a log and snoring like a lumberjack. He smacked his lips together, good. What are you doing here? demanded the officer. Clove kept her eyes on Felix. He moved, so he was right behind Hoffman and pawed at the ground. Ever hear the song Grandma Got Ran Over by a Reindeer? Drake snickered. She elbowed him. I couldn't sleep. She spoke as calmly as possible, ignoring Felix's threat to Hoffman. I wanted to make sure Felix was comfortable. He usually sleeps on our porch so he can be near me and Grandma and I worried about him out here. But you're okay, right Felix? She smiled at him. I think you look good. Your coat is shiny and you are so tall and strong. Adding in a few compliments couldn't hurt, could it? He stomped both his feet. The thunder of it tingled the bottom of her feet. Let me at him. He is strong. Just the kind of reindeer we love to take pictures of back home, Drake added. They talked as if they socialized at a holiday party instead of holding their hands in the air in front of an officer. She turned her attention to Hoffman. He had some kind of weapon trained on them. 
The end of it was square and wide and she realized with a blink that it was a taser, not a gun. The tension in her neck released. Being tossed wasn't on her Christmas to-do list, but at least she'd survive it. Right? No one died from being tossed. No one she knew personally. It wasn't like she spent hours watching online police videos. Why didn't she spend more time paying attention to what was going on in the world? Hiding in her little cabin in the woods called to her. Can I put my hands down now? They're starting to lose feeling. She smiled, though it felt pinched and unnatural to her. Drake lowered himself before Hoffman grunted at her. She took that as a yes and lowered her arms too, shaking them out to get the blood flowing. What are you doing here? Drake asked Hoffman. Shouldn't you be tucked in bed? He grunted again and looked over their heads at the camera mounted on the corner of the building. Was it on? If she had Felix fly away, would they have it on camera? That just wouldn't do. Wait, a wire hung loose. Drake turned to look over his shoulder. The camera's out. Huh. Wonder how that happened. He turned back to Hoffman, glaring. Without witnesses, there was no need to avoid a run-in with the officer. Although that taser gun was enough motivation for her to be good. What were you planning? Drake's eyes narrowed, and he shifted his weight to be ready to jump at Hoffman. Clove didn't dare step toward Felix. They were alone out here. Felix? How are you feeling? Do you need to get some exercise? She tipped her head all the way back. With the lights glaring down on them, it was hard to see the stars, but she'd noted them when she got out of the truck. It's a clear night. He dipped his chin, are you serious? No clouds, she added. Drake shuffled forward, drawing all of Hoffman's attention. He swung the taser toward him. Don't move. She motioned with her hand for Felix to go. Do you want to see Grandma? Felix lifted an inch off the ground. If you're serious. Clove broke out in goosebumps. It had been at least a month since she'd seen him fly. The magic of it never ceased to amaze her. Add an enchanting feeling to the fear that he'd be caught, and she was so nervous her lungs couldn't expand all the way. Stay there. Hoffman's arms shook. Drake lifted a hand. No one is doing anything wrong. We won't hurt you. Felix continued to lift straight in the air. His hooves were level with Hoffman's shoulders. Clove silently begged him not to kick Hoffman. She tipped her head to the east. Grandma's asleep. You can probably hear her snoring from here. He stretched out his front legs, doing a mid-air downward-facing dog. He had the good sense to stay quiet, thank heavens. Her heart was loud enough to drown out any sound though, so she couldn't be sure if he was really all that quiet. She couldn't even hear what Drake was saying to keep Hoffman from pulling that trigger. Felix moved to stretch the other way, feels so good to be out of that pen. She grit her teeth. Get a move on, she silently yelled to Felix. His tongue rolled out the side of his mouth and he jogged in a circle before heading south. Clove about died. Did the reindeer have no sense of direction? What the heck was he doing? East. East. Clove, beautiful, I think we'll come back in the morning. Drake groped for her hand. She gripped his fingers, a new fear grabbing onto her. What if Felix flew away and didn't come back? What if she never saw him again? Her hands were ice and her throat was tight. Stay there, yelled Hoffman. Or what? Drake drew up to his full height. Are you going to shoot me? Because I guarantee you, if you pull that trigger, even if you miss, I will make sure you lose your badge. Yeah, right, Hoffman scoffed. Drake narrowed his eyes. His hat brim already shaded them and the shadows made him seem dangerous. We host a lot of important people on our ranch. People who leave with a handshake and tell us that if we ever need a favor, all we have to do is call. He pointed at Hoffman. I would call in every one of those favors to remove any and all the authority you have in this life. When I'm through with you, your dog won't even listen to you. 
Clove blinked. If the situation wasn't so dire, she would have laughed at his threat. His dog won't listen to him? With his words hanging over them Drake turned his back on Hoffman, took her hand, and pulled her into the night. They were almost at the front of the building when Hoffman shouted. Where'd he go? He ran after them, his footsteps loud and fast. Clove gripped Drake's hand. Should we run? Chapter 25 Drake wanted to run. His pulse spiked and his grip tightened on Clove's hand as if she would slip away from him. Felix was gallivanting around town, having been given free rein to fly, and they needed to find him before he was spotted and some well-meaning citizen decided to take matters into his own hands. Or worse, film him. Snowball's escape from Stella a couple of years ago caused quite the holiday ruckus as she traveled around the states, flying through forests at will. At least a dozen different travelers posted videos. If there were that many people who filmed her, there had to be at least ten times that many people who had seen her. They couldn't take that risk. Halt. Hoffman huffed and puffed as he caught up to them. Drake and Clove stopped at the same time. Yeah? Drake turned, making every effort to look like they weren't in a hurry. Hoffman hooked his thumb over his shoulder. The reindeer is gone. What? Clove screamed. She appeared outraged. She dropped his hand and ran back to the pen. Drake fought a smile as he sputtered in disbelief. Clove far outdid him in the acting department. What do you mean he's gone? He's right there. He strode past Hoffman with a determined gait. Don't worry, beautiful. I'm sure Hoffman is pranking us. I'm not. Hoffman insisted. He's not there. How is that even possible? Drake tossed out as the cop dogged his heels. Did you open the gate? No. I didn't. I swear. He just vanished. The panic in his voice was totally worth getting up at three in the morning. Drake gave him a disbelieving look. He'd never come right out and say that reindeer couldn't fly. That would be lying, and that would soil his family name. They caught up to Clove, who stood by the fence, her face buried in her gloves. Drake walked around the pen with Hoffman. He grabbed the gate and shook it. It rattled loudly but didn't budge. Hoffman stepped back and glared. You. You two did this. Clove gasped, playing her hand across her chest. Drake tipped his head to the side. How? You were right here with us. He pointed to where they'd been standing. Hoffman's mouth gaped open. I don't know. But I know it was you too. He looked like he was one candy cane away from cracking. Drake walked away from him. Maybe you could check the camera. It was a bit of a dig, but it still bothered him that Hoffman was back here without the camera on. He opened his arm and Clove snuggled against him, her arm going around his back. We have to find him, she said pitifully. Her acting may have been amazing, but there was real concern mixed in with that statement. Stop. Hoffman screamed. You're under arrest. He ran around them and then planted his feet. For what? Drake asked. For taking an animal out of custody. We don't have Felix. Clove ground out through her teeth. She patted her pockets. Nope. No reindeer. Then why are you hauling a trailer? He pointed triumphantly. Drake managed to look confused. We picked it up from Otis yesterday, and I didn't want to unhook it in the dark. Hoffman glared. I have your plates. If your trailer leaves town, I'll have every highway patrolman on your six. Drake lifted an eyebrow. On my six, huh? Hoffman nodded. You'd better park it where I can see it. He gave each of them a look and then squared his shoulders. Gotta track down a stinking reindeer in the cold. He mumbled as he punched his phone. Mayor Winston, get up. The reindeer's missing. Clove grabbed Drake's sleeve. I don't trust the mayor even less than I trust Hoffman. We need to find Felix before they do. Agreed. He walked as fast as he dared. He didn't want to run and alarm Hoffman who was already at unhealthy conspiracy theory levels. Never mind that they had actually freed Felix. He helped Clove into the truck, and then went around and climbed in himself. The engine fired up, and they pulled away from the animal shelter. He gripped the steering wheel, wanting nothing more than to pull over and soothe all her worries, but they were on borrowed time. Clove put her hand on his forearm. Could one of your brothers come get Felix? She bit her lip. Drake's neck burned. He didn't want to ask his big brothers to come bail him out of trouble, but he'd do it for Clove. Maybe. I don't know. He checked the clock. It was nearing 4 a.m. He debated who to call and finally punched the button on the console and the call rang through the speakers. What's up, little brother? Asked Forrest in a groggy voice. Who is it? Natasha mumbled. Drake, Forrest told her. 
Drake hated it when Forrest called him little brother and Forrest knew it. His brother liked to needle him, especially before the sun came up. Sounded like he didn't mind Natasha at that time of day, though. The sound of blankets rustling came through the line, and he tried not to see the two of them all snuggled up together in their beautiful new house. He glanced over at Clove. Her face softened, and she had that look that women give kittens and puppies when they do something adorable. Little brother, she mouthed. Huh. He'd never thought Forrest teasing him was all that adorable, but if she liked it, and it took her stress level down even a half of a notch, he'd put up with it. Can you bring a truck and trailer out here? Forrest had spent a year looking for Snowflake and was well-versed in transporting reindeer across the country. Send me your location. Forrest hung up. Clove huffed. Just like that? Drake chucked a little. Yeah, Forrest was a pain sometimes, but he had his back. Yep, just like that. She smacked his arm. He hardly felt it through his thick coat. Do you have any idea how lucky you are? She demanded. Coming from Clove, who had Grandma and Felix to rely on, the phrase meant more. I'm starting too, he mumbled as he pulled onto their street. Blue and red lights flashed in his rear view, and he groaned. This guy doesn't know when to give up. He pulled over as Hoffman raced past him and pulled into the bed and breakfast driveway. He hopped out of the car, pointing at them. Stay in the vehicle. Clove grabbed the door handle. Wait. Drake leaned forward so he could see the roof. Look. Up on the housetop, Felix lounged like a lion overlooking the Sahara. He made it. Clove gasped and covered her mouth. Did he see him? I don't think so. Felix is smart. Let's watch and see what happens. She huffed. He's a smart aleck. He chuckled. Five minutes later, Hoffman came around the side of the house, shining his flashlight on the snow. There shouldn't be any fresh Felix tracks around the house, Drake said. It had snowed the last two nights, and following reindeer tracks would have been too easy. Clove giggled. He's so close. All he has to do is look up. She pressed her hand to her chest. I think I'm going to hyperventilate. What made me think I could break the law? This is so stressful. Drake cupped her cheek. It's going to be okay. I promise. She leaned into his touch and into his heart. Hoffman scratched under his Smokey the Bear hat and then went back around the other side of the house. A few minutes later, he peeled out of there without so much as looking at the two of them. That's a fine how do you do from the local sheriff. Drake grinned as he put the truck in gear. He turned the corner, and they pulled up to the band beat just as Felix landed on the front lawn. Clove threw her arms around his neck. I thought you'd left us. Felix turned his neck and rubbed his cheek against her back. I'm not leaving you. Ever. She sobbed in relief. Drake's heart stretched out to her for how much love she had for a reindeer. Felix turned back to Drake, his eyes panicked. Help. She's crying. Drake chuckled. He gently pulled Clove into his arms. Felix sagged. Thanks, man. Drake smiled back, even as he drew Clove closer. You're shaking. She nodded, her face so wet from tears that frostbite was a concern. He pulled his gloves off and wiped them dry. What? What is it? She drew in a quivering breath. When he flew south, I thought he'd had enough of, she gulped back her emotions, that being with us had become too much of a hassle and he was done. Drake wasn't looking into the eyes of a strong woman, he was staring into the soul of an eight-year-old little girl whose daddy walked away from her. He took her face in his hands. Let me tell you something about reindeer and reindeer wranglers. He spoke to that little girl. She was the one who needed to know that she was surrounded by people who cared and who weren't going to give up on her. Reindeer and their wranglers are herd animals. She watched him, soaking up his words. We don't leave people, especially those we call family. He lifted her face a little higher so she would look into his eyes where he poured the sincerity out of himself and into her. You will never be alone, not as long as Felix and I and Grandma Hannah walk this earth. Felix moved to lean his shoulder against her back and huffed, her fly over it. Drake chuckled, her fly over it. He's right. Clove crushed herself against him. He laid his cheek on her head. You're safe. You'll always be safe. It wasn't a proposal but it was a promise, a rather large one for a man who claimed he didn't want to share his life with anyone. Doing so with Clove would not be a hardship. Maybe she didn't want him, but she did grab onto the stability and safety he offered. He'd seen her accept it and felt the calming as her body stopped quaking and grew still. Drake fell into this moment, into the pledge he'd made, into the feel of her in his arms, and into whatever consequences followed. He pulled back, ready to make good on his promise to kiss her. Felix nudged the two of them and then turned his head. 
Drake contemplated ignoring him and kissing her anyway. She was soft and warm and smelled like cinnamon and shampoo. Can he fly again? Calter's voice cut through any romantic notions in Drake's mind. He and Clove broke apart and stared at the little boy who stared at Felix as if he were a superhero come to life. Sorry, said his mom as she wrapped her thin coat around her body. We, uh, saw him come off the roof? She hugged her thin coat around her body. She kept looking at Felix and then kicking snow as if she thought she was in a dream. Clove grabbed Drake's hand. Their secret was out. Chapter 26 Clove couldn't decide who to focus on, Calter or his mom. Calter looked like he wanted to climb on Felix's back and fly around town. His mom looked about two seconds away from scooping Calter into her arms and running for the house. I can't quite believe what I saw. She turned to them. I didn't imagine it, did I? Clove took in her messy bun, face without makeup, slumped shoulders that carried the world, ratted boots, and thin coat and decided this woman could use something magical this Christmas. She put a hand on Felix's shoulder and said proudly. He flies. Drake touched her lower back in a sign of support for her action. Can we come inside and talk about this? Maybe Felix could hang out in your garage? Calter's face lit up and then fell again just as fast. It's full of junk. His mom's face turned bright red. Calter, she whisper warned. It is. Dad left all his crap in there. We don't say crap, she said suddenly, sounding exhausted. You won't let me say any of the other words he used either. Clove pressed her lips together and turned to hide her smile. Drake pulled her into his chest and she giggled, feeling his silent laughter as well. Calter's mom sighed heavily and then cracked a smile of her own. The magic was already working. She stood taller and lifted her chin. I know where we can go. It's not far. Clove perked up, pulling out of his arms. I didn't catch your name. Gabriella, she said over her shoulder. She led them around her house and through the backyard into the woods. Clove trailed behind her on a footpath of sorts. Drake was next. Calter jogged to keep up with them in the shin-deep snow. Felix walked just behind him, bumping branches to make snow fall on the boy's head. Each time, Calter would laugh and brush it away, too busy telling the reindeer about what he'd asked for for Christmas, listing off a new bike, some electronic game, and a TV to play it on. Calter, we talked about this, Gabriella admonished him as his list continued to grow. Calter's lips zipped shut and he gulped down the hopes that had flowed freely only seconds before. Gabriella's eyebrows pinched together, and she ducked her head at dampening his joy. Clove's heart went out to her. It sounded like she'd been through quite a bit. And, if Calter's dad left them, she probably felt very alone raising her son. I wish we could help her, she whispered to Drake. We'll find a way. He set his jaw and she had no doubt that Gabriella and Calter would wake up Christmas morning to find all of Calter's Christmas wishes and more. She didn't know how, but this wrangler had a touch of magic all his own. She sensed it in his determination to save Felix. They came through the trees and into Otis's yard. Clove exchanged a look with Drake. He pulled to a stop. We don't want to bother these people. Otis has already helped repair my trailer. Gabriella held up a flat hand. Her mitten had a hole in the thumb. My mom and dad are good people. She glanced at Calter, who stood next to Felix, his glove on Felix's side. His smile was so big they could fit an ornament inside of it. They'll do anything for him. Otis came out the back door, wearing his signature overalls and stocking hat. What's all this? He had a welcome pep to his step. Calter ran forward and Otis bent to lift him into a hug. Before his arms closed around the boy, Calter was talking his ear off. Felix is a reindeer and he can fly, and he was on the roof and he flew down like this. He swooped his hand through the air. Is that so? Otis's furry white eyebrows lifted, moving his stocking hat back on his head in the process. Gabriella motioned to Drake and Clove. They need help, Dad. Pardic is after them. 
Who? Clove asked. The sheriff. She rolled her eyes. My ex. Drake pointed at her. You and Hoffman? But I thought your last name was Dixon. Clove asked. It is. She repositioned her coat, and Drake wondered if the zipper was broken and that's why she never closed it. I changed our names after he left. Drake barely managed to close his mouth before his true thoughts on a man who not only left his family but didn't care for his child nor want him to have his last name tumbled out like coal from a stocking. The fact that he could turn his back on his own son made Drake all the more happy that they'd gotten Felix away from him before he'd been able to follow through with whatever dastardly plan had him unhooking the security camera. Clove touched Gabriella's arm in sympathy. In that small touch, she managed to give Gabriella support and let her know that she was important in this world and that Clove admired her for her strength. Drake stared in awe. How did women do that so easily? Clove faced Otis who was in the middle of a Felix walk around and admire with Coulter. Coulter told Felix all about his grandpa and the tools he used. He can fix anything, he said proudly. Grandpa, do you see that freckle on his bum? Felix twisted to look, where? Drake took the nanosecond Coulter used to refill his lungs to explain their situation. We need to get Felix to the reindeer reserve, but Hoffman doesn't want him leaving town. He had a hard time calling the sheriff by his first name. Otis scratched under his heavy beard. Why don't you just leave him here? It's not like he's hurting anyone. We can set up a coral or keep him in the shop if it gets too cold. Too cold for a reindeer? Gabriella teased her dad. He chuckled to himself. Drake glanced at Clove. Was she going to tell Otis? Was he? Obviously, he didn't believe Coulter's story about him flying off the roof. Felix rolled his eyes, I'll tell him. No. Clove was too late. Felix bounded twice and then he was off, flying smoothly over the open area, banking right when he got to the trees and then coming back around to land in the same set of prints he'd started in. Otis blinked and rubbed his eyes. Did you see that? he asked Coulter, who had jumped into his arms. Coulter laughed and nodded. Grandpa. I told you he could fly. You see why we can't leave him behind? Drake grinned at Felix. He's kind of special. Kind of? Felix snorted. Clove giggled and stepped over to rub Felix under the chin. You're my special reindeer. My favorite and most handsome reindeer. He leaned into her ministrations and compliments, letting his tongue roll out, making them all laugh. The sun popped out above the trees, blinding them with the reminder that time ticked away. We should get inside, Drake offered. Otis nodded. Let's head to the workshop. Gabriella checked her phone. I need to get to work. Can you or mom take Coulter to school this morning? He's already late. She hurried over and pecked a kiss on Otis's cheek and then gave one to Coulter, too. Someone will talk to him about keeping secrets? She pointed at Felix. Drake nodded. Man to man. We've got this. Drake could have showered her with roses and fancy dinners and it wouldn't have had half the effect on her that seeing him take Coulter by the hand, getting on one knee in the snow so they were on the same level, and explaining the responsibility of caring for Santa's reindeer, including keeping them secret, was something he trusted Coulter to do. Clove's heart melted for this wrangler. He took Coulter into his confidence and treated him like he was capable of keeping this secret. Coulter thrust out his chest, feeling trusted and special. For a kid whose dad left, the validation and inclusion were huge. The fear that had thrown her back in time to the space of hurt and abandonment when she thought Felix left melted completely away. Drake promised he wouldn't leave. She'd wanted to believe him and had talked herself into doing just that, but in this moment, the effort to believe him was taken away. She trusted him so much more than she'd ever trusted another soul. Even Grandma, she'd worried, would leave at some point. Not on purpose, but because she would get older. How much love had she missed out on because fear blocked the door to her heart? Without the fear standing there, 
she felt raw, exposed, and as bare as a Christmas tree without ornaments or lights. Coulter crossed his heart and ran to Felix, wanting every moment with the enchanted reindeer he could squeeze out of this day. Come on. I'll show you Grandpa's shop. Felix followed after him and Otis took up the rear. Drake turned, catching Clove watching him. He put his hand over his heart in a silent promise and she was undone. Her heart door flew open and the realization that she was falling in love with his wrangler hit her with such force she couldn't even lift her feet to move to him. Love. The feeling was warm and comforting like cocoa, exciting like sledding down a hill at full speed, safe like walking in the front door of your home at night, and hopeful like a child writing a letter to Santa. It was too much and not enough all at the same time. As if he could see all of this going on inside of her Drake came for her. She was ready as his lips claimed hers and he gathered her in his embrace. She held the front of his coat because her knees had gone weak with the emotions he poured into her. Acceptance. Hope. Love. Desire. Admiration. Joy. His lips were firm and giving, telling her so much about this man. He was strong and good. He was kind and yet firm. He was the type of man who would fight the entire world to defend his family and he'd taken her into that circle, maybe even closer than that. He pulled back, his eyes searching her face. Was that okay? She hummed, unable to form words at the moment. She put her forehead against his chin and nodded. It's good. Good, huh, he pulled back, his eyes sparkling. Just good? She laughed. You're as bad as a reindeer. She cuddled into him. It was wonderful. Otis cleared his throat from the shop's door. Don't mean to interrupt, but your reindeer is, uh, I think he has an idea? He scratched under his stocking cap and said it all like he couldn't quite believe those words were coming out of his mouth. Drake laughed. I'll bet he does. Clove slipped her hand in the crook of Drake's arm and leaned into him as they walked. She'd found the man, the wrangler, she'd been searching for her whole life through. Drake had given her a gift, and she wanted time to unpack it, to examine it thoroughly, and to thank him properly, but now wasn't that time. She was a herd animal now, just like Felix and the reindeer wranglers. The feeling of belonging not only to the two of them but to something that was bigger than herself was incredibly curative, the medicine spreading through her body and restoring the parts of her that had been damaged for too long. This Christmas would go down in history as the Christmas that restored her. Not only had the little girl inside of her found safety, but the joy that the little girl kept back was set free. You're not going to believe this. Otis held the door to the shop open. Clove tipped her head back and laughed. You're talking to a woman who owns a flying reindeer, buddy. I'm pretty sure it won't be a surprise. Chapter 27 I don't believe it. Drake stared at Felix, who was harnessed, though he used the term lightly, to Otis's grandfather's dog sled. I have to take a picture of this. Felix planted his front feet slightly wider, which made his shoulders look broader, lifted his chin to be level with the floor. The chin lifting also pushed his antlers up and back, a look reindeer thought was attractive. He was such a peacock, though Drake would never say such a thing out loud. He could whisper it to Clove and get a smile out of her. Maybe a giggle if he tickled her side. He loved that sound. Her joy was like candy and he couldn't get enough. When he turned to her and found love spilling out of her like a chocolate fountain, he couldn't hold himself back. He had to kiss her and kiss her right or his soul would have burst out of his skin. He needed her in a way he'd never needed anyone. More than that, he wanted her. Wanted her in every corner of his house and both her pillows on his bed. Heck, he'd even throw in another one, or seven, if she wanted them. He didn't care about those things anymore. This was your idea? Clove asked Felix with a hearty dose of doubt. Felix nickered proudly. All mine. Calter smiled, just as big as the reindeer's nicker. I helped. He stood so tall. He couldn't get the reins over his antlers, so I moved them here. He pointed. You did a wonderful job, Clove praised him. Drake's phone rang, and Forrest's picture appeared. Are you on the road? Drake rolled his eyes. I wish. You're not going to believe what's happening here. I'll send you a picture. Forrest grunted. That wasn't like him. 
What's going on? Mom got a call this morning. There's been an all-points bulletin put out for a missing reindeer. Trevor has already been out to the ranch to ask for help to find him. Windy Plains is claiming finders keepers, which won't hold up in any court, but it will slow us down from getting Felix here, and, depending on where he's confiscated, they may send him back to Windy Plains. What? Drake yelled, startling everyone in the workshop. He waved them off and stepped outside. The good news is that Mom used the bulletin and all the attention it's gotten. Drake snorted. A missing reindeer at Christmas? Yeah, I bet that's all over the news. Nutcrackers. Felix was probably the most famous reindeer of all. Natasha is on it. She's campaigning on social media to have the reindeer brought to our ranch. Mom filed all the paperwork to make Felix one of ours. Legally, she shouldn't have a problem. But you know how these things work. Like pouring caramel on the front porch in January. Yep. And it's the holidays, so people are out of the office. We've talked about worst-case scenarios. Do you want to hear? Let me guess. You'll call in the North Pole and Felix will go to their stables. Forrest Post. It's the worst worst case for a reason. Yeah, because it means we'll never get a calf from him if he goes north that would devastate not only our last hope of raising flying reindeer but Christmas, too. We need to keep him with us. Drake, we'd never make it across several states without being spotted. Even if we traveled at night, can we block out the trailer windows? He paced. And paced. That's like hanging a sign on the back that says, please pull me over and search me. Drake pulled his phone away and silently screamed. Okay, stay there. Help mom. I'll think of something. Unfortunately, Felix's plan of dog sledding through the backcountry to the ranch. Did you get the picture? Hang on. It was silent for a beat and then Forrest's laugh sounded. Well, I guess there's always plan B. I can't believe I'm even considering this. He went to run his hand through his hair and knocked his hat off. He bent to pick it up. I don't even know how long it would take to travel by reindeer dog sled through the woods. If you can buy us a week, we should have all the paperwork in place. A week is Christmas Eve. He hated the idea of not getting home until then. Being on the road wore on him. This little town, with its crooked sheriff and meddlesome mayor, made him want to stay home for the rest of his life. Yeah, Forrest continued, and I say should have the paperwork because... Politics. I know. Something bothered him. How can a mayor from the middle of nowhere make so much trouble? It does seem strange, doesn't it? I'll look into it. Thanks, bro. Anytime. We're all praying for you and rooting for you. If you have coverage, check in, okay? Mom worries about you. Drake smiled. His brothers were so protective. Just mom, huh? The line filled with unsaid words that were thick with the kind of feelings men didn't like to say out loud. Forrest finally cleared his throat. You probably don't know, but when you were born, Dad sat the rest of us down and told us to protect you when he wasn't around, to include you in our brother's club, he called it, and to love you strong. We all promised we would, but Drake, it never felt like a chore. We love you, and we miss you. He swallowed and then said gruffly, get your butt home for Christmas. Drake looked up at the overcast sky, his eyes blurring. Love you, Forrest. Give mom a huge hug and tell her I'll be home for Christmas. And he paused because this was yet another level of promise. I'm bringing someone special. We know. Half the family is already in love with her, and that's just from phone calls and texts. Drake was lighter and happier than he'd ever been. All I have to do is convince her to go on a week-long camping trip in the middle of winter with a flying reindeer. If you two survive that together, you can make it through anything. Right. He chuckled, but his stomach was as unstable as a baby reindeer taking her first steps. This trip was big, in so many ways, and he knew it. Don't forget those prayers. I'm going to need them. Chapter 28 the day passed quickly as Clove and Drake figured out the logistics of taking a reindeer-powered dog sled from Montana to North Dakota. She mapped the route, sticking to wooded areas and backwoods trails so that they wouldn't be spotted. Otis had an old paper atlas with maps of all 50 states. She ripped out the ones she needed, much to Coulter's shock. The librarian would make you pay for that, he said around a mouthful of peanut butter and jelly sandwich. None of them had the heart to make the kid go to school, and he'd been with them or in the house with his grandma all day long. Drake texted Forrest for a list of supplies. He started with shelter and staying warm. As the text thread grew, so did Clove's anxiety. 
How are we going to get all this? It's not like we can wait around for two-day shipping. Turned out that outfitting a dog sled wasn't all that difficult with Otis on their side. I ordered two Sub-Zero sleeping bags to try out before my race in February. He dug around in the corner of the shop and came back with two small boxes. Here we go. Clove gulped. Those are, compact. Did her voice waver? She didn't mean for it to. She wanted to appear confident in Felix's plan, yes, she knew she was following a reindeer into the woods in the middle of winter. She also knew he thought it would be a grand adventure. And she knew that Drake also thought this was crazy brilliant. She, however, wasn't sold on the idea. It wasn't that she was averse to the cold. Yeah, that made her strange. Most women hated the cold and would rather be under an electric blanket than trudging, or sledding, across the snow for hours every day and sleeping in the snow at night. Was she really going to do this? Drake worked with Coulter and Felix to make the harness more secure. He took the trail through the woods back to his truck and trailer and came back with an armful of leather straps and pieces. He and Coulter worked to mesh things together. Drake's brother, Pax, was on video, giving advice. He looked happier with the challenge than a kid in a pie-eating contest. They hadn't fired up the welder, but the option stayed on the table as they discussed the best fasteners. Forrest moved on to texting her food items to pack. He'd spent the better part of a year trudging through the wilds of North America and sometimes into Canada, though he'd deny that if the Mounties asked. The reindeer he'd tracked down, Snowflake, popped into their video chat every once in a while. She even offered to come out and meet them, but Forrest told her that wasn't a good idea. If she was caught, they'd be in a worse predicament than they were now. She huffed, you didn't catch me. Forrest glowered. I caught up to you. She chortled, never would have happened if Billy didn't come along. If Billy didn't come along, you would have been wolf bait, he teased her. She turned and flicked her tail, I'm not talking to you anymore. Beautiful wolf bait, he called after her. The most stunning wolf bait ever. Faith chuckled. I love seeing you all interact with the reindeer. Makes me feel like grandma and I are normal-ish. Forrest threw his head back and laughed. As normal as you can be with these fur balls around. He leaned closer to the screen and cupped his hand around his mouth. Don't tell them I called them fur balls. She pressed her lips together and zipped her fingers across them. What else do we need? She turned the camera around so he could see the pile of supplies. They had a two-man tent that would be cozy, and she wasn't thinking about how close she and Drake would be as they snoozed. If they ever fell asleep, she wasn't sure she could relax enough in wolf country to ever find Rem. They also had a day pack. Two would have been better, but Otis only had one. Their snowshoes and trek poles, an avalanche beacon, she didn't want to think about why they would need that, a snow shovel, three compasses, binoculars, solar chargers, sunscreen, sunglasses, matches, and water bottles. Although the dehydrated meals didn't look like much, they'd sustain life. It was only for a week, right? Drake would put in the tools he needed to maintain the sled and the tack. Once they were away from this place, they might be able to send one of them into town for supplies while the other one waited with Felix in a safe place. They weren't worried about drawing attention by having a small fire to melt snow and cook over, so there was that. Listen, Forrest leaned back and stretched his arms over his head. If you get into trouble out there, call. We'll be there in a jiffy. Clove nodded. These wranglers never ceased to amaze her with their loyalty and willingness to jump to the rescue. We will. Thank you, Forrest. You've been a big help. He grinned. I'm looking forward to sitting around the fireplace with you all and hearing about your adventures. He wagged a finger at her. Keep it on the nice list while you're all alone in the woods. Clove's face instantly burned, and she knew she was the color of a Christmas stocking. Forrest, she scolded. He laughed easily. Merry Christmas, Clove. The screen went dark. Clove contemplated sticking her head in the snowbank outside to cool off. 
forest was such a tease. Her eyes darted to Drake, just like someone else she knew. It was nice, though, to have someone give her a hard time and not feel like she had to throw up all her defenses. Otis approached, a selection of pocket knives in his palm. You'll want one of these too. She picked the smallest one and clipped it inside her pants pocket like she'd seen Drake do with his. Thanks, Otis. I'm so sorry we're using all your gear. I promise we'll get it back to you before the new year. Otis tugged at his beard. Don't worry about all that. Just be sure to let me know when you get there safely. Me and the missus will be praying for you every morning and every night. She tilted her head to the side as she studied him. You're a Christian? He grabbed the tops of his coveralls. I know I don't look like one. Not true. She reached out and hugged him. Besides, it's not about looking like anything, it's about what's in your heart, right? Right, he said gruffly. He pounded her back. Daylight's almost gone. Grandma sailed through the door wearing her snowshoes and carrying a brown paper grocery sack in her arms. Who wants an early dinner? Clove brightened at her arrival. Drake had filled her in when he went back for tack. Like a true homesteader, she was all for them doing what needed to be done. Otis's wife had brought out sandwiches and then hurried back to the house. She didn't like the cold, winter, or the smell of oil, all three of which were found in abundance in this building. It was obvious, though, that she adored Coulter and loved Otis. Clove hurried over to help Grandma with the food. Thank you. Grandma nodded. Anything for you and Felix. Clove's stomach clenched at the thought of leaving Grandma behind. Are you sure you're okay with this plan? Grandma brushed her hand across Clove's cheek. I'm happy to stay back and keep an eye on things here. You'll need someone in the know to warn you if Hoffman follows. And no one knows more about what's going on in this town than Judy. That was true. The woman had a phone tree with branches into the next county. Besides, you should have some alone time with your man. Grandma pumped her eyebrows. Clove contemplated crawling under the work table and staying there. Grandma laughed. You're blushing. Of course I'm blushing. Clove set the bag down and started unpacking. I've never felt like this before. It's a whole lot of warm, she flapped her hands in front of her face, feelings going on. Grandma laughed again, softer this time. That's how you know it's good. Enjoy it, dear. She put her hand on Clove's shoulder. If you're lucky, you only get one time to feel like this. Clove put her hand over the top of Grandma's. Is this what it was like with Grandpa? I could have baked Christmas cookies. Hooey ee. He made my temperature climb. Clove laughed, thinking of her grandma as a young lady all hot and flustered by Grandpa's attempt to woo her. He was a good man, though he was gone much too soon. You heard me, didn't you? Grandma shook her slightly. Enjoy yourself and this time together. She bit her lip. I will. Grandma took a serving of pot roast and potatoes to Coulter, who dug in with all the enthusiasm of a hungry kid. Clove carried dinner to Drake. He went to take the plate, and she held on to it. He lifted an eyebrow. Do I get to eat this? She grinned. It'll cost you a kiss. He swooped down and kissed her soundly, stealing her breath and loosening her grip on the plate. If this moment was any indication, she would certainly enjoy their time alone together, even if they were camping in the middle of a snowstorm. Chapter 29 Drake fought with the sled as Felix pulled them at a fast clip. The reindeer wasn't trained on how to pull a sleigh, and it showed. All the finesse that the reindeer on the ranch had when they did this kind of work was a dream compared to Felix's stops and starts and jogs around trees and shrubs. Drake couldn't relax for a moment or he and Clove would be dumped from the sled. He had it a bit easier than Clove, who sat with her legs inside the cargo basket and was thrown about. She'd started out leaning against his legs for stability, but that was uncomfortable for both of them. Now, she hunched forward in an effort to not bump him off. If they'd been able to try the sled out before taking off, he would have extended to running boards so they both could stand. 
That wasn't an option anymore, though. When they left Otis's place about seven, they committed to making the journey with the sled just the way it was in an effort to escape under the cover of darkness. His truck was still parked in front of the Bambi. Grandma or Judy would move it each day, drive it around town and whatnot. They'd also turn the lights on in his room at the Band B and turn them off again before they went to sleep. Hopefully, their efforts would fool Hoffman into thinking he and Clove had settled in for a spell. Man, his thighs burned. He checked the time. They'd been going for an hour and a half, and he was beat. There was no way they were going to make it to their first stopping point before he ran out of steam. If he had any hope of continuing on in the early morning hours, he needed to make camp and give his muscles a chance to rest. Whoa. He called to Felix. Felix continued on at his jog. His tongue rolled out to the side, and he probably looked like a dog hanging his head out the window on a family vacation. He was all too happy to be in the forest again, seeing the world and gallivanting. Drake had no idea reindeer likes to gallivant so much. Whoa. Drake called as he pulled back on the reins. Felix didn't seem to notice. That wasn't a knock to Drake's pride at all that his tugging didn't slow Felix down. A reindeer weighed over 400 pounds of pure muscles. Of course, his efforts to haul them weren't more than an annoyance. Besides, wearing a harness was a new experience, and Felix hadn't figured it out. That's why they started training the new ones so young. If they knew to feel for the tug on the reins, if they were aware of their bodies and what was happening more than what was in front of their nose, then they responded appropriately. Hey, Felix. Stop, he finally called. Felix glanced back, and Drake lifted a hand. Stop. Felix put on the brakes, and Drake put all his weight on the brake to stop them from running into his back legs. They stopped an inch shy. Felix jerked his nose to the trail. Let's go. Drake hopped off and walked around to loosen up his leg muscles. We're stopping. He breathed heavily as he started to sweat. Being wet under his base layers could mean frostbite. He needed to cool off fast and change clothes. Shelter was his next concern. Clove scrambled out of the seat and walked stiff-legged back and forth. What's going on? Drake leaned over and took deep breaths in an effort to slow down his heart. I need a break. Felix snorted. Really? Drake lifted a hand. Listen, reindeer. This is my first dog. Reindeer. Sled. Experience. I'm learning too. Felix looked him up and down. Too? Drake huffed. His lungs felt stronger, so he stood up and walked to the animal. You're not paying attention to what's going on back here. He grabbed the harness and pulled back on it. The difference between me pulling and the weight of the sled isn't easily discernible. But you'll learn the cues with time. Felix scowled. I didn't realize. No one expected you to. You're doing really well for a first-timer. I promise. He patted the reindeer's side. Do you want to scout out a good tree branch to sleep in? He unhooked the leather straps. They could get caught on a tree branch and snap and then they'd be out of luck. Felix took two steps to the side and looked into the woods. I'm going to walk around. Good idea. His muscles probably hurt too. Whenever a reindeer did new work on the ranch, they felt stiff and sore. Fabric whipped and snapped in the wind. Drake spun around to find Clove unrolling the water protective barrier for the tent. She'd chosen a good spot and gotten to work. Bless her. He went to help stake things down, but she waved him off. Start a fire. We need water more than anything. She was all business and beautiful besides. He knew she was right, but he thirsted for her more than anything. He pulled her to her feet and pressed his lips to hers. Their warm breath mingled, melting the frozen places on his cheeks and lips. Hmm. He hummed against her mouth. She pulled back. What was that for? He gave her an innocent look. What was what for? I was checking you for frostbite. She giggled. I should check on you, too. She tugged on his jacket, and he willingly let her give him a thorough checkup. When they were both grinning too big to kiss properly, she released him. I think you'll survive. He walked two steps backward, his hand beating against his coat over the top of his heart to show her how much she made his heart race. She blushed an even deeper red than the color the wind painted on her cheeks and went back to putting up their tent. Gathering sticks and tinder didn't take much thought, and his mind wandered to clove. He chuckled at the juxtaposition of his feelings versus their situation. Clove glanced at him several times, a worry line between her eyebrows. When he finally had a kettle of hot water, she landed on her knees next to him. What is up with you? She glanced at his forehead as if she was going to check his temperature. I'm not delirious. She lifted one eyebrow. I didn't say you were. 
Is there a reason you would think that I would think you were delirious? She asked in a forced calm voice that had him chuckling all over again. She handed him two metal mugs with cocoa mix, and he poured hot water. I am the luckiest man alive, and I have nothing. He opened his arms wide to indicate the surrounding space. No truck. No trailer. No mattress. No roof over my head. Nothing to eat but cardboard and jerky. And yet I'm the happiest I've ever been because I'm here with you. Drake, she whispered his name. I mean it, Clove. I've never felt this way about anyone before. He settled beside her, using the sled to lean against. She snuggled into him, and they tipped their heads back to look at the stars that winked in the night sky as they sipped hot chocolate. He kissed her stocking hat before taking a drink. The liquid was warm, and he felt it slide all the way to his stomach, where it warmed him from the inside out. Clove was quiet for a moment, drinking and thinking. We haven't talked about us, or Felix. The reindeer was a shadow a dozen yards away. He dug at the snow, looking for food. As a wilderness reindeer, he knew how to fend for himself out here. Had it been any other reindeer from the ranch, they would have had to pack food for him too, and this trip wouldn't have happened. He looked down at Clove. She studied her drink as the steam came off the top. I think Felix should be on the ranch. Drake sat with her statement, letting it roll around in his mind even as his stomach soured. Was this her way of letting him go? She bumped him lightly. Say something. I'm confused. I know I fought you about him going and crashed your trailer and all that, but I was watching Forrest with Snowflake this afternoon, and I've seen you with Felix, and then there's Faith and Caleb, and she shoved away from him so she could turn and look him in the eyes. I thought you'd be happy. He threw back the rest of his cocoa and set his cup aside. He grabbed her shoulders. Let me tell you what I'm hearing, because I'm not sure I like it. She balked. Hear me out, he pushed. She snapped her mouth closed and nodded. I heard you say we needed to talk about us, and then you told me you wanted me to keep Felix, as if you weren't staying and he was. She shook her head quickly. That's not what I meant. Please explain because my heart is thumping painfully and I want to tell it to calm down. She smiled at his words. What I meant was, no matter what we decide about you and me, I want Felix to stay with you. He shook his head, his world feeling heavy. This isn't getting much better. She sighed and wilted. I'm not good at relationships. She set her cup aside and focused on him. What I'm trying to say, and this is all that I'm trying to say, is that I trust you with my reindeer. If that was all, then he liked what she was saying. He smiled and kissed her nose. Why didn't you start with that, darling? She huffed. Because I'm new to this. Isn't that what you told Felix we're all learning here? I'm learning how to share what's in my heart, and it's scary and hard. And why are you looking at me that way? He kissed her fast and then pulled back. Because you're adorable when you're flustered. She huffed again. Stop it. I won't. He kissed her again. I'm going to kiss you and call you adorable and beautiful and gorgeous and amazing and funny and resourceful. Oh, that's romantic. Resourceful. For a wrangler it is. He grinned and she kissed him. I like it when you do that, he told her. She shook her head. You're falling in love with you, he jumped to add. I know it's happening fast and that I'm probably scaring you with. You're not. Scaring me. She pulled off her glove and traced his bottom lip. Because I feel the same way. Her eyes lifted from his mouth to meet his gaze. Is that strange? That you love me? He could fly them home on the wings sprouting in his heart. Nah, happens to ladies all the time. He kissed the finger that she'd left on his bottom lip while smoldering at her. It had better not. Laughing, he pulled her to him and rolled so she was lying on the snow and he could lean down and claim her lips as his own. You're the only one I've ever loved, he promised as he worked his way across her jaw. This, this feeling of being whole and so much more than he could ever be alone was why his brothers had turned into bubbling idiots for their women, why they built them a home and hurried in from the fields at the end of the day. This, this was a slice of heaven, and he'd found it in the middle of nowhere, USA. He prayed he'd be able to hold on to it when real life crashed around them, because he didn't want to be home without Clove. Chapter 30 Clove woke up at 3 a.m. and groaned. The wind whipped the tent side to side with a slap-slap sound. She hurt all over. Drake did most of the driving yesterday, but she'd insisted on taking a shift and managing the sleigh was a whole-body experience. They decided to sleep for a few hours at night and then push on. Then sleep again when it was light out. She wouldn't have any trouble falling asleep in the middle of the day because all she wanted to do right now was pretend her alarm didn't buzz. 
Drake, she nudged him. He was warm, and she'd curled into him most of the night, subconsciously, of course. Wake up. Don't wanna, he complained. She giggled. Is my big, tough wrangler sleepy? His eyes flew open as if he just realized she was there. With lightning reflexes he snagged her into his arms and rolled to pin her under his sleeping bag and all. She laughed easily. It was amazing how quick her spirits lifted with him around. Yes, her body was sore, but everything else about her was happy. He kissed her jaw and then her cheek and then her lips. She sighed into him. I like being yours, he whispered. She shivered in the best way possible. I like it too. Hmm, his lips vibrated against her skin and she melted. Why are we traveling at night, she asked. Let's just stay here for a day or two. She kissed just below his ear to encourage him to agree with her. He moaned, and she thrilled, knowing she had this effect on him. Did you know Felix can see in the dark, he asked. She stopped kissing and moved his face to look at her. He can? Drake nodded. He has a reflective tissue called a tapetum lucidum in his eyes. It allows him to see in blue light. Moonlight, she clarified, thinking of the way the forest looked like it was blue and gray at night. Drake nodded, then bent to trace his lips over her cheek. He can see just as well at night as in the day. But humans can't. Which means we'll be harder to spot at night, she finished for him. Handsome and smart, she mused. Are you talking about me or Felix? Felix, of course, she teased. He pinched her sleeping bag at her side. Lucky thing it was so thick or she'd be shrieking and giggling. As it was, the implied tickle was enough to send her into a fit of giggles. Sometime over the last 48 hours, she'd come to understand how he felt about the oddity of being so happy when they had so little and their days were difficult and trying. She drew in a breath and they both settled. Will it always be like this, do you think? Will we always be so happy? He tucked her hair behind her ear. That's a heavy question for my brain this early. But since I'm handsome and smart, I'll take a whack at it. He winked. I'd have to say no. But only because my parents aren't like this, at least not in front of us. He chuckled. We used to moan and groan if dad kissed mom while we were in the room. Dad would growl at us to be quiet. He cleared his throat and did his best impression of his dad. I'm setting a fine example for you also keep your traps shut, he'd say. Then he'd kiss her again. Clove smiled softly. I've never seen anything like that. Oh, you'll see plenty of it when we get to the ranch. I almost feel bad for Pax because he's the only one who doesn't have someone to kiss goodnight. Clove grinned. Are you counting on a kiss goodnight every night? He nodded. Every night. She ran her hand up his arm and cupped the back of his neck. I don't understand why you love me Drake. He opened his mouth to tell her exactly why, but she put her finger over his lips, silencing him. I'm scared, and you need to know it. This part is easy. Kissing you. Being away from real life. It's fun and an adventure and I'm easy to love right now. Her eyes dropped, and so did his stomach. But I'm hard to love sometimes and I just don't know what will happen. He moved her hand but held it tight. I don't know all that you've been through. I can't answer your worries, but I want the chance to try and grace when I fail. She sucked in a breath, her eyes shining. I don't deserve this. She went to roll away from him, but he grabbed her around the middle and slid her back against his chest. Breathe, darling. Just breathe for a minute. She struggled against him. I can't. He let her go, and she moved to the far side of the tent. Which wasn't all that far, but it gave her enough room to breathe. Her chest heaved with the effort. What is it? He wore a wounded look. One that she'd put there by rejecting his comfort. Regret tore through her like a jagged piece of ice. She was a horrible mess, and she would hurt him if she wasn't careful. Working to slow down her breathing, she scooted closer. I'm not comfortable with all this. 
She swirled her hand around between them. I like it. But then the feelings get too strong, too real, and I want to jump out of them. He frowned as he worked out what she was saying. You think I love you too much? She shook her head. I think any love is too much for me. I'm broken Drake. A hot mess. He lightly touched her hand. May I? She nodded, and he laced their fingers together. Then we take it slow and get you used to all this. He swirled their clasped hands around between them. I'm not in a rush. Are you? She shook her head quickly. Okay. He kissed the back of her hand. Slow. Steady. He kissed her fingers, this time lingering. Sultry. He smoldered. She laughed, the tension bubble in her chest bursting open. Subtle. Seductive? He pumped his eyebrows, making her laugh harder. Smooth, she teased even as she scooted into his arms. Snuggle. That's my favorite. He held her and they stayed that way until her snooze alarm went off. As they put on their outer layers and broke camp, she let feelings of gratitude wash over her. Things were good. Better than good with Drake. They were only a few days from the reindeer ranch, and it looked like everything was going to work out just fine. The fear rising up inside of her had been a bump in the road and she had no reason to worry. She just had to keep telling herself that, and they'd be fine. Just fine. Chapter 31 Drake squinted into the snow that flew at him and bit his cheeks. For lack of a better analogy, it looked like they were jumping into hyperspace on the Millennium Falcon. The comparison had come to his mind when he was a kid, and he'd never been able to describe it in any other way. Of course, when you're on a sled pulled by a magical reindeer, space travel wasn't as far-fetched for him as it was for other kids. He believed anything was possible. Maybe he still did. Clove loved him, and he loved her. Wasn't that magic? With the way the snow came at them sideways, and the size of the flakes, they needed to find shelter fast. Unfortunately, he couldn't see more than ten feet in front of them. The GPS said they were close to a farming community, but their phones didn't work. He pointed them in the right direction and told Felix to find them a place to settle in for the night. He put a lot of trust in this reindeer. So far, it had paid off. Felix was smart when it came to living out here. It was too bad that they didn't have a herd of reindeer that lived off the ranch, by their wits, somewhere up north. Alaska would work. They could be on a reserve where they were protected from hunters but still allowed to be free. The need to fend for himself made Felix stronger. Maybe that's why the flying gene had manifested in him and been lost on the ranch. He'd have to ask Faith about that. She was excited to do a whole workup on Felix's blood when she could finally poke the guy with a needle. Drake wasn't the only one with theories about the flying gene. Faith wondered if the constant medical care the reindeer received, including medications, had altered them. One of her indicators was Rudy, who was born nearly blind. That shouldn't have happened. Thankfully, she corrected the issue with surgery, and Rudy was on Santa's sleigh every Christmas Eve. But they all wondered why the reindeer changed. Why didn't they all fly? Look out. Clove yelled. He leaned heavily to the right. The sled tipped and they barely missed a tree trunk. Felix, she yelled. He bellowed over his shoulder. Sorry. It's getting hard for him to see through the storm, she called up to Drake. I know. We need to consider stopping. He went through their packing list. They had the basics to survive a storm like this, but it would be difficult and Felix didn't fit in their tent. If they could find a building or a big tree that they could at least use to shelter them from the wind, their chances of survival would go up. They're fun. Backwoods adventure was spinning into a really bad idea. Felix picked up the pace. Drake barely had time to lean right and then left again. Hey, he shouted, which was not any command he'd ever taught a reindeer when pulling a sleigh. Felix moved faster and tree trunks blurred past them. Hold on, he told Clove. What is he doing? She screamed. I don't know. His muscles strained and sweat trickled down his back. If the sleigh tipped over at this speed, it would drag Clove along the uneven ground. She'd be bruised and cut, and that was a conservative guess. More likely, she'd be broken in several places. Maybe the snow drove Felix crazy. People often got lost and went nuts in blizzards. He'd never heard of it happening to a reindeer before, but he wasn't willing to rule it out either. 
Whoa, he called. Felix, stop. Felix lowered his head and took it to a whole new gear. Drake's fingers cramped from holding on so tight, but he didn't dare let go. Felix. He didn't bother to hide the panic in his voice. Clove, talk to him. Maybe she could get through to him. Felix. Stop, she commanded. Felix took four more bounds and then stopped so quickly they lurched forward and Drake rolled over the top of Clove, tumbled over the sled, and landed in a heap in the reins. Gah, he yelled as he tangled in the harness. Clove, are you okay? He'd been unable to stop himself from launching over her and the front of the sled. His side hurt like he'd been punched. His legs ached, but that was from the workout of steering the sled, leaning right or left and standing for hours on end. His shoulder protested when he lifted his arm. He wasn't even sure how that happened. As he lay on the ground between the sled and Felix, mixed up in the leather reins and staring at two large feet, he prayed Felix wouldn't take off again. He was in a bad place, with no hope of getting out. Clove. Darlin, please tell me you're alive. The sled shimmied. I'm, oaf, coming. She groaned and gripped and grunted her way out of the sled and crawled to him. The snowflakes were half the size of his hand and they came down so fast he was already half buried. Felix stomped his feet. Get up. Easy for you to say, he told the impatient reindeer. His weight on the harness wasn't comfortable for either of them. I'm stuck. Felix huffed impatiently. Clove hovered over him. Nutcrackers. Your head. She looked around for something. Drake touched his head and felt something warm. He drew his hand back to see a dark stain on his fingers. I'm bleeding he said in disbelief. He couldn't feel the wound and didn't have so much as a headache. How bad is it? I can't tell. Clove found his stocking hat, packed some snow on it, and used it as a compress over his wound. He hissed. He felt it now. He looked around them. They were out of the trees, in a field of some sort. We need to get you out of this weather so I can see what the damage is. Her forehead wrinkled with concerns she didn't have to voice. They couldn't both go to the hospital and leave Felix alone. Felix was acting strange, and they didn't want to leave him at all. The weather would make it near impossible to find a hospital. How would they explain his wound? He put his gloved hand over hers. We'll figure this out. She pressed her lips together and nodded once. Her faith in him was enough to get him moving. Help me get out of all this, would you? Felix stomped his front hoofs. Can we go inside? Inside where? Clove asked. He stretched his neck out and jerked his chin to the right. Drake squinted that direction. Did the bump on the head make his vision blurry, or was the fog coming on? A spot of red appeared. A square spot. Is that a barn? Clove asked. He lifted the shoulder that didn't hurt. It's something. At the very least, it's a wind block. He pictured a lean-to full of hay. That would protect Felix, at least a little bit. They could make this work. Let's go. He began to work himself out of the mess he'd landed in. Clove helped, her movement stiff from sitting for so long in the cold. You're pretty amazing, you know that? He complimented her. I can't believe how tough you are. She gave him a weary smile. Not feeling so tough right now, but thanks. He kissed her head. You're doing great. We can rest soon. She nodded, a determined line between her eyebrows. Darn it all if she wasn't the most beautiful, tenacious woman on the planet. If someone had asked him six months ago to list the qualities he looked for in a woman, he wouldn't have listed resolve and steadfastness and he would have been a fool. Once he was out, Clove hooked her arm through his, and they started off, moving like they were in a three-legged race. Felix trudged along beside them, the sled bumping and listing to and fro. He wasn't as worried about it being damaged in an open field. The closer they got to the red blur, the clearer it became that it was a barn. An ancient barn with peeling paint and broken windows. It's beautiful, he mumbled, his heart full of gratitude for the half-rotten building standing up against the storm. He tossed the snowball he'd been holding against his head off to the side without looking at it. The bleeding had stopped and his head hurt, a heartbeat throbbing through his skull. The first aid kit called his name. He grabbed the door handle and pushed his shoulder against the wood, feeling the jolt through his other arm. The door flew open, and he stumbled inside. The scent of hay hit his nose, and he sneezed. Clove stepped inside and sneezed three times in a row. He laughed. You're a three-sneezer? She nodded. Grandma, too. It's a time-honored tradition in our family. She joked as she scooted cautiously into the building. He leaned out and motioned for Felix to come in. Felix stopped at the door and gave him a dubious look. I can't fit. His antlers were wider than the doorframe. Trust me. Drake reached up and grabbed his antlers, 
turning him to the side so he could fit. Step forward. Again. He turned him straight and Felix moved into the building. At least it was tall enough for him. Clove turned on her flashlight and looked for a light switch. I don't think we have electricity. The sled, still harnessed to Felix, bumped against the door. Hold up, buddy. Felix stopped and waited for him to unhook the harness. When it was off, he gave a mighty shake of his whole body. That feels so good. You have no idea how constricting that is. Clove patted his side. I wear clothes every day. He grunted. Moving to a pile of hay in the far corner, he turned around three times before settling in. Good night. Night. Clove called. Felix lifted his head, took a large bite of hay out of the bale next to him, chewed it, and then tucked his head down. Seconds later, his eyes drifted shut, and he was out. Per guy, Drake frowned. He wore himself out to get us here. Clove rubbed her hand up her arm. He did. I wish I had some oats for him. I'll give him a bucket full when we get to the ranch. He's more than earned them. Drake resisted the urge to hold his head as it pulsed. Instead, he grabbed onto the sled and muscled it through the door. Leaning over made his head throb louder. Clove put her hand on his arm. You need to sit down. Too much to do, he protested. The effort to speak was alarming. Check my eyes for a concussion, will you? She blinked and then tore off her gloves. I can't believe I didn't think about that. She mumbled as she moved the flashlight in from the side of his vision, watching his eyes constrict. They're fine. It doesn't mean you don't have one, though. I'll move slowly. She didn't look happy that he moved at all, but she'd have to deal with it because he couldn't rest until he was sure she was taken care of. The building was much safer than being in the elements, but it was still cold. They needed a heat source. I've been saving these for a special occasion. She pulled out two small cans with green labels that read, Heat Source. I could kiss you right now. He did just that, and she grinned at him. He laid out the moisture barrier in a place where they could lean against a couple of hay bales. A couple of nights ago, when he was bored, he'd read the paperwork that came with the silver fabric and learned it was fire retardant as well. That was helpful, since they were in a barn full of dry hay. Clove set the kettle over the flame to heat and then pulled out the sleeping bags. Drake unzipped his to wrap around his shoulders while he sat by the small flame. Already, he could feel a difference in the air. It wasn't a large heater, but it was specifically made to heat small spaces. If they used it in the tent, it would have them nice and toasty in no time. It would have made him nervous, though. What if they fell asleep while it was burning and kicked it over? At least he knew his mind was clear enough to think about safety. Score two for not having a brain injury. Clove, wrapped in her sleeping bag, sat next to him and they watched the kettle. If you make a joke about a watch pot not boiling, she lightly threatened. Glancing at him, she jolted. What? She shook her head. Nothing. Sorry. It's just, she dug in the bag for a washcloth and poured some of the lukewarm water over it. You're a bit of a mess. She wiped the side of his head and ear where he'd bleed. Drake grit his teeth. Sorry. She paused. For getting hurt? I don't think that's something you need to apologize for. I'm going to glue this together. He leaned into her touch even though it hurt like walking on peanut brittle. He needed to think about something else. Mom glued him and his brothers back together from time to time, and he wasn't at all worried about having another scar. Besides, this one was in his hairline, not even noticeable once it healed. What did you ask Santa for? She pulled out the small first aid kit Otis included for them. Bless that man. Drake owed him so much. I didn't ask for anything. Did you? We write letters every year. You realize you're quite grown up, don't you? She dabbed disinfectant on the wound and fire raced through it making him grit his teeth so tight he could have bit through granite. He dipped his chin a smidgen. She blew lightly on the cut, her lips forming a sweet, kissable O. As much as he would love to kiss her until they were both warmed through, his energy level dropped every second. What did you ask for? She twisted the top off the super glue and popped open the top of the foil container. Back on her knees, she pinched his skin together. He gripped her leg for support. A new leather wallet, a bottle of cologne, and a tweed coat for Sundays. She paused and moved to the side to study him. Like a suit coat? Nah, like a western cut coat. He motioned, zipping it up. Fitted. Wool. Gray. She chuckled. A bit of a dandy, huh? She blew on the glue to dry it faster. Then she added more glue and blue again. I like to look good. There's nothing wrong with that. He gave her leg an affectionate squeeze. With you around, I'll have to be on top of keeping myself presentable. 
She moved to rub his now bearded jaw. What if I like the scruffy look? He grabbed her around the middle and pulled her into his lap. I forget you're a mountain girl. He buried his chin in the curve of her neck until she giggled and squealed. She managed to kiss him, which distracted him from tickling her. The kettle blew, and they broke apart, breathing hard. I can pull off being a mountain man. She giggled as she shoved him back so she could pour the water. He held the cups for her. At this point, he'd drink warm water and be grateful for it. But the cocoa was delicious and soon he felt sleepy. So what would you ask for from Santa? For some reason, it was important that she participate in this holiday tradition with him. Santa was not only a yearly figure in their lives, the whole Kringle family were friends. Uh, hmm. She settled against the hay, her eyes unfocused. I haven't asked Santa for anything since I was six. Six? He asked in disbelief. A six-year-old should be in the throes of writing letters and watching the fireplace on Christmas Eve. She closed her eyes, her body relaxing even more. I figured Dad lied about everything. Why not that too? Ah, uh, shoot. He'd never wanted to hit someone in his life, you know, besides his brothers every now and again. But he wanted to pulverize Clove's father. No. He didn't deserve the title of father. Drake's blood boiled. She yawned. I believe you, though. She put her arm across his chest and settled in. Drake laid his hand over hers and soaked in the love and peace. You believe me? About Santa? She nodded softly. His anger was gone, replaced by the sense that everything about this moment was right, that he was supposed to be here with her. He'd never quite understood what people meant when they said the stars aligned, but he got it now. This was his place. She was his woman. They were a pair. He drifted to sleep while the wind howled, and the rafters shook. If the barn didn't fall on them, it would be a Christmas miracle. Chapter 32 We're not far. Clove grinned up at Drake as they cleared another bluff. Just in time for Christmas, Adam. Pastor Thomas used that phrase to talk about the day before Christmas Eve, because Adam came before Eve. She'd always found it cute and quirky. They didn't have long before the sun set and a warm shower and a proper bed called to her. Below them stretched out the Reindeer Wrangler Ranch in all its glory. The line of houses up the drive, each one a little different, but all of them stunning. The road stopped at the yellow farmhouse where his parents lived. Drake told her all about the ranch, and she felt like she already knew her way around. There was the indoor barn where the flying reindeer lived. There was the indoor arena they used to train the reindeer for Santa's sleigh. There were the pasture lands and grazing fields. There were the chutes and corral where they vaccinated the herd. That garage was for the sleds that the reindeer pulled, tractors, and other farm equipment. It's beautiful, she whispered. Picturesque. She imagined Mitzi in the kitchen, helping Billy with his homework while making dinner. Faith and Caleb working in their home office, their little rider toddling around with a toy in his hand. Abner and Anna were by the fireplace. Whoa. Drake pulled up on the reins. Over the last few days Felix had gotten a lot better at listening to and feeling their signals. They ran as a well-oiled machine when it came to racing a dog sled. She'd even joked that they should try to enter some kind of backcountry race. What a team they would make, and they did all those miles on foot. Imagine what they could do when Felix flew. She was so proud of her reindeer. What's the matter, she peered over the top of the sled. When she sat in the cargo area, her head was just above the top, but she couldn't see much because she was so short. We've got trouble. Drake pulled to the right and Felix turned, taking them back down the hill where they were out of sight of the ranch. Drake hopped off the runners. Do you want to come see? He held out a hand to help her up. Do reindeer fly, she asked sarcastically. Of course she was going with him. He dug around in the cargo before coming up with the binoculars. Felix shifted his weight nervously, I'll just hang back here. Good idea. She patted his rump. They didn't want the other reindeer to see him and alert everyone that they were back until they were ready to be seen. They climbed up the hill until they could look over the top of it. Laying on their stomachs, they stared out over the ranch. Drake pulled up the binoculars and focused them. That's what I thought. He handed them to her. See the blue truck with the logo on the side? 
It doesn't belong out here. Clove tried her best to make out the words. It's Animal Control, North Dakota. He unzipped his coat and pulled out his phone. I'm calling Caleb and Foddy. He put the phone on speaker. Caleb's voice boomed. Drake. It's so good to hear your voice. How's the honeymoon? Drake's eyebrows shot up. Clove mirrored his shocked expression before going back to the binoculars. It's fantastic, he said sarcastically. Why do you ask? Just checking in with you. It's been a few days, but I didn't expect you to call on your honeymoon. Caleb stepped out onto his front porch. His red coat was clearly visible against all the snow. Sorry about that, he said quietly. What is going on? Drake asked. A lot of people have been looking for you and Clove. I guess her grandma told a sheriff in Montana that you two eloped and she didn't expect to hear from you for a while. Wait. Clove grabbed Drake's hand and pulled the phone closer to her. Grandma told Hoffman that we eloped? Was he harassing her? Is she okay? Drake scooted closer to her, wanting to be a support and help. She and Hannah were close, they took care of one another on the homestead. It was a lot like how his family managed things on the ranch, everyone had a job, except, on the homestead, it was just the two of them to do it all. Pretty amazing. I don't think he was harassing her as much as showing up regularly. Hannah seemed annoyed, but I don't think she's afraid of him. He chuckled. If what Rory says is true, it was the other way around. Something about sharp knitting needles. Clove grinned wickedly. That's Grandma. Faith talked to her the other night. We were all worried when the blizzard blew over your signal and you didn't answer the phone. We were well out of service, Drake said. Figured. Anyway, she said she'd told the guy you'd run off together to get married, and that she didn't expect you back any time soon. He stopped coming around after that, so it worked. At least there's that, Clove smiled, though it was strained. Why are you keeping up the eloping thing? She glanced quickly at Drake and then down again. He wanted to tease her about making it all official, but not in front of Caleb. His brother would have the preacher in mom's living room within the hour to call his bluff. That's where things get kind of crazy. Forrest was looking into the mayor, said you asked him to find out why he has so much influence. I did, Drake hoped that hadn't come back to shoot him in the foot. The director of the Fish and Wildlife Commission in Montana is the senator's brother-in-law. The kind that like each other. So? Drake prompted. So. The director has a son. One he and his brother-in-law are awfully proud of and want to see him in Washington one day. Oh no, Clove covered her mouth. Oh yes. Mayor Winston is destined to be a senator, if they have anything to say about it. Caleb sniffed. The sun went down and the temperature dropped with it. Saving an endangered species would have been the cowboy's white hat he threw into the political ring. Wickman called in a favor from dear old dad and dad called a couple of friends in our state and now Rory has to camp out here to corroborate Grandma Hannah's story. Drake looked over his shoulder at Felix, who waited patiently for them. Is it safe to bring Felix in? Sure. We're fully licensed and insured to take in rescues. It's not Felix they're worried about, it's you too. Us, they said at the same time and then smiled at each other. Clove wrinkled her nose like it was so cheesy, but he knew she loved it when they were in sync. Yeah. Hoffman claims you stole the reindeer from the animal shelter. Did you really dismantle a video camera? No, they shouted together. That was Hoffman, it was broken when we got there. Clove inched forward, as if she could crawl through the phone to prove her innocence. I figured as much. If you can, Caleb cut off at the sound of the door opening. He didn't hang up and Clove put her cheek next to Drake's as he lifted the phone closer to their faces so they could hear better. Look, I'm not asking for much. I just need to talk to them. Without a video, Hoffman won't have any evidence. Drake leaned over and whispered in Clove's ear, that's Rory Anderson. He's a friend of the family. 
What about Felix? asked Faith. Her light blue coat was barely visible on the porch because she was hidden by the Christmas tree they used for decoration. As soon as he sets foot, or hoof, on the ranch, he's safe. It would take a presidential order to move him back to Montana. Clove closed her eyes and mouthed thank you. I'll be back tomorrow. Rory tipped his hat before striding down the steps toward his vehicle. Caleb put his arm around Faith and they stood there until Rory was in the animal control truck and pulling out. Did you hear that? he asked Drake and Clove. Drake wanted to sing. A deep sense of longing to be home overcame him and he jumped to his feet. Yes. We're coming in hot. He grabbed Clove, the two of them scrambling to their feet, and ran down the hill for the sled. Drake hooped and threw his hands over his head. Come on Felix. We're going home. Felix stomped his feet, all four of them quickly. Clove climbed into the cargo hold, and Drake took up the reins. On Felix, he shouted. Felix took one mighty step forward and then another one that was three inches higher. In a flash, they were in the air, swooping over the snow and down the hill. Drake hooped again. He may not have taught the reindeer the flying command, but it was in Felix's blood. Are we flying? Clove asked. He grinned down at her. We're flying. The air whooshed all around them, tugging at their clothes and tickling their cheeks. It wasn't harsh like riding a snowmobile at top speed, and it never bit into you when you flew with a reindeer. They're coming. Caleb yelled. He waved his hat over his head. Welcome home. Drake hooped. He couldn't help himself. Joy overflowed and came out of his lungs. Felix trumpeted. Clove laughed. I've never heard him do that before. They lifted over the fence. She yelped and gripped the sled. Drake laughed. He'd forgotten the thrill of flying. Over one more fence and they blew past his parents' house just as the door flew open. Oh. Mom gasped and then surged out into the cold. Merry Christmas. Drake waved and kept going. His brothers and their families ran out from their houses, yelling and cheering and whooping at the sight of Felix pulling a dog sled. He was magical and strong and beautiful and all their hopes for the ranch and their children were in one big fur ball of an amazing reindeer. Their excitement was too much to contain, and they raced forward. Drake turned the sled and went back up the lane. This time, Caleb and Jack ran alongside them, laughing and pounding each other on the back. Forrest was already halfway to their parents' house, knowing that was their final destination. Look at you, he yelled to Felix. You're perfect. Look at that rack. You're amazing. Felix twitched his ears, I could get used to this place. Forrest laughed and tripped, catching himself at the last second. Drake pulled to a stop in front of his parents' house. Pax raced down the steps and stopped just shy of Felix. He stared and stared. You did it, he whispered. He turned around and yelled to his parents, who stood on the bottom step. He did it. Drake was torn from the runners and hugged and pounded and congratulated and passed from brother to brother. He turned to share the moment with Clove and his breath caught in his throat as his dad reached down like the gentleman he was to help her out of the sled. Dad had his hat over his heart, having removed it out of respect for Clove, and one hand extended. Clove stared up at him, worrying her bottom lip as she contemplated his offer for help. Time seemed to slow down and the sounds of celebration faded into a buzz in the back of Drake's thoughts. She trusted him, but could she extend that trust to Dad so quickly? Chapter 33 Clove stared at Abner's hand as he waited to help her from the sled. She couldn't believe she was face to face with the man in the videos. The man who had shown her another version of a father, a version she wished she'd had growing up. He looked softer in the daylight. His white beard was as full as St. Nick's, his head as bald and his belly as, well, jelly. He had on a heavy work coat and a matching felt hat, which he'd removed upon addressing her. She'd seen men do that before, but never for her. We've looked forward to meeting you, Clove. His blue eyes twinkled. 
Why you have, she asked, dumbfounded. Why? Her brain turned on. Oh, because of Felix. Of course. He chuckled, and the sound was pleasant and comforting. We're thrilled to have Felix on the ranch, but we've been waiting for a woman who could capture Drake's heart. You my, dear, are the answer to many prayers. She shifted, not sure how she felt about that. No one ever wanted her. Her dad certainly didn't, and grandma took her in. The two of them learned to love one another, rely on one another, and formed a family bond. Although, maybe grandma loved her from the start and it was Clove who took her sweet time. Yeah, that was probably the case. Funny how looking at things backwards brought clarity. I've never been the answer to anyone's prayer before. She took his hand, though she made sure to support her own weight and only use Abner for balance. Drake's stories about his fight with pneumonia last year gave her caution. I'm willing to bet my stocking that's not true, he winked at her as he tucked her arm into the crook of his elbow and walked her towards the rowdy crowd praising her reindeer as if he were the first one they'd ever seen. Natasha burst through the group and threw her arms around Clove's neck. You made it. Clove stepped back to maintain her balance. Abner let go of her and allowed his daughters-in-law to overtake her, as their husbands had overtaken Drake. You must be freezing. Mitzi exclaimed, while rubbing her arms to create warmth. She wasn't freezing at all. Whatever magic made it possible for Felix to fly also kept her warm. It was truly an enchanting experience. One she hoped to repeat someday. Oh. I wish we'd been able to vlog your trip here instead of keeping it a secret. Natasha bounced on her feet. You know what? We're going to use your homesteading experience, mix it together with wilderness survival in the winter, and do a ton of posts. That sounds like fun? Clove asked, not quite sure what the right response was. I want to hear all about Felix. Faith took her hand and pulled her through the crowd to her reindeer. Mitzi and Natasha followed, chatting easily about the upcoming holidays and what they were contributing to the big dinner. Would she be required to make something? Where would she cook? Where would she sleep tonight? More important than all of that was the question, where would she shower? Felix was busy impressing the men with his tough guy act. She didn't want to interrupt him with the guys, but she needed his strength. She put a hand on his shoulder and he leaned into her, ready to hand over whatever she was looking for. When did you bond? asked Mitzi. Bond? Clove was stuck on the logistics. Drake's family seemed happy she was there, but no one mentioned sleeping arrangements or showers, did no one smell her? She barely resisted the urge to sniff test herself. Yeah. Bond. Like Billy and Snowflake. She pointed and Clove turned to see a little boy walking with a beautiful tawny reindeer with huge, dark eyes that stared right into her soul. She glanced at Felix and then glanced down as if she were shy. Billy's hand was on her shoulder, just like Clove's was on her reindeer. I, I am not sure there was a specific moment. Felix turned to her and narrowed his eyes, yes, there was. She shook her head at him, not wanting to reveal everything to these strangers. She hadn't even told Drake about the night Felix arrived. It was too hallowed. Um, do we need to worry about the reindeer getting along? She stepped, so she was between Snowflake and Felix. A silence descended upon the group. Drake moved behind her and placed his hands on her shoulders. It's not Snowflake we need to be concerned about. She half turned and looked up at him. Who then? Drake looked to Caleb, who looked to Jack, who looked to Forrest, who looked to Pax, who looked to Abner. He held his belly and chuckled. The one we have to worry about is Dunder. He's the king around here. If he doesn't let Felix into the herd, then, well, they'll all shun him. Clove put her arm under Felix's neck and held on. That's horrible. Abner lowered his head and lifted his shoulders. It's the reindeer way. When should we introduce them? asked Drake. A mighty reindeer trumpet sounded in the barn, the noise loud enough to make Billy cover his ears. Sounds like we should get to it. 
Abner reached for Anna. In the indoor arena? She nodded. That'll give them some room. Room to what? Clove asked quickly. Jack rubbed his gloves together. To duke it out. He quick jabbed the air a couple of times. Reindeer style. Clove spun in Drake's arms. You didn't say anything about him having to fight another reindeer. Drake furrowed his brow. Haven't you ever watched the Discovery Channel? Males are territorial. Clove shook her head. You didn't tell me. She shrugged off his arms and stepped up to Felix's face. A storm brewed inside of her, started by the overwhelming number of people who hugged and handled her. She wasn't used to such treatment, such openness, or such deep attention. Even at church, she managed to keep things surface level with the women she associated with or bumped into during the week. There was nothing surface level about the Nicholas family. The storm inside her came on fast the moment she perceived a slight and made her feel out of control of her mouth and her actions. She clamped her glove over her lips to prevent herself from lashing out in front of all these people, like her dad had done many times before he left her at grandma's. Before anyone makes any decisions, Forrest hurried to defuse the situation. He rounded on Clove and smiled, throwing both his arms out to the side like he was inviting her in for a bear hug. You should meet Dunder? Me? Clove pointed to her chest, the storm moving into a holding pattern. Heads bobbed all around her as if this was a great idea. Perhaps it was, she had no idea. Besides, she'd not met another flying reindeer. Wait, can Snowflake fly? she asked. Snowflake blinked those huge eyes once and then lifted off the ground. She hopped around Billy and then sat back down, light as a feather on her black hooves. I sure can. Felix sniffed the air, you come from the forest, too. She bowed slightly, I lived off the ranch for a time. With him. Billy grinned. Mitzi put her hand around his back and they formed an image worthy of a Christmas card. We are so very thankful for all that Snowflake brought into our lives. Snowflake tipped her head, does that mean I get carrots for dinner tonight? Mitzi laughed. Why not? It's Christmas Adam, we should celebrate. Snowflake bounced happily, drawing laughter and indulgent looks from the adults. Drake took off his glove and then lifted her hand and removed cloves, too. He laced their fingers together and touched his forehead to hers, not even caring that his entire family witnessed his tender affections. She was all too aware of everyone watching, especially because they all went, ah. Please try clove, he whispered. The storm drew back, though it continued to swirl. Meet Dunder. If you don't like him, I'll eat my gloves. His friendly and ridiculous wager jolted her from the storm's path and she could breathe once again. Okay. In a blink, they swept her up in a tidal wave of people headed for the indoor barn. You're going to love him, said Natasha. I'm in his stall as much as possible. It's true, said Jack, as he winked at his wife. But it could be because I'm in there and she can't get enough of me. Natasha smacked his arm and gave him a look that said kisses would come as soon as they had a moment alone. Mitzi, Billy, and Snowflake meandered back to their house down the lane, Snowflake chanting, Carrots. I like carrots. As they went. Clove twisted to look over her shoulder and saw Abner and Anna standing with Felix. Abner talked to him while Anna praised him up and down and scratched under his chin. Felix wasn't at all worried about her, and she turned back toward the barn, ready to face the king of the reindeer. Chapter 34 Drake wished he had a minute to warn Dunder about how skittish Clove was before he brought them together, but there just wasn't time. Once the family got set on an idea, they went to work, and they'd grab this idea like it was their saving grace. It might be. Jack opened the barn door and removed his black felt hat. He stepped back and let Natasha and Faith through. Faith's mouth set in a determined line. She, out of all of them, knew what it meant to Dunder to bring another male reindeer into the barn. Caleb kept his hand on her lower back, a physical connection that they both drew strength from. He moved to put his hand on Clove's back in the same way only to feel like he'd hit a wall of sticker bushes before he made contact. 
He pulled his hand back. Clove was working through all this. His family was a lot to work through, and she needed space like that day in the tent. He could give her that, even though everything inside of him wanted to hold her close. The ground shook, and Faith stumbled. He grabbed her, and they steadied one another. What was that? She asked. He refused to lie. Dunder. He's getting impatient. They stepped through the door and let their eyes adjust to the brighter light inside. None of the other flying reindeers so much as poked their heads out of their stalls. Dunder snorted right next to his stall door. I can smell him. That's not Felix, you ninny. Faith's voice was too high, strained. It's his person. Like Billy for Snowflake. Clove is Felix's bond. He bumped the door with his antlers, and they shook on the hinges. Jack and Drake made eye contact. Maybe this wasn't such a good idea. Drake glared. You thought it was brilliant five minutes ago. Dunder stomped again, and the next thing they knew, he was over the stall door, over their heads and coming in hot. The family backed up to the opposite wall to give him room to land in the breezeway. Wawo, Clove stayed in place, her whole head following him up and over the wall. Drake stayed right with her and put his arm in front of her. Not that he'd be able to stop a raging reindeer, but he had to show Dunder that Clove was important to him. Dunder took in their stance as he settled on his feet. He didn't fly as much as he used to but showed no signs of fatigue or his age. In fact, he looked ten years younger with his chest puffed out and his head held high. His pelt was shiny and healthy and his eyes were as clear as ever, taking in everything. His glare lingered on Drake's arm. You claim her? Drake nodded. I do. His eyes shifted to Clove and he stepped forward, sweeping his antlers in such a way that Drake had to dodge to the side and lose his physical connection with Clove. Hey, he called trying to get back in place. Dunder wasn't having it. He circled Clove, keeping his body between her and Drake. Forrest grabbed his shoulder. Trust him. Drake fought with himself. He trusted Dunder always had. But this was Clove, and she was spirited and skittish. If Dunder made one wrong move, she'd leave and not look back. He realized with a start that nothing in his worries had anything to do with Felix or the ranch. He was truly terrified of losing Clove. I love her, he said, stunned that he'd admitted it to his brothers so easily. Forrest chuckled and squeezed his shoulder tighter. We kind of figured. Are you just catching up? Drake grinned. He couldn't help it. Yes, the tension in the barn was so tight that he could have strummed it like a guitar, but he couldn't keep himself from smiling. Dunder leaned in to sniff Clove, and Drake held his breath, praying with all his might that the protective, territorial, and wonderful reindeer would not mess up his chance with the woman he loved. Chapter 35 Clove held still as Dunder moved in. He was massive. His rack was twice the size of Felix's and just as thick. The muscles in his neck rippled as he stretched out to smell her. His powerful legs could trample her in seconds. I'll bet you pulled Santa's sleigh all by yourself, she whispered, not able to take her voice to full strength because of the lump of fear in her throat. Dunder stopped blinked as a tiny thank you for the compliment, and then continued to come closer. She lifted a hand. I smell like Felix. He sniffed, you smell like trees, sky, snow, human flower things, and Drake. He lifted an eyebrow. Can you explain that? You want me to explain why I smell like Drake? He sniffed her side, her cheek, her leg, he's all over you. Caleb snickered. Faith elbowed him in the stomach. Drake turned the color of holy berries. Clove put a hand on her hip. We camped together for a week, and Drake was a perfect gentleman. She wasn't going to share how he could kiss her in a place where no storm could ever reach her. Look, I need to know what your intentions are with my reindeer. Dunder jerked his head back in surprise, you challenge me? I'm she glanced down at the floor. I'm not much of anything in this world, but I'm all he's got. Clove, your AMA, Drake's reassurances were cut off by Dunder's stomp. Not as hard as he had before, but hard enough that the sound echoed through the barn like a judge dropping her gavel and calling for order. I love Felix and if you two are going to butt heads, then this whole thing is off. The words tasted like salty sand in her mouth, and she didn't know if she had the ability to follow through with her threat. She didn't want to pick between Felix and Drake. Dunder swung around and stared at Faith, what whole thing? Faith looked at Caleb before stepping forward. 
We didn't want to worry you so we didn't say anything, but we're struggling. We need flying calves and there aren't any left. Dunder staggered back three steps, no flyers? He looked around the barn, what about these? Faith came closer. The wranglers glanced around, and up, to make sure none of the other flyers were within hearing distance. Faith whispered just loud enough for him and Clove to hear, I love these reindeer, you know I do. Dunder twitched his nose. But, Faith gulped. Neither Snowflake nor Sparkle have been able to have a baby. Rudy's with Santa and Flash is unstable as a flyer. His genes wouldn't do us any good. Her face twisted with the news, like it pained her to say these things out loud. Felix is our only hope of continuing the herd. Dunder blinked, absorbing the news. He slowly swung his head toward Clove, you brought him here? We did. She motioned between her and Drake. Which is why I smell like him. She smirked. I didn't want to come, at first. But after seeing Drake with Felix, I softened. He's so good with him, Anne. What about Santa? Dunder breathed in her hand. She drew in a breath. I didn't believe in Santa. For a long time. Her thoughts came in small chunks, like memories in clips and snippets that were hard to stream together. I was hurt. She reached for Drake's hand and his strong one was there, holding her. He healed my heart and made it possible for me to believe again. Not Felix? Felix healed me in other ways, but it was Drake who opened my heart door. I don't think either of them could have done it alone. I was, probably still am, broken in too many places. Dunder starred, waiting. A sense that she'd failed the interview washed over her, and her shoulders slouched. I don't remember Santa coming to my house. She dropped Drake's hand and hugged her arms. I just can't remember. Santa won't come for you, bellowed Dad. You're too far out of the way and just a kid. My kid, which doesn't speak well for you anywhere. That's common for people with childhood trauma, said Natasha, drawing her out of the dark places of her mind where her father still lived. I did a documentary on it in college. Clove offered her a weak smile. Knowing she was normal in her abnormalities was comforting, sort of. It was kind of Natasha to offer her a line. She didn't understand though, didn't know how poor, how under-average, and how pathetic Clove truly was on the inside. No matter how she dressed up, she couldn't shake the stains her father left behind. I'm sorry, she told Dunder. I'm not what you want me to be. That was the story of her life. She gulped the emotions back. Thanks for your time and everything. She stepped away from him and then bolted for the door. Clove. Drake called after her. She looked over her shoulder to see Dunder blocking Drake from getting to the door. Let her go. No. Drake yelled. She said a silent thank you to Dunder. He was in tune with the fact that she needed time alone. She needed space from all this. But what she really needed to do was to lock herself away in a cabin in the woods and not rely on anyone else. Every time she started to believe she belonged somewhere, she realized she wasn't enough. Spending time with Drake, learning to love him, had been good for her and she'd take the lessons with her but she couldn't stay here where love was so strong it could break her. The sooner she was off the ranch, the better. Chapter 36 The doors slammed behind Clove. Move. Drake bellowed at Dunder. Dunder lowered his head, bringing his antlers down and pointing them at Drake. Make me. Jack grabbed Drake's right arm and Caleb grabbed his left. Easy now, Caleb crooned. Maybe we should take a step back before you end up at Dunder Kebab. Drake snorted at Dunder. What's your problem with her? Dunder barely shook his head. She's the one with the problem. What are you talking about? Drake demanded as he strained against his older brothers. It took both of them to hold him back. They may be older, but time erased the size and muscle differences between them. If it had been just Caleb or just Jack, he could have easily broken free. Dunder lifted his antlers and his black eyes met Drake's. Better that she leaves now. He flew himself back into his stall and kicked it with his back foot. You'll thank me one day. I oughta, Drake growled. 
Pack slid open the door to the welding shop. Bring him in here. Drake fought with Caleb and Jack. I have to find Clove. Let me go. Forrest tripped Drake's foot out from under him, making it possible for Caleb and Jack to drag him fast enough he couldn't get traction to stand back up. They tossed him into a chair. You boys have fun. Natasha winked at her husband. As she slid the door shut behind them as she asked Faith, Do you want to grab a cocoa with me? I just... Whatever she'd just done was lost as they drifted away from the door. Drake glared at the stained concrete floor. The workshop had all the tools and toys a welder or craftsman or woman could want. They all took welding and would shop in high school and learn the basics, but Pax had found his calling in life and only came out to eat and sleep. When no one spoke, he lifted his gaze to glare at his older brothers. They stood in a line with their arms folded and stared down at him, just like the baby brother they had to keep in line. He wasn't a baby anymore. He was a man who could make his own decisions. I'm out. He stood, and they closed ranks. You all are wearing on my last nerve, he ground out between his teeth. We can't let you chase after her, Jack drawled. Why not? Didn't you see Dunder? Forrest asked incredulously. Yeah, I saw him. He's a crazy old reindeer who feels threatened by my. He came up short. It wasn't like he and Clove had defined their relationship. He assumed they were headed to the preacher sooner rather than later, if he had anything to say about it. He'd never called her his girlfriend before, and he hadn't proposed. He wasn't threatened by her, Pax said, his quiet voice carrying more of a punch than any of his other brothers when they yelled. He was aware of her unbelief. And Santa? Drake scoffed. Give her one Christmas, two days, on the ranch and she'll be over that. I'm not worried about it. Pax waited a beat to answer letting Drake's comments melt into the floor before he replied, her unbelief in herself. Drake stared and stared. Then he stared at Forrest, who nodded. Dunder wasn't trying to keep her apart from us. He was making her look inside. Instead, she ran away. I can help her. Drake took off his hat and dragged his fingers through his hair. It can't come from you, or Felix, or anyone else. No one can believe in Christmas until they believe that they are worth what Christmas is really about. Jack tapped his chest. She has to accept the love that's offered, all of it, from the source of love, Pax added. We can help build her up, Caleb offered. We'll do our best by her, but she was hurt badly by the sound of things, and there are some things we can't fix. She has to do the work and God does the rest. Drake blew out. What am I supposed to do? Give her some time, offered Jack. In space, added Caleb. Drake shook his head. He didn't want to do either, but if he didn't want to scare Clove off, he should probably follow his brother's advice. Chapter 37 Clove buried herself in the warm, teddy bear blanket in Anna and Abner's spare bedroom, her phone in her hand. She had a difficult call to make and had to work up her courage to dial. A part of her felt just as she did that cold winter's day when she and Dad hiked up to Grandma's cottage. She wore a pair of two small sneakers that made her toes hurt and jeans with holes in both the knees. Her shirt came up on her stomach when she lifted her hand to scratch her head and her hair hadn't been washed in a week. If they owned a hairbrush, she hadn't seen it. Dad had on new pants that were so stiff they could stand up on their own. She'd read the labels at the store that said they were fire-resistant. That was a good idea. Why didn't they make all clothes fire-resistant, she'd asked. What a stupid question, he'd scoffed. Why would babies need fire-resistant clothes? He glared at her until she dropped her gaze. She didn't bother to explain why she'd thought it was a good idea. Doing so would only bring on more ridicule, more name-calling. He'd spent over $700 in the store, using a shiny new credit card she'd never seen before. There was a display of winter knit hats for children at the register. She stared longingly at a light blue one thinking it was soft enough to wear to bed and keep her warm. Our kids' hats are on sale this week. The sales girl smiled brightly. Would you like to get one for your daughter? Not worth it. Dad swiped the card, took his bags and receipt and they drove to a place she'd never been before. She hoped it was for the new job she'd heard him talking about on the phone. A new job meant they would stay in one town, at least for six months. She'd get to go to school and eat lunch there. School lunches had so much food and she was always full when she got to go to school. Instead of going to a new apartment, 
Dad grabbed her grocery bag's worth of things and they walked up the hill. Grandma opened the door, having seen them coming. She had tears in her eyes as she took Clove in from head to toe. Dad shoved Clove forward, dropping her bag on the porch. Her feet were heavy and her legs didn't want to work. Something wasn't right. I'm headed to a new place, a new job. She'll be in the way. He didn't have to tell Clove to stay put when he walked away. She knew he didn't want her, and that was that. She'd cried and screamed at him to come back, though. He never even turned around. And here she was, going back to Grandma after being told she wasn't enough all over again. It totally sucked. She grabbed a tissue from the side table and dabbed at her eyes, counted to three, and made the call. Grandma picked up after two rings. Clove. Hi, Graham. Every bit of sadness in her heart oozed out in her voice. What happened? Clove began to cry in earnest. I'm not even sure. They're reindeer king, I don't think he liked me. I don't have any memories of Santa and he was all judgy and mean. I didn't even let them introduce him and Felix. I'm not sure this will work out. She hiccuped. Tomorrow is Christmas Eve and I just want to come home. She burrowed deeper into the blankets. I'm so sorry. She blew her nose, grateful no one could see her like this. Anna and Abner offered to drive me. That couple's kindness knew no bounds. Anna fed Clove a hearty homemade dinner, including a cherry cobbler for dessert, and Abner set Felix up in the indoor arena for the night. He'd had a great time running the obstacle course and flying through the hoops. We'll swing by and I can get my car. You and I will be back to the cabin before it's dark. That's awfully nice of them. What about Drake's truck? Clove lifted a shoulder. I haven't talked to him. Drake's silence hurt most of all, like a jagged icicle to the heart. Because he didn't say anything, she assumed that Dunder's rejection was his rejection as well. These wranglers were loyal to their reindeer. She understood, on one level, because she hadn't wanted to choose between Drake and Felix either. In a perfect world, she wouldn't have to. I'll see you tomorrow, dear. Try to get some sleep. She let out the breath she'd been holding. She'd been doing that a lot tonight, forgetting to breathe out. Love you. They said good night, and she pulled the blanket over her head. After a week of sleeping on the ground, the bed was almost too soft. It didn't matter. Tomorrow night she'd be in her room with her things and back to her old life where the reindeer could fly and her heart was safe from Drake Nicholas. Chapter 38 Drake woke up to a pounding on his door. He'd fallen asleep on the couch, not able to go to his room because Clove might show up at any moment and he wouldn't hear her knock on the door. Or, he might give in to his crazy idea of storming his parents' house and demand that she speak to him. She'd hidden herself away in the guest room and not come out all night. It almost killed him to be kept away from her, but he'd respected her need for time and space to work through whatever issues Dunder brought up. Bang. 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 Coming. He half yelled and half growled at the door as he stumbled over, still wearing his shoes from the night before. His body didn't want to do anything he asked of it. His right leg tingled with new blood flow, and his right ear was asleep from the angle he slept on the arm of the couch. He probably had couch marks on his cheek. He ran his hand through his hair as he pulled open the door. Morning, Drake, chirped Rory as he swiped his hat off his head. I'm here to meet the missus. Drake groaned. She's not here. He dropped his hand from the handle and walked back to the couch. Rory stepped inside and shut the door behind him. Oh, looks like the honeymoon is over. His eyes swept over the couch and Drake's ruffled appearance. You expecting her soon? Drake sensed something was going on that was bigger than his domestic state. Why do you ask? Well, Rory rocked back on his heels. I gotta collaborate on an old lady story about you getting hitched. Drake groaned. Or I gotta haul you in for trespassing on government property and stealing an animal. He frowned. I'm really hoping you had a fight with your wife, and that's why you slept on the couch last night. I wish that too. He rubbed his palms down his pant legs. Clove wouldn't talk to him, and he had no hope of making it look like they'd run off as a happy couple who were stupidly in love. Rory, you gotta believe me. I didn't steal anything. 
I do. But I'm an officer of the law, and I have to do my duty. He stepped forward and took Drake under the arm. I'm really sorry about this. He slapped a handcuff on one wrist. Drake sighed as he turned, not fighting his arrest. Do you mind if we stop for breakfast? My mom's making cinnamon rolls. That might buy him some time, too. He wasn't sure what he would do, but surely someone would think of something. That's tempting. Sorry. Think you could call her to bring you some? You get one phone call after all. Rory motioned for him to go outside first. He opened the door and Drake stepped into the blinding sunlight bouncing off the snow. Snowflake, who was out for her morning walk, stopped and then turned and sprinted back to Forest House. I'll get help. Skittish little thing, isn't she? Rory opened the back door to his four-wheel drive. Do you normally let her wander? Drake mumbled something. He wasn't even sure what, as he ducked into the back seat of the police car. Rory slammed the door, and he turned to see Snowflake scrape her antlers across Forest's front door. Mitzi wouldn't be happy about that she'd just finished repainting it Christmas red. The door swung open and Snowflake bit the front of Forrest's bathrobe and pulled him onto the porch. Rory put the key in, and they pulled away. I'm sure we'll have this all wrapped up real quick. He slapped his leg. Get it? Wrapped up? Christmas? Drake dropped his eyes to the back of the seat in front of him. Without Clove, his world fell apart pretty quick. Christmas Eve, and he was headed to jail. Ho 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 and all that jazz. Chapter 39 Clove's eyes popped open, and she stared at her surroundings, trying to make sense of them. The blanket was too soft, her back didn't ache, and the light was muted as if by curtains. Her surroundings and circumstances crashed down on her all at once and she suddenly felt the pressure in her sinuses from crying herself to sleep last night and the crusty tears that dried on her cheeks and lashes. She rubbed her eyes in a way that would make people who cared about wrinkles cringe. She didn't need to care anymore because she was going to die alone. Apparently a good night's sleep hadn't brightened her outlook. She glanced at the clock and gasped. 10. Throwing off the covers, she scrambled for her clothes, only to come up empty-handed. Holy berries and pumpkin pie. They were supposed to leave at 7, so Anna and Abner had time to make the return trip. It was Christmas Eve, for crying out loud. Why hadn't anyone woken her up? A sense of unimportance washed over her again as she realized they must have forgotten her in the holiday rush. She took a step and the pajama bottoms she'd borrowed from Anna fell to the floor. Whoops! She scooped them back up, gathering the extra material in her fist. Anna had insisted on washing everything, and she meant everything, for her last night. If she dropped her pants in front of someone, she would reveal all her secrets. There was nothing to do except swallow her shame at being forgotten and go in search of her belongings, and hope she didn't drop her drawers along the way. She cracked open the door and listened. If she remembered right, the laundry room was off the mudroom, which was off the kitchen, which was through the family room. Just a hop, skip and a jump past the Christmas tree and probably the whole family. Although, at this late hour, they would be out working and not gathered around the table having breakfast. Sniff. Sniff. Was that cream cheese frosting? Her stomach growled. Yep. It only did that for cream cheese. She shored up her courage and slipped into the hallway. Clove. Yip. She hugged the fistful of fabric all the tighter and spun to find Pax leaning against the wall, waiting. His hair was a medium brown with a bit of red tossed in and his eyes were a steel gray. He had the same straight nose and chiseled jaw as Drake. You scared me. She shook her finger at him. He blushed. Sorry. Stuffing his hands in his pockets, he stood there awkwardly. I didn't mean to. She scolded herself. Pax was the shy brother. The one who locked himself away day after day, according to Drake. Her eyes dropped closed as the pain Drake's rejection caused blossomed freshly inside of her. Would that ever stop, or was she destined to live it over and over again? Uh. Mom said not to wake you up. Pax's ears turned dark red. But she wanted you to come down as soon as you were out. That's why I'm standing here. She thought I would have the patience to wait for you. She smiled. You mean you have more patience than your brothers? 
he jerked his head once. I need to get my things from the laundry room. She looked down at what she was wearing. Yeah. You probably should. He motioned toward the stairs. You can go first. Thanks. Pax had this aura about him that was so different from any of the rest of the Nicholas clan. Where Caleb and Jack took charge and would muscle their way through a problem, Pax seemed like the type to ponder over it for a while. Where Forrest charged out into the world, Pax hung back. And where Drake, Blossoms, ouch, was smooth and charming, Pax was thoughtful and kind. How did you survive in this family, she said without thinking as she tromped down the stairs. Pax chuckled. I sometimes wonder the same thing. They reached the bottom, and she turned. Wait, he said. She stopped. To be honest, my family gave me room to be me. I shouldn't have joked about surviving them. She wanted to roll her eyes at his sweetness, but something he said stopped her. What did you mean, they gave you room to be you? He shuffled his feet. I'm different, but it's okay. They like that I can weld and build and take care of things. They don't make me talk, but if I do, they'll listen. I can be me. She gulped. You're a very lucky man to have a family like that. He smiled slyly. You know. Drake is a part of the family, too. He's not so bad, once you get to know him, he added quickly. Clove laughed. I'm sure. Trust me Drake isn't, he didn't, I mean, I'd love to. She lifted her arms and let them flop back to her sides. Can we stop talking now? He slumped with relief. Sure. She giggled. What a sweet guy. One day, a woman would come in like a hurricane and throw him for a loop. Either that, or a quiet girl would slowly work her way into his heart without him even knowing. She hoped either way, he was happy. He'd be a great husband, seeing needs and meeting them without needing or even wanting her to make a big deal out of it. They reached the living room and Anna burst from her rocker by the fireplace, throwing her knitting off to the side. You're up. And you're starving. Her stomach agreed. Clove curved in on herself in an effort to make it stop. Come into the kitchen. We'll feed you and then talk about what's happened. Anna bustled ahead as if she hadn't dangled a cliffhanger in front of Clove's nose. Pax followed them and then continued on to the mudroom. I'll be in the shop if you need me. Have a wonderful day. Don't be too late. There are Christmas Eve things to do. Anna smiled fondly at her son. I won't. He shoved his felt hat down on his head and was out the door. Something happened? Clove asked as Anna set a plate full of warm cinnamon rolls in front of her. They had enough icing to make a gingerbread house, just the way Clove liked them. Anna opened her mouth to answer, but Abner burst in, bringing in a cold draft. Did you tell her yet? I was about to, Anna winked. She took Clove's free hand between hers and asked, How do you feel about dating criminals? Clove's hand stopped halfway to her mouth. Excuse me? Abner gave Anna's shoulder a light squeeze. That was my joke. He focused on Clove. We were joking about how to tell you and I came up with that line. Anna swatted at him playfully. It was a good one. I couldn't let the opportunity slip by. He chuckled as he sat down. Her idea was to see how you felt about another jailbreak. Clove let her fork clatter to the plate. I'm missing something important. They both chuckled. They arrested Drake this morning, Anna said with a little too much glee. She was on her feet before her mind registered that she'd moved. What? What for? They exchanged a secret look, both of them smirking slightly. Abner answered, apparently, for not being married to you. Clove covered her mouth. Grandma's fib. She'd forgotten all about Grandma telling Hoffman that she and Drake had run off to get married and the police officer telling Caleb he needed proof. He was arrested? She fell back into her seat and dropped her face in her hands. Why didn't you wake me up earlier? Anna patted her hands. You needed sleep. 
and he needed to rot in jail for a minute. Abner rubbed his palms together. Nothing like a jail cell to bring your life into focus. Oh, Abner. Anna stood up and went to the fridge. I don't recall you enjoying jail all that much. I don't want to talk about it, Abner grumbled. Clove shoved another bite of cinnamon roll into her mouth and kept quiet. A moment later, Anna was back at the table with three glasses and some orange juice. She poured for each of them. The question is, what do you want to do? Do, she said around the bite. She chewed quickly and swallowed. What do you mean? Anna tipped her head. We promised to drive you home today. I just wanted to make sure that was still what you wanted to do. But. Drake. She looked back and forth between the two of them. Shouldn't you be working on getting him out for Christmas? Abner laid his hand over Anna's that was on top of hers. The weight of it was comforting and let her know that their focus was solely on her. Their son was in jail and they were focused on her and what she wanted. It was all too surreal. Caleb, Jack and Faith are already down there. We're here with you. Right where we want to be at this moment. Clove stared at their hands. His words were so very wrong. Your son is in jail and you're going to drive across two states to help a stranger? Abner and Anna nodded. She felt like a complete jerk, taking these two away from their loving family on Christmas Eve to fulfill her selfish desire to be at home. She should suck it up and deal with the uncomfortable feelings until after the holiday. Why would you do that? We made a promise to you, Clove, and we'll keep it. Anna leaned over and gave her a one-armed hug. You sacrificed so much to come here, to bring Felix. We can't thank you enough. Besides, those who have flying reindeer are family, officially or unofficially. We love you all the same. Clove's eyes blurred. You're serious. Abner nodded. Thank you, both. So very much. I, I don't know what to say. Pax burst into the room, which seemed very out of character for him. His cheeks were bright red and his eyes were wide. You'd better come outside. All of you. He pointed and then ran back out. What in the world? Abner stood, pushing his hat on his head as he strode out. A blur went past the window. Flash. Anna scolded. How did the flyers get out? She was right behind Abner, grabbing her coat off the hook. Clove ran to the doorway, only to be knocked back by a tailwind. Gah! She stumbled back, throwing her arms out to catch herself. Her pants fell down, and she tripped, landing on her backside. Thank goodness the PJ top was as large as the bottoms. Huffing, she sat up and stared at her tangled feet. In the quiet second where she contemplated changing into her clothes, a beautiful reindeer with Liz Taylor's eyes appeared in the doorway. She had a light pelt, almost white, that seemed to sparkle? Clove asked. Sparkle's rack was small enough to fit through the door, and she didn't hesitate to walk right up to Clove. In the fur. She carefully, and with so much grace it was incredible to just watch her move, went behind Clove, lowered her head and nudged her to stand, let's go. Clove kicked off the pants, her bare legs hanging out. Go? I don't even have pants on. Sparkle PFT Ed, pants are overrated. She tipped her head, besides, you have great legs. Thanks. So do you? Sparkled preened, I've always thought so. She head butted her three times, out. 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 Clove scrambled for whatever winter clothing hung on the hooks by the door as she was prodded out by a gorgeous and determined reindeer. She didn't get to stop as she stepped into a pair of boots that were four sizes too big. Coupled with the long top, she was a fashion disaster. If she thought Sparkle's visit was strange, what she found in the yard was worse. Flash buzzed from house to house and yard to yard. He went over trucks and around tractors and circled children and adults alike. The children giggled, the adults yelled at him to stop. He didn't listen. I closed the door. Pax insisted to Forrest, who carried a bucket of grain. 
he held it up and shook it several times. He'll get hungry, eventually, he added as Flash buzzed right past the bucket. Mitzi put her hands on her hips. I have carrots in the fridge. I'll be right back. She stomped off, only to be turned back by Snowflake, who stood in her way. Snowflake. What has gotten into you? The flyers caused issues on this side of the fence, but the rest of the reindeer herd, all 350 of them, ran along the fence line, made a big arch, and then were back. They ran hard and were terrifying in their strength and beauty. In the middle of the herd, Dunder stood proud and tall. Abner and Anna fretted on the porch. What do we do? Anna asked. Abner lifted his hands. I've never seen them like this before. Sparkled nudged her again and Clove was forced down the stairs and across the parking toward the gate. No. I don't want to go in there. She turned and tried to dodge the movie star reindeer, to no avail. I'll be killed. Look at them. Pax and Forrest ran toward her. Sparkle. Stop. Abner cupped his hands around his mouth and yelled, Dunder. Dunder put his two front feet forward and slammed his back leg down, shaking the rafters. The herd stopped on a dime and a hallowed silence filled the space where the sound of a thousand hoofbeats had just been. Sparkle moved around her, hooked an antler on the latch, and opened the gate. That explains that, Pax mumbled. Sparkle jerked her head toward Dunder, the reindeer parting to make a path for Clove to walk through. Clove checked herself and realized she was not afraid. She went through the gate, past the big reindeer who huffed and puffed from their big run. Their breath clouded and filled the air, fogging the whole oval they'd stomped into the snow and shielding her from view. Inside the oval it was silent, eerie. Clove's footsteps were too loud, like they were in a tunnel of sorts. Dunder waited for her, his chest puffed out. When she was right in front of him, he turned his body but didn't break eye contact. He bounded once and was in the air, circling her almost as fast as Flash had blown past the window. For a reindeer his size, the speed was impressive. He soon turned from a blur of fur to a light. The light grew brighter and brighter until it blocked out everything and she was in a ball of it. She covered her head and squeezed her eyes shut. Wind rushed past her, warm and insistent. Fabric flapped against her knees and her hair whipped into her face. There was a flash, and then everything settled. She opened her eyes to find herself in a small apartment. Dunder stood next to her, his chest heaving and sparkles falling from his hide. She spun in a circle, not recognizing anything. Where are we? Dunder lifted his chin, indicating the baby bed by the tree, look in there. She moved that direction and found a sleeping baby girl with brown curly hair and a pink bow. The lights from the tree gave her skin a rosy glow, and she sighed, happy and content. A sound came from behind her and she turned quickly to see Santa pop in through the chimney. He wore the traditional red and white suit with black boots. His snow-white hair was trimmed neatly, and he carried the infamous sack of presents over one shoulder. He brushed gold sparkles off his belly and ho-ho-hoed softly. Stockings first, he mumbled as he began stuffing the one little pink, fluffy stocking hanging from the mantle. With that done, he turned and then froze like a deer in the headlights. He blinked at seeing the two of them in the room. Dunder? He stepped forward, his eyes cutting to Clove and back to the reindeer. You're supposed to be on the roof. Dunder's tail wagged, and he lunged forward, rubbing around the jolly old elf's stomach like a cat around a person's leg. How he managed it with such big antlers was impressive. You're not my dunder. Santa scratched under dunder's jaw. Ho ho ho, I don't know how this is even possible. Christmas magic is at it again, eh? I can call you old man now, can't I? He ducked, laughing, as dunder's antlers swung quickly around, playfully swiping at Santa for calling him old. You look good, dunder. Still have that magic inside of you, don't you, friend? Dunder bowed in a show of respect for Santa. You are the representative of Christmas magic. Clove soaked in the magic that dripped from these two. 
Their special relationship and the love they had for one another was a tonic to her wounded soul. If she could stay in this moment forever, she could be content. What have you brought me? Santa rubbed his hands together, taking in the room and the bassinet and then clove. His head ping-ponged back and forth between the baby and her. Clove finally had to take a closer look at the child as she slept. Her hair was so light she could hardly tell there were any at all. Her thick lashes brushed chubby cheeks and her hands held the blanket in the most endearing way. Interesting. Santa stroked his beard. Dunder, how did you gather this much time magic? Dunder flicked his ears, I had help. Time magic? The worn leather couch and tan carpet screamed 1999. Clove was born in, oh my gosh. This is me. She gripped the sides of the sleeper and leaned over for a closer look. The baby girl, her, smelled like baby powder. Her skin was rosy, and she was obviously well cared for and loved. It's me, she whispered in disbelief. Baby Clove's lips moved in her sleep as if she dreamed of eating. Well? Santa prodded Dunder. Dunder looked up to the ceiling, the picture of innocence. He had the whole herd in an uproar, is what he did. Clove smiled at Dunder to let him know she wasn't angry at him. And he looked like a reindeer king while doing it. Adding a compliment would keep her in his good graces, which was a good idea because he was her ticket out of here. They ran and ran and there was this fog. She shrugged. I don't know how it worked to do this, though. Santa shook his head as if he couldn't quite believe this situation. That explains this. He pulled a gift out of his red velvet magical bag and handed it to Clove before setting a couple more under the tree and then ending up at the plate of cookies. Oreos, did you know that this is the cookie I eat most on Christmas Eve? She shook her head, staring at the box. It had red foil wrapping paper and a large green wire ribbon. It wasn't heavy, but it wasn't as light as a shirt. Can I open it? Santa reached for another cookie. It has your name on it. She sat down on the love seat, the only furniture in the room besides the baby bed, and carefully unwrapped the box. Inside, she found a family photo album. On the first page was a picture of her and her parents. The image was taken the day she was born as her mom was in an ugly hospital gown wearing a smile so beautiful. And her dad? He was clean-cut, happy, and stared at the two of them with so much love it felt like a lie. The next page was her taking her first steps, laughing as she teetered toward her adoring father. Did you make these up? she asked Santa. Photoshop or something? He shook his head and sat down next to her, the cookie plate empty except for a few crumbs. Dunder licked it quickly, and the crumbs were gone. Santa's sapphire blue eyes twinkled. Did you know Santa's can't lie? She narrowed her eyes at him. Not that we don't want to lie, but we are physically incapable of it. It's part of the Christmas magic that makes reindeer fly and gifts appear and good will to all men abound this time of year. He tapped the edge of the book. Everything in here is true. She wasn't ready to process that, especially her father's love. Where did it go? When did he change? Instead of asking the hard questions, she asked, do you really live at the North Pole? He nodded. In an ice castle. And elves make the toys, she added. Yep. Everyone. We're expanding this year and my daughter is designing machines that can make blocks and other simple toys so the elves can focus on the electronics. You have kids. He smiled proudly. Yes, I do. Do you like cookies? I love them. He chuckled and patted his tummy. Probably too much, but what's a Santa to do? She stretched for something else that could prove he was a truth teller. Did I ever write you a letter? She hadn't. Not even in school. In the fourth grade, she'd laid her head on her desk and refused. He reached inside his red pack and came out with a piece of construction paper. Writing is a loose term. He unfolded it to reveal a drawing done in crayon and her name at the bottom written with backward letters that were not uniform. She took it, feeling like she was touching something special. 
The instant her fingers brushed the rough, touched the sheet, smelled the crayons, the memory returned. Kindergarten. Just before her mom died. She'd drawn a picture of a baby sister, the one thing she'd wanted more than anything in this world. When she asked her mom for one, she'd winked and told her to ask Santa. Two tears fell, absorbed into the letter quickly. What happened to my family? Grandma Hannah doesn't even know. Santa drew in a mighty breath. You were going to be a big sister. He put his hand over hers and chased away the chill that had set on her shoulders. You mom died of complications. Your dad was lost. She let the explanation sit just outside of her for a moment, not capable of taking it in. She was going to have a sister. Her heart ached for the loss, and she wasn't sure she could bear it. Santa put his arm around her shoulders. Think of it, Clove. You were so wonderful. They wanted another daughter. Tears pricked her eyes and quickly overflowed. Was I? He rubbed his hand up and down her arm. Not was Clove. You are. God made you. He put a light inside of you and it's beautiful and bright. The tears ran like waterfalls down her cheeks. Losing your mother and little sister could only break a man who had loved with all he had and then lost it. He flipped a page to reveal a professional family photo taken in a studio with a brown background. Mom was in a maternity dress and hoop earrings, her long blonde hair teased high. Dad wore a polo shirt and slacks, his face clean-shaven and his shoulders back. She was between them, an arm around each of their necks and a huge smile on her face. Clove leaned in to look closely and could just make out mom's baby bump. The thing that she could easily see was that they were a happy family, with the promise of many years of joy ahead. Dunder nudged her knee. You want that, don't you? Her thoughts turned to Drake and the dreams she'd held close to her heart, they looked just like this. The two of them were with a growing family working together to make a life full of love and joy. Except he'd wear his cowboy hat for the pictures and she'd curl her hair. I do want it. She sniffed. I didn't think I was worthy, but who is? Really? That little girl didn't do anything to earn that love. She tapped her own face in the picture. True love isn't earned, though, is it? It has nothing to do with being worthy. Santa smiled softly. Now you're starting to understand what Christmas is really about. She traced her dad's face. Do you know where he is? Santa paused, and she felt the silent question drift across her thoughts, do you really want to know? He couldn't lie, so she would have to live with whatever truth he handed her in this moment. Is he alive? She pulled back, not ready to carry that gift that was also a burden. Maybe someday. He nodded. She wiped at her cheeks. If I want to know. You know, later. Will you tell me? Yes. His voice moved through her in such a way that she knew he was bound by his words. Just write me a letter. He tapped the construction paper. You were not the burden your father carried. You need to know that. She gulped. I felt like I was. He said I was. Just because a man says something doesn't make it true. He stood and hitched up his black leather belt. Except for me, of course. Ho ho ho. She chuckled at his attempt to lighten things. He was right, though. She'd believed her father all these years, but the truth was right in front of her eyes. She was a daughter of God, and that gave her the right to unending love from him and the right to love and be loved in this life. Santa paused by the chimney. Drake is a man of his word. Remember that. She barely had time to blink before he was up the chimney, a trail of gold sparkles flying behind him. Dunder moved to stand next to her. It was amazing the three of them had fit into this tiny space. Maybe that was part of the magic, too. Are you ready to go home? What home? she asked wondering if he would drop her off at the cabin or take her back to the ranch. Home is the place where you belong. He stomped his back hoof, and her ears popped. Chapter 40
Drake sat on the metal bench in the jail cell, his elbows on his knees and his head hanging down. His backside had gone numb 15 minutes ago, but he didn't have the will to stand up and pace to get the blood flowing again. Christmas Eve in a jail cell. Happy holidays indeed. The cell was every bit the Mayberry setup Hollywood made small town jails out to be. A set of iron bars blocked his freedom, though his view of Rory's desk and the rest of the jail were unobscured. He'd heard both phone calls that came in loud and clear, and he had a front row seat to his brothers and Faith arguing and pleading for his release. Caleb leaned against the Pinewood desk. Can't you let him out for good behavior? It's Christmas Eve, and my mom wants her son home in time for dinner. Rory leaned back in his chair and propped his black boots up on the desk. He's only been in there a couple hours, hasn't even had time to misbehave. Caleb stroked his chin. You have a point. Jack elbowed him and scowled. Whose side are you on? Caleb rolled his eyes. What do you think? Guys. Drake lifted his head and glared at them. Go home and be with your families. He didn't care if he sat in here for Christmas, New Year's, and Valentine's Day. If he didn't get to spend those days with Clove, then there was no reason to care if he was behind bars or in Mom's living room. Faith came around the chairs and stood in front of the bars. You are family. He huffed. You know what I mean. She shook her finger at him. You are giving up when you should be fighting for your lady. Fighting for her? He surged to his feet, finally finding something he cared about more than himself. The door swung open and his mom walked in. He threw his arms out to the side, intent on telling Faith how bad the situation truly was at this time. I should be fighting for her? She locked herself away from me. Doesn't even want to look at me. I wouldn't say that. Mom held the door open for Billy and Ryder to come in. Dad, carrying Aspen, was next. Then Mitzi, and finally Pax. Good idea. Forrest beamed as he took Aspen from Dad and walked over to the desk. Aspen, sweetie, tell the nice police officer to let Uncle Drake go. He turned her toward Rory. She put her arm around Forrest's neck and turned her big hazel eyes on Rory. Let him go. Forrest kissed her cheek. You heard the woman. Let him go. The family chuckled at Forrest's antics and Aspen's adorableness. Wonderful, Drake grumbled. This is just what the children need, to visit their wayward uncle in jail for Christmas. A draft came in through the open door, drawing his attention. Is someone going to shut that? He groused like an old man, barely catching himself from saying, We don't pay to heat the whole town. I've got it. Clove chirped as she walked in and shut the door behind her. Drake's whole world stopped at the sight of her. He'd seen her angry. He'd seen her with messy hair when she woke up. He'd seen her with hat hair. He'd seen her tired and worried. He'd seen her giggle. He'd seen her enjoy a cup of cocoa. But he'd never seen her look so beautiful. She glowed. The light inside of her burst forth and she honestly glowed with it. Her long hair was down and in waves and so shiny it called to his fingers to touch it. The memory of corn silk tresses so soft against his cheek was so powerful he could have bent the bars to get to her. Her blue eyes were bright and alert, and her lips were full, soft, and kissable. Once their eyes met, she moved to him, rushing through the room and reaching through the bars. Her hand grabbed the front of his shirt and pulled him closer. He took it and kissed it once, twice, and then breathed in the cinnamon and frosting scent of her skin. I thought you'd be halfway to Montana by now. He put her hand on his chest and held it there, afraid she would disappear on him. She used her other hand to cup his cheek, digging her fingers into his beard in that way that he loved so much. He may never shave again. I belong with you. He closed his eyes, breathing in her words like he'd been out of air. Clove, I love you. I should have pounded down your door last night and told you that over and over again. He was feeling his way along a precipice, desperate to be in a place where one wrong step wouldn't drop him a thousand feet and praying he didn't trip over his words. I'm sorry about Dunder. She put a finger over his lips. Dunder is one amazing reindeer. He wrinkled his forehead. We're talking about the same reindeer, right? She glanced over her shoulder at his family with their backs to the cell, blocking Rory's view of them. Aspen looked over Forrest's shoulder and smiled. Forrest tickled her side, and she turned around again. He she stopped and wrinkled her nose. I'm not even sure what to call what he did. Magic? Her eyes brightened right before she said, Christmast. He Christmast me. She put her face closer to the bars and whispered, I met Santa. Drake blinked. Ginger came to the ranch? She shook her head. I'll tell you all about it later. I promise. We need to get you out of here so I can tell you that I love you, too.
and I don't want to go back to Montana or be anywhere that you are not. His heart expanded, and he tried desperately to get closer. Stupid bars. Hey, Rory, get me out of here so I can kiss this woman. Rory stood up and hoisted his belt. Kiss through the bars if you have to. What? asked Forrest. He grabbed Mitzi around the middle and kissed her. She stared up at him with hearts in her eyes. What was that for? He lifted a shoulder. I was just showing Rory that Christmas Eve kisses have to be without bars. Yeah. Jack dipped Natasha low and gave her an on-screen kiss. She came up breathless, her hand over her heart. Polly's. Faith jumped into Caleb's arms, wrapped her legs around him while he spun in a circle and kissed him like they'd not seen one another for months. That's how it's done. She hopped back down and Caleb gave them all a lopsided grin. Drake groaned. The bars were cold against his forehead. Mistreatment of the prisoner. Rory chuckled as he pointed to the door. There's no kissing in jail. Take it outside. A general groan sounded. Bunch of hooligans mumbled dad right before he pecked a kiss on mom's lips. The groaning got louder. Oh hush. Mom swatted at them all. I didn't raise you in a barn. Don't act like it. She adjusted her Christmas sweater and faced Rory. What do we need to do to bring my boy home for Christmas? Rory hooked his thumbs in his belt. I need proof that they're married. Clove was suspiciously quiet and Drake worried she'd hightail it out of there. You didn't push a woman like her into getting married. You would her with love and attention, building trust over time. That's the only way, asked Dad. That's the only way, confirmed Rory. The way they're painting it in Windy Plains, he was either off on a romantic getaway or he was stealing a reindeer. What if we prove he didn't steal the reindeer? Asked Mitzi. Can you prove that? Asked Rory. They all exchanged looks. She dropped her chin. Not really. Then we're back to the wedding scenario. Rory scratched his clean, shaved chin. Does it matter when we get married? Clove asked. Drake considered her, while Rory considered the question. What was she getting at? Did she want to marry him? Obviously not today, while he was locked away like a criminal. I don't suppose it does, so long as you tie the knot before I call Windy Plains. Clove faced Drake. I want to be honest. I don't want to start our lives together with a lie. He traced his fingers over her lips. I agree. Even if it means I'm in here for Christmas. Clove's eyes softened and if he could, he would have kissed her for hours because of that one look. We're not married, she announced. The whole Nicholas clan blinked in unison, shocked that she'd blurted it out right there in front of Rory. What are you doing? hissed Jack. Clove stood taller. We didn't run away to get married. She turned and winked at Drake. But we want to. For a beat. No one moved. Then Pax started to laugh. I think she beat you to the punch, little brother. Everyone else joined in the laughter. Drake drank in the love and the trust and the hope in Clove's words. Whoa. He held up a hand unable to resist a chance to tease her a little. Are you asking me to marry you? She blushed, her eyes sparkling. That was all the answer he needed. He put his arm through the bar and brought their bodies as flush as possible in their current situation. Don't tease me, Clove, he whispered. Forrest cupped his hand around his mouth and whispered loudly, Bro, you should hold out for a ring. Mitzi elbowed him hard enough that he rubbed the spot. Have I ever told you that you have sharp elbows? Me? Mitzi batted her eyelashes. Drake wished Clove was in the cell with him so he could have this conversation without his family butting in. Seriously? He asked quietly. What are you saying? Instead of answering him, she looked at Rory. Do we need a license or anything? Drake's body practically floated off the ground. This incredible woman wanted to marry him. Yes, he said, loud enough for everyone to hear. Yes, I'll marry you. That earned him another round of laughter from his brothers. It's Christmas Eve. Mom exclaimed, flapping her hand. Where are we going to get a marriage license on Christmas Eve? Caleb and Jack did that weird twin mind meld thing that they sometimes did, and then the two of them ran out of the jail. On it, Caleb called over his shoulder. Mom put her hand on her hip. Those two. It's not like the pastor is available on Christmas Eve. He has a whole service to prepare for tonight. Forrest handed Aspen to Mitzi and started for the door, grabbing packs on the way. Come on. We need to encourage the pastor to make a visit to the jailhouse. No kidnapping. Rory yelled after them. Pax turned white. I would never. Forrest shoved him out the door. No offense to the rest of you, but out of all you Nicholas boys, I think Pax would be the least likely to kidnap anyone. Rory sat down at his desk. I'm offended, Drake said. Clove's mouth fell open, and then she closed it and giggled. 
Good thing he doesn't know about your sordid past of kidnapping old ladies. He tickled her side. Grandma Hannah came willingly. Clove brushed her hand down his face, and he rubbed her arm. He couldn't get enough of her. No offense taken. Dad sat on the edge of the desk. You ever had a wedding here before? Drake tuned them out as mom and her daughters-in-law talked about wedding details. It sounded like they wanted to weave fabric through the cell bars for decoration. He didn't care about any of that, though. He only cared about one thing, making Clove his wife before Christmas. Chapter 41 Clove's name had never been spoken with such tenderness before. She faced Drake, who still held her palm against his chest, where his heart raced with the speed of 350 reindeer. Don't marry me to set me free. His brown eyes pleaded with her. Please. I don't think I could take it if you pity married me. I mean, I'm not going to lie, I love you desperately enough that I considered it for a minute. She closed her eyes, letting his words fill her up. It's so strange to me that you feel like the one getting the pity proposal when I'm the one who is lucky to get you. You've got that backwards, love. He brushed his fingers over her cheek, reveling in the feel of her soft skin. She pressed herself against the bars, just wanting to be wrapped in his arms forever. Drake, you are a man I can count on. I haven't had one of those before. I thought they were as rare as flying reindeer. He traced her cheek again, sending wonderful tingles through her entire body. I hope I'm smart enough to see a good thing and grab onto it. She fisted his shirt. Drake Nichols, will you marry me because you love me and I love you? Will you share a life where reindeer fly and the spirit of Christmas is in every single day? Will you adopt my reindeer and raise him as your own? Will you be my wrangler from this day on and forever? She held her breath. There was so much in all those words, her hopes, her feelings, her barest parts, and she'd laid them out for him without fear. His eyes dropped closed as if he was in the most wonderful, peaceful place. When he opened them, she found all his love for her shining forth. Clove Hogan. I never wanted to get married. I didn't want a wife, and I didn't want a family and I didn't want to share my space with anyone, until you came along. I spent seven days in a tiny tent with you and it wasn't enough. The very thought of losing you makes my life bare, lonely, and cold. You have shown me warmth and light, adventure and fun, love and joy. He kissed her hand. If I don't have you, I'll never love again, because you're it for me. I won't only marry you, I'll cherish you every single day. She closed her eyes, and he rested his forehead against hers, their cheeks touching the cold bars. Chapter 42 Thanks, Ginger. I know you all are real busy today, but it would mean a lot to a special little boy. Drake tucked his phone into the crook of his neck as he talked to Santa. He was our special helper. No problem. Anything for a friend of our reindeer wranglers. Her voice was as chipper as ever. Joseph, are you ready? We need to be in the sky in three minutes. I'll let you get to it. Drake said goodbye and tucked his phone away. Are you sure you're ready? Drake asked Clove as he led Dunder out of his stall. They'd gotten married two hours ago, filled out more paperwork than he ever wanted to see in his life, and driven home. Home. His home. Their home. The house where they would live and love and have a half dozen children. They would have another wedding so Grandma Hannah could watch them exchange vows and Clove could wear a white dress. They batted around dates, deciding that early summer was a good time for an outdoor ceremony. Clove wanted Felix to attend, if he and Dunder hit it off, that is. They were on their way to the indoor barn to make introductions. I'm so nervous. Clove scrubbed her palms down the front of her skinny jeans. Drake hadn't seen this pair before, and they looked good. His sisters-in-law had each contributed some clothing to get her through until they could drive back to the cabin and gather her things. They planned to take the long way around, making a lot of stops and sleeping in actual beds to avoid Hoffman and enjoy their road trip honeymoon. Dunder leaned his shoulder against her side, and Clove practically laid over him. I trust you, she whispered. But be nice to my guy, okay? Dunder smirked. I'm always nice. Drake lifted his eyebrows, silently asking Clove, can you believe this guy? She snickered behind her hand. Drake's phone beeped. The family's waiting in the bleachers. Mom made caramel popcorn balls. Clove snorted a laugh. Of course she did. 
She loved that this family didn't take things or themselves too seriously, except for their responsibility to the reindeer, of course, that they took with all seriousness. She'd watched Anna as her son was in jail and her family in a bit of a holiday fuss, and the woman was unflappable. She quietly fed everyone, entertained grandchildren, and made caramel popcorn balls. In short, she was incredible, the unsung hero of the ranch in Chloe's opinion, and she wanted to be just like her, trusting in the Lord with all her heart, might, mind, and strength. She was on her way. Trust came easier when she trusted herself. Santa gave her a gift. It wasn't the photo album or the letter. It was a sense of self-worth and her place in the universe as a daughter of God that surpassed what her father had taken from her. As a side effect of that confidence, and probably the love she felt for Drake and the Christmas spirit, she had found compassion for her father. Wherever he was, she hoped he was better than when he'd left. Before we go over to the barn, I need to tell you too how Felix came into my life. She ran her hand down Dunder's neck in a slow, smooth motion. Only if you want to, Drake offered. Dunder snorted at him. Don't interrupt. She continued to stroke his fur. I just graduated from high school and I felt all alone in the world. I didn't want to leave grandma or go anywhere. I think I was scared that I'd run into my dad and I couldn't have handled that. Anyway, I was in the woods behind the cabin and there was this rustling. My heart raced. I thought it was a wolf or a bear and I was trying to decide if I was going to lie down and play dead or take off at a sprint when there was this bleeding noise. Thinking it must be a lost goat, I crept up on this large bush and pushed the branches aside. There was a little reindeer, a calf that could barely walk, he was so weak from hunger. I searched and searched for the mom, but she wasn't anywhere to be found, so I took him home. Suddenly, I had a purpose, saving his life. I put him next to the fireplace to sleep that night, much to Grandma's dismay. He became family in a night. When did you learn he could fly? Drake grinned, knowing this would be a good story. The next morning, he was on the ceiling. I thought I'd gone nuts. She laughed. He flew to me, giving me a reindeer-type hug, and she paused. You know, I always thought this part of my memory was a mistake, but there was this silver magical ribbon that wrapped around the two of us and tied itself into a bow. I blinked and it was gone. Your bond. Drake nodded. Yeah. She smiled at him, then looked at Dunder. I've raised him. If there are any flaws, it's my fault. Dunder pranced in place like a boxer getting ready to enter the ring. Can we get going? She huffed. He wasn't going to let her take the blame if Felix didn't measure up. The three of them walked to the indoor arena, and Drake grabbed the handle with his leather glove. He gave Dunder a look that the reindeer ignored, and then swung the door open. Both he and Dunder waited for her to go in first. She'd been in here that morning as she explained what was happening to Felix and why she had to rescue Drake from jail. Then again, when they got out of jail to explain that she'd gotten married. Drake had told him that they would always have a spot on the porch for him and that he would always be theirs. Felix seemed happy with the arrangements, as long as there were oats and carrots involved. The family lined up on the bleachers, just like Drake said they'd be. They ate caramel popcorn balls, the brown sugar sent heavy in the air. Abner and Anna were in the front row in matching ugly red Christmas sweaters. Abner held Anna's left hand. She used the other one to hand out treats and make sure everyone was settled. Caleb and Jack's families were in the next row up. The twin men sitting together, their wives at their sides. Jack held his niece, Aspen, on his lap. She wiggled and squirmed, wanting to stand one moment and sit the next. He moved with her allowing her to get her energy out and even take his hat off and put it on her own head. Natasha lifted it to play peek-boo with the one-year-old who grinned as if she'd invented the game herself. Forrest and Misty were up higher, with Billy sitting on the row in front of them. Aspen had fallen asleep and was tucked into her daddy's arms. Pax sat on the other side of Mitzi, his gaze intense. Billy waved at her. Hi, Annie Clove. Okay, that was adorable. She waved back. Hi, nephew Billy. He laughed, dropping his head back and leaning into Mitzi sitting behind him. She tickled his chin, making him squirm. Clove grinned. This was her new life, her new family. They loved and cared for her in a way she'd never known, but being here was like falling into the softest pile of blankets. The fall was kind of scary, but the landing was incredible. Felix turned toward the open door and lifted his nose in the air. Clove stepped to the side to let Drake and Dunder in. It was now or never. She had to let her reindeer face this moment, even though every part of her wanted to demand another way. 
It seemed like everyone held their breath as they waited to see what would happen between the two bulls. Felix held his ground in the middle of the track and let Dunder approach him. They both stood as tall as possible, their chests puffed out and their antlers on full display. Drake slid his arm around her and pulled her to his side, leaning back against the wall. Is it bad that I'm incredibly proud of Felix's rack right now? It's almost as big as Dunder's, she whispered, her lips brushing his ear. Nope. Their eyes locked and held a thousand promises, and I love you surged between them. A loud crash rang out, and they both turned. Clove gasped in horror. Dunder and Felix's antlers locked together as they pushed, grunted, and pulled at one another. Clove's hands flew to her mouth. Drake's hold on her tightened, and his muscles tensed. Mitzi covered Billy's eyes. Faith glanced at Caleb, her forehead wrinkled with worry. Back and forth, the large bodies went. Their snorts made the dirt puff around them. Neither of them wanted to give an inch. Dunder twisted to the side and pulled Felix around. Unbalanced, Felix stumbled but regained his footing. Clove grabbed Drake's arm and squeezed. Felix's eyes glinted, and he twisted, dragging Dunder as he spun in a circle. Dunder jumped away, gathered himself, and charged again. The clatter of antlers colliding was gruesome, and Clove shuddered away. They panted with furious effort. Pushing off one another at the same time, they each took three steps back, lowered their heads, and ran toward one another. No. Clove wanted to bury her face in Drake's chest, but didn't dare look away. Time seemed to slow down with each step they took, and she prayed with all her heart that both reindeer would be okay. In a flash, time started again, and they collided, sending sparks out in every direction. Sparkles followed, and then shoots of gold and silver tinsel. The reindeer disappeared in a haze of pyrotechnic clouds. Caleb and Jack yelled as flames, started by the sparks, appeared on the ramp. I got it, they said as they grabbed fire extinguishers from the wall. The ropes, yelled Faith, pointing to the rooftop model on the side of the track. The shingles didn't catch fire, but the ropes were bright orange. On it, Forrest climbed up there and smothered them with a horse, a reindeer, blanket. When the excitement died down, all eyes went back to the bulls. The cloud dissipated slowly, revealing their outlines first. Clove's heart raced, and she forced an exhale. Both reindeer were still standing. They no longer faced each other as challengers, but stood together as brothers, shoulder to shoulder, strength to strength. It was a draw, Drake said in a hushed tone. They're calling it a draw. What does that mean? She asked, noting her fingers digging into his shirt. She forced herself to pry them open. The reindeer lifted their noses and bugled in harmony. Faith grinned. Felix passed the test. Drake hugged Clove. You taught him well. She laughed. Like I taught him any of that. She laughed through the tears of relief coursing down her cheeks. The family spilled off the bleachers, the children dancing around the reindeer, and the adults patting them on the back and praising them both. Drake kissed her ear. Looks like we got ourselves a new stud on the ranch. She squeezed her eyes shut, thinking of how much work it was to care for a baby reindeer who could fly. Are you ready for this? Drake pulled back and brushed his fingers over her cheek. I'm more than ready for whatever comes our way. She leaned into him, grateful to know that she could borrow his strength when she needed it. He never pushed it on her, never weakened her or doubted her abilities, but was always right there if she needed him. I hope so, she wrapped her arms around his neck. Because tomorrow is Christmas, and I didn't buy you a present. He nuzzled her neck. I didn't buy you one either. Her thoughts went all warm and fuzzy. Whatever will we do? Sleep in, he asked as he kissed his way down her neck. Sounds like a Merry Christmas to me. She lifted on her toes and kissed him. As his arms circled her and he lifted her off her toes, her heart lifted too, and she realized that Drake made her feel things. She'd been numb for so long, no man had stirred her heart. Until Drake came along. She'd thought living this way, with so much energy, would be exhausting, but she was wrong. It wasn't like she was dragged about by her emotions. It was more like the moments played like music when they'd been silent before. Love you. Drake continued to whisper sweet words, and she let herself get carried away on the melody. She'd gotten everything she'd not asked for this Christmas, and it was her best one ever. Who knew what would happen next Christmas? She couldn't wait to find out. Epilogue Christmas Eve church services were Pax Nicholas's favorite. The music swelled up to the rafters and the choir sounded like angels. When they were up in front, wearing their white choir robes, no one noticed that his eyes never left one singer. 
The last thing he needed was any of his brothers figuring out that he was in love. Jovi Jovi had a voice that could make hardened criminals break down and cry. The first time Pax heard her sing, in the third grade, he dropped his crayon box. Colors scattered across the floor and his world shrank to one little red-headed girl. She wasn't a little girl anymore. He could tell you exactly when. Her freckles started to fade, tenth grade English class. She started work at her family's diner, the summer between sixth and seventh grade she and her twin sister started helping out. Jovi quickly decided she liked working behind the counter while her twin enjoyed socializing and entertaining the customers. He'd eaten so many milkshakes made by Jovi that his mom said his bones were harder than two by fours. Her hair changed from flaming orange to a golden copper, one week after graduation. He'd walked into the diner expecting to see her behind the counter like always. Instead, she was in the back, learning to cook with her dad. Her hair had gotten darker, richer and taunted him because she was one more wall away. The song ended, and the congregation bowed their heads for the prayer. This moment was always a battle for Pax. He knew he shouldn't peek at her, but one more glance was all he needed to hold him over until next week. He lifted his chin and then popped his eyes open, finding Jovi. Their eyes locked. His breath caught. She closed her eyes quickly. He stared. Had she been looking at him? Before the pastor said amen, she was off the risers and through the side door. Gone. Again. He shook himself and tucked his head down, intent on getting out of church without talking to anyone. Merry Christmas, he mumbled as he pushed past the group gathered at the end of the pew. They responded in kind, but he kept going. Pax Nicholas. Someone hooked his elbow from behind and spun him around. He groaned, silently, of course, because his mother raised him to be a gentleman. He glanced down to see Heidi, Jovi's twin sister, grinning up at him. Just feel those muscles. She squeezed his arm. Hmm, mm, mm. You are just the man I was looking for. He blushed under her praise and open admirations. I don't think so. Oh, but you are. She leaned into him. He swallowed heavily, casting his eyes about for a rescue. Drake was all wound up in clove. They'd tied the knot that very day in the county jail and only had eyes for each other. Caleb and Faith talked with the pastor. Ryder made circles around Caleb's legs. Jack, Caleb's twin, waited for Natasha to finish chatting with a woman about where she'd bought her Christmas dress. He smiled softly at his wife, not in a hurry to rush her when she was so clearly enjoying the conversation. Forrest chased Aspen, who was just learning to walk down the aisle to the front. He snagged her and threw her over his shoulder, eliciting giggles that came all the way from her toes. Mom and Dad were in the middle of a group of young parents who were excited about the annual sleigh ride Dad would take through town in a reindeer-drawn sleigh. He volunteered to dress up as Santa and go, since everyone else wanted to be with their families and Pax didn't like the attention. They wanted to know what time he'd be on their street so they could have the kids ready to watch through the windows. Seeing Santa ride by was a huge motivation to go to sleep on Christmas Eve. Thanks to his family's general socialness, he was at the mercy of his good manners with Heidi. Can you believe we haven't had a proper Christmas pageant in over ten years? Heidi flipped her hair over her shoulder. Unlike Jovi, Heidi tried to cover up the red with brown hair dye. I told the pastor it was a travesty, and do you know what he said? Pax tucked his chin to keep from rolling his eyes. Seeing as how I wasn't there for the conversation, I don't know how I would know what he said. She giggled as if he were so funny. He told me to go ahead and plan one. She squealed and bounced on her toes. Can you believe it? Me? In charge of the biggest production of the whole year. Congratulations. He went to move away, and she stuck herself to his side even tighter than before. He tugged on his collar, 
feeling claustrophobic. I know you're a genius when it comes to building things, and I'm tasking you with making the sets. She winked as if he were the luckiest man alive. He shook his head. I have too much work to do. I know you have some spare time in that workshop of yours. She batted her eyelashes at him. Besides, you have a whole year to work this out. Please. It would mean so much to the children. The children? he asked dubiously. She nodded. Imagine the memories they'll cherish for years to come. He shook his head. The side door opened, and Jovi came through holding her little sister's hand. Pax couldn't help but watch the way she tucked a strand of hair back for the little girl. They called kids that were born that late a caboose and this one seemed to be just that, always one step behind Jovi. You know, Heidi tapped her chin. Jovi will be heavily involved in the planning. Pax's gaze cut to her. Had he given too much away? Stared too long. She'll be singing, of course. But I'll need her artistic skills to say, paint the sets. She looked away as if she weren't trying to manipulate him into spending countless hours on a project he didn't want. Still, if he could work with Jovi then he'd do it. She hadn't spoken to him since that awful day under the bleachers. Okay, he croaked. Heidi released him so she could clap her hands. Yay. I'll be in touch. Ta-ta. She bustled off to corner someone else, and Pax darted for the parking lot. He didn't breathe until he was in the truck and then he fogged up the windows as he worked to calm himself down. This was it. He finally had an in with Jovi and he wasn't going to let it go to waste. No sir. He was going to win her over once and for all. This was going to be the best Christmas pageant ever. Find out what happens next Christmas in One Salty Christmas Angel You've been listening to One Frosty Christmas Road Trip A Reindeer Wrangler Ranch Christmas Romance Novel Written by Lucy McConnell I know you're wondering what happened to Coulter and his mom. Did the Kringles come through with Drake's special Christmas request? Of course they do. They're Kringles after all. They never let a child down, especially at Christmas. I hope you enjoy this bonus short story. Coulter couldn't sleep, it was Christmas Eve, and if he didn't fall asleep, then Santa wouldn't come. He knew when you were sleeping. He squeezed his eyes shut and counted to ten. Jingle. His eyes popped open. What was that? Tipping his head he strained to listen. Jingle. There it was again. He pushed back his covers and then froze. Should he look? His bedroom door was right off the living room and the Christmas tree was one peak around the corner. He put his feet on the cold floor. His toes curled up but he was too excited by the rustling noises in the living room to jump back into bed. Creeping as quietly as possible, he went to the door and leaned out. He gasped, the sound so loud he slapped his hand over his mouth. The slap was loud too. He felt his eyes go wide. Santa turned around and put her hands on her hips. Ho ho ho, I'm glad you're up. Coulter tried to breathe, remembering that he had his hand over his mouth, he dropped it and sucked in air. You are? Santa nodded and motioned for him to come closer. The reindeer wranglers called me earlier tonight and said you'd been an extra good kid this year and a big help taking care of Felix. He nodded. I helped them find a sleigh. Santa grinned and patted him on the back. Great job. Coulter noticed the cookies he and Mom baked hadn't been touched. Santa saw them at the same time and reached for one, taking a big bite. Yum. Did you make these? He lifted his chest. With my mom. Your mom. Dot. Hum. Santa took another bite. I think there's a special present for her in my bag. Do you want to go get it? Coulter ran for the sack that looked like it was empty. But he knew things with Santa weren't always what they seemed. He lifted the white, fur-lined edge to find a large box wrapped in gold paper. It sparkled so pretty. Mom's going to love this. Ho ho ho. You don't even know what's inside there. Santa's blue eyes sparkled. Coulter ran his hands over the smooth paper. She likes pretty things though. It's already perfect. Mom worked all day and she didn't eat a lot at dinner. 
I made her a decoration at school and I put as much glitter on it as I could. Santa considered him. In that case, pull out that other gift. There's nothing else inside. Coulter turned around to point at the sack and it was bulging with a large box. He giggled and pulled it out. What is it? Santa looked scandalized. I can't tell you that. Coulter giggled. He thought about his mom and a memory tugged the smile off his face. Did you get my letter? Santa reached inside the red coat and pulled out an envelope. Coulter's shoulders fell. That was the letter he'd written in class. The one that asked for a bike and the toys. All the things kids were supposed to ask for for Christmas. Not that one. The secret one. Santa snapped and the letter appeared above Coulter's head, floating down for him to grab. You mean this one? Yes. Coulter caught it. He stared at the front of the folded paper where he'd drawn a smile and written Santa's name. Did you bring it? He words caught. Santa winked. Coulter, anytime someone asks for a gift for someone else, it makes Christmas magic stronger. Your Christmas wish for your mom was so strong, I couldn't have stopped it from showing up. Sparkles flashed from under the tree and Coulter looked to see a large box with a red bow, just like he'd asked. He threw his arms around Santa. Thank you. Ho ho ho. Thank you. Santa returned his hug and the world smelled like cookies. Off to bed with you now. Let your mom sleep in a little tomorrow morning, okay? Coulter nodded seriously. I love you, Santa. I love you, too. Coulter went to his room and pulled the blankets up to his chin. Jingle. Jingle. A smile spread across his cheeks and he fell asleep knowing that tomorrow morning would be the best Christmas morning of his whole life. Gabriella stumbled from her bed. Morning light spilled across the floor. Coulter, she garbled. Clearing her throat she tried again. He should have been in here hours ago, jumping on the bed and asking to open presents. Her heart raced with an unnamed worry. Every mother does this, right? They automatically worry that something is wrong. She pressed her cold hand to her forehead in an effort to relax. Just because Coulter slept in on Christmas morning didn't mean something was wrong. It was just everything went wrong for her lately. Her boss insisted she work all day yesterday and her plans to make the day special for Coulter went down the tube. They didn't get to make cookies until after nine and Coulter was falling asleep as they rolled cookie dough. Then there was the mailbox. It continually produced bills she didn't know how she was going to pay. She dreaded walking to it each day but was also too scared to fall behind because late fees could take her all the way under and she'd never get back up. Coulter met her at the end of the hall with a hug on impact. You're awake. Santa said to let you sleep in. He danced away from her and climbed on the couch, standing on the middle cushion. Merry Christmas. Gabriella glanced to the small stack of gifts she'd been able to accumulate for him and gasped. Instead of three small boxes, there were dozens. The whole living room was full of boxes, bags, ribbons, and baskets. Who? Did? This? She blinked and rubbed her eyes. Coulter laughed. Santa came last night. We talked. Mom, this is for you. He shoved a large box toward her. Santa wouldn't tell me what it is and I want you to open that one first. Gabriella blinked. You talk to Santa. She stared at the box, wondering if someone were going to jump out of it and scare her. Not that the box was that big. It would have to be short someone. Okay, it might be safe. She gulped before grabbing onto the paper and tearing off a huge piece of it. A vacuum. She fell to her knees in front of the box. Not just any vacuum, but one of the expensive ones that wouldn't break in six months. She traced the image on the box. I never thought I'd have something so nice. Coulter leaned into her. Ha! Huh. That wasn't what I thought it was going to be. She laughed, feeling lighter than she had in a long time. In one quick move, she had him in a hug. What did you think it would be? He zipped his lips. She tickled him, making him writhe with laughter. When he gasped for air, she set him back up. What do you want to open? He grabbed a box with a red ribbon. 
You do this one. He ducked his head. I wrote Santa to bring it for you. Her heart ached for this kid. He went without so much and never complained and he'd written Santa for her. Best. Kid. Ever. She reached for the box. Okay. But then you have to open one too. He nodded eagerly. She ran her hand over the shiny paper. It's so pretty. He beamed. I knew you'd like that. There's a gold one over there that's pretty too, but I thought you'd like red. She nodded as if he were so wise. Carefully, she pulled back the ribbon and then the paper. It was thick and expensive and she wanted to save it to wrap her gifts for her parents that she and Coulter would deliver that night. Finally, she lifted the lid and moved aside tissue paper to reveal a beautiful red wool coat. She gaped at it, afraid that if she blinked it would disappear. Coulter, she whispered. He leaned his whole body into hers. Do you like it? She looked to the coat rack where her threadbare, gray coat with a broken zipper hung and tears pricked her eyes. She blinked them away quickly. I love it. She hugged the coat to her as she exclaimed over each new toy. Here. He handed her an envelope he'd found under the tree and ran off to open something else. She opened it to find a gift certificate to the local grocery store. The amount would feed them for six months. The air escaped her lungs and she couldn't hold back the tears. Calter approached, his forehead wrinkled. He touched her cheek. Why are you crying? Because, she grabbed him and kissed his cheek, I love you so much. He hugged her neck. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. She sniffed and her gaze drifted to the small window. Clouds filled her view and a light storm was on the way. Somewhere out there, a group of flying reindeer pulled a sleigh. She'd met one. Before that, she wouldn't have believed a miracle like this could happen. But now, now she believed. Thank you, she whispered to the sky, her heart warming with the sense that she wasn't forgotten and that things would be okay. With a smile, she pushed to her feet. It was a Merry Christmas indeed. And we're back. Thank you for listening to One Frosty Christmas Road Trip. I hope you enjoyed the story, The Reindeer, and Drake and Chloe's Romance. Leave me a comment below. Let me know what you think. Let me know what you thought of the bonus little chapter. And I know it was little, but it was important. We couldn't leave Coulter without his Merry Christmas. It just needed to happen. So thank you again. Please like, comment, subscribe, count it as my Christmas present, and I will see you on the next video slash audiobook. Remember that you're loved and have a very Merry Christmas.